There you go. Well, we're going. I think I think we're a minute early, but we'll we'll go with it. Um, yes, you're now live, Ali. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining me. Um, I'm sorry for the early start. So, first of all, thanks a lot for the donations uh, and uh, your generosity. Um, my name is Ali Faram. I'm a consultant pathologist at the University of Sheffield, and um, I deal with and diagnose oral cancer on a daily basis, really. So I feel quite passionate about the subject. And today we'll be online for 12 hours. Um, and hopefully you won't just have to listen to me and there'll be a lot of other people uh, with uh, interesting experiences um, who will be logging on. And um, we will also have some live discussions as well, including with patients. So why am I doing this? Um, first of all, of course, is to raise awareness about mouth cancer uh, as a problem. And uh, the numbers are significantly uh, on the rise and uh, the patient survival uh, has not got better uh, despite uh, treatments getting better. Um, but also to raise uh, funds for uh, Mouth Cancer Action Month, <clears throat> particularly in these difficult times and during the current pandemic. And as you know, all charities uh, have been hit quite uh, badly. Um, also tomorrow is Blue Wednesday. <clears throat> which is um, um, run by the Oral Health Foundation as part of the Mouth Cancer Action Month. And uh, basically what we encourage people to do is do a 45 minute self check to see if there's anything suspicious in their mouth. Uh, and if they are in doubt to get themselves uh, seen by a dentist. Uh, but also hopefully today we'll get uh, patients and clinicians to just uh, discuss things together and to share their experiences uh, and any lessons they learned. And uh, of course, you will be sharing that with us. So why is mouth cancer such a big problem? So it is among the top 10 cancers in the world. Um, and in some of the developing countries, the problem is significantly sort of more challenging. For example, things like, um, uh, if you think about countries in uh, South uh, Asia, uh, like Pakistan, India, it's, like, it's the second most common cancer in those countries. But just in the UK, the incidence has increased uh, by over 64% in the last 10 years, uh, with at least 22% increase uh, in patient deaths uh, over the same period. And the 10-year survival really depends on how quickly we can detect uh, mouth cancer. So the earlier we can detect, the better the survival is. Uh, but it ranges between 19 to 51%. But if we can detect it early, then the survival can improve from 50% to 90%. So I'll be referring quite um, heavily to this report by the Oral Health Foundation, uh, which is State of Mouth Cancer UK report, which has got some really uh, up-to-date and useful uh, numbers and statistics. Uh, so approximately, um, we're getting about 8,300 new cases e uh, each year. But I think last year it was about 7,000 uh, and something. So around the 8,000 mark. And mouth cancer can involve um, a range of sites uh, in your mouth. So it can be your tongue, can be gums, under your tongue, tonsils, or even your palate. And we have at least 3,000 deaths and just in the UK, and which are related to mouth cancer. And this will continue to be a problem. So if you look at these numbers by Cancer Research UK, and these were the projected rates from 2010 to 2030 about how um, mortality rates or patient death rates are going to change between uh, those 20 years. You can see that um, the mortality rates for all the cancers and the more well-known and uh, more common cancers are significantly dropping. And the only two cancers where the mortality rates or the patient death rates are projected to increase uh, are oral cancer and liver cancer. And of course, there's a projection of at least 23% uh, increased number of deaths which tells you it's going to remain a significant problem. One of the issues with oral cancer or mouth cancer is that we don't have a single risk factor. So there's a multitude of risk factors. Uh, we all know about smoking and 17% of these mouth cancers can be related to smoking. Increased alcohol consumption is also um, a risk factor. Uh, so anyone who drinks more than 10 units is actually increasing their chances of getting mouth cancer by 81%. And this risk is 30 times higher in people who both smoke and drink. 
And recently, a role of viruses has also been shown in particular human papilloma virus and two types of it, 16 and 18, which have shown, been shown to be responsible for 73% uh, of oropharyngeal cancer. So that's one in 10 of oral cancers. And there's also correlation with increased age um, and uh, gender. So males uh, historically uh, tend to uh, get it more commonly than females, although that dynamic is slightly shifting now. So as I mentioned earlier, early detection is absolutely critical uh, and the survival uh, improves from 50 to 90% if we can detect the cancer at an early stage. Why do we detect this so late? Uh, the biggest issue is the lack of awareness or poor awareness uh, in patients and public. So although this has slightly improved over the last few years uh, due to uh, the work of charities like the Oral Health Foundation, um, a recent survey uh, by them actually showed that 12% of the population has actually never heard of mouth cancer. In particular, younger people under the age of 24 have uh, never heard of it or also don't think that this cancer is going to affect them. So they associate it with old age. Also, uh, the survey showed the people who actually smoke and drink quite actively still do not think uh, that they are at risk. The other issue that sort of came across uh, from this survey was that when people actually have a problem in their mouth, who would they go and see? And it appeared that 70% of the patients would actually go and see either a GP or pharmacist. And only 21% will seek the opinion of a dentist. And most people are actually associate a dentist with just uh, tooth problems and nothing else. And that's quite significant because dentists are much more better at picking up mouth cancers and pre-cancers and just because they receive more training and see it more commonly. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, mouth pre-cancer, uh, which we call oral epithelial dysplasia. And that can be quite difficult to detect or determine because as you can see from the pictures, the appearance is quite variable. So you can have like bigger white patches, it can be quite subtle with red areas, or it can be quite widespread uh, involving multiple areas of the mouth. But up to half of these can actually become cancerous. And that's probably one of the key areas where if we can detect these early and treat them early, uh, then we can significantly reduce the cancer burden. So what's going to happen today, we're going to discuss uh, throughout the day uh, a lot of key issues. Of course, we'll talk about awareness, uh, challenges in diagnosis, uh, the treatment pathways, uh, particularly in the UK. Uh, and we'll also hear about the patient perspective and some experiences of a patient's journey from diagnosis to where they are right now. Um, and there'll be pre presentation from a range of different specialists, uh, but also a few patients. But the whole theme of it is actually promote early detection and diagnosis and to raise awareness. So just to remind you again, it is Blue Wednesday tomorrow, uh, 18th of November. Uh, and what we ask you to do is uh, a 45 second self check for mouth cancer. And if you're not sure how to do it, uh, you can just go to mouthcancer.org or the Oral Health Foundation website and you would uh, find that information. Uh, I'll also remind you that we still got the fundraiser going. You have already been very generous and we've gone above and beyond the expected target. Uh, but uh, we would be very grateful if you keep donating throughout the day as we uh, talk about these things. Okay, so um, that was the introduction to mouth cancer. So I think our first speaker is with us. Let me just stop my sharing and I'll just uh, like to welcome I can hear you okay yeah can you hear me yes I can so um, whenever you're ready you can yeah. start presenting so um, Hani has been working uh, on uh, mouth pre-cancer and using some uh, novel and new technologies to actually improve the detection and diagnosis of these so I'm just uh, sharing my screen Okay, is that, is that clear? Yes. Oh, brilliant, okay. 
Um, so good morning and, and thank you very much for um, inviting me today. Um, as um, Dr Crumbs mentioned, I'm, I'm an academic clinical fellow uh, working at the School of Dentistry in Sheffield um, and I'll be speaking about oral precancer and the challenges involved in early diagnosis. So I want to start off by highlighting what normal mouth lining should look like. We would expect a healthy mouth um, to have tissues which are pink, firm and moist and the gums, sitting, uh, the gums should be sitting very closely around the margins of the teeth. We wouldn't expect there to be any persistent ulcers, blisters, um, any areas of tenderness or, or spontaneous bleeding. The mouth tissues should feel soft and even, and there should be no unexplained raised or lumpy areas or any abnormal changes in colour. So really, the dentist plays a very vital role um, in assessment of the mouth tissues, in addition to looking at the teeth, uh, which is why it's, it's so important that we emphasise regular dental visits so that dentists can pick up on any suspicious mouth lesions early. Um, oral precancer, in contrast, it, it describes um, a chronic progressive disorder, uh, which can affect the lining of the mouth and it can affect any part of the mouth. It's the precursor to mouth cancer, uh, which we know is, is uh, the 14th most common cancer in the UK. Um, and that's already been highlighted, has a rising incidence and a worsening prognosis. And we know the survival for mouth cancer is very low um, and continues to be low, even despite advancement in, in medical and surgical techniques. Um, and actually is reported to be lower than many other common cancers, including breast, prostate and colorectal cancer. So that highlights the importance of early diagnosis of mouth precancer, uh, because through that it can be managed early and this can help prevent new mouth cancers from developing. So um, we spoke briefly already, Dr. Curran did, about the, the clinical appearance of oral precancer. It's variable, uh, as you can see in these photos. It can present as a, a white patch, uh, such as here, you can see on the right side of the tongue. Um, it can present as a red patch, or it can be more of a, a mixed white-red lesion. You can see this speckled, bumpy, uh, lumpy area in this first photo. And it can be accompanied with areas of ulceration or inflammation or thinning of the mouth lining. Uh, and because it looks um, so variable and, and it can be um, asymptomatic in the early stages, early detection can prove to be difficult. There are lots of different risk factors, such as the ones that I've listed on the slide. And while some of these habits might be more prominent in, in certain parts of the world, um, major UK risk factors would include smoking and excessive alcohol consumption. And evidence shows that these two um, in conjunction further increases a patient's uh, risk to mouth cancer. And there are various other risk factors as well, such as uh, ultraviolet radiation, uh, fungal and viral infections, um, and, and specific oral potentially malignant disorders as well, such as oral submucous fibrosis or inherited conditions like Banconi's anemia. Now, there are lots of different clinical features um, that have been shown uh, to be linked to a higher risk of developing mouth cancer. So you can see in this table here, a lesion which has a bigger surface area or diameter um, or a mixed speckled appearance um, lesion shows a higher association. Uh, whereas age and gender um, is also important, but shows more of immediate uh, risk um, um, or association with developing uh, something more sinister. Um, but there's no single definitive uh, clinical or social feature which can reliably predict whether uh, pre-cancer is, is going to go on to become a cancer. And what we also know is that up to 50% of mouth cancers um, can essentially arise from normal appearing mouth tissue as well. So that further adds to the complexity of uh, diagnosis. This has been taken from the, the recent uh, mouth cancer report uh, published by the Oral Health Foundation. And uh, essentially, it's, I put it there to show um, that there is a general lack of awareness amongst the UK adult population with regards to the early uh, signs and, and symptoms of mouth cancer. So, for example, you can see just under half uh, the population identify white patches in the mouth as a possible sign, uh, while a similar number realise that lumps in the mouth or in the head and neck region um, um, are, are a symptom of the disease. So patient education and, and raising public awareness um, remains an important obstacle or barrier to early detection, which of course is uh, one of the reasons we're doing this today um, is to help raise that awareness. So conventionally, the gold standard method of diagnosis of uh, oral precancer involves 
uh, a pathologist looking at a biopsy sample taken from the suspicious area under a light microscope. And the pathologist then analyzes the biopsy by looking at specific tissue features and grades the lesion into mild, moderate or severe categories. Um, and that grade is then used by surgeons and clinicians um, to help guide treatment um, and decide whether a lesion should be monitored or whether it needs to be surgically removed because the grade is used to determine the risk of, of malignant progression. Here you can see the spectrum of microscopic changes seen in the mouth lining. So initially it shows surface thickening, but as the condition progresses through the different uh, grades of uh, mouth precancer, through the mild, moderate and severe grades, you can see that there are a range of abnormalities which are seen. Now in early stages of the uh, condition, um, it, if there is appropriate cessation or modification of patient risk factors, the condition can be reversed. But if it's left untreated, or if these um, you know, genetic mutations continue, then the lesion will progress to a cancer. Having a slightly closer look under the microscope, uh, this kind of animated image just shows the notable difference which pathologists see um, when comparing normal mouth tissue um, here on the left to uh, precancerous tissue, the image on the right. So you can see the image on the left um, has been divided into the three layers, which is represented by the black dotted lines and the smaller blue dots inside the cells uh, represent the nuclei. You can see um, there is a, a clear difference in the way the cells and the nuclei are arranged and they're all of different shapes, different sizes um, in the image on the right. And a pathologist has to take into consideration up to 15 different microscopic features to come to a final diagnosis um, and, and give a grade uh, to a lesion. So um, accurate diagnosis is really important because otherwise it can have significant implications on patient management. Um, but unfortunately, the, the current method is slightly subjective. So I guess the question arises is, are there any new methods or any new technologies that are being developed or in research to try and help improve the diagnosis of precancer? Well, in the last decade, there has been quite a lot of evidence uh, demonstrating the potential for artificial intelligence uh, to increase objectivity and also efficiency of diagnosis of a whole range of cancers um, and, and to produce quantifiable outputs to help with uh, cancer prediction and also prognosis. Um, I recently published, um, along with Dr. Curran, um, a systematic review, uh, which we led in conjunction with the um, International Association for Research on Cancer. And, and that actually highlighted that whilst there is um, early evidence demonstrating the role of AI um, in various um, head and neck cancers, it's, um, there's very limited um, work being done specifically uh, to show its role for oral and um, oral precancer. Um, so we know that um, artificial intelligence has shown some, some success um, and it actually has shown to outperform pathologists in, in a whole range of cancers such as breast, prostate and also lung cancer as well. At the moment um, there is some new and exciting research being led at the University of Sheffield um, which is aiming to explore and investigate the role of AI for risk prediction of developing mouth cancer. Um, and, and as part of this, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to be part of this work and having recently been awarded funding from NIHR, which will involve a three year study and um, that will help to apply and develop novel AI methods to help with oral precancer assessment. So in summary, um, early detection of oral precancer is critical to prevent the development of new cancers. Um, the greatest work really needs to be done on improving public awareness of the major signs, symptoms and the risk factors for developing um, mouth precancer. And we know there has been an implication with COVID-19 on being able to get access to dentists. So really it highlights an even more important need to be able to, to feel confident and comfortable in a self-examination so that um, the public and people are aware of what signs uh, warrant the need for early professional help. Uh, finally, um, you know, there's early and exciting work being done at the moment um, and there is a potential role for new automated technology to help with oral precancer assessment um, and that has the potential to positively reduce mouth cancer rates uh, in the future and provide more effective management strategies at an earlier stage. 
thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Anya. Really um, important point. And uh, as you know, um, how critical it is to get the pre-cancer diagnosis right. Of course, detecting mouth cancer itself and treating it early is important, but if we can intercept it even at an earlier stage of pre-cancer and remove that ambiguity and variation in diagnosis, that can significantly reduce not only the cancer burden, but of course, um, uh, the patient survival chances uh, as well yeah. as quality of life. So in the work that you were doing, I mean, I know pathology, you refer to pathology as one of the areas, uh, but did you come across uh, at any other technologies or anything else that has been used or has got any potential for early detection? Uh, specifically for mouth cancer, other than artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, the main focus is obviously is a clinical examination, um, which is our uh, you know what's um but in terms of new technology um and even in terms of ai is it just being applied to pathology predominantly oh, or any no, other so ai is being applied to um very widely for cancer diagnosis for a range of different cancers but also not just pathology um it's being applied um for assessing sinister lesions in radiology images ct scans for example mri scans x-rays um and also um clinical images as well. So there's lots of different imaging modalities that it's looking at for a whole range of different cancers. Um, there's been some groundbreaking work and, and um, very um, important studies done showing its, in, in its role in detection of breast cancer, for example, um, and also radiology. It's, it's very advanced in radiology. So it's not just the field of pathology, so it's fast moving. Okay, great. That's brilliant. And that uh, thanks a lot for your talk. And I think that leads us very nicely to uh, the next speaker, Paul Hankinson, who's uh, an academic clinical fellow in oral and maxillofacial pathology at Sheffield. And Paul did uh, quite important work uh, over the last two years or so, uh, looking at the variation in how mouth precancer um, gets treated, because uh, that is uh, one of the key issues. So not just the diagnosis that's challenging but we don't have any specific guidelines uh, on how these are or should be treated. So over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. And um, congratulations on managing to raise so much money. Thanks a lot. Um, I've just asked to share my screen. Yeah, I can see it. So just start your slideshow and I think it should be okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking briefly about a, a service review that we did of the um, pre-cancer service that we provide here in Sheffield. Um, and have a look at some of the things that, that sort of we, we thought we were doing well and some of the things that we thought that we could improve and talk a bit about, as, as Ali had mentioned, the variation that can sometimes happen with the management of these patients. Uh, these are the, the colleagues that I, I did this work with, including Dr. Karam and, and other colleagues in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Um, so it's uh, already been really well introduced. Sorry to interrupt, Paul. I think we've got yeah. your presenter view um, and not your actual full screen okay. slides. So I can change... Might need to change the window. Sure. If you stop sharing and start again. I think it's still the same, hasn't it? Is that better? Has that worked? Um, try and do the swap thing and see if it works. We can still see the presenter. <laughs> okay. But Oh, yeah, that's, I think, yeah, it, but then it disappeared. Yeah, okay, excellent. Okay. Um, so, it's, as I was saying, it's already been very well explained what um, oral precancers are, but usually they tend to present as either white or red patches in the mouth. They can have a variety of appearances, a variety of textures to them. And as previously mentioned, uh, the way that it's uh, diagnosed is with a a tissue biopsy. So a piece of the skin of the mouth is taken where the patch is and it's looked at down a microscope to determine, first of all, if it is precancer, but also how severe that precancer is. Um, and there's lots of different ways that 
Precancers can be graded, uh, but the most common way used at the minute is to put it into one of three categories, either mild, moderate, or severe. And the more severe that it is, the more likely it is to become cancer over time. Uh, we wanted to have a look at what service we are providing here in Sheffield. And to do this, we looked at 150 patient records um, to see how they were treated, what severity of um, pre-cancer they had, and also um, how often they were being seen and ha had checkups after they'd had their treatment. Um, so how do we manage these patients and how do we manage pre-cancers? So that the first thing is, um, is giving advice and giving help and support on reducing the risks for um, oral cancer. So things like helping with smoking cessation or reducing alcohol intake, as has already been mentioned. Another important thing is the monitoring and surveillance of these uh, patches. So we try to keep a close eye on these patches um, for two reasons, to check that they're not changing and they're not becoming cancer, or if they do become cancer, um, dealing with them as early as possible, which gives the best prognosis. And then for some of them, we, uh, we remove them surgically as well. So what uh, here, called? I think we're still on this slide one. It hasn't moved on. It hasn't, has it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Would you mind just stopping the sharing and starting? Yeah, on? I'll try resharing. Okay, that's better. So if you just click on, yeah, slideshow and see. Brilliant. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I um, talked about how these patients are managed and, and what we specifically found and saw in Sheffield was, first of all, that about half of patients who had had the biopsy and had the diagnosis of precancer had a mild precancer, just under a third had a moderate precancer, and then 16% had a severe precancer. We looked at what treatment they initially received and what management they had overall. So we found that you can see here on this chart, on this side, that near enough everyone had a biopsy for diagnosis of um, these precancers, and everyone had a plan for surveillance put in place. The bottom is just a little table that shows about how frequently people had photos. So we often take photographs of these patches so we can get a better idea of if there is a change or not, or if they're staying the same over time. And on average, people got photographs taken about every year. There was a lot of variation in this. Um, there was some people that were receiving photographs of their patches every six months. Some people that may well have been in and out of the hospital for five, six years without ever having a single set of photographs. There was a lot of variation there. There's also a lot of variation in who got advice on how to reduce their risk of developing a cancer. So you can see here from this chart showing advice on risk factors that 61% um, re received advice who had a mild precancer, about half who had a moderate precancer, and two thirds of those who had a severe precancer received some advice on how to reduce their risk of developing cancer. And ideally, we'd want that to be everyone. Um, again, there's a lot of variation in who received surgery. So this chart here just shows how many people received removal of their patch. So very few who had a mild precancer, um, just under 30% who had a moderate, and about two thirds who had a severe precancer. And at, at the minute, there's no clear evidence, um, and there's no good strong evidence to base a decision on about whether we remove these patches or not. Um, but there's advantages to removing these severe patches. Anyway, sometimes the moderate patches, sometimes it's the case that though the biopsy said that it was a precancer, once the whole of the patch is removed, it may be found that there is some early cancer within that tissue. So generally, it's a good idea to try and remove the more severe precancers. Um, in terms of what checkups people had after, we like to keep an eye on these patches to make sure they don't change. And if they do change, we can deal with them early. So we've split it into the initial, but also the long-term follow-up. Generally, we tend to keep a closer eye for the first couple of years, as this is when it's most likely that these patches will become cancer. And um, once they've been shown to have, have stabilized and they're not going to change, then they can still change. So we, we continue to watch them, um, but it's less likely over time. So what we found was the average that we were seeing patients was about every three months in the initial stage. And then later, about every six months for those with a mild 
pre-cancer, about five months for those with moderate and four and a half months for those with severe. So we tend to keep a closer eye on those with more severe. Again, with this, uh, similar to with the photographs and the advice on risk factors, there was a lot of variation. We had some patients who were being seen every three to four months for 10 years who had a mild pre-cancer. And then there were some patients who had a severe pre-cancer that were being seen uh, once a year for a couple of years before being discharged. So again, there's a lot of variation in how uh, patients are managed. In terms of the outcomes, um, for the mild pre-cancer patients, the majority were discharged and just over half of patients with a moderate pre-cancer were also discharged. Uh, just under 40% of patients with a severe pre-cancer were also discharged. The rest either had continued treatment or um, surveillance and monitoring within Sheffield. Um, of those who had the continued monitoring um, or of the total who had a mild pre-cancer, about 5% went on to develop a cancer, about 6% of those with a moderate pre-cancer developed a, a cancer, and a, just under 30% of those with severe and developed a cancer. So you can see the difference between the, the risk categories, uh, the impact that it has on the risk of developing cancer. These numbers are similar to other cohorts, other hospitals as well. So it's about the same as what we'd expect. And also interestingly, um, you can see at the bottom, uh, just over 16% and just under 13% of patients with mild and moderate precancers um, had a, a worsening of their precancer over the time we looked at them, about five, six years. Um, and this, the, the, these patients didn't develop cancer, but they had a, a worsening of their precancer. So that's another important thing with the monitoring is to check whether they have a worsening of the precancer. In terms of the improvements to the service, um, the main things were we aim to standardize management. So we've um, put together a protocol for management of these patients, depending on what their risk is, which we're currently trying to um, make as a guideline in Sheffield so that everyone receives the same treatment based on their risk and their own needs. Um, one of the other things that we were noticing is sometimes it was taking 30 or 40 minutes to have photographs they may contribute to why some people were getting photographs less frequently and um, waiting for the central photography service to come. So we want to train our nurses in photography so that it can take them there and then on clinic. We want to improve the uh, or reduce the variation in advice on risk factors. So we want everyone to be able to have that advice to reduce their risk and um, have a look at why some of the most severe precancers weren't removed. Some of them are very good reasons. For, for example, if, if the patient doesn't want the surgery or if they're too unwell to have the surgery, but we wanted to have a closer look at that in the future. And we discussed all this with, uh, with the teams that manage these patients uh, at several meetings. So um, we're expecting that hopefully when we have a look back and see how, how patients are being managed now, that that re variation is reduced a bit. Uh, so that's everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, are there any questions or comments? Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, really interesting stuff. The thing I was interested in is that uh, the grade or the risk score that we give uh, for treatment, uh, like mild and moderate, um, in terms of them becoming cancerous or worsening, it seemed like that there wasn't much of a difference between those two. So they actually lower lowest grade of what we think is not that harmless. It looks like that can become cancerous almost as frequently as the intermediate grade. Yeah, I think one of the things that's a bit tricky here in Sheffield is with the mild um, dysplasias is of, of this, the group of patients, there were two or three patients who were originally diagnosed with mild dysplasia that also had uh, Fanconi anemia. Um, and because of that, they're almost inevitably will develop a mouth cancer at some point. Um, and so that skews the numbers a bit. And if you take those patients out, it's more around 2% and um, for the mild category. So th when you take those, that, that group of sort of specific patients out, the, there, is a, there is a more of a difference. But yeah, uh, certainly it does highlight that the mild dysplasia still can become cancer. And I know, I mean, Liverpool have done quite a bit of work in developing guidelines. So. Do you know, are you aware, why don't we have national consensus guidelines or are people working on it? So every pre-cancer dysplasia gets treated the same way? Um, I, think, I think a lot of it comes down to the lack of evidence. Um, there's a really poor evidence base for 
most of the decisions that you'd want to make. Uh, for example, something as simple as whether to remove the lesion or not. There's, there's no randomized controlled trials. There's no clear evidence out there as to whether there's a, a definite benefit for removing these lesions. Although there's, there's obviously practical benefits, as I mentioned, uh, things like detecting early uh, invasive cancers um, from removal of the whole lesion and things like follow-up as well. There's no evidence to suggest what's a good or useful follow-up um, regime, uh, checkup regime for these, uh, for people with precancers. Um, and it, it's, I suppose one of the things is, is you, do, you want to be watching people frequently enough that you detect the cancers early because the patient, patients have a much better outcome when the cancers are detected early. But at the same time, you don't want to be bringing people back every two or three months. Um, it's, it's a burden on the people who have to come back, but it's also mm -hmm. a burden on the, the health service as well. And what sort of uh, options are available in terms of alcohol or smoking cessation? And did you feel like just going to those records that people actually listen to clinicians and may change their habits once they're given a diagnosis of pre-cancer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're providing advice on these things every single appointment, but then you'd also see that oh, on the next appointment that the, the person was still smoking or um, drinking alcohol uh, to excess. The, there are things that are available uh, um, at least in the South Yorkshire area, there is the uh, Stop Smoking Service, um, which you can access through their website. They provide all sorts of tips and, and tricks. And uh, they, they also provide various products as well, things like nicotine patches, um, that sort of thing to, to help with smoking cessation. And people are much more likely to be able to quit smoking with that. Um, and if you do quit smoking, it does reduce your risk and slowly over time, you come close to, to near baseline risk as if you hadn't smoked, although there is, there's always an increased risk there if, if you had smoked in the past. It is quite interesting, isn't it? We've got sort of uncertainty at both ends. I mean, like Hania mentioned earlier about diagnosis. I mean, yeah, most of the time we feel like that we can indicate the risk, but mm. then the treatment itself... Um, is also quite variable depending on where the patient is. So it looks like there's quite a dire need to develop guidelines and have better quality evidence so yeah. these treatments can be made more consistent. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, that was really helpful. I know it was a lot of work. Um, so perfect timing by our next speaker. Um, so um, we'll move on to... Thanks, Paul. I uh, really Thank you. appreciate your help. See you later. Bye. Yeah. So it's Dr. Shaila Zulfi, who I've known for a long, long time, since probably 1996. Um, so um, she's a very experienced uh, dentist, aesthetic dentist uh, based in London. Um, thanks a lot for joining us early in the morning. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, I really like the artwork in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not mine, though. <laughs> um yeah, I just thought it'd be really good to hear your perspective of what do you think um, a dentist can do um, or what's the role of a dentist uh, in a mouth cancer or pre-cancer patient's journey? Mm -hmm. So um, just a background that I'm a general dental practitioner and I've been practicing for over 15 years in U just UK alone. So um, our role is very important. It's paramount um, because the patients come for checkups to us. And as general dental practitioners, it's our duty to, to screen. So oral screening is of paramount importance. Unfortunately, it's been stressed upon. However, it's still not been, uh, unfortunately, in the sense that it's still not been taken on as seriously as it should be. Um, it takes about two minutes to screen a patient and that out of your normal 15 to 20 minute checkup is nothing in comparison. Um, so we're first line. So patient may not know. And as you know, I mean, it could be an ulcer, just minor ulcer. Patient may not be giving it any importance, but if they've screened and if they've found something of significance, then it's important to uh, inform the patient and then do a review after say three weeks, four weeks, whatever is the uh, standard time for FTI to disappear. Um, and then if you are in doubt, then referring on to secondary care is the most important aspect. Um, 
and I have we have discussions amongst GDPs and where they might not be screening as much or they may not be referring as much. So, so that I think is the most important start point. And informing the patient. Why do you think is that? Why do you think they are hesitant to refer or not screening? Do you feel like there's a lack of knowledge or confidence? I think there is a bit of both. Um, so, so lack of knowledge in the sense they do know it's on the rise. However, as I discussed with you about a week ago, even to me, it was a shocker that the, the incidence and the rate at which uh, oral cancer is progressing and increasing is uh, something that we're not very sort of sure about. So there needs to be more um, awareness and you're doing a great program and this, this, this should be made more aware to GDPs. And I think there's a bit of a hesitancy in approaching the subject with the patient. So based on like 15 years plus of experience, if, if we see anything and we say the patient immediately goes into like a, a wall comes up and then it's quite difficult to, to, to tell them that look, it's, it's just, it may not be anything sinister, but we've got to check it. Let's, I'm not saying they're neglecting or ignoring, mm-hmm. but it's, it's something which is not as uh, made aware as it yeah. should be. There should be more emphasis on this. Definitely. I, I feel like, I mean, from my experience, I never feel like I received any training in sort of communication with patients and how to sort of talk in their language and break bad news, etc. Absolutely. So you have to learn those um, things on the job. And it's quite important for the patient because, of course, with, with internet and every bit of information available so freely and people just go and Google things and get really upset or scared and you can understand that. So there probably needs to be sort of a better um, education awareness of how to communicate with patients. <laughs> But despite Absolutely. that, like you said, the dentists uh, are still much better or very good at picking most of these things because earlier I was just talking about a survey that was done by the Oral Health Foundation. And 70% of the population actually said that if they had something in their mouth that they were worried about, they'll go and see either a GP or a pharmacist. Yes. And the dentists, only 20% people said that they'd see a dentist. So that's another issue. Yeah. And not many are actually either registered with the dentist or coming to the dentist uh, to get these things checked out. Um, exactly. Um, and uh, the, the dentists themselves, when they're doing a screen, which we do, uh, we're not always informing the patient what we're doing. So if we start making it a part of uh, informing the patient, we'll be doing a cancer screen. Uh, I know the word sort of is, uh, is a big word, but if we start doing it, then the patients will become more aware that, look, it's the dentist we can go to as our first point of call. Uh, where there would be a better chance of pe- something being picked up uh, than them going to a pharmacist or discussing amongst friends or, or uh, so. So that, that is the first element where the screening is so, so important. Um, and then obviously we deal with the side effects after treatments have been done. So that's another element. Okay, we've got a question for you actually. Okay. Um, so Dr. Tim Bracey, who's a pathologist uh, in Plymouth, he uh, mentioned that he recently visited a local dental hygienist and uh, not a dental practice and was impressed that she did a full oral cancer check before cleaning his teeth. Is that unusual for a hygienist or a new national venture? <laughs> it's, um, it's very good if someone did it. Um, as I'm saying, it's, it's not carried out very often Mm -hmm. and it should be it should be by hygienists by dentists um but really good that the hygienists took it upon themselves to carry out a screen yeah because in the hospital or during the undergraduate studies at the how students are i mean what i've seen taught to actually just look for things like white patches and suspicious lesions or cancers etc before looking at any teeth um and that's probably something that everyone mm. needs to you know, needs to follow. Yes. Uh, but of course, we have a lot of patients who, like I said, are not being seen by dentists. So I think one big issue is, of course, also raising awareness in GPs 
um, mm-hmm. because I'm not saying that they're not good enough or qualified, not qualified to it, but they don't receive enough training or don't see these lesions or these patches enough. And that's a problem as well because I've spoken to colleagues uh, and, and Tim, you can probably comment on that in, in the chat as well, um, that uh, don't get a lot of training or exposure to mouth lesions or um, the oral cavity uh, and what sort of uh, uh, things can present. So what a pre-cancer or cancer may look like and what to do if you see one. And a lot of patients who would come in actually think uh, or have been seen by someone and been given some antifungal medication thinking it was a bit of thrush. Uh, whereas if it was just sent in a bit early, we could have biopsied it early and perhaps had a diagnosis mm-hmm. earlier as well, uh, which meant the treatment could have started early. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I mean, uh, the treatment for mouth cancer is quite uh, um, significant and that may involve things like radiotherapy and, of course, part of the jaw tongue being removed. Yeah? What sort of problems do you envisage uh, as a dentist and how do you think can help the patient? Because, of course, we know about things like mucositis, so inflammation and redness mm-hmm. of the mouth and ulcers and, and a dry mouth, etc. So is there anything that can be done to actually help that? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of things that we can encounter. Uh, and that starts from, from the time chemotherapy or radiotherapy could be administered. Um, so the most important thing I'd like to say is when the cancer team makes the dentist a part of the protocol, um, and I do receive um, letters from secondary care uh, asking to do a full mouth examination, provide any uh, necessary dental treatment. So that's really helpful. That's where our role comes in. Um, So it starts from there. And then that's when we start telling the patients, any problems you have afterwards, you come to us. So usually during the duration of the chemo or radiotherapy patients are not coming back to us, but they come back later. um, And mucositis being the most uh, common uh, inflammation of the mucosa um, and then dry mouth is the most common complaint they come with. Um, Usually they've been advised by the uh, oral cancer teams. However, it's just reassurance at that time, um, checking, advising them how to deal with it. So from a patient's perspective, uh, the most important thing is the mouth is sore, uh, whether it's because of mucositis, dry mouth. Um, So we'll deal with kind of like the simplest things first, dry mouth, ulcers, Um, So advising them to to brush, to make sure they do brush and not give up on it because the mouth is sore. Use soft bristle brushes um, and use a toothpaste which doesn't have flavor. So there's there's a whole variety of them available in the market and um, and to to make sure they use like a mouthwash as well without any alcohol, Um, take regular sips of water, Um, saliva substitutes, all of that. So we go through that uh, unless uh, they're already aware. And then the major things like resection of the jaw or the tongue or um, part of larynx removed. I have actually a patient uh, years and years of, she's got a part of the voice box removed. So she's got that sort of attachment here and, and she can't even open her mouth. So there's some fibrosis of the muscles and um, caries then again is like a very dominant thing um, which comes on due to multiple factors, dry mouth being one, um, effects of radio and chemotherapy um, and um, decay. So that's again, it kicks in. We've got to be in charge. We have to have regular checkups, uh, advise them on what to do. So dry mouth, mucositis, caries, um, and then with bigger uh, complications, um, if a part of the jaw has been removed and then the patient needs, uh, and teeth have been removed and need dentures, then sometimes it's like a specialist jaw, prosthodontist who has to provide those dentures. But sometimes in mucositis especially, or dry mouth, they could be already wearing some dentures, which become quite uncomfortable. So it's just a simple matter of guidance, telling them how to, um, to sort of what to do with the dentures. A soft reline on the denture sometimes can help. Things like that, where the GDP's role is important in the sense that patients are in pain 
and you've just got to listen to them and give them the palliative care afterwards. Um, so those are the kinds of things where we sort of can yeah. help. Yeah, that's great. Um, another question for you, and that's regarding the impact of uh, COVID-19 and reduced dental access. And I, yes. I know dentists have really sort of uh, been suffering from that. So it is even more important that patients are aware of how to self-examine However, there are many patients shielding and worried about going to see a dentist or a doctor. Mm -hmm. And do you think this can be overcome or what are the patient options? So this is a very good question and a very um, important scenario right now. So we um, opened our doors in June to patients and um, it's November now and we've yet been not been able to provide regular care. We're only dealing with urgent care. And that's like a lot of, lot of practices are just being able to do that. So any patient who comes in, obviously we're doing a quick examination because we won't want sort of to ignore anything. Uh, but the patients who are not coming in, um, if, if they are accessing us on the phone, then we are telling them that, look, anything you are unsure about, call us. Uh, we've had patients uh, transfer images if they were sort of worried about a lesion in the mouth or anything. So we've, uh, we've, uh, we give them the email to send their images across, but then there's a vast majority of people who don't have readily access to smartphones and they can't send images. And it is a very difficult area right now because this is our worry on our practice meetings. That's what we worry about as well, that when things hopefully will go back to normal and a lot of patients will come back in, we, we, are, we don't know what we're going to mm -hmm. expect and find. And uh, yes, if it's a broken tooth, if it's a pain in a tooth, they're coming to us. But yes, if it could be a lesion, a precancerous lesion, and they're not even, um, they don't have any symptoms, it could get ignored. And there should be some method or some form of awareness we can um, give out to our patients. It would be very helpful. Yeah. I think that's where self-examination probably becomes important. Yeah. But like, I mean, they need to be seen by someone to just reassure them whether it's something to worry about or not. Uh, I think the problem with dentistry is, like you said, we are so hands-on. Um, so it's not, you can't just do a video consultation and give them a medication and the problem won't go away. So you need to actively treat most of these things or yeah. pass them on to someone for, for these to be treated. And without that, uh, I'm worried that there's a lot of patients now in, in the system who haven't been seen. And then as and when the new, uh, the situation will get better, uh, we will see probably an increase in the, in the numbers and a lot of patients coming through the doors uh, with problems like this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a patient who reaches out to us, obviously, would help. But it's quite impossible. And I can say for my practice, where there's a huge um, data of patients, it's impossible for us to reach out to everyone and just inform them what to do. So that's, that's um, it's going to be a difficult area. But we're, we're, we're hoping once things are back, we are going to put in more effort and try mm -hmm. to overcome and kind of see what can be done. So how are things with practices right now? Are most of the dental practices running in some way or reduce service or is there still a few select services with measures and SOPs in place who are offering some emergency or urgent services? So um, I think most practices opened. There are some which couldn't open because they couldn't get access to PPE or for whatever reason, maybe they were very tiny practices and they couldn't afford to because it is reduced service. It's um, so if we provide any AGP procedure, which could be anything from picking up an ultrasonic to even adjusting a filling in the mouth, the handpiece is used, so that becomes the AGP procedure, which initially up to like a few weeks ago, um, it was an hour of the um, fellow time. After you've put the drill down, an hour the room needed to be shut unless you had those special kind of extractor fans installed. So that was eating up a lot of the time mm. of clinical hours. And with the way we followed our um, SOP and guidance to the T, so from the, from the time the patient comes in and the patient can leave, it's like half an hour for a non-AGP procedure. And that's reduced the number of patients we can see in a day. Um, so anyone who calls is triaged 
and then it's a thorough um, triage. We book them in. Then we see whether they need to be booked for an AGP procedure. It's, it's very difficult. It's exhausting. Um, can't wait for it to go back to normal, but it's a lot of patients who are not getting access right now. And uh, what sort of things do you think the patient should watch out for? So in terms of signs and symptoms, um, any particular things that uh, uh, might prompt them or you would advise them to get seen? So you're asking with uh, in in respect cancer, to cancer, uh, yeah. yeah so so redness white patches um, ulcers ulcers are what we generally see if we pick up early um, that's the kind of things they should be aware of and then self examination they can sort of uh, feel for nodes or swellings enlargements. Um, any unusual symptoms, I've always told my patients, anything unusual out of the ordinary, just call back, just come back. So um, that's, that's where it is. It's just a simple matter of picking up the phone, calling your dentist, advising yeah. them, and then um, taking it from there. I think there's a, probably a lot of politeness as well, where people feel like they don't want to take up time, particularly in this climate, and calling a doctor or dentist and wasting their time, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I've, I've, I was shocked to the core. Yesterday, I found out from a patient um, that one, she knew somebody in the local area who did not bother the dentist because the dentists are inundated, uh, had infection and pain in the mouth, developed into a sepsis, and he unfortunately passed away. Mm. And it was a shock. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of patients who are either not reaching out or they are, yes, being polite and saying, oh, we can't bother them. But anything and everything is important. We are here for you. We are at the end of a phone call. So please reach out and please ask. And uh, another question, hopefully the last one for you. Um, and that's uh, the message, particularly right now being given by the media is that dentists are only providing emergency treatment. And uh, I think a clear message needs to be sent out to patients that this also includes any worrying lumps, bumps, or ulcers in the mouth. Yes. Otherwise, they may not think of it as urgent. The, I think that's a very good uh, absolutely, point. Isn't it? Absolutely. It's a very good point. And that should be incorporated uh, because media is what patients, people listen to. Mm. And uh, it's ever so important that they are made aware of it, what they can reach out for. And in terms of people and uh, new patients or patients who come in who are sort of smoking or have excessive uh, alcohol intake, uh, have you come across sort of any cessation services and how easy they are to use or refer patients to? So the services are good. The nicotine cessation service, uh, we give them the number. I, I, I personally take it upon myself. I try talking to them, which is not easy. It's, it's, it's not easy. Patients don't like it. It's, there's a resistance. Usually with nicotine, they're, they're better. They listen better. With alcohol, it's like it could go into a full-on discussion and debate, and they don't want to, uh, to sort of listen to the dentist. Um, but the services are good. And it's just, I keep telling them that, look, uh, if we come as GDPs, we come from the point of view of the gums, then, then obviously it makes it more easy for us to talk about it because we can see the gum condition. But if there's no precancerous lesions, then it's, it's a bit hard. There's a resistance. They, they don't want to give in. However, we try. We try all the time. Um, every time patient comes in, medical history is asked, uh, smoking and alcohol sort of usage is recorded. And we try our best. Um, I think the patients and people probably don't realize it, how harmful they can be, and particularly having them both together, yes. uh, how significantly they're increasing the risk of getting something, uh, something like mouth cancer. Yes. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, really appreciate your time. Uh, Thank you. Thanks a Thank lot you for, for uh, your input and sharing your experience. And I'll uh, let you get on uh, with the rest uh, of your day. Thank you. Right. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so um, that was really useful uh, information and, uh, and tips from um, uh, Dr. Shara. Uh, said in London, is that if you have anything worrying in your mouth or you are worried about something, please do pick up the phone and get in touch with the dentist and this does qualify as, as uh, urgent, okay? So don't be put up by the 
fact that the media is saying only emergency treatments or emergency appointments are available. Okay, so now we're just in time for our uh, um, next speaker. Um, um, and that's Stephen Lott. Here he is, Hello. matching shirts. That's um, it. I don't think anyone can see them yet. I think we should we should stand up and show okay. it so people are on them. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what we're saying is that a simple check can save your life. Okay. So that's the message we're trying to send across all day. So yeah. thanks a lot, Stephen, for joining uh, and also for your help with the uh, the stream and everything else. Um, so. Um, Stephen is a senior PR and media manager with the Oral Health Foundation. And uh, last year when I reached out to them, um, he actually came around to my office and when, when times were normal and we had a nice long chat about mouth cancer and the problems with it. Um, and I would say since then we've become friends. I would like to think so. Yeah, um, nice. And I thought it'd be really nice uh, to um, have him with us and talk about his experience of working with the Oral Health Foundation, but also he's been involved in the Mouth Cancer Action Month for quite a few years. Um, so Stephen, over to you. Yes, awesome. Um, yeah, I think just before I get into that, I'd like to say it's great to see so many people already on the stream um, uh, having joined us. Um, so definitely if you have, if people haven't already go over, check the, the link in the description, um, you can go and donate, uh, to mouth cancer action, which we'd really appreciate. And, um, you know, make sure people are uh, you know, sharing the stream, um, getting involved with the hashtags. We want to encourage everyone to kind of get the conversation going and, um, would love to kind of see, um, as many people as possible joining. Um, but it's great to see so many people um, here. And thank you so much, Ali, for, for setting this up. This wouldn't have happened without you and your hard work. So thank you. Pleasure. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, I've, I've been working with the Oral Health Foundation for um, coming up two years now. Um, it's two, it'll be two years in December. Um, and definitely, I think one of the kind of most impactful um, pieces of work that I get to do every year is work on the Mouth Cancer Action Campaign and Mouth Cancer Action Month. And um, yeah, it's been um, really eye-opening, I must say, working on this campaign. Um, before, before I worked for the Oral Health Foundation, I must admit my knowledge of, of oral health in general wasn't the best. I feel like I, I, was a, uh, I went to the dentist regularly. I think that was something that, you know, I always knew from a young age was important. My mum... Mm. Um, you know, would drag me along to the dentist. I didn't always enjoy it, um, but she would she would make sure I go. And it was instilled in me from a from a young age that I should look after my teeth. Um, but say, having said that, kind of mouth cancer wasn't really something that was ever really discussed. I had never had a conversation about mouth cancer. I think before I joined. Did I? Did yeah, I you just cut off, but you're back now. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know what I was saying. So yeah, so before yeah, I joined the Oral Health Foundation, I I don't think I'd um had a conversation about mouth cancer. So it was really eye opening to to kind of learn about that. Um, and of course, one of the other things was I got to meet mouth cancer survivors. Um, it, it's 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 not always easy um to talk about mouth cancer. Um, but it is so vitally important. And um, speaking to mouth cancer survivors, um, it, it's, you know, it's tough to hear, but their stories are very powerful. And, and I do think when it comes to mouth cancer, um, one of our strongest tools is our mouth cancer case studies, the, the brave people that come forward to, to tell their story. Um, because I think for a lot of people, cancer is something that they know about. They kind of know that cancer is a thing that affects a lot of people. Um, but it's only when you really hear someone's experience of going through the treatment, especially for something like mouth cancer, which is often has long term impacts. And it's very um, painful at times. It can be and just very uh, uncomfortable. Um, you know, we're hearing those stories really drives home that this this is a, a disease that can affect anyone and really has quite life changing implications for, for survivors. So, um, you know, that's been really, really powerful. And, and um, you know, I know this year we've had a, 
um, some brave people come forward, um, people like Sarah Davies, who will actually be joining later. She'll be coming on at 5 p.m. Um, you know, um, and yeah, they've got very powerful stories that um, I think hopefully will really help make more people mouth aware this year. Um, and, and also as well, one of the other things that I think has really impacted me, uh, you know, had a strong impact on me through working for Mouth Cancer Action is also the bravery and the strength of a lot of these mouth cancer survivors, um, you know, to go through something um, really quite difficult and come out, um, you know, strong and still very positive, I think is real testament to their, their strength of character and really inspiring. So I feel very grateful to work for your health foundation, very grateful to do this work. Um, and I genuinely believe that work like Ma that Mouth Cancer Action does, work that supporters like you do genuinely saves lives and, and has and, and is important. And, and ultimately, you know, it needs to be talked about. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot going on there. So we need people like yourselves. We need Mouth Cancer Action to just be driving this conversation, because if we don't, then then who else will? You know, somebody needs to take up that mantle. And how difficult has it been in the current climate with the with the lockdowns and pandemic going on for almost a full year, I would say? It must have yeah. made it really difficult to communicate with patients and do all different sorts of activities. For example, like I remember last year, we hosted a sort of fundraising lunch from Out Cancer Action Month and gathered all these people together, which was quite a nice thing to do. And I know you do a lot of activities and other people like also do social activities and this year has it's not been possible to do that and we've had a conversation about that and how are charities like the oral health foundation coping and how are patients getting affected by that you think yeah no, it's, it's been it's been it's been tough i know it's been it's been tough for um everyone yeah, you know we're not charities businesses but just people as well it's 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 not been easy um, um but yeah we have obviously with the with the pandemic um it's presented a number of challenges to for the charity um as you say i think the first um the first issue really has been kind of as you say communication you know we rely um with our two main campaigns national smile month which takes place in may and june and, and mouth cancer action those are our two main campaigns and we typically rely a lot on encouraging um uh, health professionals, dentists, as well as members of the public to really go out into the community and spread our, our messages about the importance of good oral health. Um, and, uh, you know, especially during Smile Month and then in Mouth Cancer Traction Month, we really encourage all health professionals to go out and spread the word about mouth cancer. And obviously when, when the community is kind of shut off to some extent, um, that makes getting those messages out a lot more difficult. Um, so we've really had to switch it up this year and think how can we how can we still get our messages out, but in a safe and, and COVID friendly um, way? Um, and so kind of this year we, we did it with Smile Month and we kind of, um, obviously that, that affected it just before Smile Month. So it really was quite last minute switch up for Smile Month. We've had a bit more time to prepare for Mouth Cancer Action Month this year. So we really wanted to focus on social media and on digital messages. Um, so we've been really encouraging everyone to you know all our supporters to really get the word out on social media um i know some people when they hear the word social media they kind of groan a bit and think, oh social media you know it's a fluffy term but honestly social media is such a powerful tool um it, it can get messages to millions and um you know with the help of our supporters um, our messages do reach millions every year so you know it's a fantastic tool and it's something that we really would encourage everyone to use um, use the hashtag mouth cancer action um, you know tweet Facebook LinkedIn all, all of them um, and we also have a lot of resources available to download for free on our website um, at www.mouthcancer.org there's a link in the description um, so we're really encouraging everyone to get involved on social media and help spread the word that way um, and of course the other challenge that we've had um, is is funding as well. You know, a lot of our funding has dropped because we're a completely self, uh, the Royal Foundation is a completely self-funded charity. We don't get any money from the government and we rely solely on the generosity of our supporters and um, through donations. Uh, and also through our, the sale of our um, items from our shop, we run a kind of dental health shop, www.dentalhealthshop.org. Um, 
and we sell a lot of various uh, products through that um, all health education uh, products and also kind of just general health products and aids um, but unfortunately with the with the pandemic and with dentists closing we've noticed a massive drop in sales so that's been a big hit but but that's why we really appreciate people like yourselves doing fundraisers like this. Um, this it helps us immensely. It's what we, you know, we need to keep going and survive. Um, so we really, really, really are grateful for everyone who's donated to this stream, uh, to, to the Virtuathon. And um, like I said, I encourage as many people as possible to donate if you can. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, hopefully when you know we're, we're going to keep on pushing hard we're going to keep on doing our work and and you know, when things hopefully are back to normal next year we'll be able to get back out into the community in person and really drive home those messages through workshops through school visits and all all of the other stuff that our fantastic supporters get involved with because i remember last year when you guys came to see me in sheffield you were out in sheffield city center talking to people that's it. Yes, yeah. yes. That Doing was, uh, surveys and asking questions, and uh, that was quite interesting. Yes, that was. Yeah, we did that for Mouth Cancer Action Month last year, and um, yeah, that was great. And it was. Um, I'd never been to Sheffield before, so that was that was interesting. Okay, nice to see it. Um, and I was impressed with it. I got there. I thought it was nice. I, I, I kind of didn't go in with any expectations, but I quite liked it. Quite a lot, a lot more greenery than I was expecting. Actually, it's kind of yes. quite a lot of wood woodlands around, isn't there? <laughs> Lots of parks as well. Um, we've got a few comments and questions related to what you've been saying. So on YouTube, Graham Lloyd uh, has said that he had an ulcer on his tongue and he's grateful to his dentist for identifying it. His GP missed it. Uh, he ended up having a partial glossectomy. So that's part of his tongue that was removed and neck dissection. So all the lymph nodes in the neck that were removed and six weeks of radiotherapy. But he's doing really well now and he's just like to thank everyone involved in his care. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's quite interesting and similar to what your survey showed on how um, people do go to GPs probably a bit more, but perhaps there's something that can be done to help raise awareness and provide training and support to GPs in terms of identification and referral of things like that. Yes, I think I think um, it's something actually that I, must, I wasn't that aware of until we spoke last year. It's something I remember us chatting about last year um, in terms of you know um really just raising awareness amongst everyone um you know uh about mouth cancer but also looking specifically at how we can support dentists and support oral health professionals uh, in terms of you know uh supporting them in terms of training or even education around mouth cancer um and i don't think it's something that, that we you know should be should be looked into more i think that um, it's great to hear um, a, a you know success story um, that Graham got the help he needed from his dentist and um, you know uh, yeah we we really can't underscore um, enough how important uh, it is to go and see your dentist uh, regularly. Uh, we understand that things are a bit bit more difficult at this time, but but it's still vital. And as you say, um, if you do have any mouth cancer symptom, that is enough for an emergency referral. You should, you know, you should, you should be having an appointment with your dentist and um and really I'm um, insisting on that appointment because the earlier the better. You know, we know that chances of survival increase from about 50% to 90% depending on how early uh, mouth cancer is caught is caught. So um uh, it's great to hear Graham got got his in time and yeah we definitely would encourage anyone who is worried about anything in their mouth go and see your dentist they will they will be able to get to the bottom of it they they've studied the mouth for years they know um you know they know the mouth better than anyone so that they, they should be your your port of call and if 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 you can't see your dentist for every reason then yes your gp is also a good is a good port of call as exactly. well but see um, someone definitely that's it that's it yeah and and it's so much better to to have that doubt put to rest you know mm. uh I know it's, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I think like many people, you know, I'm not someone that particularly likes going to the doctor or particularly, you know, enjoys necessarily going to the dentist, although I, I've always had positive experiences. Um, but I think that, you know, even though it isn't, even though it can be scary, it's so important to do, you know, it, it, we really can't, can't say that enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um... There's another comment from Paul Hatton on YouTube, and he says he very much agrees with you. Uh, the testimonials of survivors 
and sadly the families of loved ones who did not always survive are key to raising the profile of this terrible disease. Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, I know um, on our Mouth Cancer uh, Action website, Mouth Cancer Action Month website, um, there are a lot of patient stories there. Um, I think that as well, one of the, uh, when looking at the stories, you really get the sense that mouth cancer can affect anyone. Now, we have testimony from a, a lady called Laura Gray, who was diagnosed with mouth cancer at 23, I believe, wow. um, you know, very young. Uh, and we have a wide range of people from all different walks of life who've bravely come forward to share their story. So um, honestly, if, if anyone is maybe out there thinking it only affects older people or only affects smokers, I would recommend going to the, w, to the Mouth Cancer Action website and just reading some of those patient stories um, because it just, just really gives a sense of, of how, how, this, how this disease can affect anyone at any age and, and, um, and can have... Um, you know, really, like I said, devastating long-term effects, um, issues, you know, with eating and drinking and speaking that can can remain, you know, for long after, if not indefinitely, after treatment. So um, no, I'd really recommend, if anyone hasn't already, head to the Mouth Cancer Action website, link below, and, and check out some of the patient stories. They're very powerful indeed. That's great. Um, and would you like to tell us a little bit more about Blue Wednesday? Yes. How, love... how did that idea start and how, how well it's worked and what, what do you like people to do? Mm, um, so uh, Blue Wednesday has been around ever since I joined the foundation. Okay. From my head, I don't know how long it exactly it's been going, but I know it's been going for a long time. Um, uh, it actually is linked, I believe, to um, the sponsors of the campaign, Dan Plan, um, part of okay. Simply Health, who've been very long time supporters of the campaign. We're very grateful um, for all their support. And they um, introduced something called the blue lip selfie, um, where people would take um, a picture of themselves with a blue lipstick on. Like, like this. Like that, yeah. Um, and upload it to social media with the hashtag blue lip selfie, just with the aim of, of raising awareness of the mouth cancer and the mouth cancer action campaign. Kind of blue, we have the blue ribbons. Blue is just lot for a long time now been associated with the campaign um and i think blue wednesday kind of came up around came up around that and um it's always great to see people dressing up i remember um last year we had a dentist dress up in a blue cape and kind of a blue bandana thing which i thought was awesome i always always enjoy um seeing some of the great pictures that come up on social media from that um and this year uh we're running it again um we still would love to see people dressing up in blue on Wednesday. It's, it's tomorrow, 18th of November. But also this year, we're asking for a little bit extra, something a bit special. We, re we really want to encourage the nation to do a mouth cancer check. Um, we know that um, mouth, doing mouth cancer checks is vital to stay on top of the disease. And um, of course, they should be part of every routine dental checkup. Your dentist uh, would be would be will be doing one as part of every routine checkup um, but also we need people at home to do them themselves you know um, we think it's well, obviously the dentist plays a massive role in terms of looking after all health but they also need us to play our part as well and I think part of that is is keeping on top of our, our mouth cancer checks um, so we're encouraging everyone to do one tomorrow um, now obviously some people listening may think I don't know how to do a mouth cancer check unfortunately we know actually quite a few people would would say that so mm -hmm. that's why we created a video um, detailing exactly how you do one in nice simple easy steps to follow and um, you can find that again on the mouth cancer action website which is linked below under uh, about mouth cancer and spot the signs um, so we'd really encourage um, everyone, everyone watching, and please encourage all your friends and family as well to really um, get involved with this and do a mouth cancer check tomorrow as part of Blue Wednesday um, and post about it on social media, um, whether it's just a, a silly selfie or just simply a post saying that you've done one and linking to the Mouth Cancer Action website. That would be much appreciated and using the hashtag as well, hashtag Mouth Cancer Action. Um, so, yes, please. Uh, everyone, if, you're, if you've got some time, it doesn't take long. This is the thing, only takes about a minute. You can do a mouth cancer check. And even if you, you could even do it in 45 seconds. We say it's 45 seconds because that's kind of how quickly it can be done. Um, but, you, you know, it's really not, not that long. Um, and it could save your life. That, that is the, the, the bottom line. Uh, 
you know, this mouth cancer check could be life saving. So, yeah, we'd encourage as many people as possible to do that. And I'll be keeping an eye on social media. I'm the one that, that kind of that manages social media. So I'll be checking throughout the day, um, retweeting, liking, commenting. So, um, yeah, I would love to see as many people as possible getting involved. Good. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about what uh, you would like patients and public to do. Is there anything that you think that clinicians like dentists or doctors can do to help not just charities, but also raise awareness and sort of we heard about, I don't know whether you were listening to the previous talk about some people finding it difficult to communicate with the patients and breaking the news or discussing difficult diagnoses, etc. So do you mm. think there's anything that the healthcare professionals can do? Yeah, I think there's so much, there is a lot that, there's a lot that my, uh, health professionals can do. And ultimately, I think it just comes down to, you know, pardon me, um, it, I think it only comes down to how much do you, you know, do you want to, how much time can you give? Um, we want to support anyone and everyone who wants to make a difference, you know, who wants to help raise awareness of mouth cancer, or just generally help raise awareness of the importance of good oral health. Um, and on our website, there are lots of resources to help with that. So um, if you're an oral health professional and you're there thinking, I want, I want to make a difference, I would definitely um, check out our, our resources. If you go on, again, link in the description, Mouth Cancer Action website and go on, go on resources, you'll find a lot of social media graphics and posters, which we'd love you to share. That's something that only takes a couple of minutes, but you never know um, who might just be on this on Twitter just it might you, you could post them today and it, it might just be that one of your followers sees that post at just the right time they might be worrying about something in their mouth and they see that you've posted a graphic talking about the signs and symptoms of mouth cancer and they go oh actually I've got one of those and I've been kind of I've been wondering what that is so you know we we can't underestimate how 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 much of an impact just simply sharing a message on social media can have mm. so definitely um, would recommend at least at the, at the very least getting involved on social media and sharing messages. Um, there is also more though that uh, um, somebody can do. Um, one of the other things we, which we think would, would, be, would really help in the, the kind of battle against mouth cancer would be to get involved at a, a local kind of government level um, and with, the, with your MP. So again, on the resources website, there's a, a downloadable um, letter for your MP, like a template letter for your MP. Uh, which just raises the issue of mouth cancer, the uh, mentions mouth cancer action and mouth uh, neural health foundation, and kind of just really signals an intent that you would like your MP to um, to be aware of this and to actually um, look at, uh, at making a difference at a government level. Um, uh, so I would I would it would be great if people could do that as well if they wanted to get get their MP um, kind of in the loop as it were. Um, and then, of course, there are um, other ways. I mean, simply just going on our website, donating or buying something from our shop is such a massive help um, that, you know, last well, over, over the over the last 20 years, we've invested nearly two million pounds in um, in kind of uh, mouth cancer awareness and, and in mouth, and through mouth cancer action. Um, and we could only do that because of the support of of everyone of everyone who has who's, who's donated and, and supported us over the years so we really really appreciate every single penny that is donated and we use it um we don't let anything go to waste um so yeah that's another great way that people can get involved as well and, and support okay brilliant some really good uh, uh tips and ways to help um another comment from uh paul hatton on youtube and uh, in the Second talk, I think uh, we had Paul Hankinson from Sheffield who was just talking about variations in how mouth precancer is treated. Um, and I think there was a number that was mentioned, 5% uh, went on to become cancerous. Uh, so Paul Hatton is just wondering about the potential of uh, regular screening or um, oral cancer or mouth cancer screening at a national level. I mean, and Is that something that you guys have explored or tried to sort of push yeah i mean i think i think really we uh we would say that we already have regular screenings in the if if people regularly visit their dentist you know we we say to visit your dentist um uh, as often as they recommend um typically that's every six months or 12 months 
Um, <clears throat> and, you know, that, that, that's something that, you know, if adhered to and regularly, you know, we say regularly as your dentist, you will regularly get checked for, for mouth cancer. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, we really would, I say it's, it is difficult with, with the way, with the pandemic, we, we really do appreciate that, but we really would encourage as many people as possible to, um, to go and visit their dentists as often as they can. Um, you know, uh, at the moment it's a bit disrupted, but it will, dentistry will go back to as it was uh, before, you know, we, dentists will get back to 100% capacity yeah. and there will then be opportunity to go back regularly for your checkups. And we would really like, uh, we would encourage, absolutely encourage everyone to go back to those regular appointments. Um, you know, I think that's one of the biggest, our biggest fears um, with, with regard to the knock-on effect of, of the pandemic on oral health is the, the drop in uh, patients seeing their dentists regularly. Um, I mean, we already know that one of the biggest NHS trusts in England um, saw a 65% drop in referrals for mouth cancer um, during, the, during the earlier part of the pandemic. And, and that, that's concerning. Um, and, you know, we, we just really are, are keen to drive home the, the message that when things, when, when your dentist can go back to seeing you regularly, we, we 100% do, do, do go back and make sure that you, you then keep in, in regular checkup and regular contact with your dentist. Great. Um, another question, I think that's like more of a generic question. I'll try to answer it as well. And again, Paul Hatton has mentioned on YouTube that he had the impression that there was a major need for investment in clinical research into the best approaches to manage oral cancer. But it looks like that a lot of current management is not evidence-based. So I would say, Paul, it is probably evidence-based, but the quality of evidence is not great right now. And I think that's just because of the lack of the big, uh, good sort of randomized uh, trials. Um, for example, in terms of pathology and what we use, uh, the scoring criteria, the risk criteria we, we use right now is what's been so far proven to be uh, valuable uh, or is the current gold standard, but there's definitely room for improvement in that. Someone else uh, earlier posted a question about the binary risk scoring for um, mouth break cancer. So uh, in addition to the three grid scoring, uh, um, we also have a two grid scoring, which just indicates how likely a precancer is to become cancerous. Uh, and that work was done by uh, Dr. Kujan, who is right now in Australia. And that's also shown quite a lot of promise. It reduces the variability and the, uh, and the sort of uh, disagreement between pathologists. Uh, they tend to agree a lot more on which of the precancers are high risk and which of the cancers are low risk. So there is work going on, but I think it just needs to be uh, done in a better way. And uh, uh, we probably just need better quality evidence. Um, let me just have a quick look and see if there's any other questions. Okay, I think, uh, I think we are up to date. Uh, okay, so if you've got anything else to add or? Um, no, I think um, I, I'll say again, I really do appreciate, um, you know, you doing this and would, yeah, encourage everyone to, to check the links below in the description. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's great to see people getting involved on in the live chat as well. Yeah. Um, keep it coming. And um, if you haven't already, tweet out this live stream, put it on Facebook, make, yes. get, get your friends involved, get your family. Because I think there's something, you know, there's going to be something here for everyone today. I know you've got a fantastic, um, fantastic range of speakers coming up. <clears throat> Sorry, um, uh, including mouth cancer survivors um, or health kind of professionals. Um, I think there's going to be some really interesting and fruitful discussions throughout the day. Um, so yeah, maybe actually, why don't you give a little taste of what, what are some of the um, who are some of the big speakers coming up that you recommend? You know, people really come in and tune. I would in? recommend everyone to me. All of those speakers who've agreed to speak, including yourself today, are big speakers for me because you've given your own time, uh, and that's more valuable than anything else. Uh, um, so, we've got Dr. Bernie Foran from Sheffield, uh, uh, and she's got a lot of experience in non-surgical treatments um, for oral and head and neck cancers. We've also got Dr. Ben Atkins, the president of the Oral Health Foundation. Uh, very experienced dentist as well. 
Uh, and I know you're going to quiz us about our knowledge as well. So um, I'm not looking forward to that so much. Um, we've also got Chris Curtis, who's a head and a cancer survivor and the chairman of the Solos uh, uh, support group. He will also be joining us uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. In the later half of the afternoon, uh, we've got uh, Joss Harding, very experienced dental hygienist. We'll be talking about mouth care for cancer patients. Um, we've also got um, one of our non-clinical researchers, Professor Lambert from Sheffield, who will be talking about the microenvironment and how that may or may not be targeted for mouth cancer treatment. Uh, and Dr. Denise McCarthy from Dublin. Uh, and she did quite a lot of work in increasing awareness for mouth cancer in Ireland. So she'll be sharing her experience. So yeah, quite a lot of people. I haven't even covered everyone. Um, Dr. Tim Bracey from Plymouth. I'm really looking forward to his talk. Uh, that will be at 4 p.m., 4 to 5 p.m. And Tim's talk is called The Socially Distant Pathologist. So quite looking forward to that. Um, and then 5 to 7 p.m., we have a panel discussion uh, with the patients as well as a, a range of different clinical specialties. And uh, last but not the least, 7 to 8 p.m., we have... Uh, Ava Grazel from uh, America. Uh, so we'll be sharing her story, a video of her story, and Ava will also be online to answer any questions and comments. So yeah, really interesting uh, mix of people. And like you said, there's something for everyone. I mean, when I spoke to you about this idea and started putting this together, I wasn't really sure how it was going to work, um, but it's been amazing because everyone and anyone I've approached, no one has said no, and everyone's been so forthcoming and helpful and, and generous. So we wouldn't have been able to do this without um, all these people's help, including yours. Awesome. No, it's great. I'm, I think there's a real, uh, I say, great lineup there. Um, so I will definitely be tuning in throughout the day, uh, listen to some of those. Um, so that's great. Um, I think that I know um, you've given a brief, you kind of gave a, an introduction to yourself at eight, but I was wondering if uh, for the next half an hour or so, um, I could quiz you a little bit and let people know a bit about you and how you got involved with Mouth Cancer Action. Would that sound good? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. Um, so I suppose the first question is, you know, um, kind of describe how you got involved um, in your work around mouth cancer, how you became a pathologist, and what, what, ins what was it that inspired you to become a pathologist and work, mm. in, work with mouth cancer? Um, interesting question. Uh, initially, I would say it was almost by accident in a way when I was uh, trying to study and become a dentist. Um, I had no idea that I ended up being a, a pathologist. So I graduated from, from Pakistan. Uh, but following that, I came for post-graduation to, um, to London. And that's where uh, my first encounter with pathology was. And I really enjoyed it. It was a very sort of research-based program. But that really sort of um, um, helped me realize how much I enjoyed uh, the research component of, uh, of things and particularly related to mouth cancer. Um, so following that, I went down, actually came to Sheffield for a PhD. Um, and during the PhD, while I was in Sheffield, in the same building, actually on the same floor where I am now, um, back in 2004, um, it's a really nice environment. We are clinicians and the laboratory scientists uh, and students, everyone works together. Um, so a very sort of collegiate atmosphere. Um, and um, I think you both can bounce off ideas and you can sort of learn about the work of others as well. Um, and at that time, working with some of the senior pathologists in the department or hearing about what they did um, really sort of inspired me and I thought, um, I really want to do this. This is really interesting. And this, uh, and my PhD was sort of focused on mouth cancer as well, but I just wanted to build on that and actually train as a, as a clinical pathologist. So that was the sort of uh, real sort of turning point. Uh, that, um, and following that, I just went on. I did two or three years in maxillofacial surgery and then trained as a, an oral and maxillofacial pathologist uh, for five years. Um, so quite long journey, start to finish, I would say, started as a dentist student in 96 and became a consultant in 2016. So a 20-year educational journey. It's quite a long time. Yeah, no. um, 
And in terms of getting involved with you guys, uh, of course, I mean, being in our pathology and being the clinical lead for the service in Sheffield, I'm very actively involved and we deal with or report or cancer or mouth cancer on a daily basis. And also the where I come from in Pakistan, it's the second most common cancer, actually. And in men, it's the most common cancer in the country, much more so than lung cancer or any other cancer. Um, I've always felt passionate about it, even before coming over to the UK. Uh, but being here and having access to these facilities and uh, uh, funding, etc., has allowed me to sort of explore that a bit more. Uh, but also I've always wanted to do something and sort of raise the profile of the disease. I've always felt like it's neglected. It doesn't get the same media attention or coverage as some of the other more popular cancer, although there's no such thing as a popular cancer, but you know, numbers wise, it's not as huge as breast or lung cancer. And I just feel like for that reason, it just gets neglected a lot. Whereas, uh, as we discussed previously, that the percentage of people who actually die from it after diagnosis is higher than most of those cancers. Uh, so that's something I've always been quite keen to uh, try and change or do something about. And then last year, um, I was been following you guys on social media I'm a very keen social media user and i reached out to you guys and you were very helpful you just came out all the way to sheffield spent a whole day in sheffield uh we had a nice long chat and discussed a lot of ideas and 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 here we are that's it. that's 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 great and um you know um i'm so glad that you did reach out to us uh it's been fantastic to hear about your work. I know you, you, you're, you know, leading the work. I, I, you know, in terms of mouth cancer research, and I've done a lot with AI. Um, you mentioned there you come from Pakistan. I remember when we, when we met that year ago, you told me a bit about some of the work you've done there. You're very passionate about, say, working uh, there. Can you tell, tell me a bit about that? Um, and you look at the work you've done in Pakistan. Um, yeah. Uh... I mean, if we feel like that awareness is a problem here in the UK uh, and people not having access to facilities, then um, you can imagine things are significantly worse in Pakistan. So a lot of people don't have access to a dentist or a doctor, live in the rural areas, um, don't have basic mouth care products um, or uh, how they should maintain their hygiene or what sort of signs and symptoms uh, to worry about. Also, you've got smokeless tobacco, smoking, a very common uh, pretty much everyone does it so the rates are really really high and I've always felt like that yeah I have come here and I'm working here but uh, I always wanted to do something about that problem again raise awareness uh, of the disease and and do something about it not just for research but as a sort of public health type uh, message thing as well and and over the last few years we've we've tried to do that so um, GCRF sort of the global sort of health challenge uh, uh, funding that you can uh, apply for small projects to work in uh, developing countries uh, and basically come up with ideas and projects that can help uh, those countries to come up with sustainable solutions. And they can be things like economy and um, energy and healthcare, et cetera. So we actually applied for some money and got some money to actually do a bit of work about uh, overcoming challenges and barriers or raising awareness of mouth cancer. In Pakistan, of course, it's all quite sort of preliminary work, but we work with the biggest cancer hospital uh, in Pakistan, that's uh, Shogat Khanam uh, Memorial Hospital, uh, and a few like-minded uh, uh, colleagues with some surgeons um, uh, and a public health, uh, dental public health expert, and also um, uh, some AI researchers. And then I just invited them all around to, to Sheffield for a week, um, uh, and where we just brainstormed and discussed ideas about what uh, we can do to change the status quo. And, and the biggest thing that came across was, of course, late diagnosis, late detection. Uh, how can we get the patients to be seen by a dentist early? Um, now, it's very complicated because you've got a multi-tier health system in Pakistan. You've got a private uh, care. People who can afford uh, for them probably it's not so much of a problem. They can just pay and get seen by uh, whoever they want. But in terms of the freely available government-based hospitals. They've got limited capacity, uh, probably not access to all the resources um, and specialties as well. And uh, most of the hospitals are also located in the urban areas. Uh, and their work is still ongoing. Uh, so the plan 
eventually is to come up with some sort of an app, basically in the local language as well as in English, uh, to actually raise awareness uh, of mouth cancer, but also for patients to be able to self-refer. Uh, to We're trying to get, get together a group of volunteer clinicians who are happy to see the patients for free, and patients can send photos of their mouths uh, if they feel like they've got anything wrong, and then one of the volunteer clinicians can ask them to come around uh, for a chat and a, and a checkup and a biopsy if needed. Um, linked with that, we've also been doing a systematic a scoping review actually about challenges and barriers to diagnosis uh, for mouth cancer in developing countries, which hopefully will be published soon. Uh, we also got a lot of support and encouragement. Uh, so there's a national tobacco control cell in Pakistan and they're working really hard uh, to reduce the consumption of smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco, um, and sort of legalize it so people uh, increase the taxes on it just to discourage people from having tobacco products. Uh, and the head of that, Dr. Zia, is a very uh, passionate guy as well. So I've had numerous conversations with him about how and what we can do. Uh, but we also really want to actually reach out to the masses and offer some sort of, a, I wouldn't say screening, but a mobile um, examination sort of plan. So even though people may not have access to hospitals, uh, there is sort of a female uh, health visitor program. And these health visitors actually go out uh, to remote areas and to the villages to speak to, to women about health issues, general health issues. And one of the things that we really want to do is actually speak to them, get them on board and train these female health visitors to actually identify suspicious things in the mouth and then again, uh, get a group of volunteer clinicians who can see these patients free of charge and uh, start the treatment. So we just get them to the biopsy stage and the initial checkup stage earlier. Um, but linked with that, we also really want to keep working on the AI side of things as well and perhaps develop some sort of a mobile application where people can do a cell screen um, and it can give them a risk score of how likely this thing is to be uh, precancerous or cancerous. And that work is actually going to be our work in collaboration with uh, Professor Gurkhan in, um, in America. He's at Wake Forest University. And the preliminary data of work is really interesting. So hopefully that, again, is something that we can push forward and can be used in sort of low resource setting uh, like Pakistan, India, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah, I know that um, I, I recently uh, was on Twitter um, and I saw a tweet, I think, from yourself about some really exciting AI research that you've done that's published. Uh, literally, I think it was uh, the last week. Was it week before um, that? You know, I, I read um, I, think, I think it was the day in the Daily Mail, the, the article that was linked. Um, but it was fascinating. I thought um, the role that AI can play in, in terms of um, helping to detect mouth cancer, um, because as we know, um, humans are, are, are fall fallible. Is that the right? You know, yeah. we, we, they can make mistakes, uh, whereas, you know, AI offers the opportunity to hopefully increase the accuracy of of diagnoses and things. Could you talk a bit about that research just come out? Um, kind of give people who maybe don't have, have no idea about AI um, in terms of its role in mouth cancer. Could you give a kind of brief explanation of, of what this new, what this new research kind of offers in terms of a future, maybe a potential future? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a lot of people just think AI is sort of alien to them, but pretty much all of us are actually using it on a daily basis. So anyone who's using like Siri or Alexa or Google Maps, Uber, et cetera, is using AI because they actually ta tailor things according to your need and habits uh, and tell you what where you may or may not be going and what you want to do, et cetera. Or what, you may, what sort of music you may want to listen to. And recently the application in healthcare has become sort of uh, very popular. Predominantly, it's been in radiology, but uh, over the last five to 10 years, uh, there's been a lot of uh, um, exploration in pathology as well. So, of course, when a biopsy is done and we look at the piece of tissue under the microscope, you can see at the cell level, you can see individual cells, and then you can identify whether they're normal or abnormal and or cancerous, etc. Um, so in the in the first talk uh, by Hania, she was talking about uh, variation and difficulties in diagnosis of mouth pre-cancer. So like you said, I mean, the clinicians or pathologists are very good at what we do, but no one is perfect. So what AI does, does is basically remove that variation. So 
right now we have to think about 15 different features uh, and there's a lot of uh, personal opinion and subjectivity involved there's no quantitative output or score uh, as such and uh, that's where AI can come in. It can make things faster. It can make things more consistent. And it learns from human experience uh, and actually gets better. And the more it sees, the better it gets. And once it's seen something, then uh, uh, it's very unlikely to, to, to miss it. And uh, the best thing about it is that you can get a quantitative or uh, output or a score at the end. And what we are wanting to do is actually look at a cohort of pre-cancers uh, with follow-up. Uh, so the knowledge whether these became cancers or change into mouth cancers or not and then actually develop AI algorithms uh, or work on AI algorithms uh, that at the early stage of pre-cancer can tell us which ones of these are going to become cancerous so you can remove or treat these even before uh, something has become cancerous so that's the overall aim of it is we learn from the pathologist experience but hopefully perform better uh, than the pathologist of course there are Issues, people are scared or when you talk about AI, people think of things like uh, iRobot and uh, AI taking over the world and uh, things <clears> like that. So um, I think it's really up to you how much sort of you use it and how autonomous you make it. Uh, but right now, it's a tool to actually help the clinicians and not to replace the clinicians. So if you had something that will help you get better, why wouldn't you use it? And I always give the example of Imagine a life before Google Maps. Do you remember those big AA roadmaps and trying to navigate your way from A to B and how difficult it was? Um, so if you have something as good as Google Maps, then surely you would use it and make your life easier. And I say the same thing to my colleagues in pathology, uh, that if this can help you become a better pathologist and uh, help the patient as well and help their treatment, then why, why, why not use it or at least explore it? Mm. Yeah, so somebody who used to get regularly lost with their dad on road trips because he refused, he would just refuse to ask for directions. And instead, it's a man thing, isn't it? You can't ask for directions. He would just know we have to use the AA maps. I'm, just, I'm so grateful now that we have Google Maps. So you can just click on the button. It's easy. Um, no, it's great. I mean, I think I think from an outsider perspective, you know, and I think kind of just looking in, I definitely think AI sounds like a really exciting field. Um, you know, and reading reading the article and and the the um, the success you've had already in terms of the accuracy you've been able to get um, with the AI being able to detect these cancers, you know, it's it's really exciting. I think it gives definitely gives a lot of hope. I think for the future. Would you say that AI is the most exciting development um, and research topic currently, not just in mouth cancer research, but in health research? Do you think why that? I guess it really depends on your interest. To me, it is. Uh, I just feel like just because of how quickly it can help uh, not only clinicians, uh, but also patients. Of course, there's a lot of uh, lab-based and uh, sort of molecular and gene-based research going on throughout the world. Uh, biomarkers that people want to target using sort of drugs, etc. And that research is very exciting as well. But the the time span that you require from start to finish and to get it to sort of clinical practice is significantly longer. And the good thing about AI is that we already got the tissue and the images for these patients and we have got the follow-up data, so which means we can very get uh, quickly get from A to B to actually apply to clinical practice and help patients and clinicians. I think it's much quicker. And that's the thing that's most appealing to me because whatever I'm doing, I'm not doing it for myself. Uh, well, a little bit, maybe, yeah, okay, I'm interested in pathology. But the main thing is to actually, when I'm reporting something or diagnosing something, is to help that patient. That mm -hmm. diagnosis is going to determine how this patient will be treated. So what I think of it, my personal opinion does not matter. Uh, the important thing is how that can help the patient. And if there's something that can make it quicker and better and faster and more accurate, um, then, yeah, in my opinion, I think it's probably one of the most exciting things. Mm -hmm. And I kind of would just like to kind of go back a bit as well. You mentioned about, um, obviously you come from Pakistan and, and mouth cancer is a really big issue in Pakistan. I know it's also an issue in countries like India. Um, and that kind of has had a knock-on effect to some extent in the UK. We know from our work with Mouth Cancer Action that uh, men and women from Pakistani and Bangladeshi origins are more likely to get mouth cancer. We think likely because they're also more likely to use things like chewing tobacco. Um, 
And we also know that actually getting messages to them um, is harder to some extent as well. We know that they don't, uh, that they're not always um, uh, use uh, primary care as much um, as, as kind of the general population. How would you, in your opinion, what is the best way to reach maybe the more minority groups um, who, to, uh, you know, in some cases are more at risk of mouth, mouth cancer, but necessarily aren't using the more traditional channels of just their, maybe their dentists as much. How do you think that we reach those people with our messages better? Yeah, it's a good question and a very sort of challenging problem. And I've sort of seen that myself. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, the people aren't really engaging that much with the um, secondary care. Uh, you can also make the assumption people are not on social media. Um, uh, so they don't have that exposure or sort of that uh, access to that bit of knowledge and information. I guess uh, there's potentially a few things. I feel like there is quite a lack of people from uh, ethnic minorities or our background like that who can actually reach out and speak to these people. I'm not saying role models, but maybe like as spokespersons. Um, I've never, I mean, I've been in the UK since 2002 and no once have I seen an ad on the TV, which was in Urdu or Hindi, uh, actually talking to these patients. Um, and yeah, I know we are we are in, in UK and um, we all speak English, but if you want, I mean, all of them watch TV so and, and probably listen to the radio, etc. So why not target them like that and actually have someone speak to them that way and try and sort of encourage them, perhaps find a, an easier way or at least tell them that there is a problem and what they what they're doing might might be causing a problem. Um, I guess those would be the simple things, and of course you've got things like leaflets and flyers, etc. Again, in multiple languages, perhaps you can go door to door with those. Um, but it is quite quite a challenging challenging problem. Uh, it's it's not easy to straightforward, but I think you'll have to just get communities involved. Probably start education at the school level, uh, start awareness and speaking to the kids. And kids are very good and bright and uh, um, learn very quickly. So perhaps you just need to sort of change the mindset of the next generation uh, as well while you're talking to the uh, older generation uh, right now. But I think, yeah, probably using a combination of those multiple uh, techniques uh, may overcome some of these challenges and hurdles. I mean, I'm more than happy to help with anything like that if I can. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's that many of us around who can actually sort of reach out and speak to people and break those barriers. I mean, I don't think there should be any barriers, but unfortunately there are, like you said. Um, but I think if uh, um, someone probably spoke their their own language and they just might find them a bit more accessible and easy to talk to, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's very, uh, a very good suggestion. I think that- um... Just like your mouth cancer reaction thing, for example, the self-examination, we've got it in, uh, in English. There's no reason why we can't dub it over with, in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. We can do Urdu, Hindi, Arabic, um, Spanish. I mean, a range of different languages. So people actually uh, feel like uh, uh, you're including them. Yes. No, I think that's definitely um, a good suggestion. I know that um, we're working, uh, the Your Health Foundation website can actually be viewed in Urdu and in Hindi, um, amongst other languages. Um, but I know we're looking to, to increase uh, our, the range of pages that are translated. Um, I think all of our homepage and main, main pages are um, mouth cancer action, I believe is as well. Um, but I think there's always more work that can be done in terms of making things more accessible. Um, and um, you know, for I mean, even just this year, it's something I, I we we put together the um, the mouth cancer the self check mouth cancer video, um, and I made a made a, I made sure that we had captions for it. Um, it is a fully captioned video. You don't have to you know so you know even somebody who can't who's deaf could could watch the video and, and understand and follow along. Um, and I must admit that's something that we say we haven't always been. Um, the best at in terms of our YouTube, our videos, um, but I know it's something that we're trying to to do, uh, you know, really make an effort with, um, because it's it's important to make things accessible for everyone, um, because ultimately that's how we're going to make the biggest difference. Um, I think it's interesting as well. You mentioned about getting out into schools. It is such a shame, as we kind of mentioned earlier, the um, the limits as they are at the moment makes getting out into community so difficult. But it is something that is so important, and that we'd highly encourage when things when it is possible to um, highly encourage 
um, dental professionals, but really anyone can anyone can do this to go into your local community, whether it be your schools, whether it be um, you know local groups, um, even you know scouts, things like this, to go in and talk about oral health and talk about mouth cancer, and, and you're really educated at the grassroots level um, and get the conversation going. Um, I know another uh, uh, like a great initiative that uh, one of our trust. Uh, one of our um, supporters, sorry, uh, has done uh, Chetravedi, Dr. Chetravedi. He um, did an started an initiative where he would offer uh, like health screenings at cricket matches. So um, it would be like a general health screening, but he'd also do um, a mouth cancer check there if they uh, wanted, and kind of all health check um, just generally. And and I think that's a great a great initiative. You know, going out into the community, um, you know, people can go to watch the cricket. And um, but also, you know, get a health check up. And, and, you know, I know that there, were, there are occasions where they spotted things that maybe wouldn't have been spotted otherwise. So, um, yeah, there's it's, no reason it's, you can't do oral health checkups as well. For example, I mean, the undergraduate students in Sheffield go and when things were normal, used to go on elective projects all over the world, particularly to develop their underdeveloped countries and try and, and do things like that. Community sort of um, outreach programs and work uh, in areas where they don't have all the facilities and there's no reason why you just can't have a sort of mobile health or dental unit to actually just go around and mm -hmm. advertise it and say tell people that we will be around if you just want to just drop bang and check out that's it yeah um and you know i would say as well if anyone was maybe is watching this and thinks i would love to get involved with something you know like that i'd love to get involved with a community project Obviously, things are a bit difficult now, but when they, when they, when you do get the chance, definitely go on uh, the www.dentalhealthshop.org, or you can go via our main, our main website, um, and look at our dental health shop because we have lots of really great resources there for people looking to do community initiatives. We have oral health aids, teaching aids, um, oral health products, books, uh, posters, puppets, lots of really great, great. Um, uh, products that could be really helpful for any kind of community initiative and it'd be a great it'd, we'd really appreciate it it would, it would help support the charity as well and, and support our work so definitely recommend people um, go check that out again there is links in the description and as well while I'm mentioning it please do also make sure to check um, the link to donate um, it's in the description you can donate to Math Cancer Action support this wonderful virtuathon which is going on until 8 p.m. Um, and right. yeah, uh, that that'd be great. Any support would be so much appreciated. Yeah, please. You've supported it already uh, a lot, but uh, let's uh, let's do it even more. Let's make the most of this day. Okay. And I've got uh, a comment on YouTube, which says awareness programs at schools is a great idea. Uh, maybe get volunteers living in different parts uh, involved and work on awareness programs uh, tailored for students, teachers, and parents. Now that's an interesting idea because there'll probably be different things you would want to teach uh, different people. So that's quite an interesting idea actually. Uh, yeah. Teaching yeah, the no. teachers perhaps. Go on. No, I was just saying teaching the teachers perhaps that's quite an interesting idea, isn't it? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's something that um, we definitely uh, would encourage for, uh, for sure. I think that ultimately, um, you know, you can encourage, you can encourage a teacher, you can encourage a parent, then they can instill it then in their children, in their, when they're kind of uh, students, and then you get that domino effect. And that's what you really want. You want that snowball effect where conversations, these are more conversations. And before you know it, one person's initiative, one person's conversation, that, that taking that step to have that maybe difficult conversation sometimes about mouth cancer can have a massive effect and have that um, and help, you know, encourage and, and educate many others. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And um, yeah, I would say if any, as I say, if anyone is, is interested in getting out in their community, do get in touch. Um, they can also email us pr at dentalhealth.org. Um, and we'd love to support any uh, support any initiatives um, like that and support people in in, in carrying them out. Um, but yeah, there's some great there's some great comments coming in. I saw one that um, said, "What a fantastic initiative, Ali!" I think they were talking. Uh, you were, this was when you were talking about your work in Pakistan. Um, thank you very much. Greetings from your Brazilian cells. So great to see some international. See some international. A lot, of, a lot of these people are very kind. People that I've worked with and known over the years, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, they've all supported the, the fundraising as well and it's really kind of them to actually 
log on at these really awkward times from like Brazil and America and all places. So that's quite nice. No, no, it's, it's fantastic to see the comments coming in. Like definitely keep them coming. Love to see them get involved on social media as well. Like, like the stream. Oh, and also subscribe as well if you fancy it. Um, it'd be great if we could get to a thousand subscribers um, because then we could start monetizing the channel, the channel, which would be a, 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 like a great, great help for, for the charity as well. So please, if if you um, if you're watching this, please give us uh, do subscribe and turn on the the little notification bell. Um, you know, we'll be we put we post uh, post videos on this channel throughout the year, all about oral health, trying to raise awareness for good oral health. Um, and, and some of the work of our fantastic supporters. So yeah, please consider subscribing as well. That'd be great. Brilliant. I think we're just about ready for Ben, but- um, That's it. While we're waiting. Uh, so have you come across any challenges? I mean, I know you said you've been involved in Mouth Cancer Action Month and with the World Health Foundation for the last two years or so. Um, have you come across any difficulties, people not being helpful, or any barriers, etc.? that you feel like can be overcome to make life a bit easier? Barriers to kind of... to, to Doing the work, yeah, and reaching the people and doing the work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, I think that, as you say, it's a shame there are, there are barriers to, um, to people being mouth aware and being, being aware of mouth cancer and the importance of good oral health. Um, you know, and I think that... Um, but obviously social media I feel breaks down so many barriers in terms of geography and in terms of you know format anyone with a with a social media account can can see see the messages um but also I think it is important to remember that there are people that aren't on social media and I think that they should be neglected and obviously older people maybe who aren't so au okay with modern technology and then social media they should not be forgotten um so we we we're always looking to make sure that as well as social media we we have our leaflets and we we really rely on people like dentists to get the word out as well to their patients when they come in to see them brilliant looks like ben has joined us good morning, morning ben how are you doing you okay not too bad thank you yourself wonderful thank you very much that looks like a is that a sheffield university lecturer's um, room you're in yeah, it's my, my office. So I thought 12 hours would be easier to do it from my office. Otherwise, I mean, I do have a nine month old baby who may need attention if I was at home. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for, for joining us. Um, so, I mean, we haven't met personally, but from what I know, I'll introduce you, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So Dr. Ben Atkins uh, is uh, an experienced dentist and uh, also the president of the Oral Health Foundation. Um, hold on. Sorry, I've got so many windows going on that I seem to be losing important information. That, sounds, that feels like my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I understand that you have over 20 years experience as a dentist uh, yes. and own a um, practice in Manchester. I had 11 practices in Manchester, yeah. So oh, wow. I sold it last April, but I was also a student at Sheffield. Back oh, were you? That's why that was I was brilliant. That's why I was recognizing the, um, the background. It feels ah, okay. I'd probably be in a bit of trouble in that office. If it was, it was <laughs> so that's good. Uh, well, virtually welcome back to Sheffield. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, um, I'll. Uh, let you sort of decide what's the best. I mean, would, would you prefer to use some audiovisual aids or should we just have a discussion about what we think are the challenges? I mean, we had a dentist earlier, um, Dr. Said from London. And uh, the one big issue and the question as well that came was uh, um, the access to facilities these days, particularly because of COVID. And a lot of people thinking that this probably does not qualify or um, is thought of as urgent or emergency dental treatment. So if people had something that they were worried about, how easy would it be for them to actually get in touch with the dentist or be seen? For me, I think the, the, the ulcers that are not healing or mouth cancer is probably more important than toothache. Um, and, I, and I ran out of our services in Greater Manchester, Merseyside and Cheshire. So we did 2.8 million people's toothache at the weekend before I sold the business for about 10, 15 years. Um, 
And for me, it's educating our patients on still contact your dental practice. You know, if you've got something that's happening, just phone because hmm. the phone's not going to do anything to do with COVID. You know, if, if, if dentists or, or the team are worried about it and, and explaining that to your dental team, your reception team, to your nursing team, say, look, if someone phones up with an ulcer, speak to them. We can always do a Zoom conversation with them. You know, it's, it's, it's using the um, uh, Department of Health, the, S, the SOP on remote access because let's face it, if, if, you, if I chat to a patient, you still get that prickle in the back of your neck where things aren't healing or the, my, my neck's got lumps on it or whatever it is. And then that triage, I think it's critical to speak to your patients in this time more than any, any other time, really. Um, how are you finding your referral rates um, and that sort of thing? Are there, are there the same rate or? Um, in terms of cancer, uh, probably not as, as many as, as we used to. Yes, definitely uh, slowed down. The biopsies generally as well have reduced quite dramatically. Mm. Uh, there was a slight peak earlier, but that's because there was a big backlog. Or so our surgical team actually uh, tried to um, uh, get some of those patients operated upon. But uh, it's definitely nowhere near normal, the activity. Yeah, it's, that's, that's what I'm getting from. We, I was talk, talking to Mike Lewis the other day and um, he, he was saying that it dropped off the face of the earth, the referrals during, during the, the first lockdown. And, and that as a, that's bigger worry as a, as a clinician is who, what's happened to my patients mm. um, and especially to new patients. Um, I've, over the years, I, I, I think I've diagnosed, sorry, I think I've come across three or four actual ones that have been down the journey diagnosed as mouth cancer. Um, and I would have missed those in this situation, I think, um, mm. because it's those emergency patients who maybe aren't your normal patients who mm. are accessing your clinic for the first time sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you used to get almost three to four new patients uh, every week. And in terms of uh, post-surgical sort of specimens, again, we used to get three to four a week. And I think that's definitely down to like uh, one to two. A yeah. week. Some weeks we don't get a single resection, which is quite unusual. Um, so I think, yeah, things. I don't know where all these patients are, like you said. So uh, as and when things get better, we hope that these patients come come back. Uh, but again, it will be a problem with this late detection and late stage cancer and being more difficult to treat. Mm. Well, I think when when we work, we've been chatting with Steve, and it's it's educating patients to say just just give us a phone call. Yeah. If you're worried about anything the phones are still working and the practices are all still open in fact mm. in this lockdown two as i suppose we're calling it is there are more there's more accessible now than it was before we can yeah. chat on the phone very much um and talking to friends we're there we are there yeah. for our patients um uh, we'll oh, oh, oh yeah please Stephen. You go well, i would also say as well um i completely echo exactly what ben is saying i think it's so important that you still if you you do have anything concerns with your mouth your dentist is still there they still want to help you they still um, are there for you so give them a call um also as well i would just say um that your health foundation won a dental helpline um and that is another service that people can use if they're worried about anything in their mouth they can call our dental helpline and speak to one of our dental health our dental advisors they, they offer independent free advice um and now they're there to listen to any problems you have and, and advise you on the best way forward. Um, so the details of that are on the website. Again, uh, link, link is in the description to our Health Foundation website um, where you can find uh, all the information about it. The number is 01788 539 780 and it's open from Monday to Friday, 9 till, 9 till 5 p.m. So again, another, another just another resource for patients to use if they, if they do have any concerns. Mm -hmm. And they're an amazing team. They're, they're so friendly in a worrying time when you hear them chatting to patients and it, it's it's such a night and, and often as a patient people feel more relaxed maybe not talk to a dentist you know because we are it can be scary being in a dental practice mm. it's having that conversation in a, a secure environment which is their home it's bringing it's bringing dentistry into their home and having that just not i'm a bit worried about this what should i do it's like a you know um a friend I'm just having a chat and the, the, the staff on the, uh, so they're probably more experienced than me to be perfectly honest. They are, they're amazing at talking to people. Um, so. um, we've got a comment on YouTube uh, and they've said great initiative, but what about spreading awareness on mainstream media? So more, more people can get aware because not everyone uses social media. So yeah, we, I've never seen a mouth cancer ad 
uh, on British TV, or am I mistaken? Has there been a oh, campaign think, of sorts? I think the difficult part with mouth cancer, it's, I don't want to use the word sexy cancer because that's not the probably the right description, but with, it's a almost a bespoke cancer. It's a very isolated, very, People don't look like to look at people afterwards. There's a, mm. there's a, with breast cancer, people can talk and there's a, there's a soft feeling once survivors, with, but with mouth cancer, it's a real chance. Speaking to my friends who've had cancer in of the mouth, they are amazingly brave people because of the, the aggressiveness of oral cancer. So when you're looking at mainstream press, they can shy away from that. Well, I don't know your experience, Stephen, working with all the PR. Yeah. People. I mean, we, we, we always, obviously every year with Mouth Cancer Action Month, we try and get the word out there in every way we can. Um, we, are, we are always sending press releases to the press, really trying to get the word out about Mouth Cancer. We've already sent several this month um, and they'll, we're sending out more, we're sending out um, ones about our blue, currently you know, today sent out um, several, several emails to uh, national newspapers about Blue Wednesday tomorrow. So we really, you know, we really are trying to get the word out there. Like you say, it isn't always, it's, it's hard to cut through the noise. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise at the moment, especially with, with COVID and, and all that. It's been very hard to get, to get space in, in, in national media. Um, but it's definitely something that we are always trying to, to target and to get the word out. Um, and yeah, we'd love to see more newspapers picking it up and you know, see, spreading the word. And also, yeah, um, you, you know, even TV and things, it, it would be great to see the messages out there more. Um, and, and ultimately, I think that that's something that we can just do. If we keep on shouting about it enough, we will get through. You know, I, I do believe that it, it, when it comes to things like mouth cancer, it's just about repeatedly spreading these messages, you know, and just keeping on saying until people listen. You know, it might take might take a number of a number of goes, but eventually I believe it will get through. And um, that's why we rely on the support of fantastic supporters like you, Ali, and, and and others who really just help us, you know, repeat the repeat the messages and spread them to their local communities. And I think that's that's our best way of really getting the word out. You're right there, Stephen. I think it's also, I mean, we've got a radio day on Thursday this week with a lot of national radios, but at the moment there's a considerable noise um, generally. You know, it's the COVID is obviously on everybody's mind um and i think it's 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 being proactive and positive in a very negative period of our lives i think if you can be a positive message of what to do not woe is me this is not happening i think it's it's giving patients and the public this what do i do if if i get an ulcer that's not healing after two or three weeks please phone your dentist it's it's those simple messages and if we can think about what we're drinking and smoking the preventative journey that's what your dental team is doing. I mean, I've, over the years, we, we've had those messages embedded within our, how speaking to our ex, ex, exam patients and learning where the smoking cessation clinics are, um, signposting and reduction in alcohol. It, it's so important, especially in this time of comfort. We need comforting as, as a human beings. We, we, it's not, it's making sure that you go for exercise I, that's why i was a little bit late i've just been for a walk this morning to make sure i had a clear head coming in because i've got a really big zoom day all the way through the day and not thinking at seven o'clock i'll have a glass of wine and a cigarette at the end of the day i don't smoke and i don't drink just throw that out there but my lot my friends throw that into their habit of it's that psychological relaxing time the kids are in bed the house is a mess but i can sit down i'm sure you'll see that ali coming over the next uh, few years with a, ni- a nine month old at home it's that oh I'm relaxing and it's that psychological effect. Find something different to relax with, find something about you and find something of self-caring. It's that every day I get up and I, I, I try and do some yoga and stretching. So it's that 15, 20 minutes for mental health. I'm doing okay. Um, and it's taken me 44 years to figure out I've actually got to look after me sometimes and taking a step back in this, this COVID environment mm that we worry how that's going to affect the mouth cancer in the future. You know, that we're seeing this at a point we're at at the moment, but how is all these external factors, the stress, the smoke increase, maybe increased smoking, reduction diagnosis, how's that going to affect your work, Ali, over the next, mm. what's your gut feelings going to happen? 
I think uh, floodgates are going to open as soon as things uh, uh, get to some sort of normalcy. I think, yeah, we're going to get a lot of these patients which we haven't seen in the last year. And already we were so far behind, waiting lists are long and getting patients in on time is challenging and it's going to get much worse and much more difficult. If you could wave a magic wand, um, is there any way of setting some sort of charitable journey not saying we're put we're, or a health foundation on head it or anything like that but a volunteer thing that maybe jet dentists like myself could maybe come to you guys and say i'll give you a couple of days on a saturday or is there something we could, that could happen or, potentially i mean i'm not aware of the politics of it and you know the nhs can be a bit <laughs> challenging yeah um but yeah i mean weekend sessions and extra sessions and things like that can definitely help because uh, staffing can can be uh, a challenge um and if you can you've got that option and can run things like that and i'm sure uh, that will definitely help at least get those patients through the door yeah. uh, and get the sort of biopsies arranged and the scans etc arranged that initial hurdle and just getting them in is a challenge but right now actually our clinicians are sitting around with not a lot of patients so they're being underutilized, uh, which is not ideal. But even when things are normal, uh, then they probably can't cope with the demand. So, yeah, we've gone from one extreme to the other extreme, really. I'm doing um, a lecture on the 18th. That's Thursday night, isn't it? With Dental Update and Simply Health and Oral B on the, the journey for a general practitioner. Not on your bit, not on your diagnosis, on that, on how to almost market to patients in, in this current environment on the, mm. what should we do to get our patients through the door? Because like you say, you, you've got this cohort of amazing staff who do an amazing job, but we as general practitioners, I've only got a BDS. I, I've not got, I've seen your letters after your name and it's, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, I've just got a BDS. And so I don't know, but my job is to care for my patients to make sure we're not being the, we're not being the funnel, you know, to get them through. So, we're talking about the, the the strategy of making sure all our high needs patients are coming in first. Your smokers, they come through the door first. The the, the high decay rates, they come through the first. Because we, we, you know as well as I know, the, the, the cancer patients are in this cohort of patients. 50, probably the 80-20 the rule. 20% 20 of your patients have got 80% of the disease. And within that, 5% is probably your patients that come through the door. So educating your patients, saying, Do you know what? If I'm fit and well, and I've got a good oral hygiene, we could follow nice guidelines and probably push their recalls out. Mm -hmm. But the high risk patients, the smokers, the people who drink maybe a couple of glasses of wine a day, they should be coming in from a checkup and saying, yes, they're fine. Or, or I found an ulcer, or you've got something that's, that's white patch or a red mm -hmm. patch that's not healing. I'm going to send you to Ali. And I think it's critical for patients to look in their mouths. Stephen did a really good um, self, like a self assessment. Yeah which I thought, if I can get all my patients to do that, well, that could have taken a job off me and say, well, I found a lump, brilliant, you're in tomorrow, hmm. you know? Because at the moment, you're quite right, Ali, I think we're going to have this tsunami of patient backlog to get through, which will delay diagnosis further. And I, and I, and I do, this is the worry, you know, dental hmm. decay, I can deal with. I can't deal with the stuff you guys deal with, um, but I can deal with helping and support for my patients. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, one thing I was going to ask you, you mentioned about the, the role of the dentist generally, and I just thought, what was your opinion in what can the dentist do in the journey of a mouth cancer patient? I mean, before treatment, before diagnosis, while they're being treated after, because there's so many different steps where you get involved and perhaps people are not really aware of how much you're involved. I... Um, I not that I've been thinking about this a lot since we know we're doing this today, but my role as a dentist is a coordinator of treatment. I'm there to support my patients. I'm there to support their family. You know, that conversation saying, look, preparing the patient for when they come and see you. Mm -hmm. For me, I always advise them to take a, a second pair of ears with them because that patient's in a, in a traumatic situation and then they've got to make decisions where actually if they've got their husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, whoever it is, to sit and say, oh, Ben, have you thought of this? Have you done that? I think for me, my only role is to support the patients. So if they come to you, Ali, and then they come home and go, oh, what, what did he say? 
well, phone, phone your practice. Say, look, I want to have a chat with my dentist. I've been diagnosed with this. And the dentist isn't there maybe to answer the questions. He's there to find the answers out in a mm. patient education journey way, putting into English. Um, and I'm, and I, what I mean English, I don't mean dentist English into patient learning. And that's where we can use the Oral Health Foundation's website. So actually, I'll find that information out for you. Dental practices should never be scared to say, look, I don't know about this case because I'm not an oral surgeon. I'm not a max fact surgeon, but I will find out. I think the role of a dental practice is to, if you get a patient who is diagnosed with cancer, is to give them a golden ticket. If, they, if that patient phones up, they get straight through to the dentist to have a chat. Because sometimes it's difficult to get through the hospital system to speak to their, you know, that journey to say, oh, which toothpaste should I use? Or I've got a dry mouth, what should I do? Um, so I think for me, my job is an information centre. And a reassurance saying, look, you're on the, your cancer team are doing an amazing job. But I'm there to just reassure you, just to say, look, you, you're a familiar voice, I suppose, um, and a trust place of safety. And how have you found cessation services? I mean, as a dentist as well, I mean, referring patients and how how much patients actually sort of do comply with those things or give up smoking or alcohol. And if the patients want, themselves wanted to actually refer themselves, are there many services available and how easy they are to access? I think that's, that's the challenge. And I think that is one of the roles as a dental practice is to do that finding out for the patient. One of my practices was the one of the prototypes for the NHS. So the key thing was to find that, if, and, and we actually said, look, it came up with a tick box advice to go to smoking cessation. So in the background, we took that off the dentist, the dentist team, so we had an automatic email that was sent straight out with the telephone contact details on. So what I tried to do in practice um, was to get that standard information out to send to every single patient. Because you, you know as well as I know, it's, it's, it's having a standard journey that for someone with cancer isn't new. It's that information that every single patient knows. All right, in Salford, the, the smoking cessation is here. This company runs it. This is the website address. Off you go. And it's and we, we run a homeless service um, in one of my business, one of my practices. And the biggest challenge that I've learned over the years has signposting. No, nothing else, really, because we shouldn't be doing smoking cessation in practice because we're not trained for it. Mm. We haven't got the behavioral management skills to do that. But I do feel it's one of the biggest hurdles our profession has got to deal with over the coming years is behavioral change. Um, so realistically, historically when I qualified, it was probably the, the advice for sm stopping smoking was you'd say to the patient, stop smoking. But there's a lot of behavioral change and why do people smoke and stuff. So, but my job, is to access that service. Find out, because I think in Salford, there was a very large tender came out and they consolidate all the smoking cessation clinics with the pharmacy, except to run by one company, which is, which is sensible. But giving that information out and coordinating that information, it's a nightmare. Mm. Um, but that's my job as a professional to deal with those and find that location where they're to send their information into. Um, and also using the, I love the foundation website. It's a, such an underutilized tool for everybody and the, the work the team does there on a national scale international scale really on that sort of information it is brilliant so utilizing things like um, the nhs sites the foundation sites and that sort of thing is is brilliant uh, it's it's the support to give to our patients on what is the right thing to do is, is critical yeah absolutely and um, you just spoke about training. Uh, I'm just going to ask you something which is sort of related to that. Um, how comfortable are, are you? I mean, you're quite experienced, but someone junior may not be as experienced in terms of speaking about mouth cancer, pre-cancer, or breaking bad news to the patients. And do you feel like that uh, sort of is a problem? Yeah. Um, I found mouth cancer... Eh, sorry, I found a lesion in... A very close friend and he died three months later you know so it was a it was a traumatic journey for me so I learned from that but I think that's not my role is I found something I'm not happy about. you've almost got to practice what you get a script in your head hmm. about I found something I'm not happy with I want to get you in quickly 
And quite frankly, I pass the book to you guys. I, I, I am not ashamed to saying you guys are experienced at that. You know the, the, the psychological support people need. That's not my role. However, my role is to say, look, if you have any further questions, I'm here for you. Mm. So it's understanding what your role is as a, a general dental practitioner mm. and what your role is in the, the white towers of the university, you know, because you've got that support network. You've done it. I mean, that's the different question is, Ali. How many times a week on average do you have to have that conversation? Well, right now, not at all, since I moved to pathology because I don't see patients. Well, I, I do sometimes see patients because I actually uh, offer my um, MaxFax uh, colleagues uh, that if any patient wants to come and talk about their pathology, then I'm actually happy to sit down and, and talk about it, which is quite an interesting experience. Uh, gives the patient a lot of closure, actually. Uh, but I would say in max facts, you're probably thinking about like three to four times a week at least. Mm. Uh, but it's you just need to find that balance and stressing that it's important enough for the patient to go to that appointment, uh, but not stressing so much that they actually get scared. And um, yeah, because people react differently to sort of things like that. Some people will uh, take it as a, as a challenge and they're brave and will face it. And other people may just want to just go away and just... Uh, be on their own and, and reflect and decide what they want to do. Well, what would you say is the most common reaction that you got from your time as a Max? You know, most Max? people uh, are quite brave and they just want to tackle it and fight it. And they're like, they'll do whatever it needs to be, whatever needs to be done and they want to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And there's very few who say they don't want anything doing. Um, and um, you just have to respect their wishes. Do you think, um, do you think that, uh, they often is there often a lot of questions do you think I, I often think it must be quite a shocking it must be you know shocking people often I know from my experience of talking to mouth cancer survivors even when they're going to get their biopsy results kind of deep down that they they still don't think that it's going to be mouth cancer a lot of the time they still talk about the shock that they that they have when they get that diagnosis even though arguably up until that point it's very much been on the cards um do you think that do you think that that um, you know, that there's there's maybe things you can do or things dentists can do to really help them uh, make sure they ask the right questions and get the help they need because they might just be in so much shock they almost don't know what to ask they don't know how to how mm. to ask for help. It's a, it's a difficult one because like Ben was saying you don't want to say too much because it may not be cancer at the end of the day and then the problem is we just sit in a in such a sort of a society that people are and with all these sort of no win no the sort of lawyers that people just feel very scared of actually taking the neck out and making a call in the, in the practice and I, I'm completely with them on that uh, but I think when they come before the biopsy when they're seen in the hospital I think we do start to prepare them that we think this is probably going to be bad news uh, it does come as a shock to some people more so than the others but that's where the Macmillan nurses and the, and the support uh, that we have in the hospital comes in they're given a lot of information in some instances I think actually too much information in a very short space of time. Um, but they are given time to actually go away and read their information and think about it and get back and actually take time to uh, sort of for that to sort of sink in before sort of we start planning treatment. Um, of course, you only have so much time if you sort of thinking about the, the government pathways and that within 31 days, you need a diagnosis and within 62 days, you need to do the first treatment. Um, but to, uh, patients are given information they speak to a Macmillan nurse and they give them sort of support and context that they can go away and have a think about it, come back with any questions. Um, there's also patient support groups that new patients can actually go and talk to them who've gone through treatment um, and see what their experience was and what sort of things to expect and what not to expect, etc. So, But I think those things can be better. Very good. I would like, uh, kind of echoing, echoing your point as well, there is a lot of support out there for mouth cancer survivors. I don't think it's necessarily... Um, a lot of necessary people uh, people realize how much support there is out there for them and I know that if, if you go on the Oral Health Foundation's um, website specifically on the Mouth Cancer Action website um, there is a list of uh, a database of support groups um, split by region so you can go and see what local support groups are around you um, so uh, uh, yeah there's, there's there is lots of information out there um, lots of support out there um, and I think it's just about pointing patients in the right place. I think like, like, uh, um, 
like uh, Ben says, and I know I'm maybe a bit biased, but I do think our website is a fantastic resource um, for dentists, for patients, because there is just so much information on there about support groups, about mouth cancer, and also just generally about oral health. Um, and and uh, I'd highly recommend people people use it and check it out. Um, I'm aware of the fact that of time, I've got my my quiz. Do you think well, now's a good time to do the quiz? Go on then. <laughs> I think I think um, I think it'd be good uh, test your guys' knowledge and also test the knowledge of the viewers as well. So we've got come to, come to YouTube. We've got 32 people watching right now. So it'd be great to test some some of the viewers' knowledge as well to, to kind of play along as it were. Um, I don't know if you've got any pen and paper or something to make a note of your answers, but that'd be good if you just have something you can make a note of. Right then, are you are you ready? Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. So the quiz is kind of it's a general kind of mouth cancer quiz, mouth cancer mouth cancer action month quiz. I like some of these questions you probably will find quite easy, but I'm, I've thrown in a couple of I think trickier ones. So um, we'll see we'll see how you do. Okay, number one, uh, which of these statements is true? On average, in the UK, someone is diagnosed with mouth cancer, either A, every minute, B, every 30 minutes, C, every hour, or D, every day. Which one of those is the true statement? Give you a bit of time to answer that. Right then, um, and now uh, question two. Um, what anniversary is the All Health Foundation's Mouth Cancer Action Month campaign, sorry, Mouth Cancer Action campaign marking this year? Is it A, a 20th anniversary, B, a 30th anniversary, C, a 40th anniversary, or D, a 50th anniversary? It's a big one. Which one are we celebrating this year? Um, hopefully you've got an answer for that one. Number three, true or false, Mouth Cancer Action Month has always been called Mouth Cancer Action Month. Mm. A, little, a little true or false for you there? Has it always been called Mouth Cancer Action Month? Right then, hopefully again, got an answer. Hopefully people watching along have written down an answer for that one as well. We'll move on to number four. Mouth cancer is most likely to affect which part of the mouth? This is going off of our state of mouth cancer report statistics, which were released in November. So most up-to-date statistics we have. A mouth cancer is most likely to affect which part of the mouth? Is it A, the gums, B, the tonsils, C, the tongue, or D, the cheeks? So hopefully you've got an answer for that one. And moving on, number five, mouth cancer kills more Brits per year than what two other cancers combined? Is it A, lung and brain cancer, B, liver and prostate cancer, C, testicular and cervical cancer, or D, pancreatic and bowel cancer? Oh, can you repeat the options again? <laughs> yes, I'll repeat the question, the options as well. Mouth cancer kills more Brits per year than what two other cancers combined? Is A, lung and brain cancer, C, B, sorry, liver and prostate cancer, C, testicular and cervical cancer, or D, pancreatic and bowel cancer. Okay. okay. Hopefully you've got a question and answer for that and people have watching as well. Number six. What, we know that mouth cancer affects more men than women. Um, of total cases of mouth cancer last year, what percentage affected men? And I thought for this one to mix it up, I won't give you any options. Just I'd like to know your your estimate, and I'll I'll give you a five five percent leeway. So we know that mouth cancer affects more men than women. Of total cases of mouth cancer last year, what percentage affected men? Yeah. Okay. And number seven, we have over the last 20 years, by what percentage have mouth cancer rates increased in the UK? So diagnosis of mouth cancer. Um, has it increased A, 22%, B, 45%, C, 68%, or D, 97%? 10 years. Sorry, over the last 20 years. 20 years, okay. 20. Yep. 
Okay. Hopefully, uh, then the Pentagon answer for that as well as people at home. Number eight, by what percentage have deaths increased for mouth cancer in the UK over the last 20 years? Is it A, 15%, B, 28%, C, 48%, or D, 64%? Hopefully you've got something for that. Yeah, hopefully people have as well watching. Uh, number nine, uh, we're now kind of going on to um, a few questions about our survey. So every year as, mouth can as part of Mouth Cancer Action Month, we do a survey. We survey around 2000 Brits um, to get their uh, opinions and knowledge around kind of mouth cancer and also kind of oral health in general. Um, so in your Heart Foundation survey of 2000 Brits carried out just before Mouth Cancer Action Month, what percentage said they had not heard of mouth cancer? And again, I'll give you a 5% leeway, but I want your, your best guess of percentage. What percentage said they had not heard of mouth cancer? Hopefully you've got an answer for that one. Um, number 10, what percentage of survey respondents said they felt confident in their knowledge of how to check themselves for mouth cancer? Again, your past guess percentage. Okay, uh, uh, number 11. What percentage of survey respondents said that they knew that their dentist checked for mouth cancer during a routine checkup? What percentage said that they knew that that was the case? Okay, and number 12. According to the NHS, what is the recommended weekly alcohol limit in units? Kind of the maximum amount that the NHS says we should be consuming. Um, okay, and then we've got three more questions. Um, this one I thought, again, mix it up a bit. Uh, we'll do a buzz around. Um, <clears throat> so um, could you please both have some sort of buzzer? sound that you make to get oh, God. To the answer okay ali go go ahead well, what's going to be your buzzer um should i just make a sound yeah well okay. you get okay just make a sound because surprise us why not that'll be that okay. that'll be good so this is just going to be quick fire it's gonna be who can be buzzing first and say the um say the answer i'm gonna get a timer up you're gonna get you're gonna get i think let's make this hard because you know you're both you're both experienced or health professionals. You should, I think you should be, should be on this one. So you're going to get 10 seconds from your buzzer to mention, to, to oh, answer the question. Let me get the buzzer up quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Are you ready? Uh, just a second. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Name three risk factors for mouth cancer. Okay, Ali, go. Smoking, alcohol, and human papilloma virus. Same. Done it in five seconds. Didn't even need the whole 10. Very good. Yeah. So I'll make a note of that. That's a point, extra point for Ali. Um, okay. Next one. Uh, name three symptoms of mouth cancer. Come on, Ben. Okay. I have the buzz. Um, swelling of the neck. Uh, ulcer of the tongue and pain. pain and what was that last one pain yeah very good well done three out of three and then the final one the final question of the quiz can you finish the sentence again buzz in if in doubt yeah ali get checked out there we go. Very good. Awesome. Great. Great one to end on there. A, a very important message that, of course, we've been shouting for years. If in doubt, get checked out. Very good. So let's go through the answers quickly, see how you've done, see how people have done at home um, watching as well. So the first question is, which of these statements is true? On average in the UK, someone is diagnosed with mouth cancer every... What was your answer, Ali? 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes. Um, that is actually incorrect. Ben, what was your answer? I put B. What was that? Is that 30 minutes as well? 
that was 30 minutes as well. <laughs> Not average in the UK. Someone is dying of mouth cancer every hour. It was C. Yeah. We, um, 8,000, just over 8,700 Brits were diagnosed um, with mouth cancer last year. And that pretty much is bang on for one every hour throughout the year on average. Um, number two. Um, what anniversary is the All Health Foundation's Mouth Cancer Action Campaign marking this year? Is it A, 20th anniversary, B, 30th anniversary, C, 40th anniversary, or D, 50th anniversary? What did you put, Ali? 20th. Yep. Um, what did you put, uh, Ben? I put A as well. Yes, very good. Well done, 20th anniversary. Um, we've been, yeah, doing running Mouth Cancer Action for 20 years now. Um, started in 2000. Um, and we've been kind of uh, spearheading it since 2003. Um, awesome. Uh, number three, um, this is just a true or false. Um, uh, Mouth Cancer Action Month has always been called Mouth Cancer Action Month. Um, true or false? Ali, what do you put? My guess was false. <laughs> you put false. Okay. And yeah, Ben, what do you put? I put false as well. You yes. Something else at some point. That's it. No, you're correct. It was actually um, Mouth Cancer Action Month initially started as Mouth Cancer Action Week um, kind of in the early 2000s. Um, it was just a week long campaign. Uh, and then um, we managed, uh, I, I can't, I couldn't find exactly the date, the kind of year that we that we started Mouth Cancer Action Month. But I know it's been the case for a number of years now where we do the month long campaign in November. Um, if for those that are interested on the All Health Foundation website, there is a timeline. If you go on history and milestones, there's a timeline of the foundation. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in kind of finding a bit more about the history of the campaign, about the All Health Foundation in general, I'd uh, recommend checking that out. Um, I'm just trying to keep a note of the scores, actually. So, Ali, you... Uh, you uh, we're, all, we're all winners here. Yeah, that's You're all on two. Right? Um, yeah, to be fair. The important yeah. thing is learning about it, isn't it? Well, that's it. I mean, this is this is hopefully this is why I want to do the quiz because obviously it's a chance to have a bit of fun and test yourself. But yeah. also, I think a great opportunity for people to to learn. And I'm sure they'll definitely be surprised by some of these answers. I guarantee you, someone uh, if you're watching, you will be surprised by at least one of the answers, if not already. Um, but number four, mouth cancer is most likely to affect which part of the mouth? Is it a the gums, b the tonsil, c the tongue, or d the cheeks? Um, what did you put, Alan? I put C tongue. Put C tongue. Uh, what did you put? Uh, I put ben? C. I put C tongue as well. See, uh, I'm I'm starting to to worry uh, now. But our state of mouth cancer reports uh, suggest that it's tonsils. Um, so would, that would be uh, okay. C. Um, last uh, corn to corn to results from last year. Twenty seven percent of uh, twenty seven percent of cases of mouth cancer for men were in the tonsils and 18% for women, um, which was the highest. Um, of course, mouth cancer can present itself in many different areas, not just, uh, you know, in the tongue. The tongue was uh, a, a close second. So it's still okay. somewhere that's, uh, that affects, is affected a lot. Never, never to be too um, old to learn anything, so that's good. Yeah, that's it. Um, number five, uh, mouth cancer kills more Brits per year than what two other cancers combined? Is it A, lung and brain cancer, B, liver and prostate cancer, C, testicular and cervical cancer, or D, pancreatic and bowel cancer? What do you put, Ali? Complete guess. I put A. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what about you, Ben? I put B. I put B, put B liver and prostate cancer. Um, it's actually testicular and cervical cancer c mouth cancer kills more people more brits per year than testicular and cervical cancer combined which i was very surprised at when i heard uh that um i remember that being one of the early statistics that quite shocked me because i remember learning a lot about testicular cancer um in school i remember uh a a school nurse came in um and we had a whole a whole lesson on on the importance of checking um for testicular cancer um and yeah, I was so I was quite surprised to find that mouth cancer actually kills more people than than testicular and cervical cancer combined. So I think that 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 definitely was uh, shocking when I found that out. Out um, for those who are wondering, um, last year mouth cancer killed two thousand seven hundred uh, two thousand seven hundred people. Um, let me get the exact 
So you got 2,702 Brits lost their life to mouth cancer no, last year. We were discussing before about having a mainstream campaign on, on main mm -hmm. media, whereas you, you see the exposure that prostate cancer gets or breast cancer gets, and it, it shows how important mouth cancer is um, to, for patients to be aware, to get them checked out. Anything yeah. that you feel out of the ordinary, if in doubt, like you say, Ali said before, get it checked out, because if the sooner we catch anything like this, it, it's easily visible. You know, mm. it's you don't have to go delving as very much for a biopsy. We can get things the sooner we catch mouth cancer, the better the outcome in the longer longevity of the patient. Okay. So Ali's work made it a lot easier if people rock up to the dentist in this current climate. Yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent agreed. Um Number six, we know that mouth cancer affects more men than women. Of total cases of mouth cancer last year, what percentage affected men? Um, that, Ali, what was your guess for this, or did you know? 55. 55? Okay, what did you say, Ben? So I put 60%, so <laughs> that was quite amusing. We're very close. Well, I can tell you that, Ben, you're closer. Um, it was 67% last year. Um so yeah, quite uh, again, quite. I found that quite shocking. Uh, you know, it's a, over two thirds of men um, compared to a third of women uh, in terms of case of mouth cancer. From my general dental practitioner point of view, it reaffirms why stereotypically a woman will come soon to the dentist than a man does. We're very poor at thinking oh i'll get over that i'll i'll not get it checked out i'll just leave it so it with the diagnostic process that that presentation of uh, male cancer is probably why there's more fatalities from it because men of don't go to the dentist compared to women they take the children there is that feminine female stereotypic journey that the the, the, the men leave things oh it's all right it's fine it'll go well Go to the dentist, make sure things get checked out, go regularly to a dentist. It's really critical to do that um, because otherwise we you become part of the statistic and that's not a good thing. Mm. Yeah, no, and I know that I feel like um, as men as well, we're not we're just not always great at talking about our health. Um, you know, I think that we we we're not we we don't you know talk a lot about um, about concerns. You know. Um, it isn't just a stereotype, it's something I think a lot of men do struggle struggle with. Um, so I do think that definitely um, it'd be great if we could encourage everyone, you know, but specifically as well, encourage men to, to be a bit more open about their health and, and have those conversations. If they're worried about something and they don't feel like they don't know who to turn to, obviously we'd like them to turn to their dentist, but we appreciate the fact that that might not always be easy, but if they can at least have a trusted friend that they can open up to and, and talk about, you know, then that, that can be that can be really good. Um, there's a comment to one of your questions. Uh, you're generating some controversy, uh, Stephen, on YouTube. Uh, they basically, um, Charlotte Curry has said that it depends on your definition of mouth cancer for the most common side. Tonsil is oropharyngeal, a tongue is oral. Yes, no, that is that is a very good point. Um, I, I, a very good point from Charlotte there. Um, and yes, I do appreciate that. I um, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't clarify. I didn't clarify. Now, um, it, it, it um, we're going off the sites that we use when we for our mouth cancer action month report. Um, stay at the mouth cancer report. Sorry, we go off what we used um, for that in terms of getting information from the relevant health bodies um, across the UK. But no, very good point. Um, so it might not, it might well be um, tongue if you take into fact that that definition. Um, well, we'll scrub, we'll scrub the points. For that I love that, that point, Charlotte, but it's a really good point. The fact that we do check that when you go to a dentist. Mm. So it, for 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 us who think about the mouth, we do check a lot more when you come to the dentist. And getting that message over to patients is sometimes actually we'll we'll check the head and neck. Um, it's one of the reasons I wore a tie today is the fact that when you go to the dentist, we will make sure you undo the top button. I was saying before, Ali, that I went to Sheffield and I got a kick in in one of my vivas because I didn't undo the tie. Have a look at the, you know, so that's hence why I wore a tie today. But it's that message that we're not just about teeth when it comes to the dentist. We check everything. Um, and that's, and if patients will work, go in, you say, well, what's, he, what's Ben doing? Got his thumb in his mouth, pressing around. I'm checking for cancer. And getting patients to understand that 
Um, but when we get you to open your mouth and say, ah, oh, that's what we're checking at the back. So it, it's critical that we catch things early when you go to the dentist. So it's a great point from Charlotte, but I still check it when you come to the dentist. I'll, I'll, I'll claim that error as well. <laughs> That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, right then, number seven. Over the last 20 years, by what percentage have mouth cancer rates increased in the UK? Was it A, 22%, B, 45%, C, 68%, or D, 97%? What was your answer to this, Ali? Did you say 20 years or 10 years? Uh, 20 years, over the last 20 years. 92%. Uh, do you mean D, 97? Yeah, sorry, 97. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ben? Yeah, I said I, I went the top end as well. Yeah, well done. Yeah, it's correct. Uh, over the last 20 years, in mouth cancer rates in the UK have increased 97, 97%, so nearly doubled, um, which, again, an, another another shocking statistic, I think. People don't, people think we're winning the war on, on cancer, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great research going on, and a lot of cancers, brilliant, brilliant headway being made, um, but it's important to, to know that mouth cancer, currently, the, stati the statistics are going the wrong way. You know, they're not going down, they're going up. Ali, Ali, when do you think, because I'm not sure if the pub, general public knows but why it is important HPV, human, human papillomavirus inoculations, when will that start to hit these stats, do you feel? Um, the inoculations are starting now. Um, will it, is it going to be in our career that that happens? Because uh, Probably, yeah. It's really interesting because our next speaker, Bernie Foran, uh, who's one, uh, one of our oncologists in Sheffield, will probably be talking about that. Um, I think the initial feeling was that the HPV cancers are not as lethal or aggressive as the conventional non-HPV uh, cancers. But I think there's some new evidence emerging that the late effects of these cancers, like 10 years, 15 years after diagnosis, uh, they might not be as well behaved as people initially thought. Um, so, yeah, I think in our lifetime, hopefully we will have uh, that information. There's some really good trials going on. Um, uh, things like the um, de-escalate and predictor and um, hopefully the findings for those will be uh, published in another five to ten years, um, which will probably clear the picture a little bit. You just made me smile then because you use such a a term that I love to use in practice, the well-behaved cancers. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's like, you, know, you know, because it, it's trying to make things where people understand, look, you're okay, This we can yeah. control this. It's like a child that's not being controlled. We've caught it early. They're being well-behaved. And I love that terminology. So, but then you went off-piste and when you went to the proper technology of epidemiology and studies and yeah. soon as patients, it, it's trying to use those words without yeah. patients, the well-behaved, the naughty one. Yeah, yeah. No, very good point, very good point. Um, and very good, yeah, imagery of a kind of naughty a cancer in the, in the naughty step, on the naughty yeah, step or something. The, the <laughs> one over there, because we're not talking to him. <laughs> yeah. Um, very good. Um, and number, the next question, I think, uh, number eight, well, what, what percentage have deaths increased from mouth cancer in the UK over the last 20 years? Um, a, 15%, B, 28%, C, 48%, or D, 64%? Um, I put D sixty four percent. Okay, and what did you put, Ben? I put I put twenty eight percent because I was just okay. Fair enough. The answer is actually in between the two of you, so it's forty eight percent. C. They've increased forty eight percent over the last twenty years. Um, so obviously less than less than incidences, which is good news, but still um very high. You know, um nearly uh, increased by half. Um, so yeah, definitely underscores the importance of of mouth cancer action months work in terms of getting people mouth aware because the earlier the better when it you know when it comes to mouth cancer mouth cancer rates uh, survival can be boosted from 50 percent to 90 percent um just by early detect by early detection so you know we know that um getting it early is so vital for for um a, a good prognosis and, and a better quality of life also post-treatment so really important that people get this early you know um, I was just about to say the slogan, but I won't because that's coming up later. Right then, uh, number nine. Uh, in the All Health Foundation, so this is the survey questions that we asked. Um, I said the end, it was just the end of October we did this survey. Um, so very fresh statistics. Um, in the All Health Foundation's survey of 2000 Brits carried out just before mouth cancer, mouth cancer action month what percentage said they had not heard of mouth cancer? And I was going to give you 5% leeway. What, what, what did you say, Ali? I only know it because I was putting the slides together last night for my introduction. 12% said they didn't know about it. Okay, but uh, Ben? I put, put? I put 20%. So. Okay. Um, are you, you're so close. It's actually 14%. 
Okay. Keep that out, but I mean it's it's quite it's it's within the five. Um, yeah, fourteen percent, which is is so so small. That's one in one in seven Brits. Only one in seven said that they were confident. Um, sorry, no, I'm getting confused with a different question. Only one in only uh, so one in seven Brits said that they said that they had not heard of mouth cancer. You know, um, you know, nearly fifteen percent, which is way too high. We want that number to be a lot lower. Um, because ultimately, you know, you can't be aware of something and you can't keep on top of something if you don't know about it. You know, ultimately, you know, at the very least, we need people aware that mouth cancer exists and what to look out for. You know, otherwise um, we can't uh, decrease those numbers and get people more mouth aware. So um, that's definitely a percentage that we would like to see uh, lower. And it's something that through social media, through people sharing social media, even through sharing the stream, you know, can get those messages out there. Awesome. Um, number 10, what percentage of survey respondents said they felt confident in their knowledge of how to check themselves for mouth cancer? What did you put for this one, Ali? 45. 45. Uh, ben? 20. Ben, yeah, close there, uh, very close. 17%, only 17% said they felt confident in their knowledge of how to check themselves for mouth cancer. I'd, m I'd much rather it was nearer your answer, Ali. Um, it's, it's, it's a shame. So, so few Brits feel confident. And that is why we're, you know, that is why we're really pushing for a national self-check self -check on, on Wednesday. So tomorrow, Blue Wednesday, we're encouraging the nation to take part in a mouth cancer check. Um, Ben alluded to it earlier, but I want, I want to mention it again. On our website, on www.mouthcancer.org, if you go there and click on, uh, there's an about mouth cancer section. If you click on spot the signs, you'll get taken to a page which explains the symptoms of mouth cancer and how to check for mouth cancer. And there's a video, captioned video, of me going through a mouth cancer check with a voiceover explaining all of the steps involved. So if you don't know how to check for mouth cancer, go and watch that video. And if you do know how to check for mouth cancer, Go on, go to that web page and share that web page on your on your Facebook, share it on your Twitter, uh, let your patients know about it, because we need to get the word out there. People do not feel confident in their knowledge, um, you know, only 17 percent. Um, but we can get that number higher by just getting the word out there and, and giving people the resources and the knowledge to be able to to potentially do a life saving check that you know, can only take only takes a minute and it could save your life. It really is that important. Awesome. Um, so. Coming near the end now, number 11, what percentage of survey respondents said that they knew that their dentist checked for mouth cancer during a routine checkup? So what, what percentage were confident that they knew that their dentist had checked for mouth cancer? Um, we'll ask the dentist first for this one. Ben, what did you put? I put 30%. I didn't think it was very 30%. High. Okay, and Ali? 20%. 20%. Okay. Um, near Ben's, uh, uh, 41% um, said that they knew. I'm um, not doing again, so well in this quiz, am I? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think, you know, I think um, you're quite rightly probably um, trying to be optimistic and wanting to think, oh, you know, we're doing we're doing all right. But I think, unfortunately, what our survey shows is there is still a lot of work to be done when it comes to educating the public about mouth yeah. cancer. Um, you know, uh, it definitely these numbers are a lot lower than we want them to be. And that's why we really uh, are pushing hard for mouth cancer action, mouth cancer action. Um, um, so yeah, only 41% said that they were confident. Uh, that Charlotte has just made a comment on YouTube. Um, Charlotte Curry, who asked that question earlier, and she was, she's saying, are those survey results available on your website or freely available? Because she thinks they're really interesting and would be good mm. for people to have access to that data. Yeah, so um, the then the the data isn't available, um, kind of all of the data. But um, if you go on our website and if you keep uh, definitely keeping an eye on, on it throughout the month, um, we are we are in the process of writing up um, press releases around the survey data. Um, so um, you know, keep an eye out for the news on the news and kind of blogs and news section of our website um, for all the press releases going out because you'll see then the stats that uh, feed into those articles to really help us. Um, try and get kind of paint a picture um, for people. So I would say I'm um, definitely keeping an eye on those. And yeah, they are going out um, in various releases. Um, so keep yeah, keep your eyes peeled for those. And we have a comment from Anna Dona who says she's not very good at this quiz. But don't worry, Anna, neither are we. <laughs> uh, don't worry, one, one day, one day. That's it. No, it's good. Um, you know, 
uh, unfortunately, as we say, no, we know there's a lot of work to be done, but, um, you know, we, but there's a lot of hope, I think. We're really, it's already fantastic to see so many people getting involved in Mouth Cancer Action Month. Um, you know, I've been keeping an eye on social media, and it's great to see people tweeting out the messages. Um, and obviously on Blue Wednesday tomorrow, I hope to see lots of people getting involved then. And that gives me a lot of optimism, and a lot of hope for the future when I see some of the fantastic supporters we have. Um, doing work and people like yourselves doing this event um, who knows what kind of an impact the events like these can have so um, I would say that stay optimistic there's a lot there's um, still plenty of time to turn things around and, and get get more people mouth aware um, got okay. another comment here from Will Baldwin who is saying he wish he could be listening to this live but he's stuck in the lesson Oh, no. <laughs> That's a shame. Well, I mean, the good news is that this is going on quite a while. I mean, obviously, you're going to be, me and Ben are, uh, will, will be going off soon. Ben will be joining again at five. Um, but you'll keep going right up until 8pm. Right so there is plenty of time. If you can't, if you can't quite get involved yet, if you can't turn the sound on yet, keep, keep watching because we will, it will be up. Um, and also somebody... Yeah, the, as you mentioned just on the chat there, the recording will be available later. This will be, um, the whole thing will stay on our channel afterwards. So um, if you want to kind of dip in for, to look for certain segments like that, that will be available to people as well. Awesome. Um, right then, final question. Um, according to the NHS, what is the recommended weekly alcohol limit in units? What was your answer to this, Ali? 14 units. 14, Dan? Same. Yes, very good, very good. Yes, that is the weekly limit. Um, and it's actually, unfortunately, we also know from our survey, um, let me just get it up. We also know from our survey that unfortunately, a lot of Brits are actually exceeding this. From our survey, 11% of the eleven percent of the people we surveyed um, said that they regularly drank over 14 units a week. Um, so, you know, we do really want to highlight the... Um, the, the fact that, that alcohol is a risk factor for mouth cancer. I think lots of people know about smoking now. They're aware of the fact that smoking causes cancer. Not necessarily mouth cancer, but, you know, still work to be done there. But, you know, they are aware that it, it causes cancer. People, I don't think, realise that, that alcohol is another risk factor and drinking al alcohol to excess can increase your risk. Smoking, both smoking and drinking to excess, has been shown in some studies to increase your risk about to 30 times for mouth cancer. So really uh, is worth uh, bearing in mind. Uh, well done, Ben. You won. Mm, maybe. No need to count. No, just... I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thank you. Thank you, guys. I think, um, Stephen, thank you very much for arranging this. And Ali, thank you very much for letting me on your talk today. No worries. Um, I appreciate it. And one day I will come over to Sheffield and um, I'm meant to be doing something with SUDS, which is Sheffield University Dental. Yes, uh, Dental School Society. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Thank Brilliant. You. I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks a lot. Yeah, best of luck for the rest of it, Ali. Um, and yeah, yeah, keep on going. Before you guys go, there's one last comment from Judith who said very interesting epidemiology stats and she's learned something new today. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Very happy to hear that. Very good. Well, as I say, for more information, definitely check out our All Health Foundation website and Mouth Cancer Action website. There's plenty of data there. Our State of Mouth Cancer report, which was which was released at the start of the month, has plenty of information. It has some of the information um, around stats, the sort of taken some of the stats from the survey around awareness. So um, definitely check that out if you haven't already. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See you guys later. Bye-bye. And welcome to the chat, Bernie. Thanks a lot for joining. Perfect timing. Sorry, we're running a little bit late. Uh, we're just finishing the quiz. Um, so uh, I'll just introduce Dr. Foran. She's a consultant clinical oncologist and honorary senior lecturer at Western Park Hospital in Sheffield. I'm very actively involved in our multidisciplinary uh, cancer team meeting as well as head and neck cancer patient management and uh, she will be talking about mouth cancer from the oncologist perspective so let me just uh, project your slides Bernie thanks Ali so I hope it's gone well this morning sorry I couldn't join earlier I just caught the last 10 minutes of that last session and... yes it's going yeah, okay thank you yeah interesting experience absolutely uh, hold on where's it gone So just while Ali finds my slides, just good morning to everyone. 
Um, and for the next about an hour, I think is is the plan is to talk to you about sort of what I do from my perspective and working with Ali. But first of all, thank you to Ali for for doing this. You made history because I've never done a virtue thon before. I suspect I'm, the, I'm not the only one. Um, but look forward to talking to you all. Hold on, this is the wrong. Uh... That looks like it. Yeah, let me just go back to it. Okay, over to you, Bernie. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ali. And will you just change the slides as I, I will said? do. Next. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, as I said, I, I just I, I sort of caught the last 10, 15 minutes of that last session and very much aware that there will be common themes and repeats throughout the day. And I, and I think that's really important because this is all about raising the awareness and and ultimately improving outcomes, um, improving prevention, but but also detecting these cancers at an early stage. And so what I want to do over the next, as I say, 50, 50 minutes or so is just run through things. And I don't know, I presume questions are coming through to you, are they, Ali? Um, and so just- Yeah, they they're coming through on the YouTube chat. Uh, so I'll just relay them to you. Um, okay, so yeah. I'm ready for the next slide. So in terms of what I want to cover today is, is, is really just an overview, but specifically from my point of view as an oncologist and as an oncologist, as a head and neck oncologist, I'm responsible for the non-surgical management of head and neck cancer. And that includes radiotherapy, but also the drugs we use as well. And so what I wanted to do is sort of give an intro as to, to how we go about deciding on management of, of patients, but also very much cover something that's very dear to my heart because it's how we improve things is by doing research and undertaking clinical trials and then sort of finish off really talking about where we're going how we will improve things in future because inevitably we will but also I thought it'd be quite interesting just to cover a few of the frequently asked questions that patients or family members ask me before they start their treatment or during their treatment because I thought that might be quite interesting as well so next slide so just as by way of an introduction, important to go back to Hippocrates and you know, talk about the definition of cancer because we've known about cancer for a very, 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 very long time. And many people might ask, well, why haven't we cured it? Well, it's because it's not quite so simple as that. And you know, cancer is, is, is a, a huge number of different disease and they have a similar characteristic, which is that they're, um, that they're governed by uncontrolled growth and also generally the ability to spread to other parts of the body or to other organs of the body. Um, but like I say, is there's a huge number of them and some are now curable and, and very pleased to say, you know, a number of, of head and neck cancers, including a number of mouth cancers are curable, but often it's the case of, of catching them early. But the word cancer was accredited or um, whether he'd probably want to be seen as, as the accreditor of this, but it goes back to Hippocrates, the father of medicine, who often used the term carcinoma or carcinos um, to, to, to describe lesions that people had growing on their face or in other areas of their body. So next slide. And just to emphasize, and as I say, what we were just hearing a few minutes ago is, is that cancer is common. And, you know, we're talking about all cancers, but especially in the head and neck and mouth cancer, especially, um, is hugely increasing in incidence. And it's pretty much now or very soon that we go from one in three to one in two um, patient, pa people developing cancer in their lifetime. And very much as I'm sure Ali will attest to as well, we now see people in clinical practice, you know, who not only on their first cancer, but are on their second or third or fourth or fifth cancer. Uh, and that's quite common in, in, in the mouth, especially because of some of the uh, conditions that lend themselves to patients developing cancer in the first place. So next slide. And this is what I mean is, is that it's estimated there's about 200 different types of cancer. And for certain ones, like um, if I can find testicular cancer um, over there, it, it's that by and large is a very curable cancer and certainly lymphomas are also curable. And as I've said already, you know, um, a lot of head neck cancers and mouth cancers are also curable, but there's a lot more that have very poor prognoses. So next slide. And the ones I've highlighted here in yellow are really the ones that we're talking in and focusing on today and during the month of November being the Mouth Cancer Action Month. So next slide. 
So this is what we're talking about with mouth cancer. And, and I thought this was quite important because, you know, obviously the, the, the day is, is all about celebrating Mouth Cancer Action Day. Um, and as clinicians, we often sub divide or classify things in different ways. But to me, mouth cancer is talking about the cancers within the inside of the lip, on the tongue, on the roof of the mouth, but also in the back of the mouth in, in places like the oral cavity and the tonsil. And although it's a small area of us, um, there's many different types of cancers that can occur in this area. And even though many might be said to be what we call squamous cell carcinomas as the vast majority, uh, despite them looking the same often under the microscope, they can behave in very different ways. And that can often be due to the etiology or, or how these cancers started. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But it's also to do with the anatomy of us and, and how we're wired in terms of, of the nerves, but also in terms of things such as lymphatics, which is an important part of the body's immune system. And the, the issue always with the head and neck is, is it's vital in terms of the immune system because it's, it's, it's the main gateway into our bodies in terms of the air we breathe, the food we eat, and therefore, you know, how we're exposed to viruses and, and, and other nasties in the environment and how our bodies do, do deal with those. So that's why they can behave in very different ways. So next slide. Uh, so this is really just a recap. So th these are the latest figures from Cancer Research UK, um, who are obviously the main body within the United Kingdom who collect the data in terms of cancers, both in males and females, but also ac across the various types. And if you count down eight from breast, you get to head and neck. And so that, of course, includes the mouth cancers that, again, we're focusing on today, but will also include other sites such as larynx, um, so the voice box or or an area called the hypopharynx just above the voice box, as well as other more rare sites in, in the head and neck as well. But you'll see that, you know, eight on the list is, you know, is, is pretty big. And, you know, unfortunately, with the rates of increase, you know, it might start overtaking things like kidneys and lymphomas um, if we're not lucky and if we don't have impact. Because I think this is a league table where you don't want to be at the top. Um, although, you know, of, of course, you know, compared to breast, lung and prostate and bowel cancer, numbers are relatively low. Um, but around the world, head and neck cancer can often feature a much bigger, um, will, will be bigger on this table, uh, again, because of certain inherited factors, but also risk factors as well. So that's where we're at. The pink is females. It's, it's very um, <laughs> politically incorrect, perhaps, the Cancer UK. But it, it also shows that, that females are less in terms of numbers compared to males affected by mouth cancer, head and neck cancer. But those numbers are increasing as well. And I think I think we need to be very aware of that, that although males still predominate when it comes to head and neck cancer, certainly the thing I've, I've noticed personally in my own practice is from when I started, it would be a very rare occasion that I would see a female um, as a new patient. But nowadays, you know, it almost is 50 50. Um, so so crucial that we tackle and, and look to see what are the things that we can do to make a difference. So next slide, please. So again, emphasizing what was being discussed in the last session is, and this is very relevant for, for mouth cancers because it's estimated that, you know, between 46 and 88% of, of head neck cancers and especially mouth cancers are preventable. And that's because many of them, the majority are related to lifestyle factors. So things that we choose to do that we have a choice over. And, you know, alcohol and smoking are, are the two best known about. Um, and, you know, many of us, you know, are drinking more than we should, but also many of us might have a, 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 a stronger predisposition to develop the changes in our mouth, even from much lower levels of alcohol or smoking than what is considered safe, although no amount of smoking is considered safe in terms of cancer formation. And the, the little sort of cartoon there at the bottom, you know, shows how smoking causes lots of different cancers in the body, um, but head and neck is, is right up there. And especially when you get the synergy between um, smoking and alcohol um, in changing the environment of the mouth and, and making what would normally be normal cells becoming a bit wild, that this is where the, the cancers then develop. 
those funny looking nuts in the, in the top there are, are, are called betel nut. And th this is not so widespread a problem in the UK, although it's a huge problem around the world, especially in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, where chewing betel nut is, is, is a very common lifestyle choice um, and is certainly associated with, with significant rates of, of mouth cancers as such. And, and within our Southeast Asian populations in the UK, um, it is very prevalent as well. And so we do see people, you know, across the UK and here where we are, you know, where I am in Sheffield with cancers caused by betel nut ingestion. And then the gentleman sitting down on, on, on the chaise lounge is supposed to represent a sort of a inactive lifestyle. And the fact that we know that inactivity and lack of exercise also makes us more prone to, to, to mouth cancers as well. And then that pretty blue um, sort of thing at the top there that looks like almost like a flower or, or the inside of a, a flower is actually the human papilloma virus. And that was discussed in, in the last session. And th this is accounted for a sort of an epidemic almost in, in, in mouth cancers in the back and the tonsil and base of tongue um, over the last sort of 20, 20 years or so. And what's very interesting about this is, is that you know, we, we see in cancers related to this virus in, in a different population than we're, we're typically used to with head and neck cancers, who used to be the people who would, you know, keep the, the pub industry going and, you know, keep the tobacco industry, you know, within the billions of profits that they make. But the, the cancers caused by human papilloma virus, which is the same virus that also causes cervical cancer in women, um, is, is often caused the cancer in a much earlier age group. So, so we're seeing patients in their 30s, 40s and 50s, but also it accounts for why we're seeing an increased number of women as, as, as well with cancer. There is some light with, with this type of cancer that although, you know, the rates are going up and up and up and up and up, um, it does tend to respond better to, this, to the standard treatments we have. But, you know, people should not rest on that because we do know that a subset of these patients still can have very aggressive disease. And also the treatments we need to use, as I'm going to come on to talk about, you know, need to be very aggressive in order to achieve that good outcome. So, you know, I would argue against there being nice cancers and, and bad cancers, because I, I think cancers in individuals have a real propensity to, to often be very nasty and people need to be fit and well to get the benefit of, of the treatments so really we should be trying to avoid getting any of them already and you know cutting down on our risk factors as as per this slide so next slide please ali thank you so coming on to talk about management of cancer um, what i want to focus on is is what treatments are used but also how do we make that decision you know in and how do we formulate what treatments we offer to patients because that's often a bit of a mystery sometimes to patients because um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in terms of, of arriving at the decision and, and then offering a patient a particular treatment or options for treatment where they are available. And it was mentioned earlier, I know about the multidisciplinary team meeting. Um, so I'm going to touch on that, but also about what do we do? You know, what are the investigations and why do we do it? So next slide. So the treatment options for mouth cancer um, are in, in order of frequency really is, is surgery. Surgery is still the number one for the vast majority of cases, especially within what we call the oral cavity. So that's the front part of the tongue, the, within the cheeks, um, and also along the gum line and, and where the teeth lie and, and also in the palate. But often in the in the back, in, in the what we call the posterior bit of the mouth, where the tonsil and base of tongue, more often it's radiotherapy, which takes the prevalence um, for, for treatments. And I'll explain why you know, one might be chosen over the other. But oftentimes it's a combination of these treatments, which is given in order to maximize the chance of an individual's patient's um, chance of being cured. And systemic treatments, so we don't use the term chemotherapy as the standard phrase anymore, because things have, have really moved on in the last sort of two decades. And where chemotherapy, although it still has a real pivotal place to play in the, in the treatment of mouth cancers, um, to some extent that there are the newer, um, much more expensive, it has to be said, but targeted agents uh, and also immunotherapies that are being used more, more commonly um, within, within all cancers, but also within mouth cancers as, as well. 
And crucially, again, as I'll come on to talk about in a bit, is, is clinical trials. Um, and th this is the way we obviously improve outcomes. And it's small steps, but it's only by making those small steps that you achieve the great you know, ends that we want, which is ultimately to cure more cancers. So next slide, please. So when we talk about how the decision is made, well, it, that's Ali in the back there with the, the blue striped shirt on, and, and that's me in the front with the, I, I don't normally wear my bow. And then that's the surgeon in the middle there. And it's all the other people, you know, the, the radiologists, the specialist nurses, the, the restorative dentists, it's the psychologist, it's the dietitians, it's the speech and language therapists. So head and neck cancer, and, and as I say, that includes mouth cancers, is an extraordinary complex cancer when it comes to treat. And that's because of the complexity of the anatomy, but also the, the functionality of our head and neck and, and how any treatment and any cancer can have a huge impact uh, upon that function. Um, but also cosmesis and how patients look and, and how they show themselves to the world. And so it's therefore inevitable when, when we're needing to manage cancers that we need to have the right people in the room at the right time um, with the right information to be able to get the best outcome and the best approach um, for our patients. So next slide. And I think to describe it another way, I think this was an, a brilliant slide that I got from one, one of my ophthalmic oncology colleagues, um, Mr. Salvi, who works here in Sheffield. And I think this is another way of describing why we need the multidisciplinary team. And it's really because of you know, the enormous complexity of, of what modern medicine entails now, that long gone are the days when it was very simple and you know, surgeon can cut it out, but there was often nothing else could be done. But also we didn't have the research which showed us how important the, the, the other subtleties of, of treatment, but also recovery of treatment were. And so nowadays as specialists, you know, we look at things from, from often quite a narrow um, point of view. And, and that's simply because of, of of the extreme knowledge that we need to have as a specialist. And it's only when you get the specialists that come together that you can see the full picture. And, you know, it's obviously by knowing the full picture that you can then best plan a treatment, but also have the information needed to make the right decisions at the right time um, with the patient, you know, ultimately the, the very heart of this. So the patient is the elephant and we're the sort of specialists looking around at different areas in order to give, you know, our patient the elephant the, the best outcome. So next slide. So what information do we need to know about um, an individual and their cancer before we can then decide on treatment? And this is the amount of information that we're collating and hopefully we have most of this information before we then discuss an individual patient and their mouth cancer within our multidisciplinary team meeting. And the first thing is the type of cancer. And generally in the head and neck, the majority of those are what we call a squamous cell carcinoma, as I've, I've said you know, before. But there are subtle rarities within the, within the mouth, such as you know, certain types of salivary gland tumors or more rare types of cancers like small cell cancer or lymphomas. And it's crucial that we know that before we embark upon our treatment because the treatments individually are very different, but also how these types of cancers behave are also very different. The stage of the cancer refers to where the cancer is in relation to where it started in the patient. And obviously where we're talking about today is, is it started somewhere in the mouth? But then we need to know, is it still just in the mouth or has it spread to the glands in the neck or indeed has it spread further afield to, so to other areas of the body? And the reason that's really important is because if a, if a person's cancer is localized and still within the area that it first started without any spread, then the outcome of treatment is, is, is by and large far better and our chance of cure is far better. Whereas if in the, and, it, and it's a rare situation actually for mouth cancers, but occasionally we do find that a, can, a patient's cancer is spread outside the head and neck, for instance, to the lung or the liver or the bones, when we first meet them. And if that's the case, then unfortunately, we, we can't offer a curative treatment in that patient's case. And it's important that we match the, the appropriate treatment to that patient's cancer so that we can get the best balance between helping the patient um, and not giving too much in the way of side effects or toxicities with the treatment if they're not gonna benefit on, on the back of those side effects and, and toxicity. And it's also for that reason why the fitness of the patient is very important. And by and large, cancers 
in any type are, are a disease of, of, of us as we get older. And that's because of the changes in cells and things. But it also can have an impact because often as we age, and it's not always the case, you know, I see incredibly fit 80 year olds and 90 year olds in this day, you know, in this day and age. But likewise, I, I see patients in their 40s and 50s who have very poor health for, for, for whatever reason. And so making an accurate assessment and, and measure of a patient's fitness is really important because of the treatments we're, we're offering can, can often be very tough treatments. Um, and as such, we want a patient to be able to go through the treatment, complete the treatment as planned in order to get the best outcome. And if, if people are not well, then we're often better reducing down the amount of treatment we give patient to give a better balance between helping the symptoms of a cancer, but also not adding to a, a patient's woes by giving them a lot of toxicity that they may never recover from. And I always think another very important thing to know ahead of time is, is what clinical trials and what research is being done. Because we know from you know, studies and, and questionnaires Patients and, and the general public out there really do want to participate in research on any number of, of different platforms and fields. And this is especially true with, with cancer. And it's because as human beings, we often have a very altruistic approach that, you know, we want to do things to help our fellow human beings, but also to try and improve outcomes and, and develop, you know, new ways of treating things. And, and that's why, you know, our success rates are as they are today, but could always be better. And it's because of previous trials that have been done. And so I want to know what trials are available before I talk to a patient so that when I talk to them about their treatment, I can offer that, you know, as something in addition to, for them to consider and decide. But the research, the trials are always a voluntary thing. There's never a emphasis that they must go into it. It has to be right for, for the individual. And then very, very importantly is, is a patient's wishes, because we can know the type of cancer, we can know the stage of the cancer, and we can get some idea of the fitness of the patient because of the history we take and the examination we do. But, you know, we should never, ever assume that we know what a patient wants. Um, and we should always talk to them about that and give them the information they need to then make the informed decision on what treatment is right for them. And I think this is especially important when we're talking about mouth cancers because the treatments can be significant and, and in, in, in some cases can be life-changing in terms of you know, the, the amount of a cancer that might need to be removed surgically um, or the effects of, of the treatment I oversee with radiotherapy and things on a patient. And so it's not common, but it certainly does happen that we would make a recommendation to a patient that this is the treatment we recommend to give them the best outcome, but a patient decides that that's not what they want and that they're prepared to accept, you know, less chance for cure um, in order to, you know, for instance, not undergo surgery or not undergo radiotherapy. And it's, it's absolutely crucial, as I say, that, you know, we listen to our patients, but we give them the information so that they can decide what's right for them. And often it's a time of, of giving them some time to make, to make that decision and, and talk to their family and go back to talk to, for instance, their GP or other people whose input they value in order to make the right decision. And it's also where our specialist nurses, you know, are so invaluable in terms of being able to talk to patients, you know, at different times and explore, you know, the, the various um, issues and outcomes that they want to talk about. So next slide, please, Ali. So what investigations do we need? Um, well, first and foremost, what's very important is, is taking what we call a full clinical examination in history. And this is where we're getting the information from the patient about, you know, what symptoms they've had, how long they've been present, but also about things like smoking history or the use of betel nut or alcohol intake. Um, and also, you know, any other previous cancer history, for instance, but also have they had any other operations in the past and also quite importantly, family history as well. And then in order to derive the answer as to what type of cancer, obviously a biopsy is needed. And that's where generally the surgeon, but also radiologists, the x-ray doctors often will provide that by doing what we call a core biopsy within the cancer, hopefully within a representable sample in order to then be able to inform us as to what the type of cancer it is. And then in order to arrive at where the cancer is and also to stage the cancer, that's where we do imaging or scans is, as they're more commonly known. And it's important that we do that, the area where the cancer started. So 
again sort of within the mouth and and the oral cavity uh, and typically there is a bit of variation across the country and across the world but typically an MRI scan is, is felt to be the better scan because the amount of detail but occasionally CT scans are, are the preferred option or sometimes it's a combination of the two because they can be complementary. But then also what's very important is we look beyond the site where the cancer started and look at the areas where the cancer could spread. So primarily that's sort of within the glands in the, in the neck, but it's also the chest and, and, and the, the abdomen or the stomach. Uh, and then depending upon an individual, there may be specific tests like a bone scan or more often these days is something called a PET CT scan, which is a combination of a, what we call a positron emission tomography scan aligned with a CT scan, which gives us significant information about the metabolic activity or the, the functional um, aspects of the cancer, which can help us discriminate and differentiate, but also that can be very useful in the follow up after treatment to, to to, to decide what's what, you know, whether the cancer has been treated adequately or whether we need more treatment after that. And also blood tests are, are very crucial in mouth cancers. And, and that's because of the types of treatments we're talking about in terms of surgery and anesthetics, but also with radiotherapy and chemotherapy and the effects that that can have on, on nutrition, patients being able to adequately hydrate and get fluids in, but also in, in certain drug treatments like chemotherapy that we use as well. And we need to know that kidney function and liver function is, 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 is good. And likewise, um, hemoglobin levels or the, the, the amount of anemia that a patient might have. So next slide. So I'm going to now focus really on the non-surgical treatments because, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a surgeon and just want to spend a bit of time talking about radiotherapy and then the drug treatments that we use as well. Next slide, please. So radiotherapy, I, I like this slide because, you know, it, it's Marie Curie was, was an amazing woman and a Nobel Prize winner. And she really is the founding mother of, of radiotherapy. And radiotherapy, when I ask people, is not a treatment that many of the general public know about. They all know about chemotherapy and drug treatment, but actually radiotherapy after surgery is the other treatment that cures cancers um, in, in the vast majority of, of, of cases. And often radiotherapy and surgery are combined together. But radiotherapy is, is the use of x-rays and it's x-rays like you know, listeners that, you know, if you've had a chest X-ray or a CT scan in the past, um, they're the same X-rays, but the, what we do is we use X-rays that are much more powerful, that have more energy behind them. And as such with the energy, what they have is a therapeutic effect as opposed to a diagnostic effect when we're, as I say, when we're taking the images like a chest X-ray. And this speciality grew up during the, the 1900s due to the work of Marie Curie, who is a Polish lady who her and her husband uh, um, did most of their work in Paris. And it was after the discovery of, of radium, the naturally occurring um, radioactive um, mineral, that it then was discovered that the, the healing properties or the therapeutic properties of, of x-rays. And then nowadays, um, by and large, pretty much across the world, we use x-rays that are artificially produced by big machines called linear accelerators. And these were first developed in the 1940s. And by golly, you know, the technology with computers and, and such things, you know, has just changed astronomically in terms of what, of what we're now able to do. And so, so from being quite a crude local treatment when it was first discovered, you know, it, it has become state of the art. And, and that does mean we have better balances than ever before between maximizing the chance of cure but minimizing the, the, the chance of injury and harm. But we must always keep in mind is the, the, the issue, the balance is, is where we're having to treat and the critical structures around which we're trying to treat as well. So next slide, please. So radiotherapy is ionizing radiation and, and how this works at sort of a, a cellular level within a, in a patient's body is that the, the ionizing radiation interacts and there's like a sort of a chemical reaction almost with the water molecules within our cells. And this produces free radicals. And it's the free radicals which actually cause the, the damage that we want to the DNA. Um, and that's the DNA primarily within the cancer. 
But normal cells are, of course, damaged, as I say, because of the proximity that they are to the to, to the cancer or the malignant cells. And it's this damage to normal cells which causes the side effects of radiotherapy, which I'm going to talk about. But what we trade off about when we, when we treat head and neck and mouth cancers is that normal cells, because they're normal, have much more of an ability to repair if we're respectful towards them. And we're respectful towards them by only giving a certain amount of radiation per day over the course of a patient's treatment. But also going back to what I said about, you know, appropriately assessing patients beforehand and maximizing things where we can do to, to maximize that benefit versus the risks of, of treatment. An important thing to say is that radiotherapy is a very local treatment. So the, the, the effects we get really are only in the area that we give it. And that, that's what this slice of an x-ray shows. It's the area within the blue with, with, with the red and, and the, the yellow coloring, which is where the effective dose is, is being given in, in this particular patient with a head and neck cancer. And the slide behind, below these X-shaped things are, are the, is the DNA. That's the chromosomes um, within a cancer that we're damaging. But it's an oxygen dependent process because that is needed. So we need to have tissues and cells that have oxygen in them. And the, 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 the problem we often face in a cancer is because cancers grow wildly, they haven't got the normal functional controls. Sometimes there can be an area within the center in certain areas where, where there's less oxygen. Uh, and that's something that we're always trying to battle against. So next slide, please. So in terms of radiotherapy, we, we can give it with radical, or by that I mean giving a dose, which is the intention is to cure a, a, a patient of their cancer. And that can be given after surgery is given. So, so for instance, if there's certain features that mean um, will improve the chance of cure, but by doing that, we no longer give it neoadjuvantly, although the, the reason I've kept that in, and that means before surgery, is, is because for there's, there's a very small group of cancers called sarcomas that happen in the head and neck. And we rarely, rarely see these these days, but that's the type of cancer where sometimes giving it before surgery can be helpful. But more of that is, is often in, in limbs and, and other areas of the body. And then another very important role of radiotherapy is, is to palliate. And that means when we know that we, we can't look to cure a cancer, but radiotherapy can be extremely useful at improving some of the symptoms that might happen, like for instance, pain, or if a cancer's bleeding, uh, and radiotherapy can be in a very effective approach to that. And the dose of radiotherapy, so there are different doses that we use, and we divide that whole dose of radiotherapy up into a number of smaller doses of what we call fractions of treatment. And th that does depend upon where we're treating, um, why we're treating, and also whether we're aiming to cure or whether we're aiming to palli palliate. And I've mentioned already that it's, it's a local treatment. So next slide, please, Ali. People will have heard of, of different phrases or, or different terminology use. And this slide is just showing that there's, there are different ways of delivering radiotherapy, but it's all radiotherapy. And for mouth cancers, the vast majority nowadays is in the form of IMRT, which stands for intensity modulated radiotherapy. And this is what I was alluding to earlier when I was saying about the, the enormous technological advances. And intensity modulated radiotherapy is, is, is a way of being able to, to very accurately give a high dose to where we want to do and as much as we can reduce the dose to other areas that we don't want to do. But for certain other types of cancers and um, another type of head and neck cancer is thyroid cancer, we often use um, what we call radionuclides where a patient might ingest a tablet and within that tablet is, is, is a radioactive substance which is preferentially taken up for instance in the thyroid gland. And that can be a very eloquent way of delivering radiotherapy. But also it's sort of fallen out of favor with mouth cancers in this country, but in France, I believe it's still quite widely used, which is where we implant um, radioactive needles or what we call interstitial, which means into tissues uh, and also brachytherapy, which can be used for certain tongue cancers or lip cancers as well. Uh, but like I say, is, is that's reduced in, in frequency of use. And then there's also, uh, when people look at radiotherapy, this, this looks like the sort of space age, the gamma knife for stereotactic radiotherapy. But that's again, just radiotherapy. And it's a way of being able to give an extremely high dose of radiotherapy to an extremely small area. But that's not so relevant in mouth cancer because with mouth cancer, we need to treat usually a much bigger area, which is the size of the cancer itself. But also we need to treat the areas where the cancer could be. 
And so that's where these much, 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 much tiny and more focused radiotherapies don't cut the muster, that they're, they're not doing what we want them to do. So next slide, please. And so this slide is just emphasizing what I was saying about how technology has moved on. That as we go from, um, so it's from left to right when we're moving, is up in that top left-hand corner was how we used to give radiotherapy. And that would be that we'd give a field from the right, we give a field from the, from the left and it would all meet in the middle. And you can see that even in, in, in the sort of the, the back of the neck, so, so that's a patient with a neck resting on a, on a couch, on a, on a treatment slice. And what we're wanting to do is to give it where the green and the yellow yellow is in the front there. Um, I think this was a, a, a patient who's having their lower neck treated. But unfortunately, be, because we weren't able to be so eloquent in terms of how we used to give the treatment. And so a lot of normal tissues, tissues that we didn't want to have treatment would get treatment. But then what happened is, and, and this is about 20, 25 years ago that, that this was starting to be developed was intensity modulated radiotherapy or IMRT. And the, the middle photo shows this being given in what we call a fixed field IMRT solution. And this is where multiple fields were used or multiple directions of treatment were used. And what you see is, is it carves out the treatment so that instead of giving that um, within the cave all that treatment, it's now carving the dose around. And so the dose is still received to that area, but it's much, much, much smaller and therefore significantly reduces down the side effects and, and toxicity. And what we've now moved on to on the right hand side uh, is, is uh, rapid arc or a way of giving rotational radiotherapy. Um, and, and this is where essentially imagine that that yellow line as a circle around the patient and those th those slices through like a railway track. Um, that those are all fields. And it means that as the, the linear accelerator, the radiotherapy machine moves around the patient, it's constantly delivering the radiotherapy, but in a way that builds up the dose to where we want to give it and really effectively cuts out the dose to where we don't want to deliver it. And it also means that instead of having to do what we used to do called phaser treatment, where we'd give the high dose for the first few weeks, and then we'd need to give a phase two, a lower dose, you know, to, to certain other areas, but then and boost another dose, and it all got quite messy, we now do it integrated. So what this photo shows is the area where it's yellow and oranges is the high dose, whereas the area on either side, the sort of the horns coming out, are where we need to give a lower dose because the risk of cancer is there, but it's not as high as in the yellow dose. And so it just makes for a much more eloquent and scientific type of treatment and has significantly reduced down the toxicities that we, that we see in patients. So next slide. And it's important to emphasize this point when we're talking about mouth cancer, because we have a cancer that is very curable, but the problem is we have a cancer that sits in an area of us, which is very complex with very, very important blood vessels and nerves and muscles such as our tongue that we rely on to, to feed and swallow and keep you know, our airway safe and, and avoid us you know, developing chest infections and things. And we also know that when we're treating mouth cancers, we do need to give a quite a high dose of radiotherapy because squamous cell carcinomas, which are the ones that predominate in this area, um, do respond to radiotherapy very well, but they do take a high dose. And it's a higher dose, which is in excess of things like our salivary glands and our spinal cord. Um, and so there's, there's a, a quite a narrow therapeutic ratio that we often have to contend with. And on top of that, you know, we're talking about millimeters of space. And so if a patient moves or if a patient swallows, then that can throw everything off. And also as, as patients go through treatment, whether it be surgery or radiotherapy, uh, the, the cancer itself can change shape, it can swell and it can shrink, but also patients do as well, but because of the, um, you know, if they're not taking enough calories in, but also if, if there's swelling and edema or inflammation related to the treatment, then that can change the shape of the tumor and the shape of the, the patient. Uh, and then of course, as I say, if, if we add drug treatments in, what that can often do, and, and the reason why those treatments are given together, is because it can sensitize the tissues, um, you know, not only the cancer, of course, which is a good thing, but it can sensitize the normal tissues as well to the effects of radiotherapy. So in summary, it's a high stakes and, you know, it's a high stakes treatment and it's often described as radiotherapy with chemo is a toxic cure. 
Um, and it's why we have to be very precise and, and take our time in, in doing it properly to maximize the cure, but minimize the side effects and especially the long-term side effects of treatment. So next slide. So before we embark upon giving a patient radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy for mouth cancer, there's quite a bit of planning and stuff that goes in behind the scenes. And so for instance, I've got a clinic this afternoon and I'll be seeing five new patients um, with mouth cancer. And you know, I will be talking to them about why we're doing it, um, what they can expect and leaving them with written information about the treatment, but also talking to them about you know, when it's gonna start. And cause that's the favorite question, you know, let's get going on the treatment. And I always feel like I deflate them when I say, it's gonna take about three or four weeks before we can get started because there's an awful lot we need to do. And a, a couple of the prerequisites in terms of, of head neck radiotherapy, are first and foremost, making sure the teeth are in good shape. So making sure that any teeth in a patient who aren't particularly good or healthy um, are assessed and dealt with before we even start the radiotherapy planning process. And that's because of the longer term consequences of what radiotherapy can do to a patient in their mouth in terms of reducing down the saliva, but also the fact, unfortunately, that, you know, within the United Kingdom, a, a good proportion of the population, unfortunately, don't see their dentist regularly and, and sometimes have very poor dentition when, when they come through with their, for their cancer treatment. And so it's about maximizing the, the dentition at that stage in order to maximize the longer term health and function of, 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 of the mouth and the teeth after treatment, accepting that you know, we're aiming to cure most, most patients. And so if any dental work needs to be done beforehand, that needs to be done first, because then the next step is for the patient to go and have this shell or mold made that you see on the photograph there. And it's vitally important that the patient's mouth and the head and neck region are as it's gonna be when we treat. So there's no point doing this when a patient has a mouth full of bad teeth that then might need to be removed. We need to wait until that's done and then do this properly because it comes back to those very small changes that can make a huge difference in terms of the treatment. But the reason why we use this shell, it's also called a, a, a mold, um, is, is because accuracy and reproducibility of, of the radiotherapy when it might be given over six weeks or seven weeks is absolutely crucial so that we, you know, best balance the, 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 the maximum chance of cure, but with the minimum chance of, of injury. And so it's about improving accuracy and that reproducibility. In other sites of, of the body, when we're giving radiotherapy, we might use tattoos, okay, to, to fix the spots where we need in order to set a patient up day by day um, to, to ensure we're in the right place. Uh, and those tattoos, you know, are not, I love my mum, but they're often tiny little, you know, specks within an area of a person, for instance, on, on the breastbone. But in the head and neck, obviously, that's not acceptable to the majority of patients. So the other object of this shell is so that we can put marks on. And you might be able to see, um, Ali, if you can point out with your cursor, maybe one of the X's on the shell. Yes, yeah, so for instance, there. And, and what we then have within the radiotherapy treatment room where the patient has their treatment, it are lasers that come out from the walls, usually from the sides and also from the back, exactly as pointing out now. And, and that's how we set a patient up so that we can be extremely precise in terms of, of what we're doing. But of course, this, you know, is can be quite a daunting thing for a lot of patients. And, you know, certainly one of the things we're finding more and more is, is you know, patients being fairly claustrophobic. And so what I absolutely heavily rely upon is, is the amazing team I work with within our mold room or our technical room who get patients through, you know, what can be very difficult first steps in terms of getting them to their treatment. But once this mold is made um, and adjustments can be made and, and it's not painful or uncomfortable to have it made, but then a patient undergoes a CT scan and it's on that scan, the CAT scan, that I then mark out the treatment. And then once the plan and the recipe that we're gonna use in order to give the treatment is, is ready, then the patient goes on to one of these machines and that's the linear accelerator. And it's a heavy beast, you know, they, they cost a few million each to, 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 to make and, and get um, commissioned and ready for action. But also what this does is it has a CT scanner on it as well. So that's the arm on the side there, this the square. 
And that also allows us on the actual treatment when patients are having treatment to make sure we, we keep to this reproducibility and accuracy. And the long black line there is, is the treatment couch. So this head shell above is fixed to the top of that couch. And, and then this machine, believe it or not, can turn 360 degrees around a patient in order to give the treatment. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a ballerina. As, as, as I like to say, but, you know, in, incredibly developed and, and um, in terms of delivering the treatment. So next slide. So uh, there's no doubt at all that radiotherapy to the head and neck is, is of, often a tough treatment. And other than when we give very short doses um, for people when we're trying to palliate symptoms, as I've said, but 95% of my work is when we're using very high doses and you know we're, we're giving them to areas where cancer are and, and, and there are definitely side effects. So nobody will go through a course of, of, of radical or curative radiotherapy without side effects. It's impossible. And, and that's because the doses we're using are always at or you know in some cases slightly above what we call the tolerance of the different tissues and the different organs within the, within the mouth and the head and neck area and there is also within any individual you know there's differences it's what makes the world such an interesting place but we know that some people are more sensitive to radiotherapy than others although we don't have a way of testing that up front at the moment but that's research that's being done just as we know that some of us are allergic to penicillin and some of us aren't it's it's down to our genetics um, and how our body responds and interacts with 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 the various treatments we throw at them but also the important thing is, is these side effects, which can look quite gruesome and, and certainly are very sore. So for instance, the mouth, this is what we call mucositis, and that's an inflammation of the lining of, of the mouth. And, and that white area on top is the sort of dead cells that are sloughing off. But what will happen is, is with time, new, new cells will improve and, and that will look normal again. But as the patient goes through that, that's uncomfortable, it's painful. It can mean that, that um, a patient can be at an increased risk of getting an infection, which we might need to treat. The lady with the skin underneath, it, you know, you can just see that almost looks like one big blister. And thankfully that's less common these days because of the technological advances that I was talking about. But sometimes we need to cause that skin to become very sore because if there's lymph nodes just below the surface, then by giving the, the full dose of treatment to those, the skin will inevitably look like that and it will be sore. And you know, part of our job when, when we're managing and looking after patients like this is to reassure them that it's normal for, for what they're going through but also the reassurance that very quickly after treatment, just within a few weeks, that skin will look very normal again. Um, and in some people like the lady in the top uh, right-hand corner, sometimes the, the skin can darken. And, and that's especially prevalent in, in, in Caucasian skin, but in, in people with darker skins, it can go lighter. Um, and that can be a feature that sometimes can carry on. So it's important to use sunblocks, but also moisturize the skin as well. And this little cartoon at the bottom is something that I wouldn't have put in, say, 10 years ago. But again, with this development and the changes that have happened with radiotherapy machines, what we know, because of where the dose is being given and where a lower dose is being given to sort of the back of the head here, that can make people very tired and cause a fatigue-like syndrome, which can happen a few months after treatment finishes. It does improve. Um, but it's something to warn patients about because it's often, you know, just as they're getting over the sore mouth and the sore skin and feeling like they're getting back to normal, whoosh, you know, they can hit, be hit with, with severe fatigue. Uh, and it's important to emphasize the importance of doing exercise and keeping going to, to, to minimize that. So next slide. So, and then as I've, as I've alluded to, there will be longer term effects. So nobody goes through head and neck cancer treatment without being affected in the longer term. But, it, but it's all about trying to maximize the chance of cure and the long term for the patient, but minimize these, these late effects. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, compared to the acute effects, which everyone gets, these are relatively uncommon. Um, but unfortunately, when they do happen, they're often irreversible as well. So they're, they're permanent. And this is where, you know, having knowledge about a, a, an individual's patient susceptibility or sensitivity to radiotherapy in the future will be very useful because inevitably there will be people who need more treatment um, and there will be people who need less treatment. And, and that's why, you know, it's, it's useful to know.
But for instance, the gentleman on the, on the, on the bottom left here has a condition called osteoradin necrosis. And that's where he had surgery and, and high dose radiotherapy to cure his cancer. And he was cured of his cancer. But this was about 20, 15 years later. Unfortunately, um, the, 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 the jawbone, the mandible, um, it became unhealthy because of a reduction in blood supply. And this is caused this ulceration um, in that. And it, it can be, when it happens, quite a difficult uh, condition to treat. And it's why we're very, very, um, very, very keen on the promotion of good oral hygiene, looking after your teeth, and you know, taking a lot of time even before we start treatment to maximize the environment of, of a person before they have the treatment to help to reduce down this happening. The little as, um, picture at the corner where these sort of like these spidery little veins are is, is what we call telangiectasia. And this is much less common nowadays with modern radiotherapy, but we still do see it sometimes in some people, especially sort of at the root of the neck, um, where the dose of radiotherapy might be slightly higher. It, it, it causes no concern that there's, there's no seriousness of it, but it can be a cosmetic um, issue for, for some patients. Um, but, cause, you know, camouflage makeup and things can, can help that. The gentleman on the top right is someone, he didn't have a mouth cancer, he actually had a cancer in his voice box. But I've used this picture really to demonstrate and the, 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 the people in Sheffield might recognize the man standing behind him and I'll, I'll, I'll give a prize to, to the person who does. Um, but, but this gentleman had a laryngeal cancer and had radiotherapy for that. And he was someone who demonstrated after about six months after his treatment, um, significant fibrosis and thickening within his tissues of, of, of his neck. Um, and it also shows the sort of swelling under the chin here, what we call lymphedema, which can happen in, in patients after radiotherapy to the, to, to the head and neck area. And then the bottom right picture is, is a mouth and, and it's there to demonstrate dryness of the mouth. Um, you can see that tongue looks a bit cracked and, and very dry. It doesn't have the wet normal appearance that if, if, if you all look in, your, in the mirror now and look at your own mouth. And it also shows the sort of the, the decay of the dentition as well as, as a consequence of that. So we also counsel our patients a lot to, to go see the hygienist regularly get to the dentist regularly, but also look after the mouth and keep it moist and obviously avoid sugar, you know, coated drinks and, and chewing gum and, and such things. So next slide, please. So moving on to, um, gosh, I'm running out of time and I've, I'm sorry, I've been talking too long. So going on to the drug treatments that we use the term systemic anti-cancer therapies now because it's moved on a little bit. And so chemotherapy is still the main focus, but also immunotherapy is also coming to be. So next slide, please. So chemotherapy refers to what we call cytotoxic drugs, which is cytotoxic means they, that they are toxic to cells. And these again act upon the DNA. So it's the same target that radiotherapy does, but also very much they're nonspecific, but it's a systemic treatment as well. So the drugs used in mouth cancer are injected into a patient's body. And so they go from the top of the head to the, to the bottom of the feet. And that's where the side effects can be more general. Um, but in many patients, it's an extremely useful combination in terms of giving cisplatin drug alongside radiotherapy, because what it does is it enhances the effects of the radiotherapy. So next slide. And th th these, this side effect list is not specific to, to, to mouth cancer treatments, but it was really just to sort of, you know, inform that, that there are quite a myriad of, of side effects and, and emphasize the point that it's not local. This is systemic to the body, um, but in certain areas like within the head and neck because of the, the nerves and things that, you know, are, are, are present here, that the side effects can be quite significant. So next slide. And I wanted just to mention about immunotherapy because this is often the question that a lot of patients ask. And at the moment with immunotherapy, this is where we're harnessing an individual's own body to do the work. So unlike chemotherapy, where the drug acts directly on the cancer cell, immunotherapy doesn't do that. What immunotherapy is doing is it's essentially turning the light switch on in a, in a patient's body to recognize cancers and, and use our body's own cells that are present in all of us or most of us to then multiply and then attack the cancer. So using our body's own systems to do that. 
And that's because um, one of the one of the hallmarks or one of the definitions of a cancer is is that the cancer has this ability to um, almost have an invisibility cloak on when it comes to our body's immune system recognizing cancers. And the, the immunotherapy drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are licensed in head and neck cancer, are all about stripping that invisibility cloak off the cancer and producing the sort of foot soldiers within our bodies um, to, to make the cells that then can attack the cancer. It's not the cure, it's, it's not the holy grail that we've been looking for, but we, we do see some incredible responses, but only in about one in five people. And at the moment in head and neck, we mainly use them where we can't offer surgery or radiotherapy to cure an individual's cancer, but where the cancer is either already very advanced at the, at the point uh, that they're diagnosed, or when the cancer comes back after those treatments. And in, as I say, in about one in five people, we can see very good results, um, but we want to do better. And what we're doing at the moment is trials looking at using these um, upfront. So, you know, before surgery or after surgery with radiotherapy to see if we can better improve cure rates. The next slide. And like I say, this is really just to illustrate that every week um, a magazine or a paper is talking about the, the new miracle drug for cancer. But at the moment, thankfully, you know, it's focused on COVID vaccines. So next slide. So research, next slide, Ali, will be able to go on to. So, so I think this is the, the slide that I wanted to emphasize, and which is so important to me. And, and this is that um, there's a number of trials now that have been published, which show, especially in head and neck cancer, that being in, in clinical trials or being treated in a center like here in Sheffield, where we do a lot of head and neck clinical trials, does give patients a better outcome. And it's not just the patient in, that goes into the trial, but it's all patients treated within that center. And that's because, you know, besides the obvious outcome of, of finding out that a, the clinical trial, you know, shows a better treatment, what it does is it drives up the services, you know, of, of, of everyone, you know, within pathology, within radiology, within clinical oncology, within the surgical team, the nursing team, you name it in terms of better improving outcomes. Um, and, and this is why research is, is just critical um, and why, you know, it's, it's such an important part of, of what we do. So next slide. And I wanted to illustrate this with the de-escalate study. So next slide, Ali. Um, and this was a study that I'm very pleased to see was it was a huge success. It was a very well designed study published a couple of years ago now, but was very much a UK based study. And we here in Sheffield got, got a number of patients into it. And interesting what it was doing is it was comparing in human papillomavirus associated head and neck cancers, looking at our traditional treatment of cisplatin, the, the, the traditional cytotoxic drug with radiotherapy versus cetuximab, which is one of the targeted agents, which is you know tens of thousands of pounds in cost and combining that with radiotherapy. Because the evidence up until this trial was that they do the same, but that cetuximab as yes, it's much more expensive, but actually it won't cause the same toxicities and side effects of treatment um, so that's why we needed to prove it, because there was obviously going to be a cost to the health service. And then next slide. And actually what it showed and, you know, and it showed we should never assume we need to do these these very big clinical trials is that actually it wasn't as good as the traditional cheapest chips, cisplatin with radiotherapy and, and that the overall survival at two years was extraordinarily high you know, the vast majority of patients were being cured, but cetuximab wasn't as successful. And, and, and that is a really, really crucial thing. And very importantly, next slide. Um, you know, this highlights the vital importance of research. And I'll go on to the next slide as well, Ali. Oh, I've missed one out there. But, but essentially what, what it showed was that, you know, it wasn't less toxic either. So the side effects, although they were slightly different, the rate of the severe side effects actually were, were similar. So, but by giving a potentially more expensive drugs, we thought it would be the more fashionable and the better one was not proving the point. And, and this is why research is crucial. We should never assume that we know the answer. We, we have to do research, which involves getting patients in to do. So Ali, I'm very conscious that I'm out of time. Um, so should we stop there or would you like me to talk about anything? Oh, please, continue. please continue. You can finish yours. It's okay. We've okay. got a bit of a um, breathing room for Fine. the next one. Yeah. Thank you. The next slide, please. 
So these are some of the, you know, this is not an exhaustive list by any stage, but I thought I'd just pick up on, on a couple of the trials and, and the, the, the very, you know, the key things about them. So COMPARE trial is, is looking at patients who have cancers within the back of the, of the mouth and the tonsil and base of tongue. And it's looking at our standard of care, which is a seven week wow. chemo radiotherapy. But added to that is one of these immunotherapy drugs that I was mentioning to a drug called Devilimab and looking to see if that improves outcomes and in, improves our chance of cure, but not at the expense of additional side effects and things as well. So that's ongoing. And it's taken a little bit of a hit as all research is done during this time of COVID, but is now recruiting again and, and and we'll, we'll have the results in a number of years because the, the problem with any of these trials, it, it is a, a big investment, both in time, but also money, um, but, but crucial that we support it. Torpedo is, is a really exciting trial because it's looking at proton beam um, radiotherapy, so particle radiotherapy in order to treat cancer. And I don't know how many of the listeners you know, have heard of this treatment, but it's, it's now within the UK, whereas previously we had to send people abroad for this, you know, for instance, to places like Florida or certain, certain continent, countries in continental Europe. But now the center at the Christie in Manchester is open um, and there'll be another center open in London as well at UCL. And what this study is doing, and it's the first UK study using protons as a, as a randomized control trial, and you know, really pleased that it's it's within head and neck and, and mouth cancer, but looking at whether proton beam radiotherapy is better than IMRT, so what we call photons or X-ray radiotherapy, because the suggestion, you know, that the, the, the research that's been done before suggests we won't cure more people with the cancer, but actually we can make those late effects better. Um, and of course, you know, when we're curing people, what happens in five, 10, 20 years time is, is really crucial. The keynote study is, is um, looking at immunotherapy up front in patients with oral cavity cancers or other types of head and neck cancers where surgery is the intended first treatment, but where we know they're going to need multimodality treatment. So where after the surgery, they're going to need to have radiotherapy or chemo radiotherapy under myself. And it's looking at the addition of the drug pembrolizumab before surgery, because it's thought to have a, you know, a response on the cancer that will make the surgery have a better outcome. But then also adjuvantly after the, the, the surgery with the chemo radiotherapy as well. And, and that's ongoing and is an international study that, again, we're recruiting to. And then Innovate is, is not a treatment study. And I think it's in, important to emphasize this is, is that with the human papilloma virus associated head and neck cancers, um, you know, we know where it's being driven by the HPV. We can detect that in, in someone's blood using what we call the serum. And this might be a, a very useful way of detecting how we follow a patient up or you know, how we need to follow a patient up and how certain we can be that we've cured a, a patient of their cancer by looking at the, the levels of DNA um, of HPV within a, in a patient's blood. And so this is looking at patients having chemo radiotherapy or radiotherapy and following them with blood tests and following their progress and things. And so in future, you know, it's, it's about being more intelligent in how we follow people up. So next slide. Press the slide, Ali. So whereabouts are we going? Well, there's still much to do because, you know, what we want to do is maximize our chance of cure, but minimize, you know, the, the effects on the normal tissues around. And so very much the, the direction of future research is, is looking how to do that by the technological developments that will come about, but also by adaptive radiotherapy. And, and that's where personalizing or tailoring a patient's radiotherapy dose and where we treat based on how their cancer responds, but also potentially in terms of their radiogenomics and this individualization of, of, of a patient to give those who need more and more, but give those who need less, less. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's about the combination, getting the recipe right in terms of using these drugs and new drugs are being developed all the time, but how we can schedule them, what dose do they need, when do we need to give it, uh, are all subjects of research, you know, th throughout the world. But also, crucially, is, is the quality of life, outcomes, rehabilitation, but also 
follow up as well, that with new developments in technology and imaging, that potentially can change how we need to follow patients up. And again, find out that some patients will need potentially more follow up, but some patients we don't need to follow up. And you know that can be crucial in terms of psychology and support, because I don't think there's a patient out there who before their next appointment starts worrying about, oh my gosh, what will we find and things. And so if we can be more intelligent with that, it, it really does provide better you know, for our patients. So next slide, please. And so I just now got just you know a few questions of, of these are the top ones asked by patients. So first one. So believe it or not, I am still asked this and I, I tend to smile and say, absolutely. Because especially within mouth cancers, um, we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that when patients continue, continue to smoke, that not only do they get more side effects, so their mouth is sore, they stay sore for longer and there's less recovery, but we absolutely know that smoking when you're having treatment for cancer can reduce the effectiveness of the treatment as well. And so that's why it's really crucial that, you know, we talk to patients, we give them help, and the NHS is better than it ever has been in, in terms of the smoking cessation help that's out there. Uh, and so the other question is about e-cigarettes. And yes, we know they're definitely safer than the traditional cigarette, but we really don't know long-term data. And there were some quite worrying stories and things emerging from the north, from the USA over the summer and spring about lung disease and things happening in, in vapors. So try and avoid, but if necessary, e-cigarette rather than real cigarette. So next slide. This is another favorite one as well. And, and the, the, the sort of the, the, the leaf down there is, is cannabis and cannabis oil um, and quite a common thing these days. It used to be powdered mushrooms, but there was also this book that was in the eighties about, you know, sharks don't get cancer. So shark cartilage was good. But as someone told me, um, sharks do get cancer they just fall to the bottom of the ocean so we don't find them um, and honestly you know if, if we knew of these miracles we'd be using them because it would save the NHS and healthcare systems a hell of a lot of money so there isn't any conspiracy theory out there but there are no known medication medications or supplements like these that we know will prevent or stop recurrent cancer or, or stop a cancer indeed in the first place it's the not smoking that the minimizing alcohol etc are very important as with maintaining a healthy diet and exercise um, is, is the crucial things yep next slide the other thing that's quite common is, is patients wondering how, what sort of persona or what they have to do with their day-to-day -day life when they, they, they've got a cancer or going through treatment with cancer. And very much, you know, it's, it's about continuing to be as normal as you can, you know, while you can. But understanding that as you go through these treatments, and especially radiotherapy and chemo radiotherapy, that when the side effects hit you, you, you do need to adapt what you do and try and have the energy that you have to do pleasurable things rather than the washing up or, or, the, or the housework. But, you know, getting outside, going fishing, um, working on your allotment, going for a walk, you know, is absolutely crucial and, you know, very much encouraged. And even when patients are on chemo, because it's, 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 it's an old wives tale now to say that if you have chemo, you've got to hide yourself away and, you know, shun people because it's, it's about being safe and understanding what to do if you were to develop a problem, but carrying on as normal and getting exercise and seeing the sky is, is really crucial. So keep going. Next slide. And interesting that, you know, again, 20 years ago, um, you know, but patients when they came through with head and neck cancer were often malnourished and underweight, but it's a sign of the times, it's a sign of our society, but it's also, again, related to the human papillomavirus story and, and, and its relationship to mouth cancers, in that we do see people who now come to treatment and are overweight. Um, and so some of them do start saying, well, I don't mind losing weight. You know, it's, you're telling me that I'm going to struggle and, you know, and, and we want to stop you losing weight, but I want to lose weight. And it's really important that radiotherapy or any head and neck cancer treatment is not used as, as, as a diet. Uh, and that's because we know that success of the treatment does depend upon patients maintaining their weight and minimizing their weight loss as much as possible. Because remember, it's through a healthy body that the body can then recover um, 
from treatment in the best possible way, that it enables people to, to stop developing things like infections or wasting of muscles, which again are very important. But what does happen through treatment is often that appetite and taste does get significantly hit for a short time. And then what's important is to develop a sort of a grazing um, approach to food where you have small amounts, but frequently throughout the day, um, rather than trying to sit down to three big meals a day, which often, you know, won't be as successful. But where necessary, we sometimes put feeding tubes into patients if we know it's definitely going to be a struggle. And they can be things like peg tubes um, into the tummy um, or occasionally a feeding tube, you know, into the nose and down into the stomach. But more often, what we want to do is by working with our dietetic services is for them to help and provide supplements and advice and encouragement to, to keep people eating the normal way, because that's what keeps function going um, in the best possible way as well. So next slide. So another very, very common question is, you know, well, what happens when I finish my treatment? Will you be able to tell me that it works? Um, you know, when will you be able to tell me that I'm cured? And in, in terms of breaking that question down, the thing I always say is, is that after a course of radiotherapy, patients will be at their worst, usually a week to 10 days afterwards, because there's a sort of a lag effect in terms of how the side effects come on. But then also really importantly, patients, individuals will never improve as quick as they want to improve. And that's because the effects of radiotherapy then take a long time to settle down. And that recovery is over weeks and many months rather than days and weeks. Um, but what happens then after a patient finishes their treatment, we then see them back in clinic. At the moment with the pandemic, it's more telephones, but seeing patients if, if and when necessary. But they're not rushing into doing any scan or what we call cross-sectional imaging till at least three months after radiotherapy finishes, because the radiotherapy goes on working and having its effect, but also the body healing itself for a good number of weeks after radiotherapy finishes. And so anywhere you are in the world, it will often wait three months before we then rescan. And that scan then acts as a baseline for any future need or comparisons that we might need in a, in a patient. Okay, next slide. And then another thing, and this has really been with the advent of IMRT and with, with the uh, rotational radiotherapy that I was describing earlier, is that what we do nowadays is that the radiotherapy machine has that CT scan on it, because what we want to do is, is take imaging or take scans of the patient in their treatment position, in the position that will be treating them to make sure that we're still on target. And so to, to ensure what we call the quality assurance of our treatment in that as the patients might swell because of the, the inflammation within a treatment or within a cancer, or as the cancer might shrink indeed while they're on treatment, we need to make sure that we're still treating the target accurately, but also avoiding things like the spinal cord or the brainstem, which if they receive too much treatment can be, um, can, cannot be a good, cannot give a good outcome. But very importantly for, for patients to hear is the fact that it, it doesn't matter during the treatment whether the, the cancer shrinks or not, that cancers will, will, will reduce and re respond to treatment in, in a variety of durations. And sometimes in many, it's not until after the treatment finishes where we start to get this reduction. And next slide, I think I've just got a couple more. Um, th this is really, I suppose, you know, we all have bugbears and things that, you know, uh, sort of frustrate us a little bit. And th this is maybe one of mine, because as, as patients describe it to me, when they, they get a very sore throat and mouth, it's not pain as such. And if they don't swallow, they don't get the pain. And a, a lot of people, general population, don't like taking taking painkillers because of the consequences. And it's often things like constipation or feeling drowsy. But as you go through head, neck and mouth cancer radiotherapy, it's absolutely crucial because it's about minimizing this discomfort and keeping us swallowing. Because if you don't use your swallow for, for days and weeks on end, it will be very difficult to regain that function. And the last thing a patient wants to do is to come through their treatment and then, you know, not be able to swallow normally and go out and eat in restaurants and, and eat with family and things. And it's also true that if, if you have discomfort when you swallow, sometimes our swallow is not coordinated. And that can mean that there's this risk of aspiration where whatever we swallow 
goes not down into the gullet and into our stomach and can get dealt with, but can go down into our lungs. And that can cause pneumonias, which can be a very serious and, and life-threatening thing. So it's the loss of function and swallow, which is very difficult to regain, but you know, it's easy to treat constipation or some of the other side effects of painkillers. So please, if offered, use them. Next slide. So this is my final one. So I think just in summary is mouth ca cancer is common and it's crucially important that we have events like this to raise awareness, but to enable early detection so that we can cure more patients. But very much the treatment of what we do does depend upon the type, the stage and the patient's issues. And more, more often than not, treatment is a combination of surgery and radiotherapy with or without drug treatments. And research ongoing is essential to improve outcomes and to prove the benefit for our patient group. And so thank you very much. I'm very sorry I ran over, um, but happy to take any questions if Ali says there's any time. Thanks, Bernie. That was really, really interesting and, and useful. Uh, we have a little bit of time. I'll just read one or two comments of YouTube first. Um, um, and Dana from India said that this is a very good information of side effects and outcomes. So thanks for that. Thank you. And then Zoe Marshman has it's mentioned... Door, Ali. Just hold on one minute. Come in. I'm at work at the moment. The joys of virtual meetings. Virtual phone at the moment. Yeah. About 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Ali. <laughs> no worries. And Zoe has said that uh, what you showed was really interesting about volume of recruitment correlating with survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think this is where head and neck and, and it's often with radiotherapy and, you know, a lot of the developments has come from head and neck because there's always been this need to strive to do better because of the, you know, that that risk benefit ratio that I talked about. And so the clinical trials that have happened in radiotherapy have always, it's been one of the things they've done is look at quality assurance mm -hmm. and how important that is. But it, but it shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that research does drive up standards for all patients. And you know, with all these new treatments that you mentioned, although the side effects have reduced um, the osteonecrosis or the jaws getting affected still remains a problem, doesn't it? Or you think it's got better? Um, I'd like to think it is. And certainly speaking to colleagues up and down the country, you know, that we definitely see less of it. And I'm currently sort of working, you know, with a group looking at consent of radiotherapy and head and neck. And, and that's forced us to look at the research and what the figures are. And yes, thankfully, with the developments in terms of, of radiotherapy and, and how we're better at reducing the dose to the jawbone, then numbers are going down. I think the challenge always is, is that, you know, we need to drive up the standards of, of things like our dental health, you know, around the world, you know, to, to reduce down the chances, because we know there's pre you know, disposition in terms of patients who are more likely to get it um, and, and look at newer ways of treating it as well are important. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Dan Lambert has asked a question. If uh, there is any particular area based on what you see day to day uh, that you think needs a research emphasis? Mm. Well, I, I suppose the, the, the area that's ongoing um, is, is about immunotherapy and bringing that up front. Um, because I, as I say, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, you know, for sure. And, and what I've said is that when we catch these cancers early, we do cure a lot of them, but we don't cure everyone. And, you know, as, as we know from our day-to-day our -day lives, mouth cancer can be a very distressing illness in many patients. And so we, we need to look to do better. And putting immunotherapy in with our standard treatments of surgery and radiotherapy really does show a lot of promise. And that's because radiotherapy it is what we call an immune modulator. So radiotherapy, even if we're giving it to someone's head and neck, does enhance the immune response in the rest of someone's body. And that's why it's really interesting looking at that combined with immune therapy is, is that there's probably a synergistic um, effect between the two, but without the side effects related to chemotherapy potentially, although it's not to say it doesn't have its own side effects. So looking to see how we can harness that, I think is, is, is really, really enticing. But I think the, the other area is, is about looking at an individual, not only the patient's sensitivity to radiotherapy, but an individual's cancer um, to radiotherapy. And, and that's how we personalize what we do and therefore can again better, you know, reduce this, this risk benefit ratio. Mm. 
And how do you feel about communication? I mean, I guess you have to do a lot of talking to the patients. And as oncologists, do you receive uh, training and uh, sort of um, how to sort of communicate things to the patients and speak to them? And because, yeah, it can be good news. It can be bad news. It can be quite challenging. Mm, absolutely. I think I'm a big believer in the fact that you know, you sort of find your niche, don't you, when you go into medicine in, in terms of potentially your strengths and weaknesses and things. But but definitely within oncology training, communication training is, is compulsory. You know, you can't go through it without. Um, and, and that's a very good way of, of honing your skills and, and how you do it. So, you know, over the years, I've worked with nurses, um, the community McMillan team, but also the, the doyens of communication, like Leslie Fallowfield and, you know, participating in re research she did looking at communication within oncology but absolutely crucial brilliant thanks a lot bernie just one last comment the person in the back was a cash by any chance yes all right okay you get a lollipop ali <laughs> <Did you? laughs> <laughs> who's cash but yeah, yeah cash is a larger than life colleague of ours here in sheffield great thanks a lot bernie really really helpful and really nice overview of everything there's lots of comments on youtube people saying how interesting and informative it was and uh, i really thank you for your time and um i'll see you again later in the evening i'll go but see some patients and then I'll, come back. I'll, I'll tell them about virtual fun as well perfect yeah. thanks a lot thanks. bernie bye -bye. All right. see you later bye bye Okay, so that was a really nice uh, session and overview of um, um, oncological treatments for mouth cancer. Um, now I'm joined by an old, very good friend of mine, Alistair Henry, uh, and um, hopefully another friend of ours will be joining Simon Harvey. And the three of us actually used to be senior house officers in maxillofacial surgery together in Sheffield back in 20, 2009, 10. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was a while ago, wasn't it? Um, both Simon and Alistair are also Sheffield graduates, dental school graduates, and uh, Alistair is working as a specialist registrar in oral facial surgery, uh, and Simon um, is a consultant in dental maxillofacial radiology. So I thought it'd be quite nice to actually um, just have a general chat and discussion and share some of their knowledge and experience as well. Uh, 10 years ago, we had this chat that we might actually get to do something together for cancer patients, and here we are. The only difference is, Ali, is that in 10 years, both you and Simon are consultants, and I'm still lowly you're almost, you're almost there. doesn't matter you know any less. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks a lot uh, for joining us. Uh, it seems like you're at work on call. So yeah, I'm actually on call today as well. I've had to cover a call in the last minute. So I apologize in advance if I um, get called away. No worries at all. Um, did you have some slides you wanted to share? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Try and share my screen, so bear with yep. me. Oh, it's asking for security and privacy preferences. Hold on two seconds. No worries. I think I need to quit and come back in, Ali. I'm really sorry. No worries. Otherwise, you can always email it to me and I can project from this end. If you give me two secs, I think if I sign back oh, in. That's yeah, absolutely fine. It should sort it out. Okay. So while we're waiting, I'll just uh, look at some of your comments. Um, I'd just like to reiterate again here, yeah, please uh, do um, try and subscribe to the Oral Health Foundation's um, YouTube channel. And um, do remember about Blue Wednesday tomorrow and the self-checks. Uh, and also please keep visiting the donation page and uh, share it with as many colleagues as you can. And when I said thank you for an excellent session, and uh, Hani is saying that was a brilliant talk, informative for patients as well as clinicians and surgical trainees. Uh, 
then there's another comment excellent job all the presentation are great thanks a lot guys thank you for watching and Alistair has joined us again so let's try this right. can you see my screen yes we can Two seconds. so i've put together a very short um, presentation okay i just want to go full screen yeah aimed at patients primarily Okay, never mind. Full screen is proving a problem. There you, you go. Yes, yeah, working fine. Thank you. Great. So I'm happy to be interrupted at any point, Ali, if anyone's got any questions or anything on here. So as Ali said, I'm a specialty registrar in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Uh, I'm currently based in South Wales. So a significant part of my day is spent looking after patients uh, with oral cancer. So either seeing them on the clinic or looking after them in the theater or on the ward post-operatively. Um, so it's a significant part of my working life. So I just wanted to hit home a few um, statistics or a few ideas about mouth cancer. And the main one is by spotting mouth cancer early, uh, we have a much, much better chance of curing it. Um, we get at the minute, most of our clinics are made up of urgent suspected cancer patients. And the earlier we can get those patients in, uh, the earlier we can set them on a path to diagnosis and treatment. It's much, much easier to treat a small mouth cancer uh, than it is to treat one that's very advanced. And with early diagnosis, um, the Oral Health Foundation quotes a survival rate of uh, nine out of 10 patients surviving. Presumably that means it five years. So the prognosis is good if we can get patients in early. So how do we get patients in to see us early so that we can treat them effectively? So the main thing we need patients to do is to be aware of what mouth cancer looks like, or what it feels like. And there's no one criteria that you could say that mouth cancer looks like. So I think what I would say to patients or people advising patients is, the patients need to become familiar with what their own mouth looks like. So what is normal for them? And then if they're used to what it looks like on a regular basis, they should be able to spot something that is abnormal or something that is new. The Oral Health Foundation has got a few um, things, a few criteria that they would say are suspicious for mouth cancer. And these are widely accepted. So ulcers that don't heal within a certain time period of uh, three weeks generally. So an ulcer is usually a sore patch in the mouth that might be um, a yellow color or a white color. It might be surrounded by a red patch. So an ulcer that doesn't heal within three weeks. A red patch or a white patch is also suspicious or a new lump or a swelling within the mouth or within the neck itself. But as I said, if you're used to looking in your mouth on a regular basis, if anything new crops up, then that may or may not be suspicious. And the best thing to do if, if something pops up is to get someone to have a look at it. And probably the best person to look at it would be uh, a dentist or a GP. Uh, dentists are looking in mouths every day and they're very uh, adept at deciding what, or what is not suspicious. So if in doubt, the, the slogan is, if in doubt, get checked out. So there's a video on the Oral Health Foundation website that tells you how to do a self-check. See if I can get that up. Oops, two seconds. I'm not sure if this will play. Bear with me. Hmm. So there's a video on the website that shows you, it's a 45 second check to assess all areas of your mouth, um, starting from the outside and working inwards. So checking the neck, checking the lips, checking the tongue, the roof of your mouth and in your cheeks. And it's just a simple way of starting and covering all areas looking for important things. I can't get that video to play, but it is on the um, All Health Foundation website. So I've just got some examples of things that may or may not be cancer. These are fairly early 
um, changes, some of them. Um, so if you look at this one, for example, on the side of the tongue, there's this ulcerated area with this white ring around it. That may or may not be a mouth cancer. The only way to tell really is to do a biopsy. Uh, this on the lip again, an ulcerated area. So it's with this whitish appearance and a red ring around it. And then this picture, which hasn't come out very well, sorry. Uh, a white patch on the side of the tongue, um, which again, may or may not be hiding a cancer. So all three of these things, uh, you could make an argument that they need biopsy, which is the only way to tell really uh, whether something is or is not cancer. So as I said, if you spot something new and you're worried about it, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have it looked at. So pop along to your GP or your dentist. If they're worried about it, they will then refer you to a specialist uh, in the hospital, so an oral maxillofacial surgeon. And they will then see you within, the target is two weeks. And that's what we aspire to. So we'll see you quite quickly. Um, and then once you get to the hospital, um, you will initially be seen for a consultation. So that's where the uh, surgeon will go through what your problems have been, what you've noticed when you noticed it, what your symptoms are, what problems it's causing, um, and then they'll have a look at it. So they'll have a look at the, the lesion or the lump or the bump in your mouth. And very quickly, they'll be able to get an idea of whether this is something that's worrying or not. And usually they'll convey their initial thoughts to you. But ultimately, what is going to need to happen is you'll need to have a biopsy. And so a biopsy is where we take a small piece of the, of the lesion of what we're worried about, take a small sample under local anesthetic, so just with injections like you would do at the dentist. Um, quite often and more and more what's happening is that is happening at those initial appointments. So you'll be seeing consultation, examination, and the biopsy quite often will happen at that appointment. And then after that, you'll have some x-rays and scans, which I think Simon is going to talk about, but basically you'll have an ultrasound scan, a jelly scan of your neck, and then a CT scan and an MRI scan, if it's suspicious enough to warrant the scans. And then very quickly, within usually a week, maybe two weeks, you'll be seen back on clinic with the results of the biopsy and the results of the scan. As I said, very quickly, we can get an idea about whether this is something that's suspicious or not. And those thoughts will usually be conveyed to the patient. So the patient should have some idea about whether this is something we're worried about or something that we're not particularly worried about. That being said, about one in 20 urgent suspected cancer referrals that come through to hospital turn out to be cancer. So there's a 19 out of 20 chance that this is not something to worry about. But for those one in 20, we want to catch them early so that we can treat them effectively. So consultation, biopsy, scans, x-rays, and you'll be seen back in clinic. At that clinic, you'll be told the diagnosis. And if um, it's bad news that it's cancer, there'll usually be a clinical nurse specialist, um, the consultant around. Um, in, once you've had the results of the biopsy, you, your case then gets discussed at a multidisciplinary meeting. So that's a meeting composed of uh, pathologists, so the people who look at the um, biopsy down the microscope, uh, radiologists who look at your scans, surgeons like myself who do operations, and also oncologists who offer medical treatment for cancer. That team will come up with um, a potential list of treatments so that might be surgery, it might be surgery followed by radiotherapy or chemotherapy, or it might be um, chemotherapy, radiotherapy in isolation. But we will come up with a proposed treatment and then that will be put to the patient um, because ultimately it's the patient who uh, decides on what treatment they would like to go for. Um, taking into consideration their general health, their age, uh, what their wishes and expectations for the treatment are. So this will be then be put to the patient. So as I said, the main treatment modalities, the main treatment options would be surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. With early mouth cancers, 
by and large, patients can be treated with surgery alone. Uh, and the smaller the cancer, the smaller the operation, the less the side effects and the quicker the recovery and the less the chance it is of coming back. With larger cancer, the surgery becomes unfortunately more extensive and the risk of chemotherapy and radiotherapy increase and the risk of that cancer unfortunately uh, coming back increase as well. So what I really want to hammer home to uh, any patients or anyone concerned is that the earlier they get uh, access to treatment, the, uh, the higher the risk of cure in the long term. And uh, that is all I've got to say, really. Um, if anyone is worried, pop along to your dentist, pop along to your GP, and um, get access to treatment sooner the better. Thank you very much. Um, That's great. Thank you. Chat or take any questions, Ali. Okay. Thanks a lot, Alistair. I'll just stop your screen sharing. Um, so, just for patient medicine, what not everyone probably knows, uh, what's the referral process? You mentioned the two weeks, so... That's right. So the target is two weeks, and that could be started off by a dentist or by a GP or another specialist. Um, so from the date that referral is sent, we try and see those patients. The government target is within two weeks, so you should be seen on clinic within that two-week window. And within the hospital, are there any targets as well that we need to aspire to? So the, from the date of referral, the target window is 30 days to receive a diagnosis and then another 30 days to start treatment. Okay. So start well, the treatment. Getting, we, well, before COVID, we were working quicker than that. Yeah. timelines are unfortunately being stretched. Better. That's the next thing I was going to ask you, how has COVID affected mouth cancer surgeries and waiting lists, etc. and are you seeing less patients and how's well, it working? my experience, most centers, well, all centers are carrying on with the cancer work. We're getting a mix of patients coming in. So we're still getting patients luckily presenting early, but I think probably the number of patients presenting slightly later has probably increased. Uh, so there are some patients that have maybe been a bit reluctant to see the doctor or the dentist um, and that those patients have been held up slightly. So I think we're probably seeing some larger cancers than what we were before. Um, in terms of the treatment, by and large, patients are still having the same treatments that they had prior to COVID. There's been a very small number of cases where um, the surgery has been slightly less extensive with a view maybe going on and doing more surgery at a later date if needed. So, um, Without going into too much detail, um, with a mouth cancer of a certain size, you would remove the tumour, the cancer within the mouth, and then you would most likely offer the patient a neck dissection, so removal of the glands from the neck. So in this small number of patients, we may have decided to just remove the cancer and then uh, carry out observation on the neck. Um, and some of those patients have went on to have neck dissections and some of them have been really in disease free. I think only time will tell whether those decisions have been the right ones, but they've mm. certainly been challenging decisions. Mm. And when, did you, when you remove a piece of tissue, uh, depending on, like you said, the size of cancer, etc., then you guys sort of reconstruct it with something as well. So how does that work and how do you decide what you're going to use? Sure. So... The main message is small cancers you can remove and that's it. You can remove the cancer uh, and close up the defect, um, but only with small cancers. The larger the defect becomes, then the more difficult, the, uh, the more the side effects would be, so the more likely you are to carry out a reconstruction. So as an example, um, if you remove part of someone's tongue uh, because of a mouth cancer, um, and it's a significant portion of the tongue that's then missing, we need to reconstruct that. So one of the reconstructive options we use is something called a radial forearm flap. So that's where we take some skin and uh, fat from uh, your forearm, and we place that into the defect. Now that doesn't become your tongue, but what it does is it fills the gap from where the cancer was and allows your remaining tongue to function 
as close to normal as possible. And so there are various different options of reconstruction um, of varying complexity. Um, but, and the more advanced the cancer, the, the more challenging the reconstruction becomes. And I'm guessing if there's involvement of the jaw bones and if you're removing a little bit of that um, or quite a bit of that, then the reconstruction involves bone from somewhere. That's right. So if it's just a soft tissue defect, such as the tongue, you can replace that with skin and some fat. Um, if you then start to lose bits of the jaw bone because the cancer becomes more advanced, then you need to reconstruct that as well. So we can actually take bone from someone's hip or someone's leg and we can uh, reconstruct a defect in that way. Uh, so there's various different options um, to put people back together again. And that's what it's all about. It's, we need to remove the cancer to get a cure, but it's cure with quality of life afterwards. And that's where the reconstruction becomes important. Um, and that's where we spend uh, long days in operating theatres. Um, yeah. And is it just a matter of taking a flap um, and just plugging it in like a gap? Uh, because how, how does it stay alive? So there's different types of reconstruction. So by and large, the type of reconstruction that we use for um, tongue or jaw resections are what we call free flaps. So a free flap is when you take some tissue, for example, from your leg, and we remove the portion of bone from your leg with the uh, artery and vein that supplied that bone. So we use a fibula flap in, um, for a, a jaw quite often. So we remove the fibula with the artery and the vein that supply that. We then put that into the defect and we do a bit of plumbing. So we connect the artery and the vein that supplies that leg into a new artery and vein in the neck. So that allows blood to flow into the flap, the fibula, the new bone and flow back out again. So that keeps the flap alive. So that is quite an intricate procedure and that's why these operations are so long. Um, and that also means that these patients require very close observation for a period of time afterwards to ensure that that plumbing is still continuing to work. And how can you tell uh, when you've closed everything up, how do you know if the plumbing inside is still working? For example, in the kitchen, we only know plumbing isn't working and no. things stop draining, yeah, and it's already too late. So there's a few ways. So clinically, we can have a look. So quite often we take bone with uh, some skin as well. So you can have a look at the skin to make sure that the skin is the right color. So it's, for example, if it doesn't receive a blood supply, uh, the skin will go pale. Um, or if the blood isn't draining, then the skin goes dark. So we can have a look at it what we say clinically, so we can have a look inside the mouth or at the skin, and that can give us a clue. But we also use a system called Doppler. So that's a little electronic device that attaches to the blood vessel itself. And that tells us if there's blood flowing through the, most people attach it to the vein, and that tells us if blood is flowing out of the flap, which gives us a sense of reassurance that things are working correctly. Okay, so quite a lot of pressure even after the surgery, isn't it? Yeah, I think the first 24, 48 hours is the highest stress. And as time goes on, I think by about five days, most people are kind of relaxed. Um, from so, speaking to patients that have been through this process, um, for patient comfort, most often after a long operation like this, and um, we're talking 12 hours operation, at least most patients are kept asleep the night of the surgery in intensive care, not because they're unwell, but because it's um, a more uh, calm environment for keeping an eye on this flap. So we would observe the flap at least every hour to make sure that things are working correctly. But as the patient wakes up, we still continue to do those observations for a period of time. So that includes throughout the night. So uh, patients quite often get extremely tired by us uh, having a look at the, the flap to make sure that things are still working correctly. And that goes on for three, four or five days usually. Okay. It's awesome. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, do the patients have to be mindful of anything or anything they can monitor after surgery? Um, um, I think the main things that I try and convey to patients before they have these types of operations are, as I said, the bigger the cancer, the bigger 
the operation. Um, so a lot of these patients, if it's more advanced, will end up having a breathing tube, a tracheostomy, temporary tracheostomy in the front of their neck. Um, but that's only temporary, that's usually in until the swelling from the operation settles down. So a lot of patients will have that removed at day five, for example. So during those first five days, it's quite difficult to communicate as a patient. And I think patients quite often find that frustrating, that being coupled with uh, being extremely tired because we're waking them up to check that the surgery has gone well. Mm. Um, so it's not being able to talk, being tired. It's very difficult to lip read from these patients as well because of the swelling and the changes that go on. Uh, so I think it is frustrating for patients, but I think if they're aware that the first few days are difficult, undoubtedly, um, if they're aware of that going into it, um, I think being you know, forewarned is forearmed really, they're more prepared. And as long as they know there's some light at the end of the tunnel, um, I think that's uh, reassuring to them that they know at least when this breathing tube comes out, I'll be able to talk or um, communicate more effectively. Mm. When the breathing tube or the tracheostomy comes out, it still can be difficult because of the changed anatomy and the way that the mouth works. But with time and with expert you know, uh, input from speech and language therapy, um, a lot of patients uh, will get back to uh, perfectly um, comprehensible speech. And that's what we strive for, really, being able to talk on the telephone without anyone asking to repeat yourself. Mm. Very good. Um, yeah, I think some uh, some tools are becoming available as well. I was uh, uh, attending the Head and Neck Conference uh, organized by the Solos recently, and I think um, Chris there was showing, Chris Curtis, who's the, the chairman, was showing this, this board. I've forgotten, I don't know, it's a boogie board or something like that is called. And patients can actually write on it. Uh, post-surgery yeah. and then they press the button and it gets wiped out so that's very easy for them to communicate post-surgery uh, because you remember on the ward after the surgery it was very yeah. difficult to to relate with the patients and uh, and figure out um, if there were any problems and how they were um, coping etc can you, you hear me to, okay so chris wants to donate some boogie boards that would be good yeah, Chris is saying we donate boogie boards to hospital. Then. So, yeah, get in touch with Chris. Uh, Alistair can yeah, use some, it looks like. We're still using pen and paper or a Michael Doodle if we're lucky. Yeah. Those boogie boards are yeah, really good, really helpful. In some patients, um, if you have an iPad before the operation, there's a few apps you can download, hmm. um, which help people communicate as well. Um, so, yeah, communication can be difficult, but there are tools and ways around it which. Um, it's only getting better with time. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the details of Chris, contact details of Chris after the event with you. You can get in touch yeah. with him. Yeah. So he's saying they donate boogie boards to hospitals, speak unique program free to patients. Nice. And uh, they also donated three Dopplers to Preston Hospital costing over 3,000 pounds. So everything costs money. Yeah. So it looks like Simon is still stuck in that meeting. So we can probably just discuss a little bit about the different types of imaging between us. Uh, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess it really depends on what we're trying to establish, doesn't it? I mean, you mentioned that we can use a jelly scan, which actually uses sound waves, an ultrasound scan. Yeah. Um, how mm -hmm. and when would you use that? I'm guessing that's more for lumps in the neck um, compared to a CT scan or MRI scan. So there's... Each multidisciplinary team, so each hospital will have um, their preferred types of imaging. But I think if a patient turns up to clinic and we're suspicious that this is a cancer, then we would organize that imaging um, straight off the bat. So we would carry out a biopsy and organize the imaging. So the imaging usually, by the time it gets through, is a couple of weeks. Um, so biopsy first and then imaging. In the hospital I work in at the minute, so we carry out an ultrasound scan of the neck. So that's looking at the lymph nodes uh, in the neck. So oral cancer or most cancers have a predictable pattern of spread. So for mouth cancers, they tend to first spread to the glands in the neck. Um, so we can pick 
those changes in those glands up using an ultrasound scan. So that's just like um, the scans that we use for in pregnancy to check the baby. So it's a painless scan. If they spot something that looks suspicious, so the radiologist, if they spot something that looks suspicious, they can carry out a biopsy of a gland uh, using a needle. So we call that a FNA, a fine needle aspiration. Um, so they can sample some cells from that and send it off to cytology, to the lab, and they can tell us whether those cells look suspicious or not. Um, so that can help us in deciding what treatment uh, to offer the patient. So that helps us decide about whether the patient needs something called a neck dissection or where we remove those glands from the neck. Other types of imaging are a CT scan. So that uses x-rays to look at uh, the tumor itself and also to see the extent of it. Uh, and then the other type of scan is an uh, MRI scan. And that looks in detail at soft tissue and also helps us decide on the, um, the extent of the tumor. And most places also carry out a CT scan of the chest to check uh, to make sure that the cancer hasn't spread to the lungs, which is rare, but can present in later in more advanced cancers. So there's usually three scans, so ultrasound scan of the neck, an MRI of the cancer, and then a CT of the chest in, in my hospital, but other hospitals might be different. And uh, I guess then we use all that information to come up with the, with the stage for the patient. Just so all of us are speaking the same language, otherwise everyone would be probably using different terms and things. So would yeah. you mind just elaborating a little bit on what staging is? So yeah, following the biopsy and the imaging clinical examination, um, we stage the cancer using, the, the staging system we use is called TNM. So that describes the size of the tumor and how extensive it is on a local uh, basis. So it, it could be something as simple as if it's less than two centimeters on the tongue, then we call that a T1 tumor. So T1 to 4, 4 being more progressed and more advanced. So T stands for the tumor size, and then N stands for the number of nodes. So N not means there's no suspicious nodes in the neck. And then the higher the number, the more, uh, more advanced. And then M stands for whether there's any metastases. So metastases um, outside of the neck, so to the lungs, for example. So the earlier the stage, um, so T1 and not would be the ideal situation where we want to uh, catch these cancers. And it's quite common, uh, um, mouth cancer spreading to other parts of the body. Because I remember when I started or uh, when I was a SHO didn't used to, or student, didn't used to see or hear about that many, but over the last few years, I'm seeing probably more and more cancers which may have spread to other parts of the body, more so than we okay. used to, or is that because the imaging techniques have got better and we sort of got better at picking them up? It might, I, I don't know how the honest answer. It might be because we've got potentially better at treating the primary site, maybe. Um, so with more effective treatments locally, patients are surviving longer and maybe metastases might spring up at a later date. I don't know. Mm. And I good. guess with new imaging techniques like PET, which actually look at the sugar content and give us an idea of the biological activity, yeah. uh, I guess we are probably picking up things in other organs which we may not have picked before. So that could be another reason as well. I know that quite often when patients go to MDT and they've had a PET scan, which, as you say, looks at the metabolic activity of uh, cancers, they'll quite often pick up other areas that look suspicious. Mm. And that can be like a double-edged sword sometimes. Uh, so, they, for example, it might show up a lesion in the kidney and then that patient's treatment is potentially delayed while they have investigations for something else. So um, it's not routinely done, but it, uh, I think it is becoming more common. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned something about COVID earlier and that treatment has carried on as before. And uh, in terms of capacity, do you feel like it's affected things? Because, of course, you need a little bit of time and sort of cleaning and PPE, etc. things changing over. Do you feel like you're operating it as many or the numbers are reduced for that reason just because you need a little bit more breathing space in between? Um, I think the numbers of patients that we're seeing 
probably decreased throughout, especially early on in the pandemic. I think patients were potentially more reluctant to seek attention. So the numbers have tailed off a little bit, uh, although I think they are coming back again now. So our operating capacity had or is still limited, but it wasn't so much of a problem. In I can only talk for what I've seen locally. Yeah. It wasn't so much of a problem because the numbers coming through at that point were reduced. So as I said earlier, most patients that present with cancer are still getting the treatment that they would have had before the pandemic. The operations are probably taking slightly longer because there is increased uh, time from PPE and extra protocols. But by and large, patients are getting the same treatment with a few exceptions. Um, I think it's going to become more interesting now as more patients are coming through, but our operating capacity is still Hmm. more limited. So once those numbers start to go up, it's going to become increasingly challenging to treat these patients. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that I think everyone is concerned about. Um, our operating capacity, I would say, is at about 25% of what it was pre-COVID. What that, as a, as a speciality, so what that means is everything that isn't cancer um, in our hospital has been cancelled. So that leaves us just doing cancer operations, which allows us to provide a good standard of care, mm. but it means that everything else is uh, pushed to the side. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to wait and see how things work out. Um, I mean, even the cancer numbers in terms of new patients and new diagnoses, etc., we don't feel like we're seeing as many as we used to. So when things go back to normal, whatever that normal would be, uh, it'll be quite interesting to see how the NHS and we can cope with that yeah. workload. Because those patients are still out there. Exactly. So they are going to present at some point. Um, so I think the, the message would be if there's something that's worrying a patient now, they should get it sorted sooner rather than later. Because hmm. as I said, the longer this, this goes on, the more difficult it becomes. To, mm. And I have seen a few patients like that that have just been reluctant to seek care. And uh, unfortunately, some of those tumours were very advanced and very difficult to treat. And the side effects were you know, much, much higher. So I think if anyone is worried about something, it's, I can't emphasise enough how important it is to get checked sooner rather than later. Okay, and one last question. I promise I'll let you go after that. Um, so you guys communicate with cancer patients a lot and uh, have to sort of share bad news or good news with them a lot. Do you feel well-equipped that you receive the training, uh, guidance, mentoring to actually break bad news or speak to patients uh, in a language that they understand without overwhelming them and explaining everything to them? Because I remember once... Uh, I don't think it's got anything to do with just experience because I have been in a situation where a very experienced surgeon saw a patient with me and when they walked out of the room, the patient actually told me that they would never allow that surgeon to operate on them because they uh, just did not connect with the patient. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really unfortunate and difficult situation to find yourself in, isn't it? Mm. As a patient, that's a nightmare situation really, isn't it? Um, we're taking patients on a journey through possibly the most difficult time in their life. So I think to be able to connect to a patient and listen to them and identify with them is central to your role as a doctor, as a surgeon. Um, I think it depends on your training, really. I know that it's sort of in the syllabus that um, as surgeons, we are good communicators. How well that's assessed is difficult to assess. It's um, you're being assessed by people who might not be very good communicators themselves, really, when it comes to talking to patients. Yeah, I guess a lot of these clinical jobs, there's a lot of learning on the job as well, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. So, 
most of the communication skills that I learned for talking with patients actually came from my time at medical school. Okay. Um, and in the postgraduate period, there hasn't been much in the way of um, didactic or uh, supervised learning for communication skills. So I think a lot of people just make it up as they go along. And some people are more successful at that than others. Mm. Um, I think everyone adopts their own style when it comes to discussing difficult things with patients. Um, I think for me, um, and what I've been taught is when you see a patient with potentially a difficult diagnosis later on down the line, it's, there's a few sort of key things. One is not to instill like a false hope that this is nothing to worry about because that's, mm. well, that's very unhelpful. Um, if you see something that you think is suspicious or worrying for cancer, then I think it's important to try and convey that to some extent to the patient so that they get an idea of the seriousness of the situation so that they turn up for their hospital appointment so that they're forewarned or at least have an idea of what's coming uh, when they eventually do get that diagnosis. It allows them to bring someone else along to the appointment. Mm -hmm. It allows them to take more information on board. So I think a warning shot to tell patients that you know, this is something concerning uh, and definitely don't belittle what you're seeing because that can give patients false hopes and more distress of them when they do get you know, bad news. And I guess that becomes even more difficult these days with uh, not that many face-to-face -face appointments or like Chris has mentioned as well, the new world is Zoom or Teams and virtual consultation. So do you think trainees need extra training and without the body language, I mean, showing empathy and communicating with people is even more difficult, isn't it? I mean, Ali, even face to face, um, behind uh, a mask it, and a visor, it is so difficult to communicate effectively with patients. Um, again, some people are better at it than others, but it's so, so difficult. Um, virtual consultations, I haven't had that much experience of myself, but I can only imagine, at least you can see facial expressions, I guess. But it's, um, it's difficult to really empathize with someone when you're looking at a computer screen, I'd imagine. So, yeah, I think training would be welcomed by a lot of people. Uh, hopefully we'll not need to be in this world for too much longer in terms of virtual teaching, virtual consultations, but we're here for the foreseeable future. Or, or virtual tones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay. who knows? Thanks a lot, Alistair, for your time and uh, sharing all that experience and knowledge. Uh, I'll let you get back to your own call. Uh, it was really helpful. There's some really nice comments on, on YouTube and people are saying thanks a lot for the informative presentation. Uh, well done. Uh, and uh, I can see that Chris is uh, um, quite sort of interested in what you've said. And he's also mentioned that uh, uh, referrals... Uh, stats that he has show 60% reduction in referrals uh, yeah. in March this year. So yeah, things have changed and uh, we'll see when we go back to the normal and how, how we cope really. Yeah, I think there's a tidal wave of diagnoses coming one day, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. See. All right, take care, Alistair. Thanks, Ali. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. Well Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. So that was Alistair Henry, um, special registrar in maxillofacial surgery. Um, and we just covered uh, just an overview of treatments and what happens to mouth cancer patients, how they send to the hospital and when they go to the hospital, or what happens in terms of investigations and treatments, etc. And our next speaker is, uh, is here as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Curtis. And there he is. Um, Chris is um, a head and neck cancer survivor and the chairman of the Swallows Head and Neck uh, Support Group. And today he'll be talking to us, uh, um, at his talk is titled, From the Cancer to the Palace in Six Years. So I'm quite intrigued by that. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, um, thanks a lot for your time and joining us, Chris. Um, really no, looking forward. 
I enjoyed that last speaker. Um, I, we're just before I go on to my talk, but we are working on a project with DataCan at the moment to show the impact on the five-year survivorship rate going forward post-COVID. And the stats that we have from DataCan are frightening. There are an awful lot of patients out there that are either mm. going to go through the NHS through A&E or with very light diagnosis, which is going to cause problems. So we are going to launch all these stats um, towards the end of the month, beginning of December. So watch this yeah. space. So I'm going to try and share a screen, if that's OK with yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Please do. Um, now then. You'll have to tell me whether this is working. Does that work? Uh, not so far. Right. Let me stop that and I will move that across to there. And maybe it'll work this time. That's the only problem with multiple screens. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just hoping share computer sound. Okay. I'm now going to share it this way. How's that? Uh, Please work. I can't see anything so far. Why not? Hold on. Let me see. Try it. Yeah, I can't oh, see there, anything. There, there, there. Wait, 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 wait. That's, that's, I think this is it. What do you got there? You there? That's it? No? Mm, still waiting. Wow. That should be working. So, let me... Just bear with me. I had it all so well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. It's, it's showing on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's here. Uh, but I've just took it off now. Okay, put it back on. Right. <laughs> it worked uh, eventually. Wait, 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 wait. The last thing you did, just do that again. Yeah. So I'll just bear with me. And let's hope it works. I just hope it transfers the sound as well. So we will do our best, shall we? So I'm going to share the screen again now. Um, Great. So, yep. Uh, take it that works, yeah. It does, yeah. So that's on YouTube. Is it now working? It is, yeah. Perfect. So, um, my talk is cancer to the palace in six years, and it becomes very, very apparent as we go through why I've called it that. Um, so that was me in. North Africa, Tripoli. I was born there in 1958. That is actually me at two years of age in Tripoli. Um, obviously, the picture isn't the real picture, but that is actually me. And I just wonder if I could get, I always wonder if I could go back to that child and say, what will you be doing in 2020? And I bet he wouldn't have said that I'll be sat here talking to you virtually. He would have more likely said that he was going to be a professional footballer, earning lots of money and have loads of wives. So I didn't get the football right, but I am on my fourth wife. So some of it came true a little bit. Um, so my journey has been a journey of a road, ups and downs throughout. The 29th of April is an important date in my, in my calendar. That's the day I went to see my dentist. And I had a lump on the left-hand side of my neck and I had a hoarse voice and I wasn't feeling very well. I'd lost weight, went to the dentist, he checked my teeth, told me I needed a fill in and off I went. So then on the 6th of May, I finally got to see my GP because I was really feeling bad and I had a lump on the side of the neck and Sharon, my wife, made me go and see the GP and then from the 6th of May, and then on Friday the 13th, I was being told I've got cancer. Now, when I got told I'd got cancer, I was a week away from being inoperable. So 29th of April is such a big date because that should have been picked up by my dentist. Now, I do a lot of work with my dentist at the moment that missed that because he now will never, ever open someone's mouth without looking for cancer. So he learned a lesson there. It's not about suing people. It's about people 
we're all human. We all make mistakes, but we have to learn from our mistakes. So then Friday the 13th, I got cancer. And as you'll see, as we go through my journey, and that saying there, cancer is a long, hard journey. It certainly is that. But I met some fantastic friends on this journey that I would never have met if I hadn't have been diagnosed with cancer. So 2011, there's me. Um, good looking fella, I believe. Um, so the wife was telling me at the time. I was 22 stone, enjoying life, never drank. Um, I wouldn't say I've never drank. I'm not, I'm not teetotal and I'd have the odd pint, but I wasn't a big drinker. Never smoked. And in 2000, the May of 2011, I was being told I got cancer. And then in 2012, after the first lot of treatment, that was me there, not at my lowest weight, because in total, I lost 12 stone in weight. Oh. So I even went down further in weight loss than that. And there's me with the same little boy, uh, my little dog, in 2020, looking not too bad and getting back to my normal sort of fighting weight and enjoying life as it is. So that's me before, during and after cancer. Friday the 13th at 11.30, how three little words can change someone's life. You have cancer. And to this day, I really can't remember a lot more after that than three words were told me. And, you know, Friday the 13th at 11.30 is in bedded into my soul. I will never forget that moment when I heard those three words. One of the symptoms that I got that, I, that led me up to thinking that something was wrong, um, I used to, I had a little lump at the side of the neck and it got bigger and bigger. Charon made the appointment for me to go to the doctors and that was about the only sign. There were other signs, but I didn't know they were signs at the time. I was being told on 11.30, on Friday the 13th of May, that, I was, that I'd got cancer. Without Sharon, I wouldn't be here today. I generally can say that I would not have got through my cancer and I wouldn't be a survivor today without Sharon. Suddenly being plunged into being a carer it kind of happens immediately. Especially with Chris, with him switching off, I suddenly had to pick up everything. Sorting out transport for his appointments, making sure his, the food was ordered because he was peg fed, so it's a liquid food they have to have. And then obviously when he came out of surgery, having to look after um, the wounds that he had and also things like cleaning the peg and what have you all need to be looked after. And I just did it to start with and then people start saying you're a carer. You know, it's my husband, you have to do it. We've gone from two full-time wages down to one. You still want to provide for the children, so they've got school trips coming up, going out with friends, you're still trying to supply money for that. That was the hardest bit of being a carer. A typical day, the ones that stick out are probably when he's being peg-fed, so we would go to bed at night and we would attach Chris to a feed that sits at the side of the bed and we would go to sleep and probably about three in the morning You'd be woken to, oh, it's, it's broke. And basically the feed comes off the peg, but the feed continues to pump into the bed. So suddenly you're waking up to a soaking wet, stinking bed, because it's like a thick strawberry milkshake. You come down in the morning, you sort the kids out, you take the kids to school, you go to work, you come home, Chris is sat in the same seat. He's not put the washing out, he's not put a wash in. He's down in the dumps, um, he's needing another feed. I think help from people is, is great as long as it's what, you know, what is going to help you. Things like being an ear to, to listen to you is really helpful because you just need to get this stress off you sometimes. You know, sometimes it, it would be nice to have a meal cooked, you know, just turn up with a lasagna at the door or something like that. It just, just takes that little bit of pressure off you having to do those extra things. So during my cancer experience, um, early doors, I felt that I needed to talk to someone that had been there and wore the t-shirt. When we started The Swallows, um, it was really about the patient needing to talk to another patient. But it made me start thinking that 
carers need to talk. You know, when I looked back over my journey, it was that frustration that I didn't talk to anybody about anything. So I got more on board with you, didn't I? And then we decided that at these meetings, we have patients and we have carers, but we need to separate them because they need to be able to talk openly about their feelings or what they're going through. It's all talking about survivorship and giving people that hope. And that's what The Swallows is all about, is giving people the hope that they can beat the cancer. Merck, through its Embracing Carers initiative, is asking for your support to help carers. And you could help them by picking up their prescriptions. You could take their children to the park. You can drop their kids off at football. Carers would appreciate any time you can give them. So join Time Counts. So, um, I put Sharon in there because it's important that we remember our caregivers. Um, this talks about me going from cancer to the palace in six years, but I would never have been on that journey without Sharon. So it's important that we never forget our caregivers. Without caregivers, the NHS would implode. And there's a difference between a carer and a caregiver. A caregiver is someone that is employed, paid, and been trained to be a carer. A caregiver is someone that is, you know, a secretary one minute, and then you come home from hospital after diagnosis and you become a caregiver. And Sharon never wanted to be a caregiver. It wasn't something we got married for her to do. So I think it's important that any health professionals that are out there now, remember the difference between a carer and a caregiver. I honestly believe in all cancers, not just head and neck, but what we should be doing is calling our people that look after us a caregiver, because then we can recognize that differently to a carer. Sharon never applied for carer allowance because she never thought she was a carer. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until afterwards she suddenly realized we were actually entitled to carer allowance, but she never saw herself as a carer. So one little word can make a massive big difference into this journey. So please start thinking it as a caregiver, not a carer. So what was my diagnosis? That was my diagnosis. As far as I'm concerned, I had throat cancer. They give me all those th that big top words at the top there and HPV 18 plus. They told me all this, what you see there on after I got told I'd got cancer. I can't remember that. I have a box down here that I get out every now and then, and it must have 60 pieces of paper in still to this day. And that was all what they gave me over a two day period. And the only time that box ever gets open is when I'm trying to find something for a talk. But it never got opened when we needed it. It just stayed in that box. But that's what I had. But as far as we were concerned, it was throat cancer and it was at the base of my tongue. That's all we needed to know. HPV 18, never heard of it. I thought I had HIV, because that's what I heard. But it was HPV. Six weeks radiotherapy, they told me 65 greys in 30 hashtag of XRT. What the hell does that mean to me as a patient? I've just been told I've got cancer and then they're hitting me with this sort of stuff. I'm gonna be once a week chemotherapy, cisplatin. Yeah, right, okay. And I'm going to have a right and left neck dissection. And you're going to have a feeding peg. What I didn't know, that feeding peg would be with me for three years. And I didn't eat or drink for three years. And I lost over 12 stone in weight. And because of that, I got depressed. And because of that, I was suicidal twice. So, you know, but they just tell you that as a matter of course, as a matter of fact, that's what's going to happen to you. But the good news is you will survive the cancer. And I also volunteered for the original pet neck study. Now, it's quite funny that because I've been working on the new pet neck 2 study with um, Mary and Joe in London. And then I got the box out only last night to do some work on this presentation and found my original papers that I signed to be in the pet neck study. <laughs> quite hilarious, really, um, how things have come around. So during my treatment, I needed to speak to someone that had been there and wore the T-shirt. That was my big, big thing that I wanted to do. And there was nobody. So what helped me getting through my 
out the other end of my charity was, out of my treatment was developing a group that would look after other patients and would be supporting patients and would be there to talk. My background is marketing. So I started to work as if it was a customer asking me what they wanted to do. So I started putting a plan together. I designed all the graphics and designed all the brand and all the logos. Um, and we're called the Swallows because we struggle to swallow. No rocket science behind the name. So it worked well. And yeah, and it's all about supporting. So it was born in the November 2012. We needed £5,000 in the bank to become a charity. We'd done a fundraiser at the beginning of November and raised £18,000. And then that started the charity off and we went charity status at the end of November. What is the Swallow's vision? It's to help each other. It's to have fun. Meet every month without fail. And March last year was our 100th consecutive monthly meeting here in Blackpool. We have never missed a monthly meeting. Even through COVID, we have never missed a monthly meeting. And you'll see how we do that. Enjoy each other's company. Meet like-minded people. No one is ever turned away from our meetings. We have patients there. We have carers there. We have family members there. We have family members there without the patient and the carer. We have patients there without the carer. We have carers there without the patient. No one's ever turned away. One of the stories I can tell you is mum and dad sits outside who are the cancer patient and the carer. Their 15-year-old boy comes into the meeting and he never misses a meeting. But now he understands that dad can survive because he's amongst other survivors. And his biggest thing was mum and dad had no money so they took his mobile phone off him because they couldn't afford it. So the group bought a monthly, a, a monthly contract for the son. And now he can communicate with the world again. Makes a big difference. No judgment. So there's no judgment with any of us were in that meeting. It's, it's a safe environment with no judgment. Medical staff are invited, but it's not a right to attend. And when medical staff come in, we ask them to dress normal and not in their medical clothes. And to be fair, we also ask them to say what they want to say, take a little bit in and then make their excuses and disappear because we know the dynamics change when you have a medical person in the room. And it's open to everyone affected by head and neck cancer. That's literally anybody. So we have people that have had eye cancer come into our meeting. The only thing that we will try and steer away from is brain cancer because it is so specialised we collaborate with a brain cancer charity that we try and refer patients to because we feel that none of us can support brain cancer because of the issues they go through. So what do we do? Majority of our activity is support and it will always be support. Um, we have a lot of awareness. We buy equipment for hospitals and for patients and we have various other activity around other stuff that we do as well. That's a picture of a boogie board there. That's an old boogie board. We now got the new style and I contacted a company in, in, in uh, America who I forced them with a little bit of storytelling to donate a hundred boogie boards to us. They cost 60 pound each. So we've got a hundred boogie boards and we send those out to hospitals and patients so that they're not using pens and paper. Um, so what have we done over the time? We bought that piece of machinery there for Blackpool Hospital, which cost us £36,000. It's an early diagnosis machine, and Mr Nygam has already said that he has caught more early diagnosis with that machine than he ever would have done before, so it's saving lives. We spent over £25,000 on patient equipment. We've done over 100 consecutive monthly meetings. We now support over 20 hospitals here in the UK. We have over 7,000 patients and caregivers. We have our, our patient book, which is now in Spain, the US and Australia. And we always print 10,000 copies at a time. So we're working on edition three now and edition three we're about early in the year. But because we need more books, we've just reordered another 5,000 to get us through the back end of this year. 
and we spent over seven thousand since COVID started. Seven thousand pounds is spent on our support boxes that we send out to both hospitals and to patients. <clears throat> They're just a selection of some of the hospitals we deal with currently. Just a very short selection. We also collaborate around the world with patients and caregivers and other groups and other charities around the world. And we also very much collaborate with the hospitals around the world, especially with our International Head and Neck Cancer Conference that we put on every year, which was at the beginning of this year. I think Ali, you referred to it early on. Um, this year, we had over 1,500 people on it over two days. And uh, it was fully packed, as Ali will tell you. We have patients, we have health professionals, we have all sorts of people talking. Um, next year it's in Cardiff and there'll be lots of promotion stuff added, so look for it. We also have our radiotherapy mascot. And what we try and do is take that scariness away from radiotherapy because the mask is scary enough. So what we ask patients to do is instead of destroying it at the end, celebrate what that mask has done to you. That mask is, could possibly have saved your life. So yes, we know it's brutal. Yes, we know it's horrible being pinned to the bed. But actually, if you had to have a shield because someone was going to come up and shoot you, you'd celebrate that shield because it's protected you. This thing called a radiotherapy mask has actually possibly saved your life. So why not decorate it and then let's celebrate it? So we have lots of masks like these. These are all patients that have decorated the mask. The one that you see on the right hand side, which has got the swords out of its back, is a 15 year old boy that had internet cancer. The one in the middle, which is the mask, obviously looks like it should be on stage, was actually an actor that was in Phantom of the Opera that then got mm -hmm. diagnosed with throat cancer. You've then got the mask Tutankhamun, and you've also got our Barbie dolls. So Ken and Barbie. Are, um, they go absolutely everywhere. They go all abroad with me. They get pictured everywhere. People have photos taken with them. And they go on, they're on a world tour as well. Ken's actually had a peg fitted. So if I lifted his shirt up, you can see a, a peg fitted. Those radiotherapy masks you see, Northampton actually put them on the table and fitted their masks. So Ken had his first. He then met Barbie and now they're having a relationship. And very shortly, they'll be getting married and the wedding will be on Twitter. The reason we do that is just to raise that awareness, a bit of fun around radiotherapy. So and then we have our Lego models that you see there, a CT scan and a radiotherapy machine. And we use those in education around schools and young people, because, again, it brings it home to people what it's really like to have radiotherapy. <clears throat> there are support boxes. They are jam-packed with products that is, that is available for people with side effects of head and neck cancer. The one that you see that says Oralief on it, that's packed with things for dry mouth. The one on the right with all the food from Ames, that is all high energy food. All these companies donate it to us for free, but each parcel costs us about 10 pounds to send out. They go to either a patient or a bigger box to hospital. So the picture in the middle is the box that we sent to three nurses in a hospital so they can still give them out to patients. Um, the, the board that the lady's holding in the middle is the new style boogie board. Mm. And as you can see there, when we send these back boxes out, it's actually a lorry that comes and picks them up. We're sending that many out now because of COVID. So the support boxes are a big part of what we do at the moment. Um, and the patients, absolutely, the things I get back from the patients are when they arrive, it's like Christmas. And now I'm dealing with all my side effects with all the products. <clears throat> HPV, we were one of the big campaign drivers to get boys vaccinated. And that's the picture that um, some young kids drew in, a, in a, a junior school. And they said, and the boy said, why me? Why can't I have the vaccine? Such a powerful picture. We used it in the campaign and they also done a video to go with it. So we used that picture plus the campaign video and targeted government on the basis that under equality, if you give girls something, then you should be giving it a boy. And we won that argument and now boys 
are getting vaccine for HPV. Whether you believe it or not, whether you don't want to do it, whether you do do it, it's totally irrelevant. What you should have is the choice. And the boys now have that choice. Up till September last year, they never had that choice and that was wrong. So that's how we drove to get HPV vaccine for boys. <clears throat> Whether we like it or not, our next generation of patients are born with mobile phones in their hands. I don't know how mothers now are giving birth with babies coming out with phones in their hands, but it seems they are. And unless we start medical people and the whole medical society starts getting together to understand that, then, you know, I mentioned it earlier on, you know, we're getting people doing reviews over team and over Zoom. And I had done a presentation to um, a university last week with all the future medical people and the idea they were going to communicate with me and none of them knew how to do it over Zoom. That to me is frightening because they're our next generation coming through. And they all admitted no one's given training how to do to actually deal and communicate locally over the internet. So we've now generated an app and it's a app for head and neck patients. Eventually it will cover 220 cancers and it also links to the hospital. So the hospitals get an iPad and they will have real live data coming from their patients 24 seven. That has been written and we've done it over two years and we're, gonna, we're actually gonna launch that before the end of the year. And we are looking for hospitals to try that and research it, whether it works or not. So that is coming, whether people like it or not, because our next generation are born with mobile phones. <clears throat> We've been trying to get this off the ground for some time. It's our restaurant card. Obviously, with COVID, it's been put on the background. But the idea is, whenever I went into a restaurant, because I struggle with dry mouth, you can't eat big meals, you can't eat certain foods. And you almost have to stand up in embarrassment to explain to the waiter why. And then when you say to the waiter you need extra gravy or you need it mincing or you need something doing special to it, it's like, well, why? So then you have to explain I've got cancer and, and it's horrendous. So the idea with these cards are is that the restaurant will be, will be taught and educated how to deal with head to neck patients. So if I take that card in and show it to the waiter, there is no questions asked. When it goes to the kitchen, it's very much like being a vegan or one of the other things that happens. Mm. The chef and everybody in that, that restaurant will know how to deal with that patient. It's all been approved. It's all been sorted. We're just waiting for COVID now to stop. And hopefully we can start working on that and during 2021 actually reactivate it and get it live. It will make one heck of a difference to patients. We hope that it will get them out the house and start communicating again. We hope that they'll start socialising again. And, you know, timing might be good because restaurants will want public to go back in. So we might just be able to work on the back of that and get sponsorship from restaurants. Um, I keep mentioning it about our caregivers. Our caregivers are so, so important. They have an impact as well with this cancer. So what we tend to do with our meetings are normally is when we meet on a month to month basis, we bring them all together and then halfway through the meeting, we separate them. So we always have two rooms. So the carers will go in a room, the patients go in a room and they all discuss their issues separately. And then we bring them together. As soon as you separate them, all the problems come out. When you bring them back together again, they protect each other. So that's the reason why we do it that way. But obviously COVID got in our way. So what we do now is we do it online. So we started in the March and had about 30 people online. Our monthly online meetings are every second Wednesday of the month. They start at 6.30 in the evening, finish about nine, as long as I can shut them up, because once they get going, they never shut up. Um, and they finish about nine o'clock. It's all online. And last month, we had over 120 people online. So, and they come from all over the world now. So it's very much like a mini conference without all the formality. We have speakers, we have people talking, it's an open session and it's open to anybody. So if anyone's out there is interested in coming on to one of our meetings, 
The next one is the 9th of December, starts at 18.30, and we've already got over 100 people registered. So please, if you want to come and see what patients are really saying, get onto that meeting and join in. You're part of our family. Anyone that's watching this is part of our head and neck family. So please come and be involved and meet the rest of the family. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a flavour about one of our meetings. Tonight, we've got Australia in the room, we've got USA in the room. Just thank you that I can be here. Chris Lewis is my favourite Crystal Palace fan. <laughs> I didn't want to bore everyone, to be honest. This guy's worth following on Facebook. If nothing else, for his socks. No one needs to hear this again. Hi! <laughs> it's good to see some of my friends uh, from the Netherlands and from Romania and India. So, has anybody any questions for me? All health for me, I'm a tooth geek, so I can't help get a bit excited about teeth. So, I think it's really good. I have no issues talking to companies and embarrassing them to give me products. Fantastic. Is anyone on the call currently undergoing treatment? To be told that I only had six months to live was, was really shocking. But it'll be interesting over the coming months how that's going to affect patients. Charlie, horses in my neck, some dry mouth, but in general, very good. George, it's great to see you from Romania. I love the haircut. I have a lot of opinions, so I don't want to go there. I get no sleep for 24 hours. What? You know, we've got to work together to support patients and carers. And it's a wonderful thing that we've got the technology to do this, isn't it, Chris? Well, I'm a self-proclaimed expert. I love having to wear a mask. Through it, we're doing good. We're, we've got a great team. I hope you can all see my film that I produced and directed. I mean, it's such a privilege and resource to be amongst everyone tonight. Do you know what you remind me of, Derek? I've just realised. Captain Bird's Eye. That's the one. <laughs> So oh, that, that's just a, a little insight into one of the meetings. And trust me, it's two hours of that. Um, we're a great believer here of laughter is the best medicine. And if you have a laugh, it's very hard to feel sorry for yourself for those split seconds. So we try and make it so that everyone has a laugh. So please try and get there. I wouldn't be doing my job right if I didn't bring up some figures. So these are our figures from a, from a recent survey. So in 2015, 625,000 patients were struggling with side effects. They forecast in 2013, 1 million would be struggling with side effects. These aren't side effects like taking a tablet where you can stop the tablet and it will go away. These are side effects that once they're there, normally stay there for the rest of your life. The top five, physical, emotional, practical, financial, and spiritual, they were the top five. So a recent study, data from 4,000 cancer survivors, 4% head and neck. So at the 4% of head and neck, 83% had difficulty swallowing and speaking. 88% had dry mouth, thyroid issues, altered neck dysfunction, and then it goes on and on. But the biggest one that they all said, there was lack of communication between the patient, the caregivers, and the medical professionals to warn them. So I understand the issue with warning people, because if you warn them too much, they may not go through the treatment. If you don't warn them, they're gonna moan at you at the end. It's a fine balance. But I do think if someone asks you that question, then like my oncologist said to me, if you ask me a question, Chris, I will give you the answer and the honest answer. Be careful what question you ask me. So we were always warned to be careful of the question we asked. But we know that if we'd have asked him a question, he would have given us the honest answer. So I think that's possibly one way. Because some people want to know everything. Some people like me didn't want to know a thing. So I know that medical people have one hell of a battle to win there. So I wanted to compare that, what was described by patients. So I went out on my own survey to over 7,000 patients. Dry mouth changes in saliva was the top one. Taste changes, 
risk of tooth decay and bone damage in the jaw was the other one. Changes in eating and drinking, such as difficulty swallowing. Changes in hearing, pain and stiffness in the jaw, the neck and the shoulders, and changes how you look. That was their top ones, which isn't much different to that, but a bigger, and these were real patients telling me the truth, mm. being asked by a fellow patient. And I think that makes a big difference in any survey. So the clinical effects for head and neck, dry mouth, difficulty in swallowing, weight loss, they're all there. But the big one there is on the second column, it says survivor's guilt. You wouldn't think that would be there, but actually I know of about five or six patients that was prepared for the worst. They went through all their treatment, they came to meetings, and in the end, they admitted that the only reason they were there was because they were feeling so guilty that they had no side effects. And within a couple of weeks, they went back to work. But they felt that they still had to come to a meeting because they were feeling so, so guilty about having nothing. And I think we tend to forget about that one sometimes, that people are out there still having problems. And the other one, obviously is the lymphedema. That is sort of just put to one side and unless you live lymphedema, then it's not just a swelling, it's more than just a swelling. Dry mouth, best way I explain what dry mouth is. If you haven't got dry mouth, you've not been through radiotherapy and you're sat there as a medical person that's never had head and neck cancer, you'll be seeing burger and chips like that one is on the left hand side when i look at burger and chips it's cardboard and because what i have to do is i have to eat it get it to the back of my throat because that's where the natural gravity takes the food down then i have to put water in my mouth and wash it back down again dry mouth is not just dry mouth live with dry mouth and you would never say it's only dry mouth if you want to know what dry mouth is really like, try the 60 second cream cracker challenge. Get six cream crackers on a, on, a, on a plate, no water, get a time clock and see how many you can eat in 60 seconds. If I tell you the world record that stood for almost five years and the world record stands at four, I live with that and so do other people with dry mouth. 24 seven. That's what dry mouth is like. Try it. Impact on quality of life. I'm a great believer in survivorship is not survivorship without quality of life. When I'm talking to drug companies about new drugs, the first thing I ask them is what impact is that going to have on quality of life? Because no more do we just want to get to five years where the health professional is saying, I'm really, really pleased you're cured of cancer. This is not just about being cured of cancer. Head and neck cancer is quality of life and impact on quality of life. It's so, so important. Loneliness, treatment, mental health, communication, living with a fear of reoccurrence, side effects that never go away, lack of community medical help because they don't understand it, financial burden, relationship and family understanding, getting back to work. If you've ever been over 50, getting over cancer and then try getting back to work. It's bad enough over 50, getting back to work without cancer. When you start telling future employers that you're recovering from cancer and you've been off for five, six years, trust me, you very rarely get a phone call back. So that then has an impact on everything else. Quality of life is all about survivorship and survivorship is not survivorship without quality of life. You really need to really understand that. I don't know whether you're all aware of this, but head and neck cancer is literally in the top two of all cancers for suicide. It has a 40% higher suicide ratio than any other compared cancer. If that was breast cancer or bowel cancer 
or prostate cancer. It would be all over the news and there would be mental health coming out of your ears to protect them. Because this is head and neck, then it tends to be forgotten about. Mm. Yet we're in the top two. Why are not psychologists part of the MDT? They should be right at the heart of that MDT. And people like Alex King, who was on our conference last week, has proven that A, it saves the NHS money, but also it captures people early enough that they don't get to that stage. That, that little quote there, I never expect you to answer the phone at 3 a.m. That was on our 24-7 line. We take the call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was a call at 3 a.m. It took us two hours to calm that guy down because he'd had enough and he wasn't going to go back for treatment. So he just said he wants to end it. He's going to end his life. I can't take any more. The end's enough. So we spoke to him about two hours. We spoke to him the following day on the Sunday. He went back to treatment. And the other week, me and Sharon got a big hamper through saying, thank you. They've just told me my cancer's gone. And without you guys, I would have given up. That shouldn't be our job. Mm-hmm. You know, we're a patient organisation that support and help which we don't mind doing, but we don't get paid for it. We get no funding from the NHS. We are self-funding, and this is a service to the NHS completely free of charge. So commissioners should be falling over backwards to give us funds, but they don't. That should not be our job, but we will continue to do it because someone's got to do it. But that suicide rate has got to be taken serious. Cancer is a terrible, terrible disease. It's a rotten disease. There's no easy way of saying it's going to be a good trip. I was diagnosed in 2010 with mouth cancer and I was devastated. In 2008, I was diagnosed with um, cancer of the Is it froze, Ali? Yes, it has, yeah. The moment it changed was when the doctor said to me that he was going to refer me to the local hospital because he thought it was cancer. I'm living proof of the progress this field is making. I've come a long way. Mm. I've come a really, really long way compared to how I was. Uh, what it is down to now is me accepting it and building my life. This is the road on which I believe progress lies. And this, of course, is why you all are here today. Straight away, you, you just think, well, that's it. I'm, I'm, you know, there's no hope. I've not remembered the following week. Um, it was information overload. Everybody was throwing questions at me. Everyone was throwing information at me. I became a bit of a recluse to start with. I wouldn't even go out the house. I became a nurse, which I wasn't, I'd never wanted to be a nurse and I found that quite difficult. Where do I go from here? I would advise anybody that's gonna go through this, who's just been diagnosed, for instance, to seek out help as much as they can. You will be in places throughout that journey that you think that there is no hope whatsoever, but trust me, there's light at the end of that tunnel. What you've got to do is find that light and hold on to it. We ventured out, Julie and I, through a supermarket. And this was my first trip to a supermarket since the operation. And they had a little boy there, about eight or nine years old. And he kept looking at me. And so I said to his mum, I said, I got a disfigurement. I said, um, but your little boy keeps looking at me, can I talk to him? Mm. So I sort of got down on my haunches and I said to him, are you looking at my face sometimes? Mm. And he said, yeah. And because of his curiosity, I gave him a little 
story about how it came about and what it was. And he said, well, how did you get the cancer? And at first I was a bit lost as to what to say, but then I said, well, I believe it was because I used to smoke cigarettes. Mm. He says, I'm never going to smoke. I said, sorry, couldn't you? And what that little boy said did so much for me because if nothing else, that little something so ain't gonna smoke, he's not gonna get cancer. <laughs> that's that's how I looked upon it. Yep. And bless him, he made me feel so good that day. Mm. Because I was able to open up to somebody. I know he was only a young lad, probably doesn't fully understand it, but I think I did a bit of good there. With this room full of men and women like yourselves, devoted to this field, pushing it forward with every case you take and each patient that you treat, we can only imagine what the next century will bring. And short of that, we can look around and we can say that something is working. So that was a, just a little clip there from some of the patients that have obviously done films that we've worked on in the past and including ourselves. Alfie, oh, little story, always makes me think that when you're in that shopping aisle and you see somebody, how come it took a young lad to talk to Alfie and open Alfie up? How easy would it have been for adults to do that? How easy would it have been for somebody else just to turn to Alfie and say, you're all right? I wonder how many other Alfies are out there today and tomorrow wandering this world, waiting for someone just to say, how are you doing? What's your story? And that always, that always upsets me every time I see that because it took a young lad, and I know children, bless them, have no filters. And I think we get those filters as we grow up which is a shame in some places, but it's a true story. And, you know, it helped Alfie. So lessons to help patient and caregivers, and then I will hopefully wind up. Improve community support. Improve understanding of side effects within the community. I know you guys out there dealing with us every day of the week does, but we tend to forget that when we're in the community, those guys have got to pick up the pieces. And I think they should have more training and more help and more support. Engage with charities like the Swallows who specialize in supporting head and neck cancer. I think the Macmillan do a fantastic job, but they're like going to a GP. They're very generic. You know, when I have throat cancer, I want to go and see a specialist who deals with throat cancer, not someone who also deals with breast and prostate and everything else. I want to go and see a specialist. So why don't you guys deal with a specialist charity similar to ourselves. Why should we have to come looking for you? You should be coming looking for us because we specialize. And like I've seen in the past, we raise money and get funds that Macmillan would never be able to do. So Macmillan have a place and they do a great job, but start using the experts like you're expecting patients to do. Improve quicker access to psychologists during post-treatment and during treatment. Get them involved in the MDT. I know it's all about funding, but there are models out there that prove to commissioners that it saves money. Commissioners are accountants. So start treating them like accountants, get the business model so they can't say no, get the actual patients to say they need it. And there's no reason why it can't be embedded into every MDT. If one hospital can do it, every hospital can do it. Improve better action. Are you there, Chris?
think Chris has been disconnected. Just wait for him to reconnect. Thank you for joining us, Eva. Can you hear me okay? Okay, we're just trying to figure out what's uh, happened to this stream. So just give us a few minutes. But as you heard, I mean, some amazing work done by Chris and his wife, Sharon. And there he is. He's Sorry, back. Alex. Sorry about that. No worries. Everything okay? You. Yeah. So that's me finished, Ali. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Chris. And, uh, you know, just you really opened my eyes. I mean, I sort of thought that I understood a bit about the patient perspective, but what, what you've shared and what you've shown is just, I just had no idea how how bad things can get and it's it's really upsetting and I wish I could do something to help. Um, I think you are, Ali, by doing sessions like this because it gives us the opportunity and I know you've got Eva coming on, which she's phenomenal. Um, but it's having sessions like this that we as patients have the opportunity to talk to you medical people in a safe and open environment. That's so, so important. So you are helping in your way. And what we hope is if someone can just take one thing out of this and change the way they work, it's worth me spending an hour talking and two hours preparing. And so you are doing your bit. Don't ever think you're not, but it's it's a long road, and there's a you know we haven't got a perfect system, and the day we have a perfect system, then something's gone wrong because we will never have a perfect system. So, it's just having the opportunity to put what I found over nine years to you guys, and you just hope that things will start to change, and you hope then that people will start contacting us and that we can help them to create those changes. Mm. So, yeah. You know, a lot of it is sort of bureaucracy in the NHS as well, unfortunately. Uh, the number of times, I mean, I've had the names of swallows come up, but for some reason we just never really work with you guys or utilize your expertise. It's just, uh, just a no-brainer for me. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, we are called the National Health Service, but we're far from national. Um, I was just really I mean some of the ideas and things you've done is amazing the radiotherapy mask thing was just brilliant I mean what a, what a great idea to to celebrate what you've been through uh, but I mean I spent a few years uh, as a junior trainee in maxillofacial surgery oral maxillofacial surgery and I always thought when we saw a new diagnosis diagnosis of patients the amount of information that was just being hurled at the patient was just too much and even as a dental professional I just thought even I'm struggling to cope with all this and how would the patients be thinking right now and then you spoke about asking the right questions and maybe not the medical professional not sharing all the information and and I think you're you're spot on because in, it's called informed consent for a reason and unless you have all the information and if you decide not to have the surgery that's absolutely fine mm. but not sharing that information with you is not fine yeah so I review a lot of um, clinics here in the UK so I get invited in to review how they deal with patients and I give them an honest review and I have a flagship that I've always seen and I will always talk about. Richard Simcox, the way he deals with his patients in Brighton are phenomenal. Patient information has been the bugbear of health professionals and patients for years and years. The way Richard does it is he records every conversation and he tells the patients from the minute they sit in that seat, don't worry about taking it in because you are going to be told so much information today, you cannot retain it. But what we're going to do is at the end of the day, we're going to give you a CD with all those conversations on. 
we want you to take it away, listen to it for two or three days, and then come back with your questions. When I spoke to them patients, A, I never saw a glazed eye, and B, none of them had a problem with information overload because they all waved their CD in front of me. Mm. How simple is that? Mm. Why can't every hospital do that? Richard Simcott and his team do it all the time. The patient sits in one chair and everybody comes to him or her and they all get everything recorded. It's an incredible way to get rid of information overload. Yeah, it's a great idea. So, so that's, but I, what I got was that. That's my box hmm. from 2011 and it's full of stuff. And how are we supposed as patients after being told you got cancer, then take that home and read it. It's just, it's crazy. Mm, and it's yes. a subject that has to be looked at, but it's been looked at for years and years and years and spoke about for years. What we need is action now, not talking. Yeah. So don't get me on that soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'd just like to say thanks again, Chris, for your time. No and uh, just using that... Um experience to actually have the drive to help others and going through so many difficulties yourself is it's just brilliant and amazing and uh, i'm really grateful for all the work that you're doing and also for your time and sharing your thoughts with us no problem and hope and, to uh, see yeah, more of you and uh, uh, be a sort of more active part of the solos hopefully in future perfect well if there's anyone out there obviously wants to get in touch they can go through yourself valley or go through our website it's either way but i'd love to speak to more people and what i'm gonna have to say is you've got two incredible ladies coming up soon you've got eva who is if she doesn't make you laugh and smile then you might as well go home and just get in the back and then you've got ross and i hope she's got her toothbrushes with her because these two ladies that you've got coming up now are incredible ladies and I will certainly be staying on just to watch them. I'll get on YouTube and watch them. So thank you for the invite, Ali. I Amazing. wish you the rest of the good luck for the rest of the day. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys themselves. So enjoy yourselves. Thanks so a thank lot. There's, there's uh, two or three comments. Uh, I'll just read them yeah. read them out to you. First of all, Eva is saying uh, good morning from Florida to us. <laughs> and just rubbing it in a bit. Um, <laughs> Then we've got uh, Haley Leach on YouTube. She's saying that that was a great talk, Chris. You're very inspiring, and she will look into the solos. Oh, nice. Uh, and we've got multiple people saying it was a brilliant talk, uh, and they really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, and, yeah, just generally people are just, they found it very inspiring. So thanks a lot for all that you do. No problem. Yes. Chris, I would love if I could get a copy of that video and share it here in the United States. I will send it over to you. Thank you. I will send it over to you. And we missed you this year at the conference, Eva. I oh, know. We missed the dancing and the rapping. <laughs> you always do such a great job, Chris. Great Listen, work. forget Ali. Me, you, and and Josh would just talk for the rest of the day. Forget the rest yeah, of them. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I think I think you guys do a much better job, and people find Listen, it a lot Ali, more interesting than seeing you me. Should have met, you should have had some time for just us three to talk. We would have entertained everybody. <laughs> yeah, true. That's true. But I'm gonna go. So thanks, ladies. Talk to you all uh, again soon. Okay. Thanks, thanks Ali. Thank you. You know what? If you want to fill some space, you could always show my oral cancer rap. Uh, no, oh. <laughs> I can't do rapping, but I will put it. I will put it out on the internet so people can see you rapping because that's something to watch. Yeah, okay. I can put it in the chat too, so you have it. <laughs> yeah, if you want to put it in the chat, I'll, I'll put it on. Uh, Eva, I'm just going to yeah, take a it, five, it. ten, five, ten minute break. And yeah. then we can start with... Uh... Her rapping is legendary. All right, let's hear some of it then. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, Joss is a great rapper. Oh, wow. no, no, after, no, 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 no. Especially no. after a bottle, of, bottle or two of wine, she'll rap no. with anybody. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> right. I'm going. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye, Bye Chris. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Oh. Welcome, Joss. Welcome, Eva. Hi, Ali. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Good Hi, to see yes. you guys um, virtually, finally. I know, finally, I know. Thank thanks you a lot so for much. all your help. Uh, thanks for Thank you. your help today.
So I'm, I'm just going to, oh, have you sent the video? I'm going to play the video. People can watch that and I'll just quickly go and grab something because I've been going since 8 a.m. So just give oh, me five, okay. 10 minutes uh, and then I'll, I'll be back, all right? Let's see. So there's the video. Let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Hey.
All right, thanks a lot for waiting. That's okay. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Halfway through the day. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot for joining, Joss. I know you, you're very busy, um, but uh, yeah, really grateful for your time. And do you want to share your screen? Certainly. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. No worries. Feel free to start. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I hope you've enjoyed um, Chris's lovely presentation. Amazing story. And um, I was very inspired by Chris actually a few years ago when I met him, uh, a couple of years ago when I met him at a dental show. And after I met him, I came back and I had to write this particular article and I'll discuss this further on uh, down and as we go through. So yes, mouth care, Cancer and Collaboration is the title of my presentation. Here's my dog represented and doing her blue lip selfie. So uh, yeah, we'd like to get everything involved, including my dog. So a little bit about me. So I started in the Royal Navy in 1987. I served nine years. I started as a dental nurse and uh, then passed to be a dental hygienist, did my course and qualified in 1992. So I've been qualified a little while, um, did my nine years and here's a photograph of me. I often refer to this as my dear Juvalo photo. Um, when I left the Navy, I then joined the NHS. I worked for a lovely practice down in Devizes. I work in general practice here in Confident Dental and Implant Clinic. And I also work in Gloucester and Cheltenham in MaxFax. So today is my Tuesday and today is my sandwich day. So MaxFax this morning and at my lovely practice here in Stroud for the afternoon stroke evening. So I was a pro national award winner, Dental Hygienist of the Year in 2018. Uh, Phillips winner, went to San Francisco, amazing conference they took me to there along with three other amazing winners. Um, I was a finalist this year for one of the charity uh, categories. Um, I've been published in dental and medical publications, which is just fantastic. I was chuffed to bits when my article was accepted by the British Journal of Nursing. I started having my conferences actually inspired by Chris because it runs on a similar line. It's about collaborating lots of different professionals and sharing knowledge. It's very important we share knowledge because every day is a school day. Um, I'm a clinical ambassador for the Mouth Cancer Foundation. So I'm hugely, hugely proud of being an ambassador for the Ca uh, Mouth Cancer Foundation. This month is very busy and it's all about raising awareness throughout the year. And this month, as you know, is Mouth Cancer Action Month. I'm a UCOMIC team member, so I'm uh, part of the United Kingdom Oral Management and Cancer Care Group. It may be a group that people may or may not have heard of. Um, it's a team of amazing professionals who talk about guidelines and guidance for all cancer treatment and what they can do to help the professional, but also to help the patient. Part of Public Health England, obviously gov.uk now, um, delivering better oral health, version four, of the updating the oral cancer um, section to that. So I saw a draft of that, an amazing meeting. I learned an awful lot that day. I've seen the draft and um, it will be lovely to see the final documents, which should have come out this summer. Unfortunately, obviously COVID sort of stalling that a little bit. And during COVID, I thought it might be a good idea to start a master's. So uh, I'm doing my master's in advanced and specialist healthcare. And as you can probably guess, I'm doing a lot about mouth care for cancer patients and seeing what I can do to sort of improve things, improve things. So that's a little bit about me. So mouth care, cancer and collaboration. So following this, um, the presentation you'll have a better understanding maybe of the mouth care of a cancer patient and the importance of collaboration and you know understand the difficulties of mouth care well if you've heard Chris's story and you've listened to that you will you will know about how dreadful parts of that journey can be uh, for the patient before during and after treatment so long-term effects for our patients we have to really look after them and I'm passionate about the mouth care because it's long-term care that keeps them as the dentist surgery not having work done keeping them healthy and keeping them in the right place so very powerful story from uh, Chris and you will hear from Eva Grazel and I've heard her speak a few years ago and she was on the stage here in Cheltenham speaking alongside Rachel Parsons so patients powerful story it makes you it inspires you to want to listen and to do something about their journey 
So why is this topic so important for us? So this is a photograph I took when the Terracotta Warriors came to Liverpool. And this was two years ago. And so this photograph I took of what they think and how they, the Warriors were put together. Um, I like, I think it sort of represents us with the patient. So this could be all medical professionals around the patient. It could be medical and dental professionals. It could be lots of different professionals around this patient, helping them on the journey and somebody is guiding them at the front. Um, and I, I love this photograph it means a lot to me um, so we have to think every every little cog works together and we've, we've got a part to play it improves their journey and keeps them healthy so my resources so delivering better oral health now gov.uk have a uh, delivering better oral health 100 pages this is on page eight and nine so this is about our high-risk patients how can we look after them and it gives us evidence-based information so for our children it gives us information and for our adults so it's all about keeping their risk as low as possible for tooth decay gum disease and it, it all works together so a great document so these are the Royal College of Surgeons uh, guidelines updated in 2018 so the oral management of oncology patients requiring radiotherapy chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation on here is a great piece, uh, one page, it tells you about the pathway that should, it's the way it should happen for all, all our cancer patients um, and which order it should be in. So it's guidelines, we like guidelines, we like evidence-based guidelines and these are excellent. So these are Ucomic. So Ucomic is, as I say, an amazing group of professionals all to do with cancer care, different, different professionals, so radiotherapists, surgeons, immunotherapists, there's, there's loads of different professionals and the guidance is great. So please feel free to go to the website and have a look at the guidance there. And this final resource I always um, quote because it's for specialist pharmacist services, it's actually for professionals in the NHS, but actually when you look at this document, it's a great document. And on one of the pages, I'm a visual learner, I like this algorithm because what it does, it takes you through the stages. So if a patient comes to your practice during treatment, you're able to say how you're supposed to treat them if you, if you can, where they are in their journey. But when you read further on into that document, it actually says, please refer back to oncology. We need more collaboration with oncology. I'd like them at the end of the journey or certain parts of the journey because some patients are on treatment forever. So I need to know when they can or when they're healthy enough at the right time for them to come back and see us in, in surgery when they're not neutropenic. We're not going to cause problems. They will often come and it's important that we collaborate. So yes, more collaboration needed. That's my big passion. So these are the four major resources that I recommend professionals um, to go to. So mouth care for the cancer patient. So as Chris <laughs> mentioned, I'm often standing here with a, a bunch of toothbrushes. Um, I've literally just arrived here, so I haven't got these, but I would have done if I'd known. So yes, they're normally sticking out because there's so many different things that we can recommend. So mouth care for the cancer patients should in fact read mouth care for the patient living with cancer. There's a big drive to change this terminology um, as we don't say elderly, we or aged, you know, there's different things that need tweaking slightly. So it should be called mouth care for patient living with cancer. So this is Bertie. Bertie was a relative of mine. Bertie was a dental phobic. Um, so he really didn't like coming to the dentist. He had very ill-fitting dentures at the start of his journey. Um, he lost an awful lot of weight during his journey and his dentures didn't fit very well then. And he had further teeth removed and they really didn't fit. So it changed his ability to eat, the nutrition he was getting. Um, and I tried everything for him to help him with his mouth. So the impact of cancer diagnosis. So you will have heard Chris say those three words and he doesn't remember anything else. You have cancer. It's a, a diagnosis. And but it affects so many things around our lovely patients. Finances is often what they'll first be thinking about because they may well have been working. They'd never thought they'd have a cancer diagnosis. So do they have debts? Do they have mortgages to pay? Um, you know, finances can, you know, have they got family to support? It's a big topic. So oral health 
if, especially if they're not if they're dentophobic, would not be high on their list. Finances usually are. As you will have heard from Chris's story, he had some major, major lows in his journey, financial reasons for that. So it's important as healthcare professionals, we listen to our patients. There's a lot that we can do by listening and then signposting them if we feel that they need some extra support and help. So fatigue, the inability to sleep, stress and worry. So fatigue, I often mention to people if they haven't heard me speak already, I talk about the spoons theory. When I've been to various Macmillan days, they've often talked about fatigue. And if you imagine as you're a regular person with no cancer, you have a journey through your day and you get up and you go to work. Well, you don't in fact just get up and go to work. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you have a shower, you brush your teeth, you put your makeup on, you put your clothes on, go downstairs, have your breakfast. Now, every one of those activities will use a spoon. Now, for us who don't have cancer, we have as many spoons as we like. For a cancer patient, they may actually be shortened to possibly 30 spoons that they have for their day. And you think about how many spoons you may use just by getting up and going downstairs. And what you have to remember is to save a spoon. Don't use spoons from tomorrow. And you have to be very careful. So some, for most of our patients, we get up and go as we've always done things, not had anything that can stop us. If you Google the YouTube about spoons theory it's very interesting and the story behind it is a lady who had lupus and her friend her very good friend who'd known her for many years so what it's like having lupus and she's like we well, you know you know go to the appointments and things and they were in a restaurant so she was like no 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 what is it really like so she gathered up the spoons and she gives this story and so it's a very good way of being able to explain to patients slow down do what you can do be prepared to actually say, sorry, I can't make that appointment or sorry with a friend or sorry, I can't make that cup of tea. Or maybe I've really got to think about what I need to do this afternoon because I've used up a lot of spoons this morning. So it's it's a great way of being able to help patients understand fatigue. So inability to sleep when we when we're stressed, we we sleep badly and sleep is we're all much, much better after we've had a good night's sleep, aren't we? and worry. So worry, who doesn't worry, but worrying after you've had that diagnosis, worrying about the unexpected. So they're tired and they're fatigued. So it's important to remember all these things when we're looking after our patients and just picking up on points that we might be able to just help with. Relationships and intimacy. So when you have a head and neck cancer patient who's had major surgery, and they have a loving partnership, but are they still able to kiss? Are they able to still make love like they used to? It's an important topic because a relationship is really important and diagnosis of cancer can blow your world apart. For head and neck cancers, it can be quite extreme. So it's something we wouldn't necessarily talk about with a patient, but it's something to be very aware of. So who else does the diagnose effect? So you will have heard about Chris and his passion. It's not just him that had the diagnosis. It was his family as well. It's like dropping a pebble into a lake and the ripple effect. It affects everybody around that patient, around that person that's had the diagnosis. So carers support with the swallows is fantastic. And we've got a helpline at the Mouth Cancer Foundation. So there is places to sign post people too so and not just the patient because the patient they have a lot of support the carers uh, their support is getting better but they want to be able to talk about things that they won't necessarily be able to talk about the patient and they just want to get their worries off their off their chest and be able to speak to somebody somebody that will listen to them and listen to their worries and fears so it's a, it's good to remember who is around this patient Statistics and raising awareness. So here on the screen, you can see some great leaflets and information. So it's important to raise awareness. This is what this month is all about, raising awareness. Statistics, absolutely. People like to know numbers. For our head and neck cancer patients, it's about early diagnosis is better. So we need them to be coming to the dentist. 
a lot of patients don't come to the dentist COVID times this is really difficult um, so when they do get to come when the doors are open better they're able to make the appointments hopefully they're not dentophobic like Bertie who you saw um, we can have a feel around the jaw we can have a feel in, inside the tissues we can feel down the neck we can feel all the way down to the clavicle so it's important that we can pick up potentially early signs and there's many early signs so as you can see it's about the checking this is the mouth cancer foundation leaflets fantastic where to check in the mouth but also look at the symptoms listen to our patients if there's something's a bit different or they're a bit worried about potential earache or a cough or sore throat or something that's going on longer than it should be it needs checking out so this month is fantastic for raising awareness, very important we do this. As we can see, over 8,300 cases each year. 78% of cases are over 55. So it's important that we talk about smoking, drinking and HPV. I ask all my patients when they come in, I said, are you aware of the, why we're doing this? And they'll say yes, or if they say no, I'll explain to them. It's about checking out for anything that doesn't feel quite right and potentially head and neck cancer. And it's not to make them scared. It's not to make them worried. So if they do get something, I'm hoping they're more likely to come through the door saying, do you just have a check of that? I'm just a little bit worried about that. I'd much prefer that. So for average age cases over 55, I have cases that are much younger than this, um, but it's important to raise awareness. Mouth cancer is twice more common in men than in women for lots of different reasons. What we need to do is keep checking everybody. Don't assume it's all men. Um, I do have some women that come and see me and they're, they're seeing me three monthly just to help them with their mouths in max packs and I have two ladies in my practice here. Raising awareness and having anything checked that doesn't feel right. Like any other part of the body if we have a lump or a bump or a sore patch or something that doesn't feel right it's good to get it checked out. We need early diagnosis for the best long-term results with head and neck cancer patients. So yes, raising awareness, make sure that you put information on your social media, in the windows of your practices, um, really make sure that everybody knows something about mouth cancer. They know about other different kinds of cancers that are more um, widely known, but we need to raise the bar with mouth cancer and with our Mouth Cancer Action Month. So some side effects of treatment. So here we go. Here are some of them, just some of them. There's many more. So dry mouth, uh, decay, sorry. Serostomia is another word for dry mouth. Oral mucositis, ulcers and halitosis. So I'll take you through each one of these, if that's OK. So decay. So if you have a dental phobic and they come in and they are they have teeth like this. We know 50% of the population don't come to the dentist. So every opportunity counts. So make every contact count is what it's called, MEC. So why have they got tooth decay? And what can we do about when that is fixed? So potentially in MaxVax, the poor teeth with a poor prognosis will be removed. And they'll be sent back to the dentist eventually for having any fillings and things like that done. If they're able to be done before they start their treatment, so if they are having radiotherapy, it's important that they're seen and seen early. Give them some oral hygiene advice and uh, they will be certainly put on a prescription for high fluoride toothpaste and we get them sorted with some fluoride varnish once they come back to us in clinic. They'll often be high risk for tooth decay because of what they need to eat and drink. And as a hygienist, I would always be right, you need to eat your sugars four times or less per day. When they go through their treatment, we need them to eat and drink absolutely anything and everything they can. So my role in the hospital with our MaxVax patients is to protect their teeth, help them protect their teeth. Once they've been through treatment, it's then about lowering their risk, seeing what their previous habit was like. Why did they get holes in their teeth like this? Potentially, what can we do about just changing your habit a little bit so that we keep your risk as low as possible? So looking out for tooth decay with these patients is huge. And so it's all about keeping them healthy. They do need to eat and drink everything and anything. And they were very honest when I lost my face to face. And I had to do phone calls from the hospital and they put me on speakerphone and they'd say, oh, 
I'm glad I can tell you I had like a straw it was like a jam donuty spongy thing for breakfast and I was like great please get it down your neck they lose an awful lot of weight generally in um in their journey especially with radiotherapy so we need to keep the calories going in and keep their weight up so oh gosh let's go backwards so food, swallowing and impact on patients socially. So you will have heard about Chris talking about actually going out for meals. I think he will have covered that. This is a book that's great. Um, Brenda's Easy to Swallow Cookbook. It's an option um, for people who are struggling with um, eating and drinking. It's about textures, about taste, their taste changes. So it's called Disquisia. Um, lovely Brenda created this book with lots of top chefs. She didn't unfortunately get to see it published, but it is a great go-to book and it's available on Amazon. Um, so it's an option for patients. So food, swallowing and impact, impacts on them socially. So it's, food is really sociable, isn't it? We're around tables, we want to eat with people, but they might be aware of how their mouths are sounding. They might be making noises. Sometimes they just can't eat the volume they ate before. It takes them so much longer to eat. They might need a lot of sauces on their food. Um, it's all those things that we take for granted, um, which impact on our head and neck cancer patients. So dry mouth, you can guess, dry mouth here. I've got a plate of crackers here. So I often show a video. I don't think I've got it on this uh, presentation, but when I heard, uh, Chris talk about cracker challenge I then got him to come and speak to our group of hygienists and I got them all to do the cracker challenge so the cracker challenge is how many crackers can you eat in 60 seconds or in one minute and so it gives you an idea of dry mouth you might get to two and a half possibly nearly three the world record is four I certainly can't do four but it gives you an idea of what dry mouth can be for chemo patients this may be only a short term problem, but for our head and neck cancer patients who've had radiotherapy where it's affected their, the function of their saliva glands, this can be a long term effect. So if you want to try and see what it feels like, you can have a go with this challenge, um, but it makes you uh, a lot, have a lot more empathy for our head and neck cancer patients if you were to do this. So this is my lovely group. I'm hoping this is going to play. Okay, so I'm hoping you're able to all listen to that so that we could um, just show you what I did to my lovely friends. Um, yes, they're still good friends. And it just gives you an idea, as much as this was a fun day and we did this, um, it gave everybody a really good idea about what dry mouth actually feels, or short term, what dry mouth feels like. So oral mucositis. So this is where the lining of your mouth, potentially all the way down the GI tract, become very inflamed and sore. So there's gradings for this oral mucositis. And when I heard a lovely uh, CNS nurse, a clinical nurse specialist talk about this, she said, think of pizza and how it burns your mouth. It burns and it's sore. She said, but it, think of it hundreds and hundreds of times. And this is potentially what oral mucositis can feel like. And that when I look at this picture, you can't unthink it anymore. So oral mucositis is, very important to be aware of. It's one of the top reasons that patients come back and are admitted, head and neck cancer patients are readmitted into hospital. So there are various things that can be prescribed that can help our patients, but it's incredibly sore and it can be long term, sort of two weeks after radiotherapy. So once they finish their treatment of radiotherapy, it carries on burning for another two weeks. So something to be aware of. Ulcers. This is a very tiddly ulcer. 
patients can have whoppers of ulcers. And if you think you've got a patient who's got a dry mouth, they're trying to eat and drink everything they can, and the ulcers can be quite a problem. Many of our head and neck cancer patients, they will be peg fed or they will have other feeding tubes, which can actually help to give them their nutrition. So two weeks into the radiotherapy, a lot of, the, a lot of them are sort of slightly irritated by the peg, um, but actually they then start to need it as their mouth gets sore. Um, so we need ulcers to be, not be there really. So it's being aware and trying to help them with anything that can keep their mouth pain free. And last one, halitosis. There are many, many problems with head and neck cancer treatment, and I've just picked five here. Um, but halitosis, so for a lot of patients, when they have their treatment, they start to create a, a thick mucus, and this cannot be pleasant. They're coughing it up all the time. It can be quite smelly, it's quite sticky, and there's various mouthwashes that could help a little bit, but patients are aware of it. Um, and keep everything as fresh as possible, keep everything as clean as possible, depending on how sore their mouth feels. So what is available to help? So this is my dining room table. And at the beginning of COVID, I did a couple of webinars. And so I went around my home and I picked up all my bits and pieces, which I fortunately had to give this webinar. And yes, I am a magpie. Um, so there are lots of options for what we can use to help our patients. So we have toothbrushes so toothbrushes they may be on electric toothbrushes sonic toothbrushes manual toothbrushes it depends on what works for them as they go through their treatment depending on how sore their mouth is they may well come off the electric toothbrush they might prefer a manual toothbrush it's there are many that are really really soft that can help if their mouths are incredibly sore then there's other sort of more specific kinds of toothbrushes. Orally do a lovely 360 toothbrush, Colgate do a super uh, slim, um, soft toothbrush, and TP do a lovely um, um, specific toothbrush. So there's lots of companies doing very soft toothbrushes. As long as we can try, if possible, to just keep the plaque moving and keeping the mouth healthy and fresh and keeping the fluoride on there too. If we really struggle, there's water jets, water flosses, often humidifiers and nebulizers are recommended to help break up the slough and the mucus and things that can uh, be a problem. So water jets and water flosses, very easy to get hold of now, quite powerful um, and a nice way of just getting rid of some of the sticky plaque because when your mouth is dry, the plaque is much, much stickier. Toothpaste, many kinds of toothpaste. The recommendation from gov.uk is the high fluoride toothpaste, which is recommended and prescribed by the, um, the Max Fax department. Uh, potentially, if they're radiotherapy patients, they will be on this toothpaste forever. So the GP will often recommend it or the dentist will recommend it. So toothpaste. If they don't get on with mint or they don't get on with the frothing agents, saliva, uh, sodium laurel sulfate then there are many other options there are many companies that do gentle toothpaste mild mint they've got b vits in they've got oh gosh they've got loads of different enzymes in so you know you've got bio extra you've got oral leave you've got biotine you've got um sprays and gels from saliva sana you've got salivies um many mucosamine, gosh, there's so many. It's important to try things. There's plenty of samples the companies are quite happy to send out. Chris often sends out a patient box to patients or to departments. I mean, my website, I have a website, mouthcareforcancerpatients.co.uk. Um, on there is a page for products and you can look on there and there's a huge number of products on there available and it's worth trying. Patients will all come, always come back to me and say what they do, they don't like, what lasts, what doesn't last, what they like the taste of, what was too sweet. You know, it's nice to have lots of options and it's very patient specific. So toothpaste, mouth rinses. Mouth rinses I always recommend use of if you wish, you know, fluoride toothpaste with fluoride in at a different time to toothbrushing. If you do it straight after toothbrushing, it will wash away all that good fluoride. I need that to stay on the teeth. So mouth rinses at a different time of day. There are gels. All of these things need to be applied correctly. So a lot of people will say, I've tried this, I've tried that. Um, it doesn't work. Often I'll retry things with them, but I'll just show them more specifically. So there's good instructions out there for how to use these things. And sprays. I like sprays, especially with COVID times. It's great because you can be out there 
walking around and it's just it's a bit more discreet and you don't have to get your fingers in there so sprays are really nice to use may or may not last it so long you know but it's it's just something that can lubricate the mouth lozenges so there's different kinds of pastels there's lozenges which can adhere to the side of the mouth so there's xylem mounts that you can try all these different things that are available and mint so in a lot of these products there's xylitol and if you haven't heard of xylitol it's a natural alternative sugar it's made from beech and birch trees it uh, came from finland i think in the 50s and 60s and it helps to reduce your risk of decay so for patients with halitosis it's a great way of being able to make their mouth feel fresh but do really good stuff for their teeth so the mints that are out there at the moment have a look at the mints you'll find some that have chemical type of alternative sugars these are natural so you've got Dr. Hefts and you've got Pepper Smiths. Um, just try different ones and see what you like. Quite easy to get hold of. And lip balm. So Oral Eva got a lovely gentle lip balm for the lips because people often complain, complain of dry mouth and dry lips. What can we do to help before, during and after treatment? So if you get the opportunity to see the patient before the treatment starts, Give them oral hygiene instruction, help them with their toothbrushes, give them a little package of samples. They can check with oncology if they're happy for them to use them um, or to keep until after they finish their treatment. Give them that care and attention. So gently help them with those side effects that you may well be aware of, but just gently help them. They are rabbits in headlights just before they start treatment. Ideally, get their teeth sorted if you have time. If you get the opportunity to see the patient during treatment, often patients will turn up during treatment, um, not quite so much head and neck, I think, but um, cancer patients will often turn up during treatment because your priority, they want to see you. However, you're not quite sure what their blood count is like, how healthy they are to be seen. So I never turn them away. And that's why I always put this cup of coffee um, photograph in because it's important to sit down with them. They've used spoons. Remember, their spoons have been used to come and see you. And don't turn them away. See how they are. See how the families are managing. You know, it's an opportunity to care for them. Ring oncology. See if you are able to treat them. Um, if their oncology aren't available, then maybe rebook for another time. But make sure the specialist has said it's OK for them to come. And then if you get the opportunity to see the patient after treatment finishes, if they're a dental phobic and they haven't been for many years, we will certainly in MaxFax be trying to recommend them to join a practice to get a dental checkup to make sure they're healthy. So any problems during that the years going ahead, we try and minimise those problems as much as possible. They may have root surfaces that are exposed. Those are highly susceptible to tooth decay. They may have a dry mouth forever. So they're highly susceptible to decay and gum disease. So wherever they were before their journey, then look after them ongoing. So welcome them into your practice. Thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to put this photograph of myself on the left hand side because this was our first Mouth Care Matters meeting at our hospital in Gloucester and Cheltenham. And these are different specialists from different areas of care. Um, they are passionate about the mouth. So lots of medical professionals out there want to know about what they can do for the oral health of our cancer patients. I was buzzing. The hairs on my arms were standing up by the end of this meeting and it's a great group to be involved in. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. There's my details if anybody wants to get in touch, but thank you, Ali, for inviting me. Absolutely huge honor. Thank you for squeezing me in between our two amazing speakers. So Chris is phenomenal, Eva's phenomenal. So yeah, you'll have a, a great day ahead. You've got some great speakers, so thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Joss, for taking the time out and joining us, uh, sharing your experience and perspective. Um, I didn't know about spoons theory, so I learned something, and that was quite uh, interesting. How do you think sort of COVID has affected what you do in terms of are you doing sort of still face-to-face -face consultations, or are you seeing as many patients or few patients? So in general practice, we're we're carrying on. We're carrying on. Obviously, it's very different. There's not many people in the waiting room, hardly ever. You know, we're trying to be very careful about everything. We're following the guidelines to the letter. Um, with hospital work, yes, it was first time round, face to face was stopped because what I didn't want to do was create any issues with bringing a patient into the hospital purely for oral hygiene. I want to get my hands on them, obviously, but to reduce that 
potential of risk, but no, our appointments at the moment, our numbers here are really low. So for, for the moment, we're carrying on as normal. I've seen patients this morning. Um, so long may that continue. If not, I will carry on keeping them advice, giving them advice over the phone and helping them as much as I can that way. Fred, I was just posting on YouTube that I'm going to try the cheese cracker challenge tonight <laughs> and see how that goes. I don't think I'll get yeah. past two, but let's see. Yeah, have a go. Um, yeah, I mean, Graham Lloyd is saying, well done, Josh, very informative presentation. Chris is there as well. Uh, he really liked the image that you used to explain mucositis. Um, I was going to ask you, you mentioned quite a few products uh, that can help. Uh, are most of those available over the counter or do patients need a prescription for them? So uh, uh, there's a few, quite a few available on prescription. So I, when I give out samples, I'll often say to them, what did you get on with? And I'll say to them then, if, oh, but this is available on prescriptions to so see if you can get that from your GP. A lot of our patients are on medications already. I think there's, up to, well, some companies say 500 medications cause dry mouth. Prof Skelly said there's a, potentially up to 2,500 medications that cause dry mouth. So I always say with every medication, there's a consequence. So I, I always look around teeth, gums and saliva flow and if they have a dry mouth we have a talk about dry mouth but you could have a patient that's on a lot of medication then gets a diagnosis of head and neck cancer so they're dry already to start with um, so yes quite a few on prescription so our prescription list is different with doctors to dentists um, but there's a lot of products that are available online okay great and in terms of like you mentioned manual toothbrushes and electric ones etc which one do patients find easier generally with a sore mouth? Uh, with a sore mouth. So if they, they're really in the midst of it all, then I will often give them a free sample of the Orally 360. Um, I will recommend the Colgate and I'll recommend the TP because they're all slightly different. And it depends on patient's dexterity, if they've had surgery, what the shape of the mouth is like compared to what they had before. Um, there's so many variables with this area of care, um, but whatever works, whatever works. If their mouth isn't sore, then I'll often get them to crack on as they were, you know. Yeah. Um, we need to try as much as possible, keep their mouths as clean as possible, um, however that works, you know. Chris has just mentioned in the chat that Dr. Hef's Mint, um, you can get a 10% discount through the solos by using a discount code and the solos get a portion of that as well. So they're, um, um, I bet they're quite useful and handy. They are, oh, they're amazing. So on that video, there are the two Dr. Hef's dentists on that video doing the Cracker Challenge, because that was a day where I introduced Chris to Dr. Hef's, which was just brilliant. Um, they're lovely, lovely mints. They're quite a good size mint and they've just been repackaged. So they're just being remarketed. Um, but yeah, Dr. Hef's, if some, some patients who go through cancer treatment don't get on with mint. So Peppersmith's are great. So you've got lemon, strawberry, spearmint and peppermint. So the lemon's my favourite. Um, but both companies are fantastic. Xylitol is a product, it's amazing. But it's all about keeping that uh, risk of tooth decay as low as possible, but easy enough to get hold of. But yeah, great with a discount too. And how easy or challenging do you find to motivate patients who have got a diagnosis of cancer and are undergoing treatment of cancer to talk to them about oral hygiene because that might not be in their mind top of their priority? It's at the start, it's definitely not their priorities mm -hmm. and it may not have been on their radar before that. Um, so I just gently motivate them. I am a persuasive person. I see them regularly and I don't give up on them and just, I just generally try and coax them into my line of thinking because really they don't want to be in the dentist chair after they complete them, you know, they're back out, uh, out of max facts. They don't want to have extractions. They don't want tooth decay. So it's about keeping that risk as low as possible. So I try and work on that side of things. This might not be a priority, but let's just make it happen. You know. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, well, thanks again a lot. Uh, it was you really informative, much. really helpful. Uh, and a uh, lovely presentation and uh, thank you for sharing your experience and thank taking the time out. I know you were rushing from A to B, so thank <laughs> you for accommodating us. That's okay. Thank you very much, Ali. Brilliant. No worries. Um, so we've got about five minutes before the next speaker. I think some people were saying that when we played Eva's video, the audio wasn't working, so we're going to try it again. Hopefully this time it will work. So let me see. Oh, by the way, Eva is saying that uh, the picture that you use for mucositis, she missed that. And would it be possible for you to share that with her? Oh, okay. Absolutely. 
So. Okay, so. I can send her my presentation if that helps. Yeah, you can just email it to her. I'm going to try and play this video. Ali, there's, there's still no sound, I don't think, on this video, unfortunately. I'm going to say ta -ta now, so thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot. Great, so that was good. Hopefully this time it worked a bit better. Oh, thank you, Denise, for joining us. So, I mean, our next speaker is Professor Dan Lambert from Sheffield. I think he's going to speak for about 20 minutes about targeting uh, the mouth cancer microenvironment. And Dan is a professor of molecular cell biology. And he'll be followed by Denise, who'll be sharing her experience of raising mouth cancer awareness uh, in Ireland. So. Thanks a lot for joining both of you. And Dan, I don't know whether you've got a rap ready to go or are you just going to do a conventional presentation? Well, I was thinking of doing a dance instead, Ali, but uh, I'll, I'll save everyone the singing, that's for okay. sure. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll um, I'll try and share my yeah. screen and let's see what happens there. Oh my word, why is it doing that? There we go. Can you see that, Alan? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, hopefully everyone can see and hear. Um, so first of all, thanks to Ali for organizing this. I've, I've really enjoyed listening to as many of these sessions as I can, hearing from all different um, stakeholders and, and people with an interest in patients. It's been really, really fascinating to see all these different sides uh, of what we're talking about today. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of a, a, an overview of a view from the lab. Um, so I'm based in Sheffield. Um, I work with Ali and several other people in Sheffield. And one of our interests is to work on what we uh, term the micro environment. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to 
hopefully explain that a little bit more clearly in a moment. And right on cue, someone's knocking on the door, so I'll, I'll just try and ignore that for the moment. Okay, so um, when I uh, first started working on uh, oral cancers, probably about 10 years ago now, um, I was talking to my boss at the time, I, I won't say who, about what I was moving on to work on, and he said, well, why, why would you do that? No one, uh, do you know anyone who's had oral cancer, who's had mouth cancer? And I, I think this can be a, a slightly pervasive view, unfortunately. Um, and if you look at the, the stats, that obviously that really doesn't stack up. So here's some data from Sheffield. Um, it's five years old now, uh, but I suspect this hasn't changed hugely. If you look at the breakdown of causes of death in the city uh, and you pull out here in this infographic, you can pull out the, uh, the deaths due to cancer. And actually mouth cancer figures very prominently in there. So it's up there with breast cancer. Uh, there's more deaths of mouth and throat cancers than from prostate cancer, uh, which I think would be a surprise to a, a, a lot of people. And it shows the, the scale of the issue here. And it's quite interesting to um, look at this alongside where the research funding goes for uh, different types of cancer. So this is in no way knocking Cancer Research UK, um, but this is fairly common ac across all major funders, I think. But if you look at where the research funding goes, so this is the, the grant, grants that are awarded for research into different mm -hmm. cancers, uh, you can see down the bottom there, uh, hopefully you can see in the, the bottom line of blue circles there, uh, oral cavity and lip. It's a pretty small circle compared to uh, some of these much larger circles further up. And I think it's fair to say, and as I say, this is reflected across a number of, of different funders. I think it's fair to say that research into uh, mouth cancer, oral cancer, um, has been quite poorly funded over, over the years. Uh, and as um, Bernie was highlighting, Bernie Foran in a talk this morning, it's so important uh, that we are able to carry out um, research to improve uh, outcomes. And, and as Chris was highlighting, to improve the quality of life uh, of, of patients following treatment as well. So this is really, this is the, the thing that's driving the laboratory research that we're doing, working to push that through to the clinic to, to improve survival, but also to improve quality of life. So our research focuses on uh, the cellular level. So the things that are happening at the molecular, the cellular level of tumors. So at the molecular and cellular level, what is a tumor? So obviously intuitively, so, so here you have um, some tissue from a tumor. You can see that that tissue looks quite disordered, quite messy, and that's because the tumor's broken down the normal structure of the tissue to create this, this rather messy looking uh, mass of cells here when there, sh there should normally be order. And that mass of cells there, you might intuitively think is cancer cells. So most of what is in a tumor you'd think would be cancer cells. That's not necessarily the case. Certainly, of course, there are cancer cells there within a tumor. That's what's causing the tumor. But we shouldn't focus entirely uh, just on those malignant cancer cells because there are lots of other types of cells that surround the tumor. So all tissues in the body are made of different types of cells that do different things. They all have different specialized functions uh, and some of those cells go wrong and they form a tumor but when they do that they corrupt the cells that surround that tumor and there are lots of different types of cells that you might find in what we call the tumor microenvironment so these are the cells that are surrounding the cancer cells and often intermingled with the cancer cells so I'll just run through some of these just to give you an, an idea of the sort of uh, cells that we're looking at. So here we have, we have the cancer cells in the middle, the pink cells, and then around those I've illustrated these blue cells, which are what are called cancer-associated fibroblasts. So fibroblasts is a cell type that, that you find in most types of tissue, uh, and it provides structure to our tissues. 
they provide, they produce most of the glue that binds our tissues together that we call extracellular matrix. So this is a sort of jelly material that all our um, cells in the body sit in uh, and it uh, provides structure for our different tissues. So our fibroblasts are sat there to provide fuel for the tissues. We have a blood supply, so we have blood vessels and blood vessels are made of various different types of cells, but important ones in tumors are endothelial cells and these pericytes. And all these different types of cells talk to each other. So tumors are quite good at corrupting the blood, the blood supply and gaining blood supply that they wouldn't normally have. So they cause blood vessels to grow into the tumor by talking to these different cell types that form these blood vessels. And that allows them to get fuel and oxygen for the tumor to grow. In the oral cavity and around the head and neck, we have lots of bony structures. So the cancer may be close to bone. So you will also have the, the cells that make up bone nearby, but we'll also be talking to the tumor. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. We have immune cells. So again, Bernie Foran talked about the importance and the emerging importance of immunotherapies. So these therapies look to reprogram immune cells that come into the tumor. And there are various different types of immune cells that you will find in tumors, T cells, which we're hearing a lot about at the moment in terms of um, COVID. Uh, but we also have cells like macrophages and all sorts of other types of immune cells. And these two get reprogrammed by the tumor. So we might think of immune cells as being a good thing, which very often they are, clearing away the cells that are misbehaving, but they can also be reprogrammed to help the tumor grow. Uh, and that can be a, a, a real problem and an area of in, intense research to try and reprogram those immune cells to help kill off the cancer cells. In the head and neck, it's the lymphatics, so the lymph vessels play an important role because this is often the way that the cancer cells, as many of you will know, can spread to the lymph nodes so they can get into those lymph vessels and spread to the lymph nodes. So it's important for us to understand the communication between the tumor and the lymph vessels. And something that's been often overlooked is the contribution of the nervous system. So sometimes these tumors can be painful, of course, uh, but it's not just the pain, it's the presence of these nerves that the tumors can use um, to grow, to help them grow, and also to help them spread, can spread down through these, these nerves. So the contribution of nerves is important and we're beginning to understand that more. And there are other types of cells, depending on where we are, we may have some fat. So we might have some, uh, what is termed adipocytes. These are fat cells uh, around the tumor as well. So all of that together, that initial image that I showed of a tumor, isn't just tumor cells. It's all of these different cell types all working together uh, to uh, support the tumor growth and uh, often resist therapy uh, as well. So it's important that we understand these communications. It's probably worth saying that in the early stages of a tumor, certainly some of these cell types will, will resist the tumor growth. So the fibroblasts, some of the immune cells, they will probably um, help stop the tumor grow. Um, but as the tumor um, progresses and gets bigger and starts to spread into the surrounding tissue, it re-educates uh, these other cells and makes them misbehave and help the tumor rather than hinder it. So this is something that we need to understand better, this switch in, in how these cells behave from, from stopping the tumor growing to helping the tumor grow. And that's one of the things that we're, we're very interested in because we think in all these different cell types around the tumor, there are opportunities to target these cells of the tumor microenvironment with new therapies um, to help stop these tumors grow and spread. And one of our main areas of interest is uh, the cancer associated fibroblast. So these are the cells uh, shown in blue here that I explained before. They're producing this glue, the extracellular matrix, 
and they're often in very close association with the tumor. Uh, I don't know how much, because I see a strange screen here, but on the right here, um, here's a piece of tissue that's been cut from a tumor. Uh, and the cells are these blue dots. So they've been stained so that they are, they're blue. And these are the cancer cells. So these blue dots are the cancer cells. These brown cells that you can see surrounding it, these are fibroblasts um, that have been identified using something that particularly picks them out called SMA. So this brown staining is a fibroblast and the blue staining is the cancer cells. And you can see that around these these cancer cells, there's a lot of this brown staining. There's a lot of these fibroblasts. So there's very close communication going on between these two different cell types. And we want to understand that more. We want to understand how these cancer associated fibroblasts are affecting the tumor uh, and whether we can target them to help stop this tumor grow and spread. And we can see the importance of these cancer associated fibroblasts. We often call them CAF for short. If you look at the survival statistics for uh, head and neck cancer patients with high levels of this brown staining, so high levels of these CAFs, um, <coughs> so, sorry, high levels of the CAF is shown in red down here. They tend to, the survival tends to be quite poor compared to those with tumors with low levels of these CAFs. So the more of the CAFs you have, uh, the more aggressively this tumor behaves. And actually, this is one of the, the prime, primary indicators of how a tumor is going to behave, how aggressive it's going to be, uh, and what the prognosis is, is to look at how many of these uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts are around the tumor. So they're clearly very important, but we're only just beginning to learn why they're important. So how are they affecting this, this uh, tumor aggressiveness and prognosis? Uh, and is there anything we can do about it is one of our key questions in our research. So coming back to the, the whole tumor microenvironment again, we know that these cancer associated fibroblasts are close to a lot of these other types of cells. We know that they can talk to some of these other types of cells, but we don't know the detail yet of many of these interactions. We know quite a lot about how they talk to tumor cells, but we know much, uh, much less about how they talk to the other types of cells that are around the tumor. And that's really the focus of our work is to investigate uh, how the cancer associated fibroblasts communicate with these other cell types, how that contributes to the tumor progressing and what we can do about that. So how can we stop that? So I'm just gonna give one example of the sort of work that we've been doing. And that's looking at the communication with uh, bone that's near a tumor. So uh, as we've heard earlier today, often these tumors can invade bone and that has um, big consequences for the type of surgery that's carried out, the need for bone grafts, et cetera, and of course the effect on the quality of life. So this is, a, this is a major issue that we need to address in the treatment of uh, oral cancers. Uh, and that has an effect again on survival. So this is a similar sort of graph showing the, the survival rate with and without bone invasion and with bone invasion the survival rate is is much poorer uh, and of course the quality of life following treatment can be affected as well so together with uh, one of our phd students who's now moved off to los angeles Arij el madrati and this chap down here in the bottom right who you might recognize he's been on screen a little bit today uh, Ali Karam, um, we made some initial observations that in, in these tumors that are invading bone, what you very often see is an awful lot of these um, fibroblasts around bone. So I'll try and point out what you're looking at here. So these purple patches here, this is bone, and this is bone that's been degraded away. You can see in some places, it's like it's been nibbled away. And this, this should be a solid piece of bone. So this is a tumor that's invading into the bone, destroying the bone, degrading the bone. But actually most of what you see around this degraded bone isn't the cancer cells themselves. So the cancer cells, these are cancer cells over on the left here, these, these tight purple patches over on the left. Here's some tumor. The rest of this is all these cancer associated fibroblasts. 
So this had been observed before, but we'd never really looked into the, the mechanism, mechanism of what might be happening here. So we thought that perhaps these cancer associated fibroblasts might actually be degrading the bone themselves and creating a path for the tumor to invade. So there are some simple experiments that we can do in the laboratory to look at this uh, sort of process. So the cancer associated fibroblasts, these can be grown, so very kindly donated uh, following surgery by patients. We can grow these in the, in the lab in flasks that look like this. And then we can take what they produce and we can add them to a bone destruction assay. So this is where we, we effectively, we take some bone uh, and we add what the uh, cancer associated fibroblasts are producing to a dish containing the bone and also containing some of these cells that are called pre-osteoclasts. And osteoclasts are the cells that degrade bone. So there's different types of cells within bone and the osteoclasts are the ones that degrade it, they break it down. So they're the culprits for this, but they need to be told to do that. So the C, we were looking to see whether the, the cancer-associated fibroblasts produce signals that tell the osteoclast to degrade bone. And you can see they're degrading bone by looking down a microscope and you can see these pits that are forming. And this is where these osteoclasts are literally drilling into the bone. So they're degrading the bone and forming these pits. So we did this assay and we looked what would be the effect of using normal fibroblasts that we find in healthy tissue and what would be the effect of using cancer associated fibroblasts. A normal fibroblast, hopefully you can see here, it is always a little bit difficult to look at these images, but there's no bright white spots here. There's no pits. So these normal fibroblasts, they're not causing these osteoclasts to drill into the bone and degrade this bone, but the calves do. And this was the first time we've seen this. So there, there's some evidence that cancer cells can do this. They can cause the bone to degrade, but no one had ever seen that the, the cancer associated fibroblasts are able to do this. So this was quite exciting for us because this told us a, a completely new mechanism that hadn't been reported before for how tumors invade bone. So this is sort of where we got to with this, where we, we realized that the cancer associated fibroblasts are producing these signals that activate the osteoclast to degrade into the bone. And then it's likely that the, the tumor would be able to then uh, invade further into that bone. So the question, having found this, it's all very nice seeing these things in the laboratory and, and thinking, well, that's exciting. We found something new, um, but we want to be able to do something useful with that. So what can we do? So we did some work, and I apologize that these graphs aren't the easiest things to look at, but I'll try and explain what's being shown here. We, we found a couple of different drugs that were able to kill cancer-associated fibroblasts much more than they kill the normal healthy fibroblasts. So this is the amount of cells that are alive. And when you increase the concentration of the drug, the, no the normal fibroblasts pretty much survive, certainly up to a certain dose, but the cancer associated fibroblasts start dying away. So we've found two drugs here that are able to, this one seems a little bit more toxic to, to normal fibroblasts. And this is still fairly early days in identifying these drugs. Uh, we will be able to optimize drugs that do this more effectively and kill more calves compared to the normal fibroblasts. But we've found drugs that can kill the calves, um, but have a minimal effect on the normal fibroblasts. So if we take those and we expose our cancer associated fibroblasts in the lab, so we give them these drugs and we kill off some of these fibroblasts and then we do our bone assay, do we see an effect? on the ability of, of these osteoclasts to drill holes into the bone. And we do. So again, the normal fibroblasts, they're not doing anything very much. The calves are drilling these holes where these bright sparks are. But when we add these drugs to the calves that are killing off at least some of these um, cancer-associated fibroblasts, we only see the odd spark, bright spark there. So we've reduced the ability of these cancer-associated fibroblasts to degrade the bone. And this is, this is the first time 
this has been shown. So we found a, a new mechanism here in the ability of these fibroblasts to cause the bone to be destroyed. Uh, and we're also beginning, and it is early days, these are still laboratory experiments. Uh, and we need to do these in some, some more sophisticated laboratory models. And of course, also uh, in patients. Um, but we've begun to get quite excited that we've found a way that we might be able to um, reduce the ability of these fibroblasts to cause destruction of bone, which might be clinically very useful, particularly in tumors that are, are only superficially um, degrading bone. We're also interested because we're able to kill these cancer associated fibroblasts, we're looking at all the other effects of cancer associated fibroblasts uh, in a tumor and whether we'll be able to use these drugs to block those effects as well. So effects on the uh, immune response and, and response to immunotherapies, for example. Um, so this is really what we're, what we're looking for. So this is one arm of the research that we're doing. We're looking at ways to target these CAFs to try to normalize, to make like healthy the tumor microenvironments uh, and in that way, impact on survival and quality of life. So there is still some way to go from getting this from the laboratory into the clinic. Um, but we're, we're, I think we're heading in the, the right direction with it. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if I can, and if there are any. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, really nice overview, and thanks for explaining it so well. I'm just going to ask you, and this is something that Chris mentioned earlier as well, is that why doesn't head and neck cancer get the same recognition or funding and attention as some of the other cancers? To be honest, I don't really know. I, I'd like to think things are changing a little bit. Um, CIUK has certainly funded some big uh, head and neck cancer studies, um, predominantly in London, actually, in, in the last five years. Um, but some other cancer charities are still not really funding in that area. I think some of it is perception. As I say, when I first started working on head and neck cancer, my boss at the time, who was a, a scientist, didn't really understand why I was doing that. As he said, well, I, I've never known anyone who's had it. Have you? So I think there is that perception that this is rare um, mm. and therefore not worth spending the money on. And I think we need to challenge that. Yeah, because the numbers you showed were quite telling in terms of the number of deaths, almost similar, if not higher than most of these uh, much more well-known cancers. That's right. And, and certainly at the, the molecular level, that, which is where my expertise is, we know a lot more about those tumours, the breast tumours and the, the colorectal tumours than we do mm. about head and neck. And that does, it, that does impede our ability to develop new treatments uh, and give the right treatments to the right patients as well. And that's, that's really key. Okay, that's great, Dan. Thanks a lot for Thank you very much. sharing your, your knowledge and your work. And I know I've been sort of partly involved in that as well. So, so watch this space, I guess. Let's hope that this work can just go on and actually benefit the patients. Absolutely. And okay. thanks for your support and, and for organizing today, Ali. I think it's, no been, it's been great. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. It's, it's, it's great because of everyone's participation, people like you and Denise and Ava and everyone has been very sort of kind and forthcoming to help. So that makes it uh, the experience it is. I mean, no one would sit there and watch me speak for 12 hours. You could do a rap. <laughs> Not for 12 <laughs> hours, I can't. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Dan. Shall I, um, I'll leave so someone else can. All right. Yeah. So that brings us to our next speaker. Let me unmute Denise. I think you are on mute, Denise. For some reason, I can't unmute you. Let's see if you can do it. Oh, brilliant, I can hear you. Thanks a lot for joining us, Denise. Um, um, so um, Denise very kindly um, agreed to sort of share her experience about um, uh, raising out cancer awareness. Um, mouth and head and neck cancer awareness. Um, so are you happy to present from your end, Denise? Absolutely, as long as I can open the uh, screen, yeah. will I try? Share screen? Yeah, go for it. Ooh, hang on. Um, 
Sheffield looks good. And great, um, I can see your screen. So okay. just just make it full screen or slideshow and then you're ready to go. Perfect. All good. <clears throat> All right. Will I start? Yeah. Please. Okay. How long do I have, Ali? Um, you've got half an hour if you want. But, but no, no, I think you said about 15 minutes. No, that's fine. <laughs> However long you want. I'll, I can do a wrap to fill in the extra. Okay. Minute. So uh, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to um, everybody who's listening. Um, as introduced by Ali, my name is uh, Denise McCarthy. I'm a recently retired uh, consultant periodontist and um, I worked in the uh, dental school in Dublin. So it's um, it's sad that due to the um, recent pandemic, we can't meet directly or have have a have a conference where everybody's all together. However, I'm I'm very happy to bring you greetings from um, County Kildare in the east of Ireland, and uh, I'm very very happy to be joining you today. My thanks initially to um, the, uh, the the Oral Health Foundation and to Ali for organising uh, this session. It's been somewhat of a challenge to me. As I mentioned, I've, I've recently retired and um, was plunged immediately into the uh, pandemic. So this is my first time ever uh, doing a Zoom presentation lecture. We've had meetings, but a lecture. So I'm very excited about it and hope that it goes all right. But I must congratulate Ali. It seems everything seems to have gone quite without a hitch today. So it's it's been so interesting. And um, I've particularly enjoyed the, the lectures. I've listened to quite a number and um, to uh, Dr. Foran this morning was absolutely fascinating. It's a, it was a wonderful presentation. So today I'd like to talk to you about increasing awareness um, about mouth, head and neck cancer in Ireland and um, how we started a campaign here a number of years ago. I'd like to talk to you about how we started and then the work that we've done and then a little bit about um, my, my thoughts about the way forward as such, or if that's possible. So. We set up a clinic in uh, the dental hospital. As I say, I was working as a consultant periodontist uh, teaching and doing clinical work, but we set up a, a clinic uh, to provide dental and oral care pre-radiation for head and neck cancer patients in uh, the late 1990s. And this wasn't a very uh, onerous task at the time and was something of a passion of mine, but the numbers increased over the years uh, so that by the time I retired, we were seeing in the region of uh, 300 uh, new cases every year, and that would have included uh, review cases as well. And this was, in fact, without any um, funding or um, staff st additional staffing. So that was quite difficult. Uh, but I'll come back to that later. And one thing that always concerned me um, in the middle term of um, the sort of middle 2000s, um, I noticed that a lot of patients were presenting at a relatively late stage and a lot of, of your presenters already today have spoken about the staging of cancer, but quite a number of patients, particularly men, were presenting at stage four uh, for mouth and oropharynx cancers and uh, women presenting at 30-35%, th which, was, which was a high number. And this really, to my mind, was unacceptable because the oral cavity is readily accessible for examination, provided that people attend the dentist regularly or that they uh, carry out self or for self or professional examination. So the five-year survival rate depends on the stage of diagnosis with a decrease in the um, survival following treatment at, if the patient attends at stage four. So therefore, early diagnosis certainly saved lives. And we want to see patients who present with an early cancer when possible. And again, I will come back to this in my final slides, rather than somebody presenting with a cancer at a later stage, as already mentioned by, by many of your speakers today. So where did our um, awareness journey start? It had to start somewhere. And we had a, there was a survey carried out in Ireland uh, of hospital outpatients in 2008. And 70% of the people surveyed had never heard about head and neck cancer, not quite as good as your figures this year um, in the UK. 73% didn't consider alcohol as a risk factor. 
and less than 50% would be concerned by hoarseness or a persistent ulcer. So that was certainly alarm bells uh, with regards to, to knowledge. And around the same time, um, a lady called Leah Mills, whom I'd met as a patient in 2006 when she attended the dental hospital for a pre-radiation assessment. Um, she, was a, she is a writer and uh, she published a book about her experiences of uh, head and neck cancer. She had mouth cancer. And um, she was forever saying to me, look, Denise, really, when people are looking for information about mouth cancer, when they've been diagnosed, or if they're wondering, the information isn't there for those who need it. And she was forever pushing, pushing us to uh, do something about it. So eventually things began to happen. And in uh, 2009, uh, we founded the Mouth, Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Ireland group. So that was quite an auspicious year. And this I'll introduce you, this is Leah here. And the whole campaign would not have started without Leah. And these are a, a group of people um, who worked, they, some, some were mouth uh, cancer survivors and uh, many, uh, most of them were in fact, and many uh, helped us and worked with us in relation to um, getting the message out and working with the different groups that they were involved with as well. And that was one of the strengths of our group that we managed to network quite extensively around the country. We're obviously a much smaller country than the UK, but um, I was very interested today to hear about how many um, interactions there are between so many different people over there. So the first thing we did with our group was we looked at what we saw as priorities and we felt that integration and education of students about mouth, head and neck cancer was important. And we looked particularly about the dental team, the medical team and the pharmaceutical team. And again, the, the role of teams was, was very nicely described this morning. And the examination for mouth cancer must be part of every dental examination, which now thankfully is very much a given. We wanted to build up public awareness and um, target risk groups for examination and to try to work with national organizations to get things to move along. We, we, we made a brochure uh, for information with information about risk and um, preventable and modifiable risk factors and uh, signs and symptoms and so on. So it, it, this was done in the first year. So we, we, we got all that lined up. Uh, we wanted to target um, at risk groups and groups in the community. And just as an overview of what we did over the first 10 years of the group, we had free checkups in the dental schools and with general practitioners, general dental practitioners. Uh, we, looked, we met with rural communities, uh, disadvantaged and marginal groups, and also um, the Men's Shed organization. I don't know if that functions in the UK, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. And we worked with Spun Out, a youth-focused organization. And in 2020, um, we worked with elders in our community. And this was our first uh, virtual um, Mouth Cancer Awareness Day. So our first Mouth Cancer Awareness Day was in uh, 2010, and it was uh, hosted in the dental school in Dublin and the dental school in Cork, uh, two dental schools in Ireland, in the south of Ireland. There's a dental school obviously in Belfast as well. And we, it was advertised as a free mouth cancer examination. And uh, Leah assured us that, you know, we'd have maybe a hundred people uh, would turn up to the two dental schools. And uh, you can imagine our shock on the day when uh, 2000 turned up to the dental school in Dublin and another 2000 turned up for the free mouth checkup in Cork. Most fortunately didn't have mouth cancer, but I think free was the, the, uh, the, the very important word. From the, from the outset, we got our students involved. That we felt was very important. So, and all through the last 10 years, our students have been pivotal on mouth cancer awareness days. And as I alluded to earlier, we've been very lucky that we've had um, great support from the two dental schools, both in Dublin and Cork. Um, we have uh, on our committee, we have the Dental Health Foundation, um, the Irish Cancer Society, the Irish Dental Association, very, very importantly, and uh, we had a logo developed and the National Cancer Control Programme was extremely important as well. We've all got members of these groups on our committee and also a group from Spun Out, uh, which is the youth organisation. Over the first four years or so, approximately 25,000 people attended uh, general dentists for a free mouth checkup and advice. Uh, it doesn't seem like much in relation to your numbers in the UK, but uh, these are relatively substantial numbers in Ireland, particularly as um, a lot of dental care is in the, in the private sector. 
checkups are available, but um, it, it isn't as freely available as on the NHS. Uh, but um, it was a, a, a great success and it generated um, awareness and uh, empowered people in general practice also, I believe. Uh, we had um, fundraising in the dental school and um, they were as a group called the Molar Rollers and they cycled from Dublin to London, interestingly, and uh, they gave us some money from their fundraising. And with that, we uh, produced word of mouth. And I think Leah has sent you a copy, Ali, and um, it's available on Amazon freely. Well, for a small download fee of either a euro or a pound. And it was uh, edited by myself and Leah Mills and has stories and information and, and advice. It probably needs to be updated at this stage. In 2015, we focused on rural communities and uh, we worked with the, um, these are a huge um, community in Ireland, obviously, and we worked a lot. We got a lot of co coverage and publicity uh, through the uh, rural um, media, the newspapers and so on. And we also worked with the Irish Farmers Association and the Irish Countrywomen's Association. And uh, this was one of our patients uh, who was a farmer in the Midlands of Ireland with his family. And he gave us great support and did uh, interviews and so on. And also, uh, interestingly enough, um, at around the same time, our immediate past president um, of the country, Mary McAleese, her husband was a dentist, is a dentist. And uh, they were very interested in working with older people in rural settings. Um, over 25% of people are over 65 in Ireland. And again, many live in rural communities. And um, President McAleese uh, said she often attends senior citizens meetings and was always surprised to see so many women and a very, very few men and always wondered where the, uh, where, the, where the men were. And they were setting up groups in the country trying to encourage men to come out and to uh, join, uh, come, come and have meetings, which were organized uh, on a monthly basis in towns and villages around the country. Our students got involved and did presentations, uh, one of them at the uh, Ninth International Cancer Conference in TCD. We also got a lot of support from um, media, uh, well-known people in the country who were, um, who were affected by um, head and neck cancer, in fact, mouth cancer in, in a lot of cases. And uh, this man was an Olympic boxer and um, this lady, um, Emily Hurricane, was um, is, is a very well-known journalist in Ireland. And John Langton is a member of our mouth cancer, mouth, head and neck cancer awareness group. So we, we, got, we, we tried to generate publicity in that way as much as we could. In 2017, we focused on disadvantaged groups and we tried to work with the groups supporting the homeless in Ireland and also groups uh, working with people in rehabilitation for alcohol and drug addiction. Dentists went out, general dentists went out to um, outlying sites and provided free mouth examinations in the field as it were and lectures were provided for people who work in the area and uh, we had very interesting speakers um, a group from a, a, an organization called safety net which is a mobile unit that travels around the center of dublin in the in the night time and uh, provides care for people who may be at risk or who need care we didn't we had an economist because obviously money always comes into these things and um, somebody who's involved in care of the homeless with mouth cancer survivors and obviously um, talk about smoking cessation also, which we have a very good provision by our health service executive, the HSE. So this was a very successful day. And we um, the, the lectures that we provided uh, were useful and we made very good contacts. And in fact, our students now go out to these, these, uh, these groups and these people and provide oral health advice and lectures and so on. Uh, the same day, one of our um, committee members, uh, she, this, girl, this lady, uh, Roisin Whelan, had developed um, a cancer when she was in her late teens at 19 and went on to become a psychologist. And um, she is now uh, running a head and neck, mouth, head and neck support, cancer support group. And she was pictured here at one of our mouth cancer awareness days with the uh, then Minister for Health. So uh, that was an interesting one. Um, I mentioned earlier the men's shed. Obviously, men are very, they're, they're much more commonly affected by head and neck cancer than women, maybe almost two thirds. You spoke about it much earlier this morning, um, Ali, with, with some other people. Uh, so we, at the men's shed, it's an organization around Ireland and um, again, uh, is very valuable in getting information out there. And this gentleman, uh, Stephen was a mouth cancer survivor and this is my colleague, uh, Dr. Eleanor Sullivan from Cork. Uh, and we all work very well together 
So it, it's, a, it's a very good situation. We focused on younger people in 2019, similar to yourself. in the community. And I think you mentioned 17% uh, in your recent publication, and it's it's somewhat similar in Ireland, it is reducing. However, um, oh gosh. However, when you when you when you drill into it, um sorry, when when you drill into it, um, smoking rates remain highest amongst those aged 25 to 34 at 26 percent. So it's much higher and rising, and also in the younger age groups. Sunbed usage is highest uh, among younger younger women, and also um, it, there's a poor knowledge about HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer uh, among students, and this was found in 2018. Uh, in 2020, we had actually planned to uh, work with women uh, in Ireland, but with the pandemic and with the um, isolation of people in nursing homes and so on, we decided that because in the older community as well, um, the the the, the uh, incidence of head and neck cancer is more common. So we decided to focus on the elder communities in Ireland, both uh, in care and also in the community. So uh, that was quite a successful, as I say, a virtual um, a virtual event. Um, so where are we now? Having read your very interesting um, publication, Oral Health Foundation 2020, I see that 86% um, of the UK public have heard of mouth cancer. However, 80% um, stated that they could, didn't, weren't aware of seeing any information. In 2018, there was a publication in Ireland where 86% of non-consultant hospital doctors in Irish hospitals feel they don't have sufficient knowledge of prevention and detection of oral cancers. And for risk, risk factors, they listed smoking at 98%, alcohol 63 and viral 29. So that wasn't, it wasn't great. And it becomes more relevant when we look at an audit that um, myself and my colleague, Dr. O'Sullivan uh, are working on at the moment. It's um, getting ready for publication. We did an audit of patient attendance in 2010 and 2019. And we found that 78% of people diagnosed eventually with head and neck cancer first attended a general medical practitioner for advice and 12% attended a general dental practitioner. And that's worrying if recently qualified medics feel that they haven't had sufficient education. So that certainly is something that needs to be looked at. But uh, on a slightly more hopeful side, there was a publication in Ireland uh, just recently during um, the summer. And uh, the study found it was mainly on, um, on uh, path 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 pathology uh, specimens and biopsy spe specimens referred in. And the recent study found that dentists were detecting quite a number of uh, early dysplastic lesions, not necessarily cancers, but they were, dentists were identifying changes in the oral mucosa and uh, were sending in more cases. Up, uh, as, and they, these were opportunistic findings uh, when people attended for routine uh, dental examinations. And that brings us back again to the huge importance of ensuring that um, people attend the dentist regularly. I was surprised to hear an earlier speaker say that, um, that a, a substantial percentage of people in the United Kingdom uh, don't attend the dentist um, regularly. I, I would have thought that it would have been almost 100%, but certainly um, that's something we're trying to work on in Ireland. Um, we're nearly there. Uh, we had a, we the, our group, um, this is uh, the representative of the Irish Dental Association and the Dental Health Foundation. Um, we made a submission to the third national cancer strategy um, for Ireland, uh, which is make it, the, make, making planning about general cancer care in Ireland. And for the first time uh, on the basis of our submission, we got the we had the role included of uh, the role of the, the of oral care and the dentist in the pre and post uh, head and neck radiation therapy patient and this was included for the first time and really was enormously important to get it included because um, it then puts the, the it puts the planners in a position where they need to um, where they need to support the uh, the, the, the need for um, care of head and neck cancer patients, the need for oral and dental care. And we're here at government buildings, and this is um, was the Minister of Health at, Health at that time, who was um, Dr. Radker, who then went on to become our prime minister. So um, the, the uh, government buildings are quite close to the dental hospital, which is quite useful. And uh, a totally, uh, 
just before I retired in 2018-19, um, a totally new consultant post to carry on my work following my recent retirement was also established for the care of the head and neck cancer patients, which was absolutely fantastic. So we have much certainly more to do because possibly messages aren't getting out um, as well as they should be. And um, thank you for your attention. And I certainly hope, Ali, that we'll be able to work together. And having heard the amount of stunning information and interaction and enthusiasm uh, from your speakers today, it would be fantastic if we could work together a bit more. And there are a few websites there of um, work that are things that we have on our website. This is our um, mouth, mouth, Head and neck Cancer Awareness Ireland Group web website there. So that's as much as I've got to say. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot, Denise. That was really interesting and useful. And it looks like a lot of people feel quite passionately about the problem and have been working on their own or in their area or their region, but there's no reason why we all of us can't work together to do something mm -hmm. about this. I think so, yeah. The free checkup was a great idea, I guess, before the 4,000 people showed up. So how did you deal with all those people showing up uh, on the day? Did everyone get seen? It seemed it seemed like a very it seemed like a very sensible um, uh, idea, but uh, it was picked up by a lot of the radio stations and um, newspapers in Dublin, and it was brought. So people, essentially, what happened the, the in the two dental schools, uh, all the clinics more or less shut down. Students, staff, everybody, and everybody just rolled up their sleeves and started working. And interestingly, even eight or ten years later, people, the, the staff who are still still in the hospital. Uh, they say it was one of the best days. They really felt as though they had achieved something and mm. done a good job. Uh, so it was. It was an it was an interesting day. It was a, a, a shock, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a it's a good way to get people through the door. That initial hurdle of seeing mm. them first time. Yeah. Um, I think you you wouldn't know how many of those that you saw actually had suspicious lesions or needed biopsies, etc. Not, not, not as many as you would anticipate. There were a number of biopsies, probably about, I think there were about 50 or 60 biopsies um, and there were six cancers detected. So oh, that was, you know, very, at a very early stage. Hmm. And um, I think, and I suppose some of them maybe were people who had, the, the cancer was there and they, they were sort of, they hadn't done anything about it. So, but I do think though, um, when you're, organizing awareness campaigns mm. and we have our mouth cancer awareness day on the third wednesday of september every year and you're involved in it you think everybody knows about it but then when you speak to people your cousins down the country or friends mm. they haven't heard about it no. so it's how do you actually get the message out there in a, in a meaningful way i think it's quite challenging because although you may think that things like social media and internet makes it easier but that also means that there's so many different avenues for information you can't just put it in the newspaper and assume that everyone's going to read about it so you almost have to target it from all directions really. but i think dentists dentists really are key yeah you know, absolutely yeah it's quite interesting the numbers you showed are somewhat similar to the oral health foundation numbers uh, because um, in the survey it said of only 20 percent would actually go and see a dentist and most people actually go to a GP or pharmacist if they had something in their mouth yeah. and yours was also about 78% sort of medics uh, yeah. who didn't feel like that they, they were experienced or trained enough to actually um, look at those things or refer those things mm -hmm. so that's probably another potential area for improvement is in training the medics to identify these lesions. I, I think what you learn as a student as a, as a student a healthcare student you, you take with you for life really so I think it's important to get the message out there yeah. A, and but that's a longer a longer piece of work to a large extent okay. but thank Brilliant. you very very much i really no, enjoyed it thanks a lot i mean it was really really a uh, good presentation and great to hear about your work and looking forward to hopefully working together in future thank you very much all right thank take you. care Denise. i'll sign out now yeah first zoom presentation was brilliant so well done Okay, so there's 10 minutes to four. So we'll just have a quick 10 minute break. And uh, when we come back at 4 p.m., uh, we will be joined by Dr. Tim Bracey, who's a pathologist. And uh, he will uh, be talking about uh, uh, the socially distant pathologist. So uh, quite looking forward to, uh, to his talk. So please don't go away anywhere. Just uh, grab a drink if you like, and I'll see you in five to 10 minutes.
Right, we're back. We've got Dr. Tim Bracey with us, literally on the beach, or virtually on the beach. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Sorry, can't hear you. Hmm. Sound doesn't seem to be coming through from your end. Can you hear me? Okay. Try this. Oh yeah, there well, you go, okay. it's working now, yeah. I've had to, um, I might just try it once more just to get my microphone working on my ear. Okay. Now can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Sorry, I was just saying that um, it's nice to hear the same topics coming up again and again about teamwork and communication. Yeah. And it's been a really interesting day so far, so I hope I won't ruin it for you. I'm sure you won't. Thanks a lot for <laughs> taking the time out. You're welcome. Um, and from what you mentioned, I'm um, assuming you're going to tell us about the socially distant pathologist. So most people haven't uh, come across um, a pathologist and, uh, of course, the role in the uh, mouth cancer patient's journey. So it would be really interesting to hear your views. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Please. Yeah, it's working. Is that showing now? It is. Great. So I think, Ali, we met about two years ago, I think. Um, but we probably met through social media before that. We did. Um, and uh, it was really nice to, to bump into you at a conference and you came up and introduced yourself. And I think that's perhaps one of the stereotypes that I wanted to talk about today is that maybe pathologists aren't very social. Um, we, we have this reputation of hiding in our labs, uh, but um, um, communication is what we do. Um, communication is at the core of what we do, communicating our results and communicating with the clinical team, often every member of the clinical team, in order to get the details we need in order to, um, to give the patients the best possible um, diagnosis and treatment. Um, so I want to bring together some of the themes we've talked about already. Um, I uh, work down in the far southwest of England, and um, so I'm, I'm physically distant as well as, uh, at the moment, uh, trying to do social distancing as well. Um, and we're obviously using technology today to, to communicate our work, and I think that's another thing we have in common is our passion for our subject and um, for trying to communicate what we do. I'm going to give um, quite a general talk about why I became a pathologist um, and pathology in general and bring in themes about um, mouth cancer whenever possible. So this is um, my village where I, I'm fortunate enough to live uh, with my family and um, we uh, I've been very fortunate um, that social distancing for us um, isn't difficult. Um, we can uh, easily walk out onto the cliff and, and be on our own or on the beach. Um, and I think um, we, we've benefited. Our hospitals haven't touched wood so far, become overwhelmed. And I think that's down to um, the responsibility, uh, the responsible nature of, of, of the public and um, and all of us really um, trying our best to um, protect the vulnerable. And also um, in so doing, um, we're able to concentrate our efforts on um, patients with diseases like mouth cancer. So uh, pathology's beginnings, it may uh, not be clear to everyone um, that the first pathologists, probably the ancient Greeks who started doing autopsies. Um, but um, it was really mostly based on superstition. Uh, there were the four humours and um, all disease was thought to be um, due to an imbalance between earth, fire, air and water humours. It wasn't until um, Rudolf Furkoff um, who was a physician who was really the first physician who started using a microscope 
in the 1800s um, who was able to define that all disease started with cells. Um, uh, cells led to cells and many of the definitions we use today in today's medicine like thrombosis, embolism, leukemia and different ty other different types of cancers um, were down to uh, Rudolf Virchow um, recognizing this um, under his microscope. Since then, uh, pathology has somewhat split from um, the main branch of medicine and surgery. And it may not be clear to everyone that pathologists are um, uh, multiple different specialties. Um, I think one of the um, things about the COVID pandemic is it's brought attention to the importance of what we do in pathology and perhaps these hidden specialties, particularly microbiology and virology have become very much more into the forefront. Hematologists, clinical chemists, um, immunologists are all um, practicing um, clinical doctors who um, spend a lot of their time on the wards and clinics. Um, also molecular genetics, um, toxicologists, and even veterinary pathologists are all part of our Royal College. Um, Ali and myself are histopathologists, and um, we also, well, I certainly do cytopathology as well, which is looking at cells removed from fluids and tissues. And then obviously uh, most people will be aware of pathologists um, as doing post-mortems, and in the UK that's either forensics or, um, or coronial. So um, histopathology and cytopathology, um, pathologists such as ourselves, um, some of us are quite specialized like Ali um, uh, and myself, um, I have an interest in, in mouth cancer and oral pathology, um, but it's one of the other specialties which I, um, uh, uh, which I do as a pathologist and I also do post-mortems. Um, and perhaps there's this um, reputation of pathologists um, that we don't like people. That's certainly not the case for, um, for, for the vast majority of us, I would say. Um, and people sometimes will say, I, I, I hear that you're behaving and communicating quite normally, so why did you have to become a pathologist? So, um, and I think some medics, this may be slightly unfair, perhaps choose their specialty partly based on what kind of personality they think they are. Um, it's nice that they start off thinking, putting us in the same category. I'm not sure that's the, that, that's the same for all of us. Um, my wife's an emergency uh, medical consultant and she's obviously in the crazy no attention span category. Um, but pathologists are generally thought of, uh, of being responsible for the dead, which of course is not at all true. Um, the vast majority of our work is on living patients trying to understand disease and um, diagnose and provide um, prognostic and diagnostic information. So this was me as a two-year-old. Um, I spent my early years in Australia and uh, was particularly interested in nature. And there's a lot of uh, nature around. It's quite amazing that I survived that time, really, with all the poisonous animals around. Um, but that was the first um, uh, uh, clues that I was developing into uh, a geek and um, and might be interested in pathology. I later uh, have no apologies in, uh, in admitting that I was a bird watcher and, uh, and found it interesting to separate species dependent on um, very fine um, morphological features. Um, I actually became a biologist and did my PhD in, um, in tumor biology. And really I was interested in all kinds of biology. And like Darwin's finches, the biologist correlates morphology with behavior. Darwin was able to identify that um, different kinds of beaks um, would be a clue towards the different behavior of, of finches in the different Galapagos Islands. And in my research, I was fascinated by um, the fact that um, uh, different tumors could change their appearance under the microscope, sometimes just with one genetic change. Um, and that genetic change could even change a tumor's uh, clinical behavior and response to treatments quite dramatically. 
So moving on to oral cancer, what's the role of a biopsy? I'm sure we've talked about that um, to quite quite a great deal today. Um, but I'm never, it never ceases to amaze me that um, sometimes the um, clinical presentation may be quite similar of a benign tumor like, um, like this one, the pleomorphic adenoma, um, which formed a, a painless lump in the, in the palate in this case, and quite an aggressive malignant um, salivary gland tumor in the palate of a different patient, um, which was an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Fortunately, um, pathologists can usually identify these differences um, immediately on a, on, on a standard stained section, but sometimes we have to do special stains and use antibodies to identify um, features of these particular tumors. And it, it may be that sometimes a very small biopsy isn't enough for us to make a diagnosis and we need um, a bigger biopsy or in fact to have the tumor removed. Um, one of my gastrointestinal um, mentors, who sadly is no longer with us, um, was quoted to say, it's your job to control surgeons as a pathologist. And I think radiologists and pathologists have a role in this, um, in that we hope to limit collateral damage if at all possible, and uh, make the diagnosis on the smallest possible biopsy that we can. This was a, a, an interesting case, uh, which was biopsied recently um, in my own hospital, um, suspected mouth cancer. And uh, the biopsy was unusual. Um, there was a, a thickened squamous epithelium that had an unusual inflammatory infiltrate that seemed to come down into the submucosa and infiltrate down nerves. Um, my hunch uh, was confirmed when I sent this biopsy for a, an antibody stain, and that identified spirochetes, um, characteristic of secondary syphilis in this patient. So um, my role at that point was to make an immediate phone call um, to, to relay that information and ensure that the patient um, didn't receive surgery, but instead um, received antibiotics and um, contact tracing was carried out. Uh, this was a sad story. I don't know the full details, but a, a former model um, in another country um, whose biopsy was misdiagnosed and uh, received um, radical treatment and unfortunately had a complication as well. In this country, we're um, fortunate enough to have multidisciplinary team meetings where um, before any radical treatments carried out, um, there's careful discussion of um, all the different um, clinical, pathological, radiological aspects of the patient's presentation. Um, more recently, of course, um, COVID-19 has prevented um, close social meetings um, such as this. And in fact, the other quality control um, we have in pathology is that we um, previously have sat around what's called a multi-header microscope. Um, uh, where we can discuss difficult cases and some of the subjectivity can be um, can be removed um, during that discussion. Um, so so those are now out of action as well due to social distancing rule rules. Fortunately, though, technology has come to our rescue, and in March, um, Microsoft announced that um, NHS staff could use uh, their teleconferencing platform, Microsoft Teams. And personally, I found that extremely useful and um, have bothered Ali probably even more since then with every difficult case. Um, and I've been able to share my microscope uh, and, and he's able to view, view my biopsies through Teams and we can discuss the cases together. I find that a, a very useful platform as well to discuss with my um, oral cancer surgeons and other healthcare professionals as well. Um, I'm the lead pathologist for um, a five hospital regional um, upper GI cancer, esophagus and stomach cancer, MDT, and um, even don't have to wear my mask for that, which is nice. We've used um, teleconferencing now in pathology for almost every part of our job. Um, our trainees um, 
used to sit next to us at the at the desk and look down the microscope now more and more we're doing um remote teaching that enables us to be a bit more uh, clever with with how we spread out the teaching we can do that regionally now without the travel costs and inconvenience that that that, that produces and in fact um Ali asked me to show this slide that I that I tweeted. Um, it, it seems that um, I think it's predominantly pathologists and radiologists that have have responded to this, but I think most people would prefer to carry on their MDTs and tumor boards via teleconferencing rather than face to face meetings. I certainly find that this kind of meeting, um, where there's a very um, clear um, goal to discuss various features and to decide on management works very well with um, with teleconferencing. Um, other types of conversations obviously are best carried out face to face. Um, one of the things we have to do as specialist um, pathologists is handle very complex surgical specimens. This is a mouth cancer uh, specimen uh, which, which to the untrained eye um, may look uh, like any old piece of um, tissue, um, but um, to the trained eye, we're able to identify um, that that this part of the um, specimen is the tumor on the oral cheek, um, that there's bone of the mandible underlying that, and that the tumor is involving the overlying skin, um, and that there's a, a malignant looking lymph node um, just in front of the submandibular gland. And this is the sternomastoid muscle, which um, uh, um, contains some of the uh, additional lymph nodes that were taken out at the time of surgery. One of the things that um, I've been working on is to be able to guide um, our lab technicians um, to handle some less complex specimens um, using um, teleconferencing. Um, we have cameras and microphones um, over the dissection bench. And so some of our... Um, uh, uh, technicians are able to help with um, pathologists carrying out this work um, with a socially distance and in fact sometimes doing this from home as well. This doesn't of course solve the problem, the work keeps coming, this isn't my desk fortunately, um, it's one of my colleagues in Plymouth um, who's now retired but um, uh, we, we end up with this situation sometimes where you know the, the pathologist goes off sick maybe or um, or has to shield um, for a couple of days and the, the, the room is full of urgent and less urgent cases that are sort of strewn around the office um, and it can be very difficult for the admin staff and um, clinical staff chasing the results to track down that particular biopsy. More and more we're looking at uh, digital pathology. Now digital pathology is just um, pathology um, but instead of looking down microscopes we're increasingly looking at biopsies on the computer screen this technology has been around since probably the 1950s um, in in a different guise i think it was used in the military initially in in um in in rural areas of canada to um, diagnose biopsies remotely more recently um we've been using starting to use whole slide imaging where the whole microscope slide is is scanned at terrific detail um, and then the pathologist is able to look at the the biopsies on um, a, a picture archiving system just as the radiologists use uh, use them as well and that that um, gives us terrific advantages to to share cases and and to um, to to um, use artificial intelligence as Ali has been describing earlier on in the day. Um, there's a lot of skeptics with this technology and um, it does add another step unlike radiology where they could take away the sort of toxic chemicals and, um, and, and films. We still have to produce slides so those slides still need to be scanned and that does add additional time um, and expense. So some people say is it, is it a solution looking for a problem just like this um, picture phone which obviously we're, we're using this kind of thing now, but we the problem has pushed us towards using this kind of technology. So the problem, there's a lot of text on this slide and I'll just scan over that mainly. Um, we've got a staffing and recruitment crisis in pathology. We are one of the vulnerable specialties. 
Um, about a third nationally of NHS consultants will have retired within five years. There's hundreds of jobs vacant and um, we don't have enough trainees coming through. Most trainees can get a job where they finish their clinical training and there's vacant jobs everywhere. It's difficult to recruit in areas that are geographically isolated such as ourselves and um, we have um, a lot of pathologists um, in these areas that are near to retirement. Also, increasingly centralized and specialized workload is good for patients, but it's very difficult to distribute that workload um, when there might be only one expert in a particular um, field such as mouth cancer in a, in a dispersed geographical region. Of course, digital pathology gives us pandemic resilience. Um, People might need to stay at home. In fact, it's it's being advised by the government that we should stay at home, work from home. And it's difficult currently with slides being moved in and out of departments uh, with concerns about viruses being transmitted on those hard surfaces. So digital pathology is no doubt the way to go, um, but there are challenges. Um, so the, um, the traditional way of getting a second opinion um, is that the the pathologist, the, the, the red face at the bottom of the slide um, and the left side of the, um, of the slide is showing that, that they're sent through jiffy bags um, and, and might uh, be sent to several pathologists in a row before getting a, a remote happy diagnosis. That may be weeks or months if special tests are needed um, at those places. With digital slides, we can distribute um, those images through um, a remote net network of pathologists. The, um, the sending pathologist can learn from that, um, uh, that case um, and from the expert in a more dynamic fashion. And sometimes um, we can get a, a second opinion within minutes. I've certainly have that luxury with working with Ali remotely too. Um, so the digital microscope, well, it's not just a digital microscope. It enables us to be more clever and lean um, with our workflow. Um, we're able to um, highlight urgent cases. This is one of my colleagues in up in Leeds who've gone fully digital, and um, they can arrange their workloads um, according to specialty, urgency. Um, those cases can be distributed throughout a wide geographical network um, potentially, and the the, the most expert. Uh, pathologist who, who happens to be available that day can potentially then um, diagnose um, that case wherever they happen to be sat. Of course, one of the most exciting areas is um, deep learning artificial intelligence, which I think has probably been discussed today already. This is a photo from my family archive. If you pick up your, um, your cell phone these days, and just search for a cat or a dog or something. It'll tell you. All, it'll show you all the photos in your in your album, and that's a similar technology uh, that that's being used um, in histopathology these days. Um, features which are suggestive of that particular feature can be highlighted, and the AI can be taught with amazing uh, rep repetitive um, and objective accuracy. And in fact, one of the things that I found interesting about this photo is that that a different kind of food which looks a bit like pizza was identified um, in my archive, which makes you wonder um, if that could be done with tumors as well. Um, in, in one of my other specialty of, of gastrointestinal pathology, um, but I know this is being done in oral pathology as well, um, even specific mutations, the targeted mutations for drugs can be identified quite accurately um, using artificial intelligence. And that allows the, the, the tissue to be used very much more sparingly and, um, and, and actually potentially more cheaply um, than um, running a whole uh, barrage of molecular tests. There are obviously ongoing problems and challenges with digital pathologists with digital pathology, we still need more pathologists. Um, even with this technology, we may be able to be more clever and efficient, but but um, we still need more people to 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 report those slides. We can't um, be reporting 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Um, it's very expensive and that's the main challenge at the moment, but it appears that um, this pandemic and other uh, uh, factors are pushing us more and more towards digital pathology. There's problems with the uh, lab information management systems, the LIMS, in that every lab has its own um, separate LIMS generally, um, and they don't tend to communicate very well with each other. Um, security is obviously vital. Um, but that needs to be um, balanced against usability. Um, systems can't be so secure that, that, that pathologists can't use them. And along those lines as well, um, this technology needs to be um, easier for pathologists to use, or at least as easy as what they do at the moment. Otherwise, it'll put people off and they'll want to retire early, which has certainly been threatened by many of my regional colleagues. Uh, finally, I suppose that people are worried about um, computers taking our jobs. Personally, I look forward to the day that um, that uh, artificial intelligence can do some of the more boring tasks that I have to do, like counting uh, mitotic figures and um, and 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 grading, um, where um, you know that process is quite subjective and time-consuming and better done by computers. So I'm just going to finally show that the antisocial pathologist, although socially distancing, uh, can be and has to be really sociable. Um, this is off the top of my head, uh, the groups of people that I tend to speak to on an almost daily basis. Um, I'm very, very grateful to my local um, colleagues and regional colleagues, um, and particularly in, in the context we're speaking today, my my maxillofacial surgical colleagues um, who've been a continuous inspiration and, and and are fantastic communicators we have a great relationship as a team and um, although teams is being used a lot i think the actual physical team is the most important thing um, and the, the the teleconferencing is a facilitator to that and finally just a bit of a plug i'd like to invite um or any any budding consultant pathologist to come and work in cornwall you might have seen on the BBC, Cornwall with Simon Reeve has started, and that's our very own beach, um, Port Town, which is 20 minutes from the hospital. So come and work here, and you could have the kind of lifestyle which um, we're very fortunate to have here. So thanks very much. Any questions? Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Tim. That was really interesting. And your living arrangements definitely didn't make me jealous at all. So, yeah, um, but you, you're so right. It's just things have changed a lot, haven't they? I mean, um, I know you've been quite active on social media, not just in terms of um, um, teaching and education, but generally just uh, sharing things about technology and sort of adopting new technologies as well. And there's not that many pathologies who actually do that. And that's probably one of the reasons that you and me did come across because... Um, is i mean in america i think as us is, is a lot more common uh, but I, I think things are changing uh, uh with new people coming in and like you said digital pathology probably becoming a bit more widely available and i think the expense or expensive nature of it probably is mitigated by the fact that pandemics and situations like covid actually show you how valuable it can be um, and that you can still maintain a good level of efficiency uh, by people working from home, etc., cetera. Um, because otherwise it would be very challenging to maintain and run a service, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that, that teleconferencing has been available. I mean, I think I used this kind of teleconferencing about 10 years ago. Um, but of course, we didn't really need it then. Um, but, but now we need it. And, and that need has pushed us into using it more. And now we're able to see how useful it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is a comment on YouTube uh, which says that given the access of non-clinical PhDs with a biomedical science background, is there an argument for diversifying training routes for histopathologists uh, similar to physician associate routes? That's a big question. And it's a, a very interesting one. I must admit, I'm a, uh, I, I'm a great advocate of... Um, um, pathologist assistants, and you've you've talked about the um, the US situation, and that's definitely um, almost commonplace there. Mm. I think there's um, there's a slightly 
paternalistic culture, I suppose, um, in that, you know, we, we know better and, um, you know, we need to do all this, um, all the dissection work, for example. But I think I've personally, in training uh, biomedical scientists to, to dissect some of these specimens, I find that, that they do a fantastic job. They might be, they, they don't cut as many corners as us. Um, you know, they're more careful, perhaps. Um, you know, we, we know we target our dissection, don't we, to, because of our, perhaps our increased clinical knowledge. Um, but I must admit, I'd be very happy training a biomedical scientist and observing them remotely to do a lot of this work. Um, and, and it's very satisfying as well um, for both. I think um, it makes them feel um, respected and cherished and, you know, in their roles and, and makes their roles more interesting. Yeah, what do you think about biomedical scientists reporting as well as cutting up? Because I know some places do that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a different question. Again, I think um, I don't I don't have a problem with it in, it, it, you know, in its um, basic form. I think perhaps um, some of the the roles in the in the dissection room perhaps would free us up to do more more reporting. But I think um, one of the things we're experimenting with down in Cornwall at the moment is a sort of pathologist triage system, um, something which perhaps could be done with AI in the future. Um, but, you know, to, to, to go through the, uh, the biopsies and, and to pick things up and, and push them into a more urgent category, for example, um, based on our, our clinical knowledge. Um, I think there's certainly um, a lot of my work, which I'd be very happy for an experienced biomedical scientist to report but um, I think, as we've talked about, communication and um, consensus diagnosis is, is so important and will continue to be, you know, whether that's side to side or remotely. I think we need to concentrate on trying to do that. And it, and it reduces that subjectivity initially when you, there's lots of studies um, showing that consensus diagnosis is safer for patients and, and, and leads to, to increased quality and, uh, and all those things that come with it. Yeah, and sometimes even between consultant pathologists, for example, or pre-cancer or dysplasia. I mean, in Sheffield, we actually double report or do a consensus report for all mouth cancers and dysplasias. Um, just because of the subjectivity, I mean, maybe cancer is not as much because it can be most of the time quite uh, obvious, uh, but particularly pre-cancer in terms of uh, agreeing a grade and, um, um, and the diagnosis. Um, and uh, one person, because just because there's so many sort of variables involved, and that even if you looked at the specimen yourself a few days later, a few months later, you might actually grade it differently. I think that's very true. You know, I sometimes say, you know, that the the amount of coffee I drink could change the grade of dysplasia that day mm -hmm. very slightly. Um, I don't want that to worry any of your patients, but it is a slightly subjective um, process. I found it very interesting to to hear one of your speakers earlier on talking about clinical photographs as well. And I think, you know, when when you develop uh, expertise in a particular specialty as a pathologist, you also get a keener eye for the for the macroscopic and clinical as well, um, and also radiological, um, which in oral pathology we need to. I think pathologists need to develop some expertise in those areas as well. Um, I was interested that one of your um, one of your speakers mentioned that obviously completely normal looking mucosa can also be dysplastic or precancerous as well, and that's something which um, uh, is certainly true. Um, I, and and I must admit, I always go back to the clinical photos in those those cases, and I want to try and identify, you know, are there any subtle abnormalities? I'm sure that um, increased um, use of imaging techniques will will improve both macroscopic photographs and um, and cross sectional imaging as well. Yeah, they can be a great tool because, like you said, if we're getting a small piece of tissue and we get a request form, and that's all the information we usually have, but that might just be the tip of the iceberg. So you actually want the context, and sometimes looking at the clinical photos, particularly for white patches or potential pre cancer, cancers can be a big help um, because it just 
help you decide whether it's something a bit more suspicious and do you want to be a bit more confident with your diagnosis? Just like radiology, I mean, sometimes we look at radiology as well just to sort of correlate what we're seeing pathologically. Um, just to come up with an answer which we think is probably going to help uh, get the best treatment for the patient. Absolutely right. I agree. I think, you know, the people talk about digital pathology is eventually a merging of, of radiology and, and histopathology into sort of macroscopic and microscopic imaging. And I think the more you look at them together, if you're taking a, a radiologically guided biopsy, then then you should ideally look at the, the radiology and the pathology on the same PAC system mm. to get the most from that. Um, so I just thought of one thing that might be interesting for, I don't know how many patients are watching right now and how many clinicians, but what actually happens to their biopsies after a biopsy has been taken? And I'm just wondering, would you mind going through the steps of what happens to their biopsy before we actually look at it and give a diagnosis? Yeah, sure. So um, the um, the biopsy is usually um, taken in a theater or a clinic and um, and is generally placed into formalin to fix, to fix the biopsy. It may be that if there's any... Um, special fluorescence techniques you know or, or some other specialist techniques that it, that it might have to be sent fresh that's the first um point where i think the communication um from the clinical team helps i think if you um if, if there's an unusual uh or difficult diagnosis it's it's good for the um, clinical team to get in touch with the pathologist um not just the reception um to discuss um how best to send these um the, these biopsies and that's certainly what my oral cancer surgeons do not infrequently um the the if if it's a small biopsy then those are generally um processed into small plastic cassettes in in the um, laboratory and, and go through a range of chemical um changes um uh in, in order to and then placed into paraffin into a paraffin block and then sectioned very very thinly and um, those sort of wafer thin slices of, of paraffin with the tissue inside them are, are floated onto onto a water bath and then placed onto a microscope slide and then that microscope slide will usually be stained with um, chemicals called hematoxin and eosin which will stain the cytoplasm and the nuclear material of the cell and give us our histological pattern that we're used to recognizing um, it can be that um, that these days that those um, the antibodies you use to identify particular antigens um, proteins in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm or on the cell surface and those can be um, targets for drugs so um, we, we're increasingly doing more and more of that and one of the things we can do under the microscope is, is dissect out um, specific areas of tumor in order to to test for particular mutations um, and that's something which I think you know may be guided with AI techniques in the future as well. Of course these days with the HPV related cancers and Chris was earlier talking about his experience and that it was HPV 18 positive and that's somewhere the pathologist is also quite important whether they do a a special color for a different type of stain or do a molecular analysis to actually get that information which may uh, decide the future treatment. Um, but uh, my previous conversations with patients have sort of made me realize that they, they don't, they never thought that pathologists have got such a key and central role to their treatment. I mean, before they start their treatment, it's dependent on the diagnosis that's given on the biopsy. Um, during the treatment, sometimes, uh, we may get intraoperative frozen sections so when the patient is actually having the surgery, the surgeons, if they think they're not sure whether they've got all the tumor, may send us something which we quickly snap freeze and have a look at. And then, of course, after the surgery, when we look at whether all the tumor has been removed and whether there's any tumor in any of the, the lymph nodes or, or glands, etc., which will determine whether the patient needs any future surgery or chemo radiotherapy. So... But unfortunately, we're quite invisible and almost sort of hidden. I, I like to think the pathologists are the unsung heroes in the mouth cancer, but not just mouth cancer, basically uh, in the patient's uh, sort of journey. Um, and uh, do you think um, 
I mean, like you said, most people think most people become pathologists because they don't have any people skills <laughs> or don't really like people or want to talk to people. Uh, well, but, I don't know uh, whether that's really the case, but I think um, that there's, there's, there's a tendency for people to think that about pathologists. I think, you know, I always say we're all a bit on the spectrum, but, you know, we're, we are, um, we're certainly analytical personality types, aren't we? Um, but I've seen a huge range of personality types in pathology. I did surgery before pathology, and, and I think I've seen more of a range of, of um, personality types in pathology than any of any other specialties I've trained in or, or seen. Um, but you, So I think some of those stereotypes are a little unfair, but I think um, uh, likewise, I think if, if, if people go into medicine, uh, they shouldn't be put off if they are perhaps quite introverted and analytical. Um, and they're interested in science, and I think they could be in, in, very happy in pathology. And um, we we can all find a niche within what we do in pathology. There's so many different subspecialties. Mm. Um, that there's so many ways in which we can, um, you know, carry out our art and our science really um, in pathology. So it's it's, it's a very satisfying specialty. Um, I previously took um, biopsies myself as well, and. You know, that's certainly um, something which is open to pathologists to be able to do um, if, if their department supports that. Mm. Do you miss the patient communication? Because a few times I felt like I maybe uh, missed uh, not being able to speak to those patients. That's the reason that I volunteer to actually speak to some of the patients to if they want to come around and discuss their specimen and, and the pathology and what it actually meant and what sort of things we look for. Yeah. And, uh, I find it quite rewarding and I felt like that the patients find it really interesting because they don't really have uh, any idea of how much tissue was removed and what it looked like and what it actually meant. Yes, I, I do actually. And, and, and previously just doing fine needle biopsies myself, um, I've had some great chats with patients and um, perhaps with the benefit sometimes of not having to deliver the diagnosis, um, which can be difficult, but um but but you know I've really enjoyed my my time communicating with patients and I I'd, I'd happily do it again if there was the ability to do that and I suppose one of my um, uh, optimistic thoughts with digital pathology and artificial intelligence is it may um, free up time for us to do more of that in the future and I think um, what what we're going to end up with with artificial intelligence is a load more data. And I think who are the people that are going to understand that, that data best is going to be us. Mm. You know, so I think we should be the people that should be communicating that data. I think we've lost the, to some extent, uh, lost the battle with genetic data um, in that we've handed it over to others um, to some extent. I don't know that pathologists do, some pathologists do a lot of genetics, molecular genetics, um, but we tend to outsource that don't we, to someone else to, to yeah. report. But I think with AI data, um, computational pathology, I think it'll be up to us to, to do that. And that's, that's my hope. Mm. Fingers crossed. Uh, Chris has just mentioned on YouTube, uh, uh, Tim, what a great insight to a hidden profession to a patient. So thanks for that. And uh, Dan, who posed the earlier question about BMS, as he was saying, uh, interesting discussion and I think it would be very attractive to some BMS and PhD biologists um, the thing you mentioned about cutting up and being able to report a bit as well you know there's an institute of biomedical scientists uh, isn't it and uh, more and more you can become an advanced biomedical scientist and be able to cut some specimens and report um, some biopsies as well so there, there is a sort of pathway that exists but there's not that many people who do it yeah, from what I understand, the, the rules are quite restrictive. Um, but, um, you know, if the pathologist is taking overall responsibility and, and overseeing the process, then I see no problem with, with doing bits and pieces as we go and, and instilling your, confidence. And in terms of your mouth cancer patients and new diagnosis, have you guys seen any difference pre and post COVID or has your service pretty much continued as normal? We've been very fortunate in this area to have had very very low uh, numbers of covid patients one thing we've noticed in my other main specialty the sort of gullet and stomach cancers is that um, we had a worrying decrease in presentations um, suggesting that people were staying at home 
um, afraid of coming into hospitals. Um, and I think that was certainly in this part of the world, arguably more damaging than the virus itself. Hmm. But, you know, we've been quite lucky in that geogra being ge geographically um, separated from the more densely populated parts of the country that, um, that, that the virus has, has spread here very much more slowly and perhaps dispersed. And, and in your eyes, what do you think are the challenges in terms of diagnosis of mouth cancer? I mean, we've discussed, you and me, on occasions, some of the things like the overlap with the skin cancers. It can be quite close for head and neck, sort of SCCs, etc. And then you've got so many different types of cancers and tumors in a very sort of small uh, region of the body, which can be quite challenging. Um and just like a hairline's width can make all the difference in terms of how you stage or treat them. But other than that, uh, I mean, you can elaborate on that, but also do you feel like there are any other challenges, et cetera, any challenges or issues or barriers that you feel like? We I can find that, that mouth cancer, head and neck pathology in general, it gives you incredible diagnostic um, challenges as a pathologist. And I think, if if you're someone that likes to put pieces of jigsaw together, um, then I think it would appeal to you. You know, we I think it puts off a lot of pathologists to go into this area because they're afraid by the sort of cornucopia of, you know, diagnoses, which you see, you know, you see lymphomas presenting and mesenchymal sarcomas, you know, strange inflammatory conditions. You know, we see, we see everything, um, don't we? And and developmental things in children. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I feel personally that I will never, you know, fully understand <laughs> this specialty. <laughs> you know, there's, I've been doing it, you know, decades now and, um, and, and I still see something and learn something new every single day, pretty much, you know, and, and, and that's, actually attracts me more to it yeah. um and and i sort of think well you just give it your best shot and you and you always think about the patient and and think about what you can do for the patient yeah i think what you said is spot on i think that's probably for me as well the most attractive thing is that just the variety of things that you see and uh, how not challenging but i mean thought-provoking everything is and there's very few things that are simple and straightforward and you always have to sort of uh, think outside the box and possibly take into account other things like we spoke about clinical photographs and radiographs and um, so yeah it's uh, it's it's quite different uh, to all the other um, sort of areas or regions I would say so quite demanding in a way uh, but also at the same time intellectually quite stimulating and rewarding if you actually get things right. I would say so. You know, I, I, there's aspects of being a general pathologist that I like as well. It keeps me, um, it keeps me thinking about the, the, the patient as a whole. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's this kind of work which, which gets my juices flowing, really. You know, it makes me think. It makes me consider. It makes me, unfortunately, sometimes keeps me up at night. <laughs> Anna tells, tells me off or sometimes, but... Um, mm. But yeah, I find it terrifically rewarding. I've turned off everything in my um, office except my landline phone, which is still ringing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually turned it off this morning because I knew it would ring today, <laughs> although it never rings. But the staying up at night is a really interesting problem because uh, that happens to me as well. Actually, last time it happened was a, I wouldn't even say second opinion, it was a fourth opinion case. It already been to three pathologists and then it came to me as a fourth person and you know, one of those where you're not really sure the first time you look at it. And I just went home sort of unsure about it, not completely satisfied with what I thought I was going to call it. And two or three in the morning, I just woke up and like, it's one of those. Yeah. It shows you care though, Ali. It shows you care. You know, I, I sometimes have these, these aha moments when I'm riding my bike into work. And I, I, I was, I had one of those five or six years ago. I was cycling home and I, and I just put a report out and I turned around. I thought, it's wrong. I bet it's mm. going to be one of these, you know, uh, lethal midline granular. Mm. <laughs> turned around, went back mm. and it was, it was bang on. But, you know, you've got to listen to those. Absolutely. Your spidey Definitely. senses, as I call it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you mentioned the views or potential application of AI. So I know there's a lot of promise and a lot of talk, but not many things have been clinically deployed. And I know, I mean, there's one or two that have been recently sort of used. Uh, is it IBEX or uh, yeah, uh, something like that? And do you know how that's working and what's the sort of feedback or results so far? And do you think there'll be more like that? Very much. Um, one of the problems I think is the regulatory restrictions at the moment. Um, everything needs to be um, compared with the gold standard, which at the moment is us. Um, the, the IBEX algorithm you're talking about is a prostate cancer um, diagnosis tool. I've, I've been fortunate enough to trial it um, on some uh, sort of archive cases, I guess. The the ethics are difficult at the moment as well because you can't use it retrospectively. Mm. You can't go back and, uh, f f and use it on patients who've already been treated. Um, but but um, it was incredibly impressive. And I know from people in the know um, who don't have any financial um, interest in that company that, um, that they've found it incredibly instructive and uh, it's taught them things as well. Um, it's a little bit like the guy that got beaten at, at, at Go or, or chess by the, um, by the algorithm. Hmm. You know, he could have taken it as, um, you know, this is a time to give up, but it, it, instead he thought, I want to get better than this thing. You know, and I think that's what we need to do as pathologists. We need to think, well, we're going to learn from this algorithm. I've spotted that thing before under the microscope. I didn't know what it was. And the algorithm's telling me it's important, you know, so I think, um, and, and that's, that will happen with, with mouth cancer as well, yeah. undoubtedly. Um, Chris Gerd is asking, uh, I don't know whether you attended his talk earlier from the Solos. He's, he's asking which hospital you're based in and are you up for a collaboration to tell your story? Because he'd like to get in touch. Good. There he is. He's just joined us. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hi, all right. Yeah, we can't see you. Uh, yeah, that could be a there good you are. Thing. Welcome back. Okay? Yeah. Perfect. Hi, Chris. Hi, Tim. Nice to hear the talk. Thank you. So uh, it would be nice to uh, collaborate with you and uh, document your story and be able to share it with people through our network, because I do believe your service is a hidden service. I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, there's a few of us like Ali and myself that are, that are a bit outspoken about it. And, you know, I'm really glad to have had this opportunity to, um, to tap into this, you know, I'd never be as organized and, um, and, and motivated enough to be able to put something like this together. But I know he's, he's been able to do that with his team, which has been fantastic. Uh, I, um, I remember being diagnosed with my, my cancer, um, for throat cancer. And they told me it was going away for a biopsy. And it wasn't until I started doing this advocacy work, some, what, five, six, I realized it wasn't a machine that told me I had cancer. It was actually a human being. And I honestly thought that it just went away. Some x-ray or some machine looked at whatever they took out of my body and said it had cancer. What I didn't realize, someone actually cut it up, looked at it, and then actually defined my treatment pathway. Yeah. And that's one thing which amazing. I've... Which I've I've um, not mentioned enough is that you know we've got in most departments like this we've got seventy or eighty sometimes uh, people working in the lab and they've all got their own role. Um, I don't do any of that um, work apart from the identification, the dissection of the specimens. You know the rest of it is done by highly skilled um, uh, biomedical scientists and lab technicians. Um, who, 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 you know, a little bit like, you know, making a car, they're putting all the bits together yeah. and they've yeah. all got their own vital role. And, you know, we, we don't speak up. We get more pathologists don't, no one knows about us, but, you know, the people know even less about the, about yeah. the people working in the lab. Yeah. So, yeah it needs think, to be uh, recognized. It's a shame because it's such an important part of our cancer journey as patients. It starts from the minute you guys start looking at whatever they take out of our body. And you do define what's going to happen later. And, and you know, I don't know whether you know um, Emily Fong from Scotland, but she's an, a local artist that has got funding. And what she's done is she's tracked a biopsy from when the patient was told he had to have a biopsy. 
So she's tracked it in art all the way through and is still tracking that patient because she fetched the biopsy alive through art. And it's an incredible project. And some of the art that she's done, you, you need to look at her work. It's unbelievable. And what she's doing is she, in simple ways of art, she's making that biopsy come alive. She's even named the biopsy because uh -huh. what we found amazing was that she was working on drawing this bit of flesh or a bit of organ, but actually the person it came out of was still alive. Right. So she had to do that organ justice because it was alive to a person and it's incredible work. She, she showed her work at the conference last, last week and it's just, it's unbelievable. So you need to look at, and she, she works, she's out of Edinburgh um, in Scotland. So if you don't have got that, yeah. then Tim, if you send me an email, I'll send I'd love you. To, I'd love to see that. I, I, that was yeah, one thing which I didn't well. really, I didn't really mention, but I think um, what, one thing which, which brings pretty much all pathologists together is our fascination with, you know, the beauty of the microscopic world. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think you know, I've had clinicians say to me, oh, I, d I don't understand uh, histology images. And it's just familiarization. You know, yeah. it's, it's what, what one day you look at them enough and, it'll, and it all just comes out and you can understand it. Um, and I don't believe that anyone has, doesn't have those, those skills. It's just that, you know, we look at CT scans and MRIs and, you know, all the time now and, and it took back 10 years, I wouldn't have been able to recognize anything on those um, wow. apart from the fact that the patient had a head. Um, but, but now, you know, in my own specialties, I can, I can recognize quite a lot of pathology on, um, on scans, which I, I wasn't previously yeah. able to do. It'll and histology is the same. It'll be interesting to see if you looked at one of her pictures whether you could see what part of the process it is, because that would be the ultimate hmm. pick to her. It sounds like a, a pub quiz round to me in the making. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, honestly, Tim, the work's incredible. I'll send you some links and you need to look at it. I'd love to see that. Yeah. There's a lot of people on YouTube, because I mentioned it, want to see it, but obviously I couldn't put one of the pictures up, but I'll send it to, to Ali and I'm sure Ali will be able to distribute it. That would be great. Yeah. Thanks yeah, I'd love to collaborate with you more, Tim. Going, what hospital are you from? So, um, Royal Cornwall Hospital in oh, Truro. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's Can't the you tell? Can't remember. you tell? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's really I'm, interesting. I'm the... at University Hospital Plymouth as well. I, I work one afternoon a week in in Plymouth. All oh, right, well, we do look some after remote the, work there as well. We've got a support group in Plymouth. Okay. We have uh, we look after the head and neck patients in Plymouth. Okay. So yeah, we'll definitely we'll definitely collaborate up. And yeah, you know Steph happens. Steph Murgatroyd and her yeah. team, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. So, yeah, that's Sorry, quite interesting we're because when I got in touch uh, with the Oral Health Foundation last year about mouth cancer, and I think Stephen actually when he rang, rang me and he said we've never heard from a pathologist, no one has actually ever approached to be an ambassador for mouth cancer. Um, but we are in a lucky position because we are in Sheffield and one of our Actually, a few of my colleagues have just joined. So Ian Varley is uh, uh, our maxillofacial <laughs> cancer surgeon and also the MDT lead. And Simon Harvey has joined us as well. He is a maxillofacial radiology consultant in London. Um, we've also got Jane Thornton, who's a speech and language lead in Sheffield, and Kate Smith, uh, um, who's a di dietitian uh, and really our expert opinion that our MBT is quite valuable. And um, hopefully we'll be joined by one or two other people. So uh, Ian, uh, I'm not sure whether you know Chris. Uh, Chris uh, is a mouth cancer survivor and he's also the chairman of the, the Swallows. Uh, had an next support uh, group, which you may have heard of. Actually, we've just been uh, joined by Sarah as well. Um, hi. Hi, Sarah, thanks for joining us. You're sideways. Uh I know, I'm just going to sorry, turn my camera around. And basically we were just talking about, and Christina just joined us as well. So one Hello. Of our recently appointed consultants in Sheffield. Thanks a lot, everyone, for, for dialing in. But basically all day we've just been talking about issues with mouth cancer, particularly late presentation and what can be done to overcome that, how COVID has affected things and whether 
a lot of patients are still waiting in the wings, difficulties in diagnosis, etc. But also the journey of the, the patient. Um, and Chris uh, shared uh, his story earlier, which was when he was diagnosed and how much information was given to him in such a short space of time, which was quite overwhelming to come to terms with that. And that's how we ended up uh, setting up the swallows. Uh, to actually not just help the patients, but also their families who end up being the caregivers for these patients. And I just thought it would be really nice to hear from all of you because all of us are actually contributing to these patients' care and diagnosis in uh, some way. Uh, so I was just wondering, Sarah, what, what was your experience as a patient? It would be quite nice to start off with you. If you can just share your story. Um, I think initially it took quite a while um, to actually get the diagnosis, which was um, I, I had the symptoms in the October of 2013, but I didn't get my diagnosis until the end of August um, 2014. Um, once I was actually diagnosed and sort of on, on my journey of treatment, so to speak, um I couldn't really fault it. The hospital were fantastic. They kept me informed all the time. Um, if I ever felt I had questions or needed to talk to somebody, they were available. Um, the McMillan team, for example, were there was always somebody available via um sort of internet or phone uh if I had any concerns. So in that sense I felt very supported. And is there anything you would change about it, how information was given to you about your diagnosis and anything that you feel like would have been more helpful? Um, I think the actual getting to the point of diagnosis, I, I felt I was um, misinformed along the way from going to my dentist initially with the problem um, to actually finally getting referred and then seen by the hospital that took quite a long time um and then the actual wait from having had my surgery to actually starting my treatment as well that was put back a couple of times which added to the anxiety um but i think once i'd actually been told the communication as i say from the hospital was great I don't think the early part actually with the dentist was so supportive. Um, and I think what surprised me was that although I didn't know it was cancer at that point in the October, um, November time, when I actually went for my appointment in November, in the waiting room, there was a massive campaign about mouth cancer and the symptoms, what to look for. And at no point from the November until the April when I was referred to the hospital, did anybody in my dental surgery suggest that it could possibly be mouth cancer? That was never even a, a possibility. Um, which when I look back now, I had at least sort of two or three symptoms. I'm surprised it wasn't something that they investigated. It's really interesting because during the day we've been hearing the dentists are probably better at picking uh, pre-cancer and cancer up than, than medics just because they see see these more. Chris, what was your experience uh, from diagnosis to treatment? Um, I got diagnosed very quickly and I think it happened too quick in one sense because I got diagnosed and very quickly I was in the in the journey of treatment and, and things were happening that because normally previous to this I always thought the NHS you go in for a consultation and you've got to wait six months to even get back to, to be seen by somebody. And there I was being seen. And then within a week, I was back having a biopsy. And then within seven, eight days, I was being told I'm starting all my treatment. So it was a bit scary, really, because it happened too quick. But I understand now why it had to happen quick, because where the tumour was and the, what it was about to do to me, they wanted me in treatment sooner rather than later because it started to choke me. So, but it, from a patient's point of view or a person's point of view, it's frightening. And all the information they give you, on top of all that, it just, the only way I can explain it is like looking at a blue screen, the old fashioned computers. You look at a screen, you do try and do two things on it and it goes blue and then it disappears and, and it spots away and you have to reboot. I think that's what your brain does. There's all this information coming at you 
And sooner or later, the brain has to say enough's enough. You're not taking any more in. And it stops you taking it in. So it puts a barrier up. And also the psychologist said to me that, you know, you either accept it or you want to flee. And the human thing is to flee away from the danger. And this is suddenly going to become a danger to me as a, as a human being. So my natural thing is, is to get away from it. And the only way I can do that is shut my brain down. The frightening bit was, was that at the point that I realized my body didn't belong to me anymore. I was handing over my life and my body to an oncologist and a nurse. And I had, I'd lost all independence on whether I could do or can't do. My life was in the hands of somebody else. I had no control on what was going to happen. That was the frightening bit. Mm. Mm. Ian and Christina, as our surgeons here, would you like to sort of continue the conversation here? And... Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Is a slight uh, lag or buffering. Ian is froze, it looks like. Okay. Hey, Ian, we can't hear you. Okay, Christina, your connection seems to be better, so. Yeah, I find it quite interesting um, what the gentleman was saying about how frightening it is to get information in a quick hey, amount of time. Not doing too well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's a different point of view from what I would have expected. Um, and do you think the help of the, the support from the nest specialist is actually something that should be introduced as early as possible in any consultation? to support patients in getting all the information and digesting all the information that's given, particularly if it's given in a fast amount of time. I find that that seems to me to be the limiting factor, the support of our amazing nurses. So from my point of view, I got, I had my diagnosis, went back for my review and you walk into the room and suddenly you're surrounded by all these specialist people and you know straight away something's not right because this just doesn't happen and then they say the oncologist said i've got some bad news it's cancer and from that moment your brain starts to shut off but then we were taken into a separate room with just the cns was my nurse specialist who sat us both down with a cup of tea why english people have to have cups of tea i'll never know but we had a cup of tea <laughs> with lots of sugar in it. I don't take sugar. And then she explained everything. The problem is, my, it was, I'll show you. That's my folder I had when I left the hospital. And I've still got it to this day. And inside it is all the paperwork with all the documents, with everything. And you have to take all that in within the space of 15, 20 minutes. And then you go home and then the bombshell ha happens and you're in this flea mode of trying to get away from it all and your brain just can't take it. And, and the CNSs, I think, do a great job. And I think they are so vital to the pathway. But they are restricted on what they can and can't do. They're out, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes when I was in a room was not enough. I think what should happen also is a patient advocate should be available to talk to patients at that point that can give hope to where they're going to go on that journey. So, you know, mm -hmm. the MDT is supposed to be surrounded by experts. With all due respect, all you surgeons and all you medical people went to university and thank God you did and you come out as experts. I tell you what, the experts are the patients that's lived it and gone through it. We're the ones that are the experts. So why not use those experts to help the next patients come in through? I'm not saying every patient is capable of doing that. But if you've got advocates in your area and you've got groups like the Swallows, going back to my talk, you really should be engaging with us more mm. to help those patients in clinic. 
because yeah. we would take some of that anxiety away from people, which means those patients then would be more compliant, which means they will have an easier and a softer journey through. And if they've got a problem, they've got a mentor to ring. Whereas at the moment, they don't until they're in the position that they are really struggling. And then they contact us on our 24-7 number at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That could all be stopped. Sorry. Thanks, just, no, it's fine. Yeah, please. Do. Ali, can I just say something? Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I think it's really, really, really important that the patient is, you know, and like you say, we use this buddy system of um, the expert patients. And we do have... And I think most areas are very similar like this. We have a selection of patients because, like you say, everybody is different and everybody's experience is different. Um, I think there's been a big push not to include the patient that, you know, sorry, the, I don't know what you call them, ex-patient, patient user, expert, um, at that very first appointment because we never know how the person is going to react to that news that they have got cancer and the plan but we do always offer them a visit. And for, I mean, I've been working this area now for 30 years, so I've got quite a bit of experience of this. Um, and by and large, most of our patients don't want to talk to anybody at that stage. Um, yes, they do afterwards. And we would obviously be in frequent consultation with them as to what they want. Um, but at that first stage, like you say, you're bombarded with so much news. And even the people who think they know what they're going to hear are still really stunned when they do hear it or relieved fall into two camps there um so I get your point that you know you are the experts because you absolutely are and I will always say this to patients I can tell you the theoretical stuff I can tell you what the plan is but I can't tell you what it's like going through it only what people have told me um yeah, I agree with that, Jane. But what I will also say is, so here in Blackpool and at Preston and other hospitals we deal with, we're in the waiting room with a little stand and a little table. So we're just sat within the waiting room. Mm. So if the nurses find they have a patient that really needs to talk to someone, they come and get us and we go in. But most of the time they just walk past us because they've just been told the news and they're in that zone of let's get out of here. But on their second meeting appointment, they've got these questions. They suddenly then will come over and talk. But you'll always get that patient that is in that room that says, I need to talk to someone. Well, that's the case when you fetch them in. I'm not saying we should be at every meeting mm. because I think that would be the wrong place to be unless the patient is particularly wanting to talk to someone who's been there and wore the T-shirt. But if we're in the waiting room then you can always say, look, there's a group out there. There's a couple of people out there that's been through it. They've done it. You don't have to talk to them, but while you walk past, they're there. And the amount of people that would stop us post before COVID and just have a chat and literally just talk. But I'm picking, we have that 24 seven number and we pick up more calls before COVID between 11 at night and five in the morning. Now we've got COVID, we pick up more calls during the day than we do at night. Yeah. And that's because they don't have the instant access to you guys anymore. And that's not your fault. Mm -hmm. It's just the way COVID is. Yeah. So, yeah, I just think that people like ourselves have that extra little bit of safety net that patients can talk to in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And being in the hospital is is a great place or most of the hospitals we deal with would just give us one give them one of our books which is full of stories but it's positive stories you wouldn't give that book to someone you're giving the news that it's going to be palliative care because it's giving false hope mm. but someone that's got hpv and you know there's every chance they're going to survive having a book full of patient stories telling the truth how they've been is quite uplifting mm. Mm. and that's the way i'm suggesting that we sh it should be used. You know, giving them, giving them Macmillan generic head and neck patient book out is not what patients need to see. It's like going to the GP and you've got four minutes to explain what's wrong with you because they deal with every illness. Mm -hmm. You know, Macmillan deal with every cancer. We specialize in head and neck. And that's the difference. And that's what I said in my talk. You know, if I go and see someone for my cancer, I don't want to go and see a GP. I want to go and see an oncologist who's a specialist in my disease. That's all I'm saying. You should be looking vice versa. 
So, yeah, I, I understand and, and accept everything you say, Jane, but it's always a, an opportunity to do things differently with an active always. group. That's all. Always. And um, Ian and Kate, I don't know, I remember, I mean, I've seen some emails somewhere, uh, the interaction with Solos mentioned at our MDT as well. So I think there were some plans, weren't there? I am um, sorry, my internet bill, I'm not sure, has been paid. Um, I'm struggling a little. <laughs> Naughty boy. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a very, uh, very good um, group of uh, supportive patients who have been absolutely fantastic. Um, as Jane says, we're, we're very lucky to have people who are, um, when we need them, are very, very supportive for the patients who want to speak to somebody. Not everyone does, um, but a lot do take us up on that offer. Um, and a lot do um, get to speak to, to patients. We've, tr we've got some who've had um, very easy courses through their treatment, all the way up to people who've suffered every single complication I think we've ever seen. Um, and they're all wonderful at explaining how they've got through it and how they've coped with it. So we've been very lucky. Can I add in there as well? Um, so I'm also the chair for the Head and Neck um, pathway for the Cancer Alliance for South Yorkshire and Bassett Law as well. And so we have been linking in the past with the Swallows. Um, we've had you at a couple of our um, engagement sessions, our clinical delivery groups. Um, and that has informed us quite a lot more about engaging with patients and linking in with patient representatives when we're looking at improving the pathway of the patient journey. Um, and we've actually got a couple of projects on the way at the moment that actually do exactly what you suggested there, Chris, about engaging the patient to advise us as clinicians on how best we can support the patient at that diagnosis stage. Um, so Jane, myself and the ENT team are currently doing an NHS England project to look at that. Um, so we're in the early stages, but it is something we are looking at. Um, but you touched on the fact that you had a huge file of, of written information in there. Um, I just wondered if um, you could explain a little bit about the perspective of your partner or carer at the same time, because quite often we find that the patient goes, like to say, into a blue screen of of just low cancer but the partner or the relative is actually the one that then takes over the information gathering and and absorption of the information during that consultation and it's one of the um things that some places in england have done is record that session and then provide a dvd or a cd rec audio recording of that session and mm. say so the patient themselves can hear it back at a late age um, and i wondered kind of what the perspective would be of that and um, what your your uh, wife felt during that consultation and, and how her support could help you. So, not that I ever speak on behalf of my wife, although as I get told off, um, and she is in the other room, so I'll have to be careful what I say, but she don't like coming on camera, so I'm going to talk on her behalf. I think the caregiver, and I don't like the, we, none of us like the word carer because carer is a professional person that is trained. Caregivers are the ones that are suddenly a secretary and then become someone that has to look after someone without any training. So when we've done a recent survey on the name carer or caregiver, 99% said they would rather have caregiver because they feel that is what they're doing. They are given time to look after someone that they love. They're not a carer that goes into a rest home. The information side from the, the, the caregiver side, you know, that box that I have down there, I would suggest neither of us really looked into that. I think Sharon started Googling a bit more than what I did. I didn't want to know anything about where I was, what, what size tumour it was, what it was. And I think from the minute I got told, I went in shutdown. So Sharon had to stand up to that bit of doing the research, doing the questioning. The problem is that the health professionals were talking to me and not to her. So when they're talking, they're directing their conversation to me and not turning their eyes to her. Um, the information overload is the same, but Sharon's always said that we were on the same journey, but on different tracks. So her needs were different to what, what my needs were but nobody but nobody ever turned to her and said how are you coping do you need any help as a caregiver not one of the health professionals 
And that is wrong. So we have been doing over the last 12 months a lot of work with caregivers and we've got lots of films that we film carers, caregivers talking about their experiences. And it all comes out the fact that they're not treated as a couple, they're treated that you're treating the patient and the caregiver is someone there that then you're expecting them to go out like Sharon, I had a peg fitted, so my peg is fitted, go home and now feed him. Well, how do I do that? Well, two minutes lesson and go away and feed him. It's, it's a case of you're expecting the wife, the parent, to do an awful lot that they can't do. And the caregiver, we honestly believe, without them, the NHS would implode. Yet they're not taken as part of this journey that we're all on. And they have different needs. When we have a monthly meeting, we always separate our caregivers to our patients. So they have a meeting and our patients do. When they're together, it's a different atmosphere. When they separate, all their troubles on both sides come out. And when you bring them back together, the dynamics change again, where they protect each other. But the caregiver needs to have that space and time to talk. And information overload is a massive problem. I reviewed Richard Simcock's practice and he tapes every conversation. The patient sits in a chair and everybody comes to that patient. And at the end of the consultation, whoever speaks to that patient, they're given a disc. They take that away for two days, they listen to it and come back with questions. When I spoke to those patients and looked in their eyes, not one patient or caregiver had information overload glaze because they don't have to. They don't have to take it in. They've got a disc. If one hospital can do it, why can't every hospital do it? And we've been talking about information overload for nine years across the UK at different levels. There is too much talk and not enough action on information overload. And even today, a patient will get a box of information. No different than I did on Friday the 13th, 2011. And that's not right. Because in the overall big picture, it's not important. Because compliant wise, you've got to give them the information because that's part of the pathway. So we all get that information and then we're off on a journey. But you've got to stop and think that maybe patients aren't complying because they haven't heard what you've said. They haven't listened to you. They haven't done this. And information overload has got to be looked at more so than anything else. Because if you get that right, you've got a compliant patient. You've got a compliant patient and surely that makes your job easier. And the caregiver is the big part of that. And, and it's understanding that caregiver. But saying that, we're dealing with a patient who is caregiver is a manic again. depression. Yeah. And what he says to her, when he's in the hospital, he has to be the, be the big, brave man in front of his wife. So he said to me on a call, can I tell the nurse to make an excuse to move her away? Because I have issues I need to talk about. But in the hospital, he was a big, brave man taking everything because he couldn't allow her to see him weak. So how the hell you guys deal with that? I haven't got a clue. But that's what health professionals are up against. And I feel sorry for you all because rightly so, I think Jane and, and everyone else said, no one patient is the same. I've dealt with 7,000 patients now and I can honestly say not one journey, one attitude has ever been the same. I break my arm, you put me in plaster, six weeks later, it's fixed. I get cancer for throat cancer. My God, I can't, I don't know of one patient that's ever been the same. It's not easy. Katie, it's, you've got a thankless job. But by talking to people like us and letting us do the surveys and letting us get involved, maybe we can help and give you that 1% insight into a patient's world that will make 100% difference to that patient. That's all I ask for. Um, and we don't know. We haven't got it all right yet. But, you know, the caregiver, you've got to look at big style. They're your, they're your allies to make sure that patient is compliant. When I was on a feeding peg and they were trying to get me off it, 
I used to hide my food and pretend I'd eaten it because I didn't want to eat. So I would have the bowl and I'd throw it away so no one could see it and I'd leave it dirty on the side so people thought I ate. That's the reality of patients at home. Patients tell you what you want to listen to. When I go in a hospital, and I've always said, when I went into my hospital appointments, I was in my safest place. I would have stayed in that, that waiting room for my whole journey. So if you ask me questions in there, I was in the best place ever. But Sharon would say, hang on a minute, Chris, that's not right. Because yesterday you were doing this. You've not done this. But while you're asking me the questions in that clinic, it, I'm safe. So I'm in a happy place. So again, how are you guys supposed to understand that? It's a thankless job. And I wouldn't want to do your job for love nor money. But what we can do is try and help. And that's all. That's why I set up the charity. And that's why we do what we do. Trying to bring the reality of that patient in, into your role that you're not going to get from a patient that is currently going through treatment. So, okay. sorry, but that's... No, that's all right. Don't just say sorry. Does anyone like to respond to that, Tim? Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask how, um, uh, how patients are doing now with remote consultations, you know, with their first diagnosis. I guess the advantage is that they can have the diagnosis in their own home but and be with their loved ones rather than them not being able to go into hospital with them but obviously the disadvantage of not of of lacking that face-to-face -face con contact i think there's a there's a there's a type of patient that would deal with it and there's a type of patient that can't deal with it um and i think you know our next generation patients are born with mobile phones in their hand and they're going to be used to this type of work go back 12 months ago and we would have even be thinking about having this because we'd all be scared but i had my um six month consultation the other month online and i found it fantastic because a i didn't have to go out my house i didn't have to worry about car parking so a, a 15 minute appointment normally would take me two and a half hours it took me 15 minutes and then i had a cup of coffee drinking a coffee while i was talking to them and I actually felt I had 100% of that doctor's attention and not him listening to the waiting room and thinking, oh, I'm late, I'm running late, so I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I actually felt that it was 100%. But I do have patients of an older age group, and I'm 60-odd, but, you know, 70-plus, that are scared stiff. I had a 76-year-old lady that has never been on the internet her granddaughter got on it and she got told she had cancer. That's not the right person to tell. But again, you know, how do you understand what is right for one or not right for the other? You've got to have a conversation then with the caregiver or the family to understand. And can you have that conversation beforehand that you're telling someone they've got cancer? I don't know. I don't know the right answer, but... I think going forward, there's got to be a protocol of the type of patient you can talk to, and there's got to be a protocol that you can't talk to. You're never going to get it right, but you know you would hope that 90% of the time you get it right. And Sarah, was your experience similar? I'll just briefly touch on that and then see whether Austin and Bernie can share some of their experience of first appointments and new diagnoses. Um my experience was a bit different and um, I'd had quite a long wait as I said from having the symptoms to actually getting the diagnosis in the August um, when I went to get my results um, I'd initially had a biopsy and I thought that it was the, the pain I was having was to do with the wisdom tooth so cancer wasn't even on my radar and um, when I got to the appointment, my son was with me. He was, he was 12 at the time um, because it was the summer holidays. So I sort of dragged him in thinking it was just, a, you know, an update on what was going on. And when I got into the room, it was full of people. And I thought, oh, OK, this doesn't look very good. And they asked me how I was and sort of said, oh, you know, have a seat. And then they said, oh, um, we found malignant cells. And I think, it, um, like Chris was saying, at that point, my 
I was sort of looking quite calm on the exterior, but inside my head was just spinning. And I was trying to take in as much as I could whilst being aware that my 12 year old is in the room and he's sort of trying to obviously compute what's been said. Um, I think that was then bank holiday weekend. So I went home, told my husband, who obviously was like quite stunned like myself. And then it's just what do you what do you tell people? Because I was trying to then obviously tell my family, but I didn't have all the facts. Um, from that point on, things did get better. I had another appointment. I had a couple of surgeries in between. And then by the October, um, they found that the tumour was bigger than they thought it was. Um, and they were talking about then doing radiotherapy and chemo. And um, I had a two-hour appointment following that sort of further diagnosis. And I think that was where I felt totally bombarded. Um, again, there was a lot of people in the room. There was a lot of information. The news was worse than I'd hoped it would be. So that was quite emotional. And I think it's just trying to get your head around everything because you, you do, you hear the word cancer and you think that's the end of it. Um, and you don't know what to ask. So I was just trying to take everything in and my husband was asking questions, as many as we could think of. But by the end of it, I think I felt totally exhausted. And they said, go home, have a think about everything, gave me a load of paperwork, and then said, if you've got any questions, come back to us. But you, you don't know what to ask. And I had about two weeks then of thinking, um, you know, how serious is this? Am I going to die? Can I beat it? Um, and I remember asking the question of my maxillofacial surgeon when I went in for my final surgery. And... Uh, he said, oh, no, 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 you know, we're, we're not like sort of talking, you know, end of life at the moment, but they still can't give you any guarantees. And uh, like you were saying earlier, you just have to put your life in their hands and trust that, you know, what you're being told is the right thing. And hopefully you're going to get through it. And it's like getting on a roundabout and you are literally on it until it stops. And you, you don't feel like you've got any control. You've just got to follow what everybody tells you. And for me... I think it was so intense then for the next few months that by the time I got to January and all my treatment was over and it was just a case of recovering, I sort of felt totally at sea. I had no support group. Um, I didn't have the appointments on a daily basis anymore. Everybody kind of went back to work and I was just left at home kind of with daytime TV. Um, and that was when I think I really started to feel totally alone and you know, what do I do now? And every time I felt a twinge, I'd be thinking, is it, some, has it come back? Is it, you know, is this important? What do I need to do? And again, people were there that I could talk to, but it would have been helpful to have somebody that was, had been through what I'd been through already that I could sort of talk to and see where they were. Because the one issue I've been left with is uh, I've got very severe trismus, which is a, a like a locked jaw. Um, and there's nothing they can do. I'm, I am stuck with it now. And that has really impacted my life on a daily basis. It impacts how I eat, how I drink, how I talk. Um, it affects uh, how I swallow. My mouth is sort of constantly in a state of some kind of soreness or dryness. Um, and I've, I've just sort of learned to adapt and, and live with it because you trust that if there was an option, they tell you. But I've started to realise through my involvement with this how much more to mouth cancer there actually is, how many support groups there are out there, that there are people who've possibly not been through the same thing exactly as me, but through something similar. And that's why I've been so eager to be able to share my story, to say to people, it is horrible, it is hard, but you can get through it. And I don't think you ever come through completely unscathed, but you know, being able to actually talk about it will hopefully help other people. Thank you, sir. Austin, Bernie, Ian, anyone? Yeah, please, Austin. Can you mind if I pitch in? Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a bit on the low side, but we can hear you. A bit yeah. on the low side. I apologize. It's not usually my problem. I don't usually need a microphone. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I was interested. I came in a bit late, I'm afraid. I was interested. I got halfway through the previous speaker about the information overload and the pathway of getting information about a diagnosis from the facts to the patient. Uh, can you still, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Right, fine. So um, my own way of working is that I, 
never would give a cancer diagnosis unless it was really strange circumstances without it being face to face. <clears throat> so that's rule one for me. Being from Yorkshire, I believe in clarity. I have been on all the various advanced communication skills, courses and such. And I think sometimes they get lost in the preparation of the patient for something that's going to come. And so I have learned the value of a, what's called a warning shot. And interested listening to the lady, I didn't catch the name, about the, the first thing I knew was they were talking about malignant cells. So the preamble whenever I'm having to break bad news to somebody that there is a cancer on board is the reason we are seeing you is because there was something that was noticed. We have done some tests, concerned that it might be something serious. Pause. And then, in fact, it has turned out to be and then a diagnosis. Now, to be honest, we want to make that experience as comfortable as possible. But that is a step from I don't know to I now know. And actually, there isn't a ramp. You can't go up the slope to it. It has to be a step. And I've learned that over numerous years of giving that bad news. It needs to be clear. It needs to be black and white. And I fully respect the sensitivities of people who say, but he used the cancer word. But that is what the disease is. And I strongly believe we should use the right terminology. Because like diabetes or TB, it is a disease that has its treatments. And if we mystify it even further, we're actually adding to the problem. That would be the first point I would make about bad news. I scribbled about three or four down. Um, the gentleman co um, covered the concept of information overload. <clears throat> and part of my discussion with a new diagnosis patient is you will have people coming out of the woodwork throwing leaflets and pamphlets and information at you, some of which might be relevant and some of which will probably not actually be of relevance to you. So it's most important that you ask us the questions you need answering. And if you can't think of them now, then write them down and you can speak <clears throat> to the clinician at a future time. Or, and the key to a lot of this, is you can contact our clinical nurse specialist. And that's a role that's grown since it was established, whereby there's a, there's a friendly person who's readily contactable, who can give realistic advice about what's going to happen, what the uh, information means, what future developments could be, and to back up all the written information, which is fine, but that's on a piece of paper and it's not human. Whereas a good clinical nurse specialist would be able to provide that information in a way that doesn't overload people and generally answers the questions that they have. And if I may, I've just one or two other points to make. I also believe that you don't simply hand patients a block of information. The most relevant bits to that stage of their journey need to be communicated now. And the rest needs to come in step by step as, and this is something sometimes that carers and patients don't appreciate, the picture clarifies as you go through. It isn't all there from the outset. So even an experienced clinician will be feeling their way forward as to how the progress of the treatment, what the treatment plan is doing, are the reasons why the treatment plan needs to be changed. So those changes in direction or information need to be updated gradually so that the picture fills for that patient so they don't have an exploding head with detail. My view, my view. And then I'd just finally say that, that information is as good as the time you remember it. So it's important that it's repeated and it's consistent and it's relevant to what the plan is for that patient, which is why when we have multidisciplinary team meetings, the minutes will enshrine for everybody where the direction is. So anybody should be able to fill in that detail if a patient has specific, specific questions. And I, I think that's, I've covered all the points that I wrote down. I hope that's helpful, but that's my viewpoint from, a, I'd like to think, a relatively experienced clinician that's dealt with this. Bernie? 
Yeah, if I can come in there now. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was a bit late, um, a bit earlier than Austin, but late nonetheless. And it was very interesting hearing what Chris and Sarah had to say in their journeys. And, you know, it just reinforced to me the fact that, you know, for as long as I've been doing what I do, it is very much the case is, is that you, you really have to sound check with the patient and the relative and their friends as to how much information they want to know and at what time. Uh, because different patients, you know, some will want to know absolutely nothing and they'll look to their wife or, or look to their husband and say, tell him, I don't want to know. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's as I think Chris said, it, it is a path and it's a case of, of giving a person what they want to know at that particular time. And so one of the things that I found out, you know, in, in my career, actually at that appointment, asking the patient, what do they want to know? Because if you're not going to talk to the patient about what's forefront in their mind, they're not going to hear the rest of the things you say. And it is about tailoring that information to that time, but accepting, as Austin said, you know, some information you simply have to give because in order to start that path and in, in order to then move on to other information, there is a set level. But I think that the phrase that I often use and, you know, perhaps helpful, perhaps not helpful, but it's I think Sarah touched on it is that, you know, as, as a cancer patient, the, the overwhelming feeling is that loss of control. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it does help patients for, for myself as a clinician to say that with cancer, the only certainty is uncertainty and, and almost to sort of for want of a better term, sort of normalize what they're feeling. Cause you know, I can't understand how that must be not being in that situation. But again, to emphasize again, Austin's words is, is that it is a process and it's, it's using all the members of the team. And the thing that sort of struck me hearing Sarah and Chris was, was that there does seem to be a lot of variation up and down the United Kingdom. And I'm sure that means the world in terms of what's available to our patients and then. Um, because it, it, you know, often all our consultations are, are followed by the specialist nurse getting in touch with the patient to see if there's any other questions, to see if anything wasn't clear, and then to give information as the patient and, you know, the family wish to have, rather than us deciding what that patient needs. And I think just to touch up on Chris, because I, I know Richard Simcott, we train together in things, so, you know, and, and, he, and he is excellent. But it was just coming back to the DVDs, because a few years ago, we used to to record on the old tape um, and give those to patients and, and I once asked 10 patients you know how they had used it and not a single one had listened back to it and it was more about the having the information but I think it's about having you know the information at the right time and, and having access to information is most important rather than the form it comes in and you know I now have 80 year olds and 90 year olds who are on smartphones so we should never assume IT capabilities and things but it but it offers up so many more avenues of of you know recording conversations and and taking that information away but also involving the son who lives in Australia for instance you know which is what I've had on once before but we should never assume we know and it's it's about asking and informing at the right level for individual patients thank you Bernie I've moved to where I hopefully have better internet now. I don't know if I can... Yeah, it's definitely better, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, sorry, I, I caught some of Chris's speech earlier and um, I, I agree with a lot of what he says about putting the patients at the centre of the process. I would ask how long ago he and Sarah got their diagnosis because I think some of what he expresses a desire to see is what we now consider standard practice. Um, putting patients at the centre and giving them opportunities to get information at their own pace a lot more, um, to have sort of a 24-7 point of contact. Sam McMillan um, CNS team um, have a 24-7 have a um, contact number that they can get hold of somebody on. And, uh, and for emergencies, obviously, there's, a, there's contacts. Um, so I think, I, I don't know how long ago you guys, your um, treatment was, but um, I think things may have improved, hopefully in line with what your desires are. So I was diagnosed uh, in 2011 <clears throat> and there certainly wasn't anything when I was diagnosed. That's one of the reasons why I went off on this pathway to make sure things improved. So going forward now, nine years, I've spoken to over 7,000 patients and you know, I'm still speaking to patients that are being diagnosed today. And yes, there's a slight improvement, but I would say on the majority of the time, it's not improved. 
And that the reason I say that is, is because they all say, the ones that contact us, and the majority of them, and we do get a lot of referrals from your district and your area, because our books are out in that area, that say that they just want to talk to someone to clarify sometimes what you're telling them. And yes, they believe you, but actually, when they speak to someone like ourselves, and we say, yeah, what they're telling you is right, and they are doing a great job, and then they say, well, what does really radiotherapy mean to me as a person? So then we'll explain what radiotherapy is. And then they ask, is there any side effects? And we tell them that there's possible side effects, but it's no guarantee you're going to get those side effects, but they're there. But don't worry about them until they happen. And when they do happen, the medical team will pick up on it as long as you're honest with them. So even to this day, I would say information is a big, big issue. And the trouble is, there's a lot of stuff that goes out today that is very generic. And because it's very generic across a lot of different cancers and not specific to head and neck, it's not appropriate to them. So by giving a Macmillan book about how to deal with food through, through your cancer, and majority of those food in there, when you read it and look at it, is aimed at breast cancer patients, then what's the use of giving that book out or then picking that up in the Macmillan Centre when it will be nothing to do with them? Because they won't be able to eat that food. And that's it, the bits, I think, that are still to this day wrong. I, I, I'd certainly agree with you that bespoke information is the way forward. I think one of the frustrations from an oral cancer perspective has been that it has been relatively heavily stigmatized in terms of things in comparison to things like um, breast cancer and other, other cancers. Um, you know, the patients are often smokers, they're often drinkers, not always. Um, even with HPV, we saw um, a, a reluctance to talk about it in terms of um, its connection with oral sex. And um, they wouldn't immunize boys in this country until just two years ago. So um, there were, you know, 50% of the population were not immunized. And the, and the political argument about immunizing boys um, was that they would be protected when the girls were immunized, which obviously doesn't take account of, of um, men who have sex with men, for example. So there are, there are huge stigmas still attached to a lot of oral cancer. Um, there were some early leaps with HPV with the change to the um, Gardasil, which protected more people from more HPV strains, obviously. Um, but I think that that sort of generic information, a lot of the fundraising, a lot of the cancer activity is is based around um, cancers that are a little bit easier to talk about, maybe, and a little bit less uh, stigmatised. Yeah. So on the basis of that, well, we've been working with seven of the hospitals we, we work with and we've created a head and neck information folder. So when the, a newly diagnosed patient gets diagnosed, they will be given one of our folders. And in that folder is everything that a patient would want to know from all the research we've done with various patients. So they'll be given the folder. And if they are technically minded as well, they'll be given our app. And on that app is their whole journey with an instant live link to their medical team that they can have 24 seven. It also flags up to the medical team if that patient has an issue through the night or during the day or they're feeling not unwell, it traffic lights to the medical team. So we are about to go live with that across seven hospitals. That has been written solely on the basis what patients are telling us that they need at the point of diagnosis. I honestly believe that will take away all the books, all the leaflets that you need to give. Because A, it'll be available electronically. It'll also be available manually. It's got their diary in it. It's got a food diary on it. It's got a um, juice diary in there. So it records all their liquid intake, their food intake, what appointments they're going to and what appointments they've got, who their medical team is. And it's got absolutely everything in that one folder that they will ever possibly need. And the idea is, is they will take that throughout their journey. And every time they go into an appointment and an 
it's got a notebook at the back they can write their questions on or if they're on the app they can write it and preset those questions in before the meeting it's got everything a patient needs and that's what we're launching next month across seven of our hospitals and we look for other hospitals to get involved in that but you know that that has been written by patients and caregivers on behalf of patient and caregivers of tomorrow. And we believe that will certainly help. It's not the finished article, don't get me wrong. All things can be improved, but until we get out there and get it used, we won't know how to improve it. But our main goal is to get every newly diagnosed patient here in the UK, when they get diagnosed, to have one of the folders. And it'll have Macmillan in there, it will have the swallows in there it will have if it's got a local support group a local support group in there it's got everything that a patient will need in one place in a little a5 folder that they need and that's we believe will take away information overload and because we're a charity specializing on it then i can go out and get funding to produce things like that and and that's where we give back to the hospitals because that's going to help tomorrow's back no one can change my journey or Sarah's journey or any patient's journey at the moment. We can't change that. We've done it. But what we can do is live through those experiences and improve for tomorrow's patient. And that's, I think that everybody on this call and everybody listening, that's what we all want to do. But to do that, we have to collaborate. And if we collaborate, we can make changes. And then obviously the government can change things. So I don't know what Sarah thinks, but that's my thought. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I was seen at university hospitals in Coventry and Warwickshire. And I mean, my oncologist was lovely. She was very matter of fact. She was very honest. And I remember her saying to me, um, you know, you're mine for the next six months and you have to, everything will go on hold. And once you're through the treatment, what you do, you know, you, you can just get on with it, then you can have your life back. But until then, you know, you have to do what I say. And I think I sort of remember take, that was one of the things I took on board. Um, but I think, although I did sort of say, there were people I could talk to from a health professional point of view. I think the thing that was really lacking was being able to talk to other patients because I knew other people that were going through cancer, but they were breast cancer or um, sort of uh, bowel cancer, something like that. And it is, they are all their own unique journey. But there is something I think about mass cancer that considering it is becoming much more common in people, we're hearing about it much more, it is still something that isn't talked about. I mean, I, the people I talk to, my friends, people at work who were with me sort of through the journey in a sense, um, they ask me questions. I'm quite happy to be open and talk about my experience. But I think for me, it's making people realise that it does exist, that again, anybody can get it. Um, and actually, like you say, being able to feel that you've got the support. And for me, it would have been a lot more helpful, I think, to be able to talk to other patients, even if they hadn't had the same experience as me, just to sort of say, some of the things that they would have had issues with so eating and drinking because I know Chris you said earlier about wanting to eat I can remember getting to Christmas I think my last radiotherapy was Christmas Eve in 2014 and my husband was desperate trying to get me to eat something I lost about three stone um I didn't want to eat or drink anything my mouth was horrible I couldn't taste anything everything hurt and it was just such an effort. And then I got into a spiral because I couldn't eat or drink. Um, I had a feeding tube for a while, which was a horrible experience. Um, it, my energy wasn't getting back up. So I couldn't actually even start to get better. And I remember being on, I think I was living on cans of fizzy drink at one point, because that was the only thing I could get in. And my husband said, you're just going to have to like fight it. And he said, what, what can you eat? And I said, well, I don't know. And he did me, I think, like a quarter of a Weetabix. And it took me nearly an hour to eat it because every spoonful, trying to get it in and then just trying to ignore the fact it tasted like cardboard, the last thing I wanted to do was eat. But I knew I had to get through it. And it's such a long 
thing and you just feel totally alone you feel sorry for yourself you feel miserable and I think if somebody had been there to say look you know okay I didn't have exactly the same experience but I kind of know what you're going through it gives you that hope to think well it is possible to get through it and there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, and as I say very little support from a point of having the trismus I said to somebody at the hospital the other week when I went, you know, do you have a Trismus group? No, we tried to start one up and nobody was really interested. And I found out today, because I had a dental appointment earlier today, that um, I've actually got really severe Trismus, whereas I just thought, well, it's a side effect and this is Trismus and it's like this for everybody. So I think it's accepting that there are so many different degrees, but being able to see somebody's journey and that they've got through it and how they're then moving on with life is part of the process and part of the healing and something that then hopefully motivates patients to keep going and actually aim for the fact that, okay, it's really horrible at the moment, but there is a little light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and, and I think when you take the ability to eat and swallow and communicate and then give disfigurement in some way, you stop becoming a human being. Definitely. And once you stop becoming a human being in your head, then you then start getting depressed. I lost 12 stone in weight in my journey. I went down to under 10 stone. So I didn't eat or drink because I now know I was scared to eat and drink because the first time I attempted it, it really hurt. Yeah. So, and then because I was on a feeding peg for almost three years, my brain stopped telling me to eat. So I forgot that I needed to eat. So when I came off my feeding peg, even to this day, I don't get hunger, in, hunger pains anymore. My brain no. doesn't tell me I'm hungry anymore. So I can go all day and not eat. But also, I don't, in, like, so I don't enjoy eating. I look at food and it's just cardboard because I've got severe dry mouth. So when I look at food, I have to eat breakfast, dinner, well, lunch and dinner. And it's medicine to me. It's not food. Mm -hmm. Sharon will say, what do you fancy for tea tonight? Whatever. I'm not really bothered as long as you put something in front of me and it's pasta or it's fish or it's soft. I'll eat it. You know, I would love to eat a fillet steak. I'm never going to be eating a fillet steak again, ever. Yet I still try. The worst bit is when I'm in a restaurant and I feel like a pig-headed man and I think I'm going to have that fillet steak and pay 26 quid for it and put the first bit in my mouth and think, what a plonker. Why have I done this? So I'm a dog at home, gets the bloody 20 odd pound fillet steak to eat at home. So that's what we end up leaving with. So when I talk to a patient now and they talk about eating, I say to them, yeah, you're going to have problems. But what you'll do is you'll find your normal norm. So don't get hung up on what you can't eat fix on what you can eat and celebrate what you can eat yeah and then move on and then but never stop trying to eat those other things so you know try a curry if you love curry because one day you might like a curry you know i would love to have a pint of beer again so sometimes i have a pint of guinness and love the first pint so i think all right i've cracked it i go for a second pint of guinness and absolutely test the taste. I don't like it anymore. It's really weird. I can't understand. I just think our brains are such powerful things that we don't realize it's our brain doing a lot of this stuff occasionally. Mm -hmm. Because there's no reason, there's no medical reason I can't eat apart from dry mouth. No medical reason. I've been there's trying. There's got to be something with my brain. I've been trying to get shares in slow cookers because I've become a big advocate for slow cookers. For <laughs> yeah. Fantastic yeah. verses. Yeah, I mean, Wiltshire food. I love Wiltshire food because they do an arrange now between two and six, which goes from like liquid mush up to before you go on to normal food. But it's you can have a little bit, but it's packed with all the nourishment you need. So I love that because it. I don't have to eat a lot, but I get my calories in. And it's just finding that new norm so like sarah and me what we'll do to the patients is not tell them to get hung up on all the issues they're having but let's celebrate what you are yeah because i can eat toast but i can't eat bread but i was told because toast 
when your toast bread, the pores can't close. And because they can't close, when you put it in your mouth, any water you put in, it doesn't become like a golf ball. So it's like bread. So if I want a sandwich, I have a toasted sandwich. So to me, I'm eating bread. Yeah. Well, you give me a sandwich and I can't eat it. How crazy is that? So I tell patients, and they ring me up the next day and say, we tried that and I'm eating bread. It's those little things that we as patients can say, try. Yeah. And if we say it, sometimes they think, do you know what, we're going to have a go at this. But you could tell them all day long and they'll just think you're telling them that because that's what you're supposed to do. And I just think you guys have got a hell of a job to do. But, you know, Sarah talks a great story. You know, we, I talk a great story. I've got advocates all across London that talk great stories. They talk stories that are real stories and they give hope that patients can get over this problem. And eating and drinking and communicating is what we do as human beings. Head and neck cancer and throat cancer takes that away from somebody. Like, you do it's, that. Uh, yeah. You've can got I a just problem. think of, obviously this is my my bit, <laughs> swallowing yeah. and eating. And I completely agree with this variability as well. This is a story we get the whole time. You know, what, what you can manage one day, you can't manage later on the same day. And taste will change from day to day. And it's it's frustrating because people think they've cracked it and then the rug gets pulled underneath their feet again as well. What I will say is, I mean, we do do an awful lot more on taste in the last few years than what we have done. We're really, really focusing on taste, not just from a safety point of view, texture and this, that and the other. It's now to do with patient enjoyment because I think, because I do like my food, if I'm only going to be able to eat a few things, I want to make sure they're the best things that I can eat. So if I only ever want to eat custard tarts, that's what I will eat. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I always preface what I say to patients with, this is what other people have tried. This is what people tell me, um, you know, rather than why don't you have a go at this or why don't you do this? Or, you know, everything I say to them is, well, have a go at this because so-and-so said, like you say, the thing about toast, they can manage crisp breads, they can manage toast. Some people can manage different types of bread, but, you know, they may, may be able to manage a bread roll, but they can't manage a slice of bread. So, you know, I, everything I say to them will be, well, there's been a, a, you know, a new paper that's just been published that says this about taste or this about whatever. That's the scientific bit. That's the professional bit. But actually what people tell me, you know, is, you know, I had a patient last week that said they really found this useful or whatever. Um so I completely agree the patient voice and the patient experience is absolutely vital in telling somebody, yes, this is absolutely crap. You know, this is horrible. You really liked your food. Now it's just a chore. You know, you have to eat because you have to live and, and that's it, no enjoyment. Yeah. But I think also when we did try to um, locally, we did try to get far more people involved in the support group and, you know, talking to other people about this. And whether or not it was a confidence thing, they just didn't want to, I, I don't know. We had very, very poor take up. Um, so, it, you know, it's not for the want of trying that we no. <laughs> try and get people. And sometimes I think it can have a very negative effect on other people because they will say, well, I was, because they do meet people, not so much these days because we've got COVID and we don't see many people in the waiting room. But, you know, when we had big, busy waiting rooms, people would say, oh, I went through treatment at the same time as that person because they used to see them every day. Um, I'm, I can't eat anything, but they're back eating. Why have they done so much better than me? And obviously because of patient confidentiality, you can't say, well, actually their tumor was completely different um, yeah. or whatever, you know, and you just sort of say, well, what did they say? And you try and find out, you know, and sometimes the story that they are telling isn't exactly what you know is going on, but they've put no. a really brave face on it, maybe because they've got their partner with them. And yeah. like you were saying earlier on, you know, the the picture they present when they've got their partner in the room is very different to what is actually happening. And yeah. we do get that as AHPs and CNSs. We get a different story to sometimes what they tell the doctors because they're so pleased with the doctors. Thank you very much. You've saved my life. 
um, we see them and, oh, it's, it's miserable. I haven't been out. I can't do this. I can't do that. So thankfully, because we do talk to the other members of our, our MDT, mm. we have a very good relationship with, with our um, consultant oncologists and surgeons. Yeah. We will say, we're really worried about so-and-so, you know, because uh, we've, we've been told this. Yeah. So what we've done on the food basis is that, you know, we, we believe that the visual is the most important part. So when you get a bowl of mush, it doesn't look nice. So what we've done is we work with a company to create molds. So we have a mold, if you like, of a pork chop. So you can mix all the food up, put it in the mold. You put it in the fridge and it goes hard and it looks like, and then when you take that, it looks like a pork chop. So you heat it through, then you grill it. So when you put it on the plate, it looks like a pork chop. And then we've got potato molds, we've got pudding molds. So they all put it in there. So when it goes on a plate, it looks appetizing. So that's one way of making people look at it and their brain thinks, you know what, I'm going to enjoy that food. So we look at molds. We're currently working with a chef in London and one of the patients to create a 168 page cookery book, which is all from patients that have to cook mush into menus. So I hope there's going to be a slow cooker section. Sorry? A little cooker. There's got to be a slow cooker section in there. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're the sort of things that we're trying to do to make patients realise that food needs to be celebrated, but it's very hard to get them to understand that food is an important part when you don't enjoy it anymore. And, you know, I just think that, you know, doing these little things extra... You know, if I send a, some molds out to a patient or to normally goes to the caregiver, they make the meals. And when Sharon gets the phone call saying, I can't believe he's now eating that mush now because it looks like a pork chop. It's been grilled, it's brown, and it looks like a pork chop. So why is he eating that? But before when I put it on the plate, he wouldn't eat it. And it, it's all that sort of stuff, isn't it, that, you know, we as patients can help you guys get that ball rolling so they get into recovery an awful lot quicker. Um, and, yeah, I think the diet side of it is one of the most important parts that Sarah and people like ourselves can certainly help to make sure that happens. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, they, they get tend to get the four, you know, the four type drinks or the, the, the drinks they put on there. But, you know, working with someone like Ames Foods, they're much more in high in, in calories and in nutrition, yet the patients say they taste better. So why are we sticking with one supplier when there's two suppliers on, on you know, available on there, but the standard one always gets used? So when I send out the Ames products to patients and they go back in to see people like you, Jane, they say, this is the one I want because I like. And suddenly they get that on prescription. Chris, can I just chip in there? Obviously, being the dietitian on our team in Sheffield, a um, couple of things. Uh, the recipe book idea is a fantastic one. One of the things that flew off the table when we did our last uh, patient support group pre-COVID this time last year. Um, over my years of being in the diet, the head and neck uh, a dietitian, I've been collating recipes from patients where patients have said to me. I can swallow this, I can eat this meal, or I can't eat this meal, but I've taken this ingredient out and now I can eat it. So we do have um, like a patient recipe book um, that we can give out to patients here in Sheffield. Um, and that, so that having a national one would be fantastic because you're just going to get more and more recipes. Um, and in regards to the 40 sip, um, the problem with the, for the dietitian is in the acute setting we are tied to the contract of what the hospital have gone with yeah, so nutrition hold a lot of that but in the community we have the luxury of we can go with whatever the gp wants to or is willing to prescribe should i say um and so that is the point where the dietitians can start to have those conversations about right what would you like to try how can you do this and i would say 90 percent of my job is talking about how they can adapt their diet not necessarily worrying about the calories and protein that they're yeah. in but more of a bit like jane said if you want to eat custard tart all day every day great it's calories going in if that's what you enjoy that's what you enjoy um and so a lot of the time it's talking about how they can adapt things how they can add calories into the food that they are enjoying if that's all they want to 
to eat and things like that. Um, so the, the sort of cooking side of things um, is really important, but that's based on patients that can cook. Yeah. We do get patients yeah. that don't have cooking facilities, don't have the, the culinary skills at home. You know, we, we've got patients on the ward that don't even have fridges or freezers or kettles. Um, they've been get used to going out to, to local rest or cafes for their breakfast to fry up in the morning and then just a can of soup before bed, that kind of thing, before they even got diagnosed with cancer. Um, and they're the more tricky ones to deal with because it depends on the patient's skills right at the start as well and their willingness. And I think it also depends on what their home environment's yeah. like because if you're a single person living on your own and eating a lot of effort and you've got nobody to sort of chew you on or say, what about this tonight? Um, you know, you might not fancy this meal, but just give a, a spoonful a try or whatever. Um, it's even easier to just ignore it and not focus on the food. And, yeah. and, and, yeah. and, I, and I think that's, that's the hard bit for you guys because everyone's different. So, but that's where, you know, we do our support meetings and in normal circumstances, we have seven going every month and we range anywhere between 25 and 40 people every month. But since COVID has hit us, we now are online. So every second Wednesday of the month at 6.30, we go online. And we have anywhere between 120 to 200 patient and carers join us every month online. And we have a selection of speakers, nutrition, dietitians, all sorts of people. But they come online. We're getting more online than we normally would if we were live in little rooms. The people that are online are not the ones that meet in the room. It's funny because the ones that we normally have in the room don't want to get on, involved in online because they're used to going into the room in a hotel. So we've got a whole new audience. And I would say 55% of them are laryngectomy patients, which I never expected thinking laryngectomy patients would come on because of the issue with communicating. But seriously, you know, every second Wednesday at 6.30, we start until nine o'clock and then you can't shut them up. And it's, it's 120 people doing what we're doing, just all talking. It's amazing to sit back and watch. And, you know, last month we had, we had a patient from Saudi Arabia join us. We had a patient from South Africa join us. And we had a patient from Lebanon and Romania join us because they'd heard about it and then they start all talking. But the nice bit is they've all got the common same problems and they've all got answers to help each other. And it's incredible to listen to watch. So if any of you just want to come on and join and listen, if you send me an email, I'll send you the link. It's eye-opening to sit back and listen to these 120 people, all patients at different levels, starting to talk. And it's, it's just amazing to sit back and watch. But they are a completely different audience to what we have in the hotels. And I've always said, you know, the support meetings are for some patients, not for others. Some people like one-to-one. -one. Some people will contact us on the phone. Some people are on our social media closed sites and open sites. Now some people like this new Wear the World with Virgil. You can't, you've just got to have all that options available to someone that wants that support. Other people just want to deal with it all themselves with their family. There is no right, there's no wrong way. As long as all that is open to that person to get that support at the point they need it, that's all we can hope for. And I take it what, you know, Kate's saying about people living on their own. We had a patient that's living on their own, a young lad can't pay his rent, he's no microwave, he's got nothing, he's back in the community. So we bought him a microwave, we bought him a kettle and paid for his rent for 12 months. So he can just recover. So that's what we do as a, as a charity for head and neck patients. If, if it comes as a referral from a hospital, a CNS or a consultant or anybody, and that patient needs help, we will do it. Last week, I bought an electronic larynx for a patient that cost us £3,000. It was delivered today, and it will be fitted in that patient next week. 
and we bought that for just over £3,000 because the hospital had no funds to buy it in this particular hospital. If it had gone down the road, he could have got it on prescription and through the system, but he couldn't in this one hospital. So we paid for it and had it delivered to the hospital. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And that's all I'm saying about this collaboration. Sorry, Austin, yeah. No, 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 I, I didn't, wasn't meaning to interrupt you. I was just wanting to add to that, that, that the, the picture is slightly more complex as well because I've actually had patients who have been on supplements or nutritional replacements that they get on with and ones that they don't um, have a good experience with and actually have bowel upsets and all sorts of problems because of that. And unfortunately, the GP has said, here's what you're having. Mm. This is what either we can afford or it's the policy or it's what's the regional, you know, flavor, if you want to call it that. Um, and that is the situation where a body of patients with a bit of political clout can actually make it better by saying, please don't prescribe according to economy. Let's have some efficiency, some effectiveness and the right thing for the patients in this. Because I can write a letter as a clinician saying, actually, that's better for them. And it carries no weight at all. But if there's a group of patients who have access to the governing authorities that, that, that can tell a GP you're not behaving properly or this is the way it should be, that's quite strong political clout. Yeah. And, 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 and be, that needs, it needs to be focused. You can't do it for everything. You can't say, yeah. oh, we want this, we want that. Give us this, give us that. It's like you said, if there's one patient that needs one electronic larynx, you can do it. Mm. But you need the, the issues to be highlighted and they need to be the important ones that a bit of political pressure can put right. Otherwise, you're just flapping gums and it doesn't go anywhere. No. So on that basis, what normally happens is you give them a prescription. They go to the GP, goes down to the pharmacy and the practice manager, the pharmacy manager says, too expensive. We're not doing yeah, it. The exactly. patient rings up and says, well, we want this one. So I then ring up the, hosp the, the GP surgery. I will ring up on the GP surgery and talk to the practice manager and point out the issues that there is. If I get no further, I ring up the local MP and I get the local MP to ring that GP surgery. And guess what? The patient gets the prescription they need. Yeah. And that's where Which is we right. come into the force. Which is entirely right. The problem in that loop is that the person who wants to give that prescription has done it and not walked away from it, but it's sort of done. Mm. The patient's in the middle because they will take what the GP says or what the hospital says, but the two conflict sometimes. Yeah. And then, like you say, they don't know where to turn. No. So my immediate answer to that is always CNS and anybody else that they can recruit in to get the problem solved. Yeah. And that's why I think in the past there has probably been too much focus on the surgeon, the oncologist or whatever. But because they... The other staff, like even dental hygienists, will pick up something from a patient that they can relay on, and then we can tackle the problem. That's yeah. why the wider the net of people dealing with this, the better as a general rule. It's like the oral leaf spray for dry mouth. There's oral leaf, there's Riz, and there's CC Med. Out of all our patients, they three tend to be what patients like. Mm. But when you go to the pharmacy, what happens is they give you a water-based one because it's half the price. Mm. So what we do is we give a prescription because the companies have given us a prescription with all the codes on it and on the back, the reasons why. And when we tell the patients, we give them that and say, when you go in, if there's any argument whatsoever, call us and we'll deal with it. Yeah. And that's where we stop it. What we do tend to do then is if the pharmacy is still giving me some grief, I get a letter from the oncologist or the consultant at the hospital. I get one from the CNS. I then put both of those across the MP's desk and say, I need action now. This patient is struggling. It normally works because yeah. it's just budget. And I'm afraid cut that down on someone else, but not the patient that is dealing with what they're dealing with. Mm. So. Okay. Uh, really interesting discussions. Um, we've been joined by Karen as well. Um, hi, Karen. Thanks a lot. Um, I just thought we'll change tech as well, maybe discuss one or two other things. Um, we've got uh, 
Simon on the line, who is a consultant radiologist in London, uh, in Austin. You'll probably recognize him as one of your previous SHOs. <laughs> oh, uh, my goodness. Name. So we can probably have a chat with him about his experience because I guess he sees the patients quite or has seen the patient quite early on in the journey as well. And then following on from that, it would be quite nice to speak to abs and also see what the patients think in terms of the dental rehabilitation and sort of side effects, etc. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you. Very much. I'm, I'm 10 meters from home, but I can still talk to you and I'll put my video on when I get in. Thanks so much for inviting me, Ali. Ali and I were, were house officers in 2009. And yes, uh, lovely to see you again, Austin. Uh, I was in fact Austin's house officer. So it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. nice to, uh, nice to be back in Sheffield. It just goes to show me. we don't blight careers in Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> quite the opposite, quite the opposite. Yeah, so as, uh, as Ali says, I'm a uh, dental and maxillofacial radiology consultant in uh, a UCLH, which is one of the big hospitals in north central London. Uh, and specifically, I do a lot of the uh, walking clinics. And the walking clinics, uh, for those of you who are not that aware, they're generally the clinics when you've got a lump or bump that your dentist or your GP has found. And sometimes you get referred direct to a surgeon, and the surgeon will see you on a morning and then send you straight across to us in radiology. Or sometimes the walking clinics now, which is a different way of doing it, is is you get referred directly to the radiologist. So you go to your GP, you'll see your GP virtually uh, for a consultation and you'll say, I've got a neck lump, it's been there two, three weeks. And then they'll send you to a radiologist like myself. We'll see you in clinic, take a brief history and then start the imaging process. Now, uh, a couple of uh, key things about imaging is we're sort of the very first thing in the chain. So in an unfortunate way as a radiologist, I generally see patients at the very start of their journey, i.e. The, the early diagnoses, or I see them sort of towards the end once they've had treatment, and this is the, the monitoring phase. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the middle bits uh, were generally not that involved in. So I sort of see, see both ends, but not the middle. Now, I've got a very short presentation I'm just going to share with you, uh, which basically outlines just some of the imaging methods we use. And it's it's really written in a, a quite basic fashion. Uh, it's hopefully got some wonderful things in there to explain about what we do and uh, how it all works. So just gonna flip across in a second. So hopefully now, do you all have a screen that says imaging for head and neck cancer? Um, no. no. Uh, hang on, right, okay, no worries. Technology is wonderful and it's all working, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> just give me a second, I'll, I'll resend it. We can see you. Don't worry if it's, it's not working, so I just, just talk no, it's, us it's, through yeah, this. So, yeah. so I'll talk to you the first thing. So the first general diagnostic test we do is, is ultrasound. Now, ultrasound uses sound waves to have a look at soft tissue lumps and bumps. So uh, any of you ladies out there who've, uh, who've had children or any gentlemen who've been lucky enough to be there, you know we use it on, uh, on fetal ultrasounds quite a lot. Ultrasound's really quick, it's safe and it's easy. So it doesn't use x-rays or ionizing radiation. And the exam takes only about 10, maybe 15 minutes. So generally you'll get a bib pop on you, you'll lie down on a couch, and then the consultant radiologist or the sonographer will have a good look all the way down your neck. Now, a couple of things to, to point out about it, it's, it's not painful at all. You'll get lots of jelly on your neck and it gets that sort of slimy feeling, but it's not painful. You don't need injection of any sort. Uh, and it's, I say it's fairly quick, say only sort of 10, 15 minutes or so. When you go for your ultrasound, it's really a good idea to, to prep first and take off any jewelry. Uh, we'll definitely wanna see all the way down here to your, to your collarbones. And we want to look all the way down here in this triangle. And for those of you who have met any surgeons, You'll know that they always give a good feel all the way down your neck, all the way to your collarbone. And, and in radiology, we do exactly the same. So having a good everything exposed is, is fantastic. Uh, uh, the best clothes you can wear are something like a loose fitting t-shirt you're comfortable in. Uh, I know it's winter and people are wearing it more, but sort of things like turtlenecks are sort of the exact opposite of what you want to wear. So uh, ultrasounds, those are done and you can get the results normally pretty quickly. However, sometimes we need to do further imaging. Because ultrasound only looks at the very superficial parts, and superficial means it's close to the surface. It doesn't look very deep inside the head and neck. So then we've got two other imaging methods called CT and MRI. 
Now, CT, uh, it's what our American colleagues call a CAT scan, C-A-T scan. And it basically uses x-rays to make a 3D picture of inside your head and neck. <clears throat> so whereas ultrasound is very good for the things that are close to the surface, and it's great for things like lymph nodes, it can't see things like the tongue or your sinuses or your nose or things like that. So the CT scan, uh, you line your back, and often you get a little injection in the back of your hand. Now the injection in the back of your hand is a little bit sore when the cannula goes in. And the cannula is the little needle where the contrast is delivered. And the contrast is sometimes called the dye, and it's an iodine-based product. It flows into your arm. It can sometimes feel a bit cold and tingly as it goes up your arm. And then during the process itself, there's no other injections or anything else going on. Basically, your bed gets very slowly moved into the big donuts, and you can't see anything moving, nothing touches you, anything like that. You basically lie there on your back. The machine will make a few noises. You might hear a spinning sound inside the big donuts. Doesn't take very long. Most CT head and necks take a few minutes, really. You can often image quite a lot uh, in a very short time period. Afterwards, once you've had your CT, the results get looked at by someone like myself, a radiologist. And we'd look at all the images and spend a bit of time thinking about what's going on where. And often we uh, collaborate this with the ultrasound images to give a good idea. The other 3D imaging method I mentioned is, is MRI, and that's the, the magnetic donut. So it looks a bit like CT in that you line your back and you go into this donut. But MR has got a couple of differences. Uh, it uses a magnet rather than X-ray radiation. And it uses a really, really strong magnet. It also makes a lot of noise and it has to be quite close to your face. So what I mean is uh, the noise, and I'll do an impression, it sort of makes a da 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 really quite loud. And it's so loud you'll often be given headphones during the process uh, because it's so loud. It's also a bit more claustrophobic than CT. So what I mean is the tunnel you go into is quite tight. It's often only a few centimeters away from your nose as you lie on your back. There's also something called surface coils or a cage that they might put you in. Now, it probably sounds worse than it is, but essentially this is a plastic set of bars that often arches over your face like this. And the reason why we use those, it gives us better pictures of what's going on. If you are claustrophobic, there are a couple of options. The first one is talking to your radiologist or referrer or your GP about getting a sedative pill. And sometimes you can have a, a small sedative pill beforehand that might help you relax the machine. The other option is something called a wide bore scanner and a wide bore scanner has a bigger hole in. Now the disadvantage of wide bore scanners- Can, can I ask a pit. question please? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for explaining those things. I mean, in terms of the communication, because Chris was talking earlier um, about information overload and when the new patient comes in and there's quite a lot of things going on, a lot of different types of investigations, do you, feel sort of similar when a new patient comes to you and do you feel like you've got the experience or the training to actually speak to patients and sort of simplify and, and explain things to them? It's, it's really difficult as a radiologist because when we get a referral from a GP or a dentist, we get literally two lines about the, the patient. So most of my so, GP referrals will have, have all the patient's details on mm -hmm. and then it will say, patient noted lump in left neck, been there three weeks. And so when the patient comes to you as a radiologist, they're kind of obviously got lots of questions. What, what is this? What can I do with it? And it is very difficult as a radiologist to be able to answer those in, in that first appointment. And I understand the frustration from patients and, and I assure you it's just as frustrating our end as well. Uh, we don't generally give patient diagnoses there and then in imaging. And the reason is because there's no one imaging method that can give a clean sweep and give you a, a definitive answer straight away. So that's why the sort of the three tests that often go hand in hand, the, the ultrasound, the MR and the CT are so important to have together. But you still need so pathology though, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and sometimes we do what's called ultrasound guided biopsies. And, mm. and these are, are needle biopsies and, and Sarah and Chris might have had those in the past. Uh, they're basically when we use small needles with ultrasound guidance to, to target an area of cells to try and suck up a few cells. The, okay. the, the big issue with, with those biopsies versus sort of a, a surgical biopsy is that the, the, the accuracy is just not quite as good. And 
Mm. And from a technical point of view, we basically only get a few cells scattered on, on, the, on the slides. Whereas if you do a surgical biopsy, you get a, a larger specimen and the results are often uh, easier and more accurate to interpret. Yeah. So these are all frustrations that, that we share as radiologists. And, and certainly patients do come in and, and ask me, you know, is this something I should worry about on ultrasound? And it's, it's, it's very, very difficult for me to call either way yeah. from, from just the ultrasound. Uh, and I'm not trying to hide anything with the patient ever, uh, but sometimes it, it, it just isn't, isn't as clear cut as a straight call. Yeah. Often once we've, we've done the three imaging methods, then we have a much clearer picture. Uh, but then by that time, as I said, they've normally passed on to one of our surgical colleagues and, and so on. Like Austin would then chat mm-hmm. through their diagnosis, things like that. So we, we're involved at the start, but then we, we often lose patients because mm-hmm. uh, that's not really our role. Yeah, please, Austin. Um, Mm. It just occurred to me as you launched into your presentation, and I'm watching you on the screen, that if I was a user and I had a little snippet that was two minutes long, which was a video, it doesn't have to be polished or rehearsed, but it's just genuine, that would go a long way to help inform me as as a potential patient that's going to go through it as to what's going to happen. And let's face it, I'm an amateur mechanic. If I want to fix the brakes on my Land Rover, I go on YouTube. There's a three minute, four minute yeah. slot there. So something like that, that could be made available to not necessarily shoved down the throat of a patient, but made available to them to just click on and watch would be valuable. Do the, do the patient reps feel that will be, that sort of thing will be helpful? We have, <clears throat> we do a lot of film work. Film work is the way forward. So on our uh, YouTube, as Ali will know, and we've done at our conference last week, we have that that very film you're talking about where someone says to me, what is radiotherapy? You can go on there and watch what radiotherapy is about your mass fitting, about how the radiotherapy machine works. And there's no frightening bit on it. It's just factual. This is what's going to happen. And if someone wants to know what a CT scan is or an MI scan, we have all those little mini films that we do from a patient's eyes. So we go in that department and create a film from a patient's perspective and then produce that and put it out on, on our YouTube channels. So it's, it's there um, and a lot of patients do like them. But again, you've got to be very careful who sees them and who looks at them because some people are very scared. And if they suddenly, they're bad enough thinking they're going to have a mass fitted, if they suddenly see this thing being fitted and pinned to a bed and you might scare them away, it's yeah. it's that fine balance on who do you get to watch it and who you don't. What I try and do is make sure everything we produce and put out, they're not Googling and seeing the frightening stuff and then being dragged down advertising routes that they're going to take them down things. So we try and control what's out there and we do always do it from a patient's perspective and make sure it's not frightening. Okay. So they are out there through our YouTube channels and our website. And we so, will always, we've done the robotic film, which we got permission from the patient and we followed them from pre-op all the way through the robot. We actually filmed inside the surgery while they're having the operation, filmed him in recovery and filmed him back at work some four weeks later. So if someone can watch the whole 15 minute film or they can watch a short and four minute film of it. So we try and do that sort of work. Um, but we need permissions to come in places to do that. But once we get the permissions, then I get the funding. I've got a film crew that I take out and we film it from a patient's perspective. Okay. And they are very good. Thank you. And of course, another issue is I know this Austin's bugbear as well as osteonecrosis and and abs, I was just wondering in terms of the active intervention and rehabilitation of patients and dental assessments and radiotherapy, et cetera. What are your viewpoints of how, what things work and what don't work? Well, I, <clears throat> well I've taken over um, the head and neck uh, cancer stuff already for, for uh, restorative dentistry. Uh, in the absence of Claire, she's, uh, she's not here at the moment. Um, and basically what I found is we, we see the patient's pre radiotherapy assessments. We get a form that comes through uh, explaining and detailing where the patient's going to have head and neck radiotherapy. Um, and we have to make a, a decision on what teeth stay, what teeth go, um, and discuss with the patients what their expectations are, 
um, and what their existing knowledge of what's going to happen to them is because you get patients with different backgrounds that some are very aware and you know acutely aware of what's going to happen and like Sarah said earlier on some don't really know what's going to happen they haven't had much experience but they all come with differing levels of knowledge um, and I think generally you know it's, it's working fairly smoothly now the idea is to basically trim down the amount of time that we or trim the pathway down so there's no um, bumps and no kind of um, long waiting time so we don't disrupt the plan to get the radiotherapy or the surgery done. Um, Ian and I also discuss patients that are going to have uh, surgery so we'll have uh, chats about uh, surgical intervention and you know do a bit of a bit of planning in terms of how we can restore them before they uh, go in for the surgery um, and yeah it's just trying to make that, that 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 transition as smooth as possible until the treatment gets done and then the follow-up afterwards that's when the real journey starts. And like you guys have said, <clears throat> there's uh, a lot of difficulties that you encounter afterwards, opening your mouth, uh, eating, chewing, speaking, confidence. Um, so it's, it's just about trying to help and make things as easy as possible for the patient um, and avoid any kind of future issues, like you mentioned with osteoradial necrosis. So we don't really want to take and teeth out after radiotherapy if we can avoid it. Um, so yeah, just having a good, a good we've, we've currently got a setup now where we've got one of the oral surgery team, myself, and uh, a hygienist set up. So we've got three surgeries all together on a Wednesday morning. Uh, and basically, the, most of the treatment gets done. So if we get the referrals through from the oncologist, come in, um, see me. I've got a registrar with me now as well. Um, and we managed to get most of the things done, usually that, that week. Um, certainly those co first couple of days, get things done, and then straight off for uh, radiotherapy. Uh, so it's streamlined. It would be interesting to see how much more streamlined it is. Um, I think the talk about having patients discuss their experience is really good. And one of my colleagues, Raj, and I would be discussing that, trying to maybe record patients or have a little kind of panel of our own patients. So he's been keeping a list of patients that he's been seeing that have been doing quite well after radiotherapy and surgery. And that's something we've talked about, but maybe we could do that on a wider, a wider thing in Sheffield and have a little think about that. Um, that's yeah, I think that's really where we are with things at the moment. And I, I think it's, it's it's so important that 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 link that that Abs has with with the Maxfax team is so important. And you know, I have worked in a few hospitals where that doesn't exist. And and one big thing I'd say to any patient <coughs> is about to embark on the the head and neck cancer journey is, is is get your teeth sorted and get them looked at by someone who really knows what they're doing. And and I, and I mean, you know, if you've got an, a long standing relationship with your dentist then, then that can be good but if not you know if you can get the opportunity to see it see a consultant uh, restorative dentist in the hospital that's that's one of my biggest bits of advice again you know I said radiology we sort of coming at the start at the end and and osteonecrosis those you don't know it's it's when unfortunately uh, the the bone that holds the teeth in the jaw dies and it's it's a really debilitating disease because you've in a way you've sort of conquered the cancer and you've conquered the disease that, that could kill you but then you're left without any joy whatsoever because even though you know Chris and Sarah said quite eloquently earlier about about the difficulty eating there are there are some people who uh, with osteonecrosis can't eat at all and their mouth you know is in a very poor state you've got exposed bone that that smells is painful and in a way you've, you've conquered the disease that that could kill you but you're living with a, a horrible long-term condition afterwards and it might happen sometimes we can't avoid it those cases but getting that dental assessment early uh, with people at like ABS, I think is 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 one of the absolute essentials, and I would I would really push and make sure that if I was a patient going through that journey or starting that journey, that I saw someone very early, just at least as well to in my mind, I had the the dental side of things taken off my mind. It's it's not a headache anymore. Now I can plow through and, and get on with my treatments. Yeah, I think it's um... the secondary care aspect has to be there as well. So once we've finished in primary care, we've seen the patient before, we've seen them after radiotherapy, a couple of months after, made sure things have settled down after the mucositis and the mouth starting to feel a bit better there has to be that kind of passing over to somebody in secondary care who can look after these patients so mm -hmm. i think maybe the link might have to be developed by us to the general dental practitioners to explain what we expect from them etc i've certainly found we talked you talked earlier on about prescriptions and you know it'd be quite interesting to have that list that you've got chris about uh, what you think's good for patients um and what what you think's not so good what they've said uh, that'd be really interesting to have um 
I mean, because I'm, I'm quite often writing to general dental practitioners to make uh, and general medical practitioners to make sure that they are prescribing Duraflat 5000, um, or a nurse, etc., whatever they need. Um, but it'd be good to have that list if you could provide yeah. that. Yeah. Am I right in saying also, I believe, from dentists, if they do a referral from the dentist practice to ENT, so you, you go into your dentist, they spot something, they refer you to ENT, that they then the patient goes through all the treatment and does everything else. They get put back in the community, but dentists never get any followed up, follows up, follow ups. They do. They about what's them. happened? And yeah. I think that's wrong because I think, you know, the first thing they know that whether I've survived it or not survived. I mean, I got struck off my dentist three times because I hadn't gone back to my dentist, and I had to explain. Well, I've got, I did get the cancer. So, so, and then when you go back. You've got to explain to them what you've had done, radiotherapy. Oh, you've had radiotherapy. Oh, I can't see you. Well, that, that is <coughs> a, that's a real barrier. Uh, if yeah. I can just quickly, um, when they set up the MDTs with the guidance as to how multidisciplinary working was meant to be, those of us who are a bit older than the rest will remember the restorative dentists were included. And I can remember now ENT surgeons chortling about why the hell do we need a dentist in this? Because the unseen part of the iceberg are the patients that are diagnosed and treated for laryngeal, hypopharyngeal, and other tumors that may not require surgery do get radiotherapy and didn't at the time get the dental assessment because the fields of the radiotherapy include the back bit of your jaws and your salivary glands, which then adds to the pot. And they would go through the treatment, come out surviving his cancer, and get this awful osteoradionecrosis because somebody somewhere felt that that tooth has to go. Now, separating a dentist from the forceps to extract teeth with his like trying to stop Ronald Biggs grabbing the gold, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to do. So that needs to be a universal truth that gets out there that if somebody's got a diagnosis of cancer in the head and neck area, they need either their teeth to be top-notch or gone, and that there is actually an ongoing responsibility after all of that treatment to maintain where they are rather than let them deteriorate because of the poor saliva and everything else. And that hasn't got out there yet. But also, when you go back in the community, you are now off the pathway for cancer because you've been told, you know what, good news, your cancer's gone. So you go back out in the community, I've now got to pay for my dentist. And going back to, I think it was what Kate said or someone said, there are a lot of single people out there that don't have the money. They don't go and see their dentist. So all of a sudden, you've got people out there that could come back through A&E, which costs the NHS more money, could come back into the system eventually at late diagnosis for any other problems, but they go into the community and we have to pay. We're, yet breast cancer, you have got all that treatment throughout no matter what happens to you. Head and neck, for some reason... You have to pay for your dental care. Mm. Why should I have to pay for my dental <laughs> care more than anybody else? I have to go more to the dentist now than I ever had to do before. So it costs me more money to go to the dentist. That's not because I'm getting old and I can't do anything about that. The reason is, is because I've had throat cancer and I've had radiotherapy. So surely that should be on the cancer budget, but it's not mm. because I've been told I'm cured of cancer. That's where I think the fall down is. And also when I go and see my dentist, unlike my GP who gets a letter from you, my dentist doesn't get a letter. So he doesn't know what treatment I've had or what I've had or what I'm that. I'll take issue with that, Chris, I'm afraid. We we do incorporate the dentist into the yeah. pathway throughout. I, I was just about to pitch in then with the boxing gloves myself and say, actually, <laughs> on our patch, that doesn't happen. So, you know. <laughs> Well, add to that as well a lot of our patients don't necessarily have a dentist before and then it Correct. goes back to the challenge yeah. of all the issues you know here in south yorkshire we have some of the worst dental um issues i think in the country we're not proud to say but i, I think a hell of a lot of our patients when they come to see me have haven't seen a dentist in years and and i think something that i'm sure abs will be able to talk about is dental phobia you know and and not only have we told the patient they have cancer but often then it's becoming a dental clearance and all the effects that that has as well so i think but no very much if if we do have the dental contacts we copy them in but there's a huge number of our patients especially on the ent side where they won't have a dentist necessarily.
No, but I, again, Bernie, I think, you know, there are positives that come out of this. So Abs and I just this week treated a lady who's been through um, dental phobia, hadn't been to a dentist mm -hmm. in forever. She's had a, a, you know, most of her jaw removed, um, including um, all of her teeth. And, uh, and she's just getting to the point now where she's finished implant treatment mm. to have um, full rehab. So she's back with better teeth than she's ever had. Yeah. Um, she she coped all the way through treatment despite of her phobia. She was um, really struggling to even look at the dental chair to start with, um, and you know she leaves in arguably a better condition than than she mm -hmm. came came yeah. in with a, with um, very good quality of life. And she's a she's a very happy lady. Mm. No, I think there's a huge number of those stories where you know cancer many 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 times has a silver lining, and, and I think sometimes it is a focus that you know I, I can think of so many patients who have been through it, and you know as we talked about, you hear the word cancer and you just think life's over, it's yeah. never going to be the same. But actually, some of my patients tell me that cancer is the best thing that happened to them, you know, because of how they see it and how that they change things, and you know, once taking life for granted that doesn't happen anymore so so i think we should celebrate that as well you know as the negative that, for, and that's what i'd say going back to austin's point about videos we do a lot of stories yeah. AI video but also printed stories so that story you've just told there ian which is a fantastic story mm -hmm. if we got permission from that patient we would write a whole blog story on that and print it and put it on the website so if someone was having problems with dental we could refer them to that story and that would boost that person. I honestly believe now I am one of those people Lee, that, you know, looking back on my time, I thought I was going to die and the world was going to come to an end. I actually look back now and think I was very privileged to give cancer. And I think I won the lottery the day I got given cancer because of the work I do now. It changed my life for the best. And, you know, I, I have a great life now doing what I do. I love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. And my life is completely different. And I wouldn't have been on this track if I hadn't have been diagnosed cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm privileged to be in that club. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of other people that need to hear those stories. But again, I always come up with a caution. What you don't want to do is let people that are going to go down the palliative care way to suddenly get those stories and get false hope. But the majority of people that we've been talking about HPV and all the other treatments need those stories like you're talking about, Ian, to give hope. I, I, think, I, th I think the other thing I would say, though, is it's not just palliative. I mean, I'm, I'm sat thinking, poor Sarah, who's been in this uh, conversation today, is sat there with, with terrible trismus, and that is awful. Um, because even if she has a functional swallow, forgive me, Sarah, for talking on your behalf briefly, but even with a functional swallow and even with teeth that she's looking after, she's going to struggle diet, you know, from a dietary point of view in the way that an awful lot of other people would. I don't know, Sarah, what you're... Um, well, it's interesting you having that conversation because I actually saw my restorative dentist uh, earlier on today um, and I had to have uh, eight teeth taken out. And I think that was one of the sort of the, the funny points of my, my journey was talking um, to the maxillofacial surgeon and the oncologist afterwards when they said about, you know, having these teeth taken out and um, what that would mean and then what they could do for me afterwards. And I was saying to my husband in, in the clinic with me, oh, you know, maybe I could get like a lovely set of new teeth and, you know, this could actually really work for me. And then I got the trismus and I've lost eight teeth which has impacted on how I eat and how I chew and things. I've got really severe trismus and um, even just minor dental things. My dentist really struggles with, he'll say, I can't give you an anesthetic because I can't get in to actually do the injection. So I've had to have fillings without um, anesthetic. Um, most of my teeth now are hopefully pretty sound. Um, I had something done today, but the restorative dentist is fantastic. But after all, having gone through everything, I'm then sort of still stuck with issues and just thinking I'm sort of 46 now, hoping that whatever I'm left with will see me through for as long as I end up you know, living, um, because otherwise I am really, really going to be in trouble, I think. So, um, again, I just it's one of those things I've learned to live with and there's, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, apart from being really mindful about following the advice of the restorative dentist. Um, the thing that I think puts me off about going to my, my own dentist, who is lovely, is just that 
I think that Chris was saying, I have to go more frequently. Every time I go, it's never just a checkup. There's always something. So it ends up costing me a fortune. And then it does kind of put me off going because I think, do I really need extra work doing? Is it worth the the um the discomfort and everything that goes with that afterwards? So sometimes I probably do put up with things for maybe longer than I need to because I, I don't actually want to go and have it dealt with. Mm. Um, I know Karen has been with us for 45 minutes. Sorry, Karen, the discussion has been quite interesting. We haven't managed to have a chat with you. Um, uh, would you mind just sharing your story and your journey and uh, how it's been? Hi, everyone. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, tongue cancer in February 2016. Um, I've had an ulcer on the side of my tongue uh, since August before, so I've been in pain for six months. Um, I did go and see um, a nurse. I was in a lot of pain and it was affecting my speech. And I was on a very soft diet because I couldn't eat properly. So I was losing a lot of weight and I got seen by the nurse and she said, actually, it's a hole in your tongue. And I was referred to um, in nose and throat. Um, and I saw my dentist in the November in case I needed any teeth to be filed down to see if that helped, which she wouldn't do. Um, he did say to me, you're talking, your speech is very different. So he had a look at him and said, okay, I'm, I'm really sorry, you didn't really need to be seen by hospital. Um, and I said, okay. A referral has been made. Um, and he said, well, if you haven't heard anything by Christmas, please phone. And I hadn't heard anything. And when I phoned up in the Christmas holidays, said I work in a school, uh, that was the only time that I could really phone. Um, no appointment had been made for me. Um, and I was starting to panic because I was in so much pain. Um, and eventually I begged the uh, lady I spoke to if she could uh, give me a cancellation, which she did uh, for early February. So I went along and I had a biopsy. Um, which was incredibly painful, honestly, um, and traumatic. Um, the area was so painful anyway, and then to have a needle placed into that area was excruciating. I had to be pinned down for it. Um, and then literally a week later, we went back and they brought a specialist in to see me. But I actually had no idea. Maybe I was naive, but... Um, I never expected to be told um, I had tongue cancer. Um, I'm a healthy person. I run. Um, I've never smoked. Um, I don't, didn't drink much. So it came as a complete shock. Um, that same um, afternoon, I saw my cancer nurse and dietitian, who were both fabulous. Um, my husband was with me. I was a mess. And then we met the surgeon in exactly the same afternoon, evening, um, and hearing that I would be having a portion of my time removed, possible skin graft, prepare for the fact I'm never talking again properly, or I might have to learn how to talk again. It was just one shock after another. Um, and then literally two weeks later, we were seen again but at uh, Broomfield Hospital by a specialist team who put us in literally for uh, the beginning of March and I had saying, oh no 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 that's too soon too soon and my husband was there saying we'll take whatever date you brought um, but it, I felt there was no time to prepare however I wanted to be free of the cancer in my mouth um, because immediately all you think about is, am I going to survive? Um, obviously, I had the surgery. My surgeon took away the size of my tongue and didn't rebuild it. So that was that was really good. And I had a neck dissection done. But it all takes a bit of getting used to it because you're not given loads of information. And I remember um, after my operation, going to the toilet for the first time, and my hair was pulling 
on the back of my neck and I couldn't understand what was going on. And then I realised I not only had staples at the front of my neck, but then all the way back. I wasn't expecting that because it hadn't been fully explained. Um, and then obviously I had to have um, a peg fitted and I had um, radiotherapy. Um, but I found I had the coping mechanism of I, I ran all the way through because I'm a runner. All that control had been taken away from me and I wanted it back. And the only way I could function and for a bit of mental health, um, I used to go out running. I, I ran the night before my operation and I was allowed to have three weeks off to uh, heal up a bit. And then I continued running. I ran with my peg, I ran all through the radiotherapy. Um, even in the machine, I was known as the talking patient. Um, and I managed to do a, a half marathon after finishing my radiotherapy two weeks later. I managed to get rid of all the, the mucus, because that was a hideous side effect. Um, and I think I, um, one of the hard things about uh, mouth cancer, because you don't hear much about it, everyone assumed um, that I had been a smoker or a heavy drinker. Um, even the nurses at my GP surgery, they were all saying, oh, she must have smoked heavily. I went, no, never. And I think there's a self-esteem issue and confidence because it took me a long time to work on my speech. And I think even after two years, after finishing treatment, um, my confidence was at a real low. Uh, I would notice that people would avoid me. Um, and even though I worked really hard on my speech, I, um, I went to a support group that my cancer nurse organised with my husband and there was a speech therapist there at this one time and uh, they said would you like to have speech therapy and that opened up a whole new level for me because I was obviously after a couple of years my swallowing had been affected by radiotherapy and um, my speech therapist worked on exercises with me which were really really hard work I had no movement in my tongue. My tongue I used to call the Loch Ness Monster because it now curls around behind my teeth. Um, so I had to learn to move that better so I could get better speech sounds and to help with my, my swallowing because food was an issue. Um, so it hasn't been an easy journey, but I found reaching out to people through either the Mouth Cancer Foundation or in different forums on social media and share my story. I share my story a lot on Facebook and Instagram um, and then I get other people contacting me and I find I'm able to help people through their journey and um, it sends tips and advice and I find that really, really helps because it can be a very lonely experience. I've had a lot of people tell me how lonely they have found it um, because it can be, it's a very visual thing, isn't it? Look, I've, I've got to know people that have been quite disfigured by mouth cancer, by their surgery. Um, I was very lucky. Obviously, I kept all my teeth. I had a lot of silver linings. And I always say to people, just look at the silver linings. They're really, really important. And having another out outlet like running or just getting walks for share it all really helps it helped me through my journey that's just a little bit about me <laughs> right, thanks a lot for sharing that so quite similar and sort of common themes to what sarah and chris shared earlier particularly the diet and speech aspect of things yeah yeah it's not easy but i had a fantastic a medical team. My surgeon was very good. Um, I will say that he spoke more to my husband than he did to me. Um, and uh, the same with my oncologist, didn't really notice me as much, just looked over me and spoke direct to my husband. Okay. Um, but my cancer nurse was on hand the whole time. She even dropped off prescriptions to me. Um, 
and my dietitian was fantastic as well because I, I kept having blips. I would get catch infections. I even had one GP. Um, I was convinced I, I kept suffering with um, all thrush after radiotherapy. And um, I was convinced I had a thrush. I went to my GP. And as soon as I said, oh, I have had uh, mouth cancer, but I need you to check. He wouldn't even touch me. He wouldn't look in my mouth. He said, no, I'm not, I don't want to get involved. Um, he said, I'll give the prescription and go back to the hospital. Well, because obviously it had all got out of hand, I also got very run down. I had another ulcer. I ended up having to go back into hospital to have another portion of my tum removed underneath. Um, which then resulted in more problems with swallowing. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't realise. You may have a surgery, the radiotherapy, chemo, whatever, but um, people don't realise the long-lasting effects that you're left with um, and you're kind of expected to get on with it a little bit and that can be quite hard going. One similar thing I've noticed between all three of you is that you had delays to your diagnosis for one reason or another which is quite interesting because this morning we were talking about the dentists are probably better at picking these things but in your cases it seems like they didn't really can i pitch in there ali briefly yeah, please. Uh, one of the all pervading truths um which over the years I've, I've sort of noted and it seems still to be the case is that the education in medical school about the mouth is sadly lacking. Um, I, I did both degrees, obviously, when I did my medical degree. I think we got one and possibly two lectures in a five-year course that covered the mouth and things that were related to the mouth. It, I don't think, has changed much. And we get that reflected on a number of um, uh, sort of aspects of cancer for the head and neck care. First one is two week waits, we get a tidal wave of stuff that is relatively ordinary, minor trauma to the soft tissues caused by a bad or a sharp or a broken tooth that anybody with common sense who's at least looked in the mouth more than five times would spot it. And they clog up the referral pathway for those who've genuinely got a concern and genuine likely potential cancer. And we get that, don't ask me, go and see your dentist which you can argue is sending you to the specialist. And with no disrespect to either group, the general dental practitioner isn't the specialist, but I would hope that they would be able to spot things and send it down the right route. And then you get the, oh, it's in the mouth and it's cancer and I'm not qualified to deal with that. So we sort of bounce you straight back into the specialist care before there's actually kind of, well, if it's thrush, then we can probably treat it for you instead of, oh, oh my God, cancer mouth better go back to the hospital and all of those build in inefficiencies to the system and it's education and that, that's what it needs it needs the pressure groups it needs the uh the patient groups it needs the focus groups to get that educational content back into the medical schools because i can tell you what if you go and read back in prehistory when the greek physicians would do a few things they'd look at the tongue to see if you're dehydrated, smell your breath to see if you've got ketones, if you're uh, dehydrated, uh, if you're diabetic, and they'd taste your urine. And that, that's basics. But they were in the first realm of a, a medical examination, and it's gone from that now. It's not there anymore, and it probably needs putting back a bit. Yeah, and I, I've just done a... I work very closely with you, Clan, the medical teams, the dentists, the yep. nurses, the pharmacy, and... I've just finished the talk last week and they all come on and say, it's great to actually have a patient talking to them and bring that real life side of their studies at home. But what I do find amazing is they've still not got that communication skills, right? For medical people as students, mm. you know, they're used to technology and everything else. If they're on a game, they'll, they'll play it. Well, but they're still not used to that, but they do appreciate a patient taking the time to talk to them about real side issues. And I, I believe that's right, Austin. I think there should be more work in the universities with the medical students with real patients. Because they I keep telling them, they're our game changers. They're the ones that are going to come through the system 
and question people like you, Austin, and say mm. why. And I've always said the more whys you get, sooner or later you get into a conversation about the subject they're asking. And they are our game changers of the future, and they do need that education. I, I'm a great believer in that. Ali, are you speaking? Because I think you're muted. Hi, sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> um, I was just seeing two hours have flown by. Um, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> but um, if anyone's got any finals or remarks before we close the discussion. Well, got, uh, can I just throw this in about COVID? I'm working with Datacam, which is a European data company. And... Uh, so and what I want to do is look at what the impacts of COVID is going to be on head and neck in five years' time. So just to give you some highline of the data that they pulled out, and we are launching this at the end of the month with our MPs and everybody else. So if you look at 2019 in March, 19,208 referrals came to the hospitals. In 2020 in March, it went down to 17,502 which is a shortfall of 8.9%. We then go into April, which is the main lockdown period. In 2019, 19,431 referrals came in. That went down to 8,006 referrals. That's a 58.8% drop in referrals coming in. In the May, it went down to 38.8%. And then in the June, as we were coming out, it went back to 9.2. My worry is, where are all those patients? If you then look at um, CT scans, so if you look at the CT scan, and so 28% drop in CT scans for head and neck, 53% drop in MRI. I can't never say this word. What's it when they put the camera down the nose? That's the one. So 76% drop in the use of that through COVID. I thought that is the early, the, what you use to correct, get early diagnosis before MRI and CT. So that's 76% drop and around 30% less use on clinical trials. So that is frightening stats. Sorry, Austin, you're on, you're on mute. mute. Sorry about that. Can I, I know people will get fed up with hearing from me, but I, there's a point I wanted to answer. That specifically nasendoscopy in a COVID climate, that is an extremely high risk yes. procedure because of aerosol, because of transmissible pathogens, because of the proximity. And even with all the kit on, you put yourself in the danger zone. So understandably, that is going to drop off because they're going to ration it. They're only going to do it with proportions and they're only going to do it when it's actually definitely indicated rather than precautionary. Yeah. Now, the figures that you quote are fantastic and they're good figures to have, but I'll be very interested given the fact that out of our two-week wait referrals, quotation marks, urgent and suspicious of cancer, close quotation marks, the actual sort of not anything to do with cancer rate varies between 75 and 85 percent so the actual figure that will be interesting would be when you've got your 40 odd or your 50 percent drop in referrals is how many were there actually diagnosed out of the actual ones because if you dropped by half you'd still have 85 percent of those would not be cancers anyway so it's actually the yield from the numbers that are referred rather than just the numbers because it wouldn't, so, act, wouldn't actually be a bad thing if fewer came in, but of those that came in, more were likely to be genuine potential cancers. So that's, that's what I've asked DataCan to look at. And what they're doing now for next week for me, they're going to project all those figures forward. And with the use of Doctor Who and the TARDIS, we're going forward five years mm. to see what the impact will be. Mm. But still, what I'm trying to say, though, is there's still a lot of people out there somewhere that is not getting diagnosed. So they're either going to eventually come through A&E or they're going to come in as a late referral from somewhere. Or hopefully 
they're all the ones that wouldn't no, no, would come to you and you'd normally reject. I think that's what you're saying, Austin. So let's see what it, the actual figures are. But initially, COVID is going to have a big impact on it on all cancers, but more so head and neck. And I will keep everybody in touch with those figures as we launch them. Because um, I've got two stories that, one, they couldn't get diagnosed through COVID. And unfortunately, he died. Because by the time he got diagnosed, they said it was too late. And then I've just had a lady die the other week. Again, because of COVID, she couldn't get diagnosed and get into treatment. And both families want to share their stories to try and bring those, fa those figures to, to fruition which then hopefully we can get politicians to take this fight back up again, to get you guys more help and more support. That's what it's for. But I just thought I'd show you those off the top of my head while I've got the figures in front of me that's just come in today. So that's all I'd say on my finishing note. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for your time and giving up your evening for this. Uh, I'm really grateful. Uh, no, you can all go and have something to eat or, or lie down. <laughs> um, and I'll continue the conversation with Eva, who's uh, joining us from sunny Florida. So um, Eva is also a mouth cancer survivor, but she's also an inspirational speaker and storyteller. So if any of you want to stay on and want to ask her questions on the chat, please feel free. If you uh, want a good rap, then ask... Eva, she'll give you a brilliant rap. She's an incredible lady. If you've got half an hour, she's worth talking to. But I've got to go because my tea's ready. Eva, I love you to death. Lovely to Thank see you. you. And we'll hopefully see you in Cardiff next year. See you Perfect. soon. Thanks, see you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Ali. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ali. Fantastic organisation. Right. Thanks okay. a lot for joining us this short notice, Jen. Thanks a lot. See you around. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. See you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you, Ali. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Abs. If you want, you can stay. Do you? I'm here for a bit. I've got to do right. some notes. Anyway, I'm going to do two down from you. Okay, great. I was going to tell this quick story before in the conversation about how I was speaking at a grand rounds for residents in oral surgery. And one of the students, after one of the fellows, after hearing my story, said... I know it's really important for us to develop a relationship with our patients. So the other day I went into my patient's hospital room and I said, I know this is very difficult for you. And the patient said, you have no idea what it's like for me now, get out of here. And the, pa and the uh, resident asked me, what do you think I did wrong? And I said, you were close. But what you did wrong was assuming you know what it's like for this patient, because most doctors really don't know what it's like to go through, especially something as as difficult as oral cancer. So it's better for a doctor to say, I don't know what it's like for you. But if you share your story with me, if you talk to me, I'll be able to share your stories with others and help them through your story. And by approaching a patient that way, you're actually empowering the patient, empowering the patient to feel like at least everything that they've gone through is going to be put to good use. Brilliant. Very good point, Eva. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and so I don't know if this whole day, Ali, if you have talked about the difference between a general pathologist and an oral pathologist. Ooh, how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that in my story, that was a critical piece. My, uh, I'll tell you a little piece of my story is that I had something on my tongue, an ulcer, like Sarah was describing, on my tongue for about two months. I went to an oral surgeon. He said, look, if it bothers you so much, we can take it off. And I said, great, just take it off. Mm -hmm. Two days later, I was fine. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from his receptionist. She told me my biopsy was negative. 
I said, excuse me, but are you calling the right patient? And she said, did you have tissue taken from your tongue two weeks ago? And I said, yes, but I didn't know it was being biopsied. I literally had no idea what they could be looking for in a biopsy of the tongue. I was unaware that my biopsy went to a local general pathologist. It was read as hyperkeratosis, when in fact, it was moderate dysplasia. Okay. And the reason I know this is because two years later, with a period of a, about nine months bouncing back and forth between my dentist and my oral surgeon with a recurrent lesion, uh, I finally went to the oral, oh, then I got this earache, because as you know, as the tumor grows on the side of my tongue, it was now sitting on a nerve to my ear. And because I was illiterate about oral cancer, I just never knew you could get it in the mouth. I went to a general doctor and he told me I had water on my eardrum, prescribed 10 days on antibiotics. And after those 10 days when it didn't improve and the pain was waking me up during the night in tears, I went back to the oral surgeon and I said to him, I can't live like this. I've got incessant pain. I'm not eating normally. I'm not sleeping normally. I'm not speaking normally. He said, well, the, you've never smoked in your life. You rarely drink. You're young. Your biopsy was negative. It's nothing. He said to me, he said, but I guess we could rebiopsy. Okay, this is two and a half years later. He was basing his treatment plan on me on a biopsy that was two and a half years old and read by a general pathologist. So I scheduled a biopsy with him, but then I started to think to myself, maybe I should go elsewhere for answers. So here in the United States, I was able to schedule an appointment in New York City at a major medical center at the recommendation of a doctor friend of mine. I took the bus from Allentown, Pennsylvania, where I lived into Manhattan that day. It's a two hour bus drive. I had not a clue that what was on my tongue was remotely serious. This doctor looked at me. He felt the enlarged lymph node in my neck. He asked me who I was here with. I said, I didn't know I needed anybody. Mm. He knew. He did a minimally invasive biopsy, after which he told me that I had a squamous cell carcinoma on the lateral border of my tongue. Well, I said to him, is that benign? I mean, I, I didn't know what that was. And he said to me, Eva, you are in an advanced stage of oral cancer. Well, I didn't hear anything after that. I was literally in shock because I ate well. I never exercised. I never smoked. I rarely drank. I had no risk factors. And if my biopsy had been read by an oral pathologist in the first place, I would have been at least diagnosed at stage one instead of stage four. And the bottom line is when oral cancer is caught early, it's very survivable. I have met people whose oral cancers have been caught in situ literally stage zero and that in, they were excised and no chemo, no radiation. They feel and taste everything. Very different from someone like me and a lot of the other cancer survivors you have just had speak during this virtual thon. But I know I'm speaking very articulately and you're saying, wow, she had oral cancer, but actually you can't see all the long-term effects that I experienced from this treatment. So let me start by saying that a third of my tongue was reconstructed from my arm and my leg. They took fascia 
from three areas of my leg. In other words, they flapped up the tissue, they took the fascia, and then they sewed the tissue back down and they put the tissue into my tongue on the left side to build it up. So even though I don't taste here on the left, I don't feel here, so I can't feel my food, for example, I'm articulate because they left the tip of my tongue intact. And this is what enables me to articulate my speech. My tongue feels like Novocaine. It just feels like the whole side of it is numb. Uh, I, if food travels over to that left side, I literally will chew my tongue because I cannot feel the food. So over time, I've gotten very talented at keeping food only over to the right. And as many of you talked about with dentists and everything, there's a great imbalance that has happened in my mouth over the years. I only chew on the right. And because I had a, a, a radical neck dissection and I don't have a sternocleidomastoid here on the left, I have a continual imbalance in how I lift my head up out of the bed. I mean, this side does a lot and I will get intense pain in my neck that will travel up into my head and give me a migraine. I've had dental complications as a, a lot of your survivors have talked about. And radiation does a number on you. And basically, Radiation is a burning process, but on top of that, it, it shrinks all the vascularity, all the blood vessels that come here. And as a result, dental complications happen and then you don't even have the blood supply to heal easily. So one of the things I recommend to all the survivors and all the healthcare providers who work with patients with oral cancer is after they've recovered from surgery, okay? It's really important to do an intraoral massage. It's just, I mean, just imagine when your neck hurts and you rub your neck and what, how good that feels. Well, imagine those tight, those tight tendons and tissues in your mouth and jaw. And like, was it Sarah who was talking about the trismus? I mean, I highly recommend that every single night or day. Typically, it's really nice to do this in the shower when your skin, your tissues are sort of warmed up, is to really rub them. I actually put oil on my face and then I rub with my knuckles like this. I rub these muscles and, this is, and then I do my neck and really, I mean, I can experience intense pain with a light touch, but that light touch actually releases some of the gripping tendons that have been scarred. You know, it's scar tissue that really hurts. And if you don't massage and manipulate that scar tissue, over the years, it gets harder and stiffer. And then it's really tough to break it down. And soon your head start to actually pull to the left or pull to that side because that scar tissue hasn't been manipulated and softened so that it could help you to hold your head up straight instead of cockeyed. And as you age, I think it's just, it's really important for us oral cancer survivors to do this. Where even if it was just chemo that you've had in, or radiation, now it's just, it's important. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions about that? Stick that in the chat. So Ali could ask it. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about children. My children were five and seven when I was diagnosed. Oral cancer is a very public disease. You just can't hide it under your clothes. There was coughing, there was spitting, there was choking. And it's frightening for my children. Now, everybody was very concerned with me 
but nobody thought about how my disease was affecting my children. No healthcare provider recommended that my children see a therapist or just talk to somebody outside of the family who, who could give them, who could address their feelings. These children have nowhere to place their feelings. And I want you to know these kids, they are sharp. They are smarter than we give them credit for at no matter what age they are. So it's really important to share a cancer diagnosis with children. And I'll give you three good reasons why. And I'm talking about children of any age. Even if you have grown up children who are raising little kids of their own and are going to work all day and they're exhausted and you think, well, I'm only stage one. I don't need to bother them with all this bad news. I'm going to be fine. Well, let me tell you, whether these kids are little or big, one reason you don't want to hide a cancer diagnosis is because you're promoting dishonesty and secrecy. And that is not a value that we want to promote in our families. Number two, if you don't tell children and something were to happen to you, get really sick or die, they could be forever angry at you, forever holding this anger inside of them at you for holding that information back. And then once you're gone, there is nowhere for them to put that anger. So gosh, it's so unhealthy. Share it with your children. And the third reason, and the most important, is because it's an opportunity. Sharing your diagnosis with everybody that knows you and loves you is an opportunity to leave a legacy. A legacy of choosing courage during times of challenge. A legacy of choosing gratitude because that's a skill. It's not human nature to find gratitude when you're really suffering. It's a skill, but that's the beauty of life. Life is a perfect balance. You see when these really rough things happen to us and we have challenging times, all of this beauty comes forward. And you could either choose to see it or not see it. You could acknowledge it or not acknowledge it. But that beauty is there. It is, it is coming towards you. And it's a matter of recognizing it, recognizing all the people that have stepped above and beyond to be there for you. A lot of people have asked me about God. If you believe in a higher power, how could a God that you love and trust do something like this to somebody when they're a good person? Well, personally, I believe that I didn't do anything that deserved this. And nobody, nobody does anything so bad that they deserve something as devastating as oral cancer. But if I believe that, I also have to believe that no matter how hard I pray, God isn't going to heal me. So then the question is, where's God? And I found the answer. I found the answer. It's in all the people in your life. Some of those people are people that you didn't, don't expect. But I'm here to tell you, start looking at your friends and put the energy that you have, that little energy that you have for friends in your life, put it into people who are going to be there for you in the hard times. Friends are great for the good times. <laughs> it's really great to have fun with friends. It's much harder to be there 
for you during hard times. And when you see this, when you have this wonderful opportunity to see which friends are stepping forward to be there for you in hard times, those are the friends that you want to dedicate your energy and time to. Any thoughts? Just stick it in the chat. I've got a few thoughts, but I'll have a chat with you about it. Okay. So, I mean, I thought it was really, well, I'm just trying to take it all in. Uh, but the interesting thing that you mentioned was that your specimen was seen by a general pathologist. So I'm wondering, did you go back and get the original specimen seen by a neuropathologist afterwards? And so uh, what did you do with that information then? Well, there was nothing much I could do because two and a half years later, when I went into New York to have them look at this lesion, they asked to see the original biopsy. And before my surgery, the oral pathologist, the head and neck pathologist who, re who read that biopsy to, to compare it to the biopsy that they had just taken, this pathologist said to me, sorry to tell you this, but you should have been flagged two and a half years ago. Wow. You could have had treatment at that time. Maybe says you at least monitored a bit closer. That's right. May have never had cancer. But I thought your point about sharing it with children was quite interesting because the culture I came from, um, we sort of, I'm not saying I do that, but my parents or what I saw around me was hide information. Don't, don't tell people around you. They'll get worried and no need to share with everyone because why? Give why that stress to people and why trouble them. But I can completely see the points that, that you mentioned and why it is or may be important because things didn't go right or something bad happened then. Actually, um, I really didn't finish that third reason. It's to leave... It's um, by, by sharing your cancer diagnosis with those that your friends and family, you're actually giving them an opportunity to learn what it means to be a family, to be a friend. It's such a wonderful opportunity. We could go through life and never really learn that. So cancer albeit a horrible thing to go through, it's an opportunity to learn what it means to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to be supportive. And these are skills. They don't come naturally. They are skills that we learn. And we learn them so that when it's our turn to have a challenging time, because we're all going to have challenges in our life. Life is bittersweet. And when those challenges come, we're going to be more prepared and more healthy, help handle it in a healthier way. But if you hide that, if you hide the bad stuff and you only show the good stuff, what a loss. What a loss of an opportunity to raise a more full human being. When you shared your diagnosis or what you had with friends and family, I mean, were many people aware of mouth cancer or cancer? Or were you aware? I'm sorry, what was your question? Were you aware of this as a, as a disease before you got it? And people never around you? Of, okay. Never heard of oral cancer. So personally, I'm a big advocate for patient education. That is the best value you can provide patients. Educate them. So when the dental professionals are doing their oral cancer screenings, when they're doing it, tell your patient what you're looking for. I know that using the word cancer is a little uncomfortable, but try using this script. I'm providing a thorough oral health exam. It includes an oral cancer screening. And then the patient could say, what? Oral cancer? You mean you could get cancer in the mouth? And suddenly the lines of communication are open. But if dental professionals are not raising awareness about this disease, who is? Sure.
Nobody. And uh, what made you sort of go on this journey? Uh, wanted to talk to other people and try and be a motivational speaker and share your story. Well, it all started one day when I went back into New York for a follow-up treatment and a New York City bus, public bus, went by and there was an ad on the side of the bus and the ad said, there's a painless way to know if this is anything serious. And there was a woman who looked like me. She had her tongue off to the side. There was a spot on her tongue exactly where my spot was. And then it said ADA, American Dental Association. So when I got home, I called the American Dental Association and I left a message on their 800 number. And I said, look, you're doing some kind of campaign in New York. You guys need to know about me and I want to help you. Well, they called back. I ended up doing a video about my story for the American Dental Association. And then in 2003, so this is a long time ago, they asked me to speak at their national conference in front of 9,000 dentists. I only had five minutes, but I told a powerful piece of my story. And from that moment on, with all the responses that I got, I recognize it's critical that I get out there and tell my story. So I started small. I started to tell my story for charitable groups, for book clubs, for rotary clubs, and then small dental groups and dental meetings. And then it kept growing. And my my presentation got better and better. And as it grew, I started speaking at more prestigious dental meetings, and then national meetings, and then nursing and medical conferences. So it's really grown, but it took a while. Took a while of really crafting the most powerful parts of my story and making them really concise. I do wanna share with everybody, and I can put it in the chat. Um, I have a book that recently came out. It's called MC Plays Hide and Seek. It's everything I wished I had for my own children. My children had no, nobody to communicate and nowhere to place their feelings. So all their feelings were bottled up inside. And I regret not having professional counseling for them, but I didn't think of it. And when I got better, I definitely took, especially my daughter for counseling because she didn't kiss me. She hadn't kissed me in a year. So I knew this was serious. Oh, you have the book. There it is, everybody. It's available on pre-sales on Amazon and you can also get a PDF version. I could actually put it in the chat. You can download a PDF version I have to go get that link on Gumroad. Anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about the book. It's about, it starts with all the doctors that play hide and seek with cancer. And by the way, MC stands for Mr. or Mrs. Cancer, but I wanted MC to be gender neutral because nowadays that's just so important. As it is with God, right? We don't want God to have a gender either. So gender neutral is a good thing. And then after we talk about the doctors, we talk about the many feelings that doctors have when they diagnose somebody with cancer, how the person might feel. And then there's a section on children's feelings. How do children feel? There are lots of different ways Children could be confused. They could be angry. They could be sad. They could want to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. So I wanted to address all those feelings and all those actions. And then the last section of the book is about empowerment and what children can do to help themselves to help the person with cancer, and to help the world. So they can write letters to their prime minister or their president. 
They can collect money for a cancer cause. And by the way, I hope that money is still coming in for this worthy cause for the Oral Health Foundation. There's still time to give a little money and every little bit counts, everyone. And then there, uh, there are other things children can do to help themselves. They can draw pictures of their feelings. They can write a story about their feelings. So I talk about how children can help themselves. This book, I just, I, it, it, I'm so excited about it because I think it's going to really help people. And, and uh, yeah, yes. please carry on, please carry on. No, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, am I uh, mistaken or is that I, were, were you a teacher or are you a teacher? Were you in education, right? I was in education. So I was a professional storyteller. And for over a decade, I had a business where I would do inspirational, educational stories, sometimes historical, mostly legends and folk tales. But I would emphasize the values. I'm a big advocate for teaching values. That's the one thing that falls short in our community. So I work hard to teach values. In fact, oh, let me share you with, share this with you. Hang on. When I got a second chance at life, I had this beautiful charity box designed. I keep it right on our kitchen counter because it's so beautiful. And it says, enrich our lives by giving. And I love this box because it opens on the top and you could see wow. it's stuffed with money because we use this box at every family gathering. Now with the holidays coming up, I recommend that you have a box that you pass around your family table and the adults start. Adults start by saying what they're grateful for. You know, when a children hear what the adults are grateful for, without being told what to be grateful for, you should be thankful for those presents. You should be thankful you have a friend who invites you over or whatever. Instead of being told how to feel, children hear what's, what their parents and the adults in their lives are grateful for, and it really changes over time what they're grateful for. And it's, a, it's become a ritual at every family dinner and at every holiday, everybody at our table gets at least a dollar bill and we put it in the box and say what it is we're grateful for. And that's been a really lovely and very powerful tradition. And then the children decide where the money goes. Very interesting idea. And uh, I also know that you started the six step screening uh, yes. website and uh, to get the message out. Uh, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So the six step screening is six steps to a thorough oral cancer screening. I just put the link in the chat. So basically in short, because I didn't know anything about oral cancer and I didn't know anything about a screening, even though it was happening, nobody told me they were doing it or what it was. So the six steps are really designed for the general public to help them understand what the screening is and what dental professionals are looking for. So they yank, your tongue is yanked out. They look at the back lateral borders, that's step one. Actually, step one is the extra oral exam. The reason why you wanna do this exam first is because it's less invasive. So the first step is actually to feel the neck. I would like everybody out there, Ali, you too, turn your chin to one side, see how that sternocleidomastoid pops out, yeah. and then draw your fingers from under your ear all the way down on both sides. You want to feel for any hard, fixed lumps. Now, notice the difference when your head is to the side and you put your chin down. You could actually feel a different parts of your neck. So it's really important that patients aren't just flat on the table, but that they might turn their head and they might put their head 
close their chin down so that you could really get in there and feel. That is one of the first signs of the oropharyngeal cancer that you feel a hard fixed lump in there. And that's why it's important that patients are educated. How many men have you met who are shaving? They feel a little something there. They think it's a sebaceous gland, but if they knew that something hard and fixed could be serious, they get in there to see an ear, nose and throat doctor. Mm. And they catch it early. Catching it early is very survivable. So then the next step is to ask the patient to go, ah, look at the back of their throat. For you, Hopefully you'll see symmetry, but if one side's a little redder or a little more swollen, that's a sign to send your patient to see an ENT. Especially if they complain, they have a little bit of an earache or they have a little bit of a pain on one side, Good reason to send them to an ENT. The next four steps are the intraoral exam. So the first, so the, the, the third step is to yank the tongue out to look at the back lateral borders. The next step is to palpate the floor of the mouth. And you could do this yourself in a self-exam. Palpate the roof of your mouth. Okay, so that's so that's the tongue, the floor, the roof, the cheeks, and the lips. And these are something that you could do yourself. I have been in many conferences where I ask dental professionals, have you gotten an oral cancer screening for yourself? Ali, how about you? When is the last time you got an oral cancer screening professional one for yourself? You mean seen by a professional? Yes. Um, probably about three, four years ago. Okay, that's very, thank you for being honest. That's very common. People who are in the dental fields, I don't know. I think that in general, we put ourselves last. Ali, there's no reason why you can't get oral cancer. Put yourself first, get yourself in for a good oral cancer screening. You see, the thing is, if dental professionals don't feel it's important for themselves, <clears throat> how could they possibly feel it's important for patients? So put yourself first and then get your patient up after you. Get an oral cancer screening. We need everybody to be on board with this because when caught early, once again, it's what? Everybody. Very survivable. survivable. Hmm. Yes. And you don't have these devastating long-term effects of trismus and of not being able to eat a hard food and and all the dry mouth that's horrendous mm. so catch you it early. yeah you mentioned you had some bad side effects what what sort of side effects did you have and how did you cope with those oh, I have really are things any better now my saliva has gotten a lot better over time one of the reasons my doctors think my saliva has improved is because i've had three series of hyperbaric oxygen therapy it's very expensive i was very fortunate the first time not to have to pay for it and then the other two times were sort of a boost boost dose an additional 10 dives so the first time I had HBOs because my lips split after radiation and it wouldn't heal. So for any unhealing wounds, HBO is something that's used and it healed up my lip right away, really helped with vascularity in my lower jaw. And then the next time I had it is because I needed an extraction. It really helped with the extraction and the healing. I had a Maryland bridge put in because this was on the only side of my mouth where I chew. Then three years after that, I needed another extraction of the adjacent tooth because every few years I'm losing a tooth. Why? I mean, th this side gets a lot of hard use. I chew only on this side. As a result, my bite is a little cockeyed. I try to you know, I try, I wear a night guard like we talked about, but I wear it so that my upper teeth don't, that there are no teeth under here that don't fall down. So I, I need to keep my teeth in place. But I have ringing in my ears. I have sensitivity in, of light in my eyes. I've had three 
um, basal cell carcinomas in my radiated field, one on my chest right here, one on my lip right here, and a third one that started. Uh, they can't prove it's from radiation, but it's likely. In other words, I've had vocal cord polyps, nodules. I didn't have surgery, but I did have them treated with therapy. I've had actually what's called vocal hygiene. I've worked really hard on learning how to use my diaphragm to speak. And when I speak in a higher tone like this, instead of dropping down like this, it actually prevents the damage to my vocal cords. And when I do yell, my I, get, I get hoarse very quickly. So I have to use my voice properly. So these are some of the things I've had to deal with. I know that time is almost up. You guys have been on this all day, especially you, Allie. Mm. And I would like to address any specific questions that people have as well as conclude with a little story that's going to leave you inspired for the rest of the evening. Like so if there plan. are no questions anywhere. Um. I can't see any specific questions. Uh, there's a few comments of people who've um, thanked you for sharing your inspiring story, um, but no specific questions. Um, so feel free to end with your inspirational story and we'll call it uh, the end of the day. I mean, mm -hmm. I've got a few points from all the discussions and things that have sort of come up. Like you said, uh, early detection. If you've got any problems, just go and get checked out. Um, because you've got a much better chance of surviving it and not having the side effects. Um, there, are, there is support out there. People like you, people like Chris Curtis and the Swallows, etc. reach out, ask for help, um, and do whatever you can to raise awareness. Uh, all of us just need to work together to do that. Um, and basically, that seems to be the, the common theme of the whole day, really. For those of you who are interested in the book, the PDF version, so it's really easy. You can just download it easily. The link is in the chat right now. So I, it's a privilege to speak to you today on behalf of, of Ali, who is a passionate oral pathologist, right? Head and neck pathologist, oral pathologist, specializing in a very much needed field because here in the United States, there isn't even an oral pathologist in every state. So it's really important to, for people to uh, continue to pursue this specialty. I'd like to also thank the Oral Health Foundation and on their behalf, this story is for you to use in future fundraisers too. It's a story about a young man who gave up his life to save someone else. And when he went to the world beyond, he was asked whether he wanted to reside in the place up above or the place down below. This young guy said, hey, I want to see both places before I make my decision. And first, he went down below. And there he saw this big pot of sweet-smelling, bubbling soup in the center of the space. And people were sitting all around. And everybody had a long-handled spoon, long enough to reach the nutritious soup. But when he looked at the people, they were sick, pale, just miserable. Then he went up above. Surprisingly enough, he saw the exact same thing. A big pot of sweet smelling bubbling soup. There were people sitting all around and everybody had a long handled spoon long enough to reach the nutritious soup. But when he looked at the people up above, they were smiling. They were full, they were robust. This young man wondered why the difference when both places have the exact same thing. Down below the people were trying to feed themselves. The handles of the spoons were so long that by the time they got the soup, the soup couldn't quite 
reach their own mouths. Up above, the people didn't even try to feed themselves. They only fed each other. And when this young man was asked again whether he wanted to reside up above or down below, where do you think he chose? Up. The original version of this folktale, which is 2,000 years old, says that yes, he chose to live up above. But I believe this young man chose to live down below because there he could make a difference. And so can you. Any little bit of money that you could donate right now at the end of this event can make a difference. And Ali, by, by hosting this event today, you have made a difference and you will continue to make a difference in your life. And I'm, I feel a lot of gratitude that we got to meet at Chris's conference last year. And on that note, I would like to say goodbye, good night. And if you have any last questions, feel free to pipe up. Is there anything on, on the YouTube channel? Uh, people just saying thank you. There's lots and lots of thanks. Um, someone said, we, we love a story. 